Hey guys, my name is Michael, I am the creator of the top-down RPG course that you can find on this channel, and I'm also the creator of another course that is a 3D runner for both Android and also iOS. Those two courses, they are currently on Udemy, but I do not reap any benefits, and I don't have the right to redistribute them. Until today. Now today I have the right to do that, so I'll be posting it on my channel. So those two courses are now free, and they're going to be right here. Now the course that is attached to this very specific video, that's the runner course, um, consider it to be a step up from the top-down RPG course for the sole purpose that we're attacking a whole new platform. So we're going for Android and iOS, and this, this does create some more complexity, but we're going to ramp through it slowly, as we usually do with courses, so I hope you guys enjoy this. Now of course, I am putting this out there on YouTube for free, um, I'd appreciate if you gave me a like, maybe a subscription, a comment would be nice, but uh, mostly, if you just watch the video, I'd really appreciate that. And you can give me your feedback directly um, in the comment section down below. So that being said, oh wait, no, that's not, there's one more thing. <laughs> I am working on another course, and this one is going to be going immediately on YouTube. There is no third party involved this time. There is no evil person grabbing all my rights, there, there ain't any of that. So um, there's a new course coming on this channel, and I'd like you to subscribe because it's going to be a course about development, lifestyle, and career. So if you're interested in these three things, the other course is going to be covering a good basis of all of that. So without further ado now, let's get into it. Cheers. Hey guys, this is Subway Skater. It's a revamp of a game that we've already made in the past. However, this time we're doing it with a bunch of new features that were made for Unity 2019 and also Unity 2020. Something that I believe was really a good um, stepping stone for me in terms of my development career is getting this one product out. Before that, I had a bunch of prototypes, but I really had nothing on the market. I had nothing to show for. I had nothing portfolio ready. So the goal for this course is going to be to <laughs> shortcut that person I was back in the day and, and have a product as soon as possible. So if you're fresh out of school, I think this is perfect for you. If you're just getting into mobile development and you want to have uh, something to show for maybe for a mobile company that's hiring this is a very good step so you will go through all the development cycle of making a mobile game from the very beginning to the monetization to pushing over to google play store and also the apple store so both of them are going to be included towards the end of this course this course has a total of 12 hours of required content and what I mean by required content is that we have one straight flow that goes from the beginning to the end and that's all the required but then also on top of that, there will be optional videos that are just for knowledge purpose, just to enrich you in a certain uh, space that I'm very familiar with and I want to I want to share, basically. So I do suggest that you take this course maybe under two weeks. So maybe once a day for two weeks, I think it's a good pace. Um, and, and by the end of that, you will have a good product. Also, if you're interested to know how fast you're going to evolve in this, there is another video, another free video you can look at, which is the um, section breakdown. I think it's called the section introduction. You can go through it and you'll see that at every single section that you're going to go through the product of the game that you'll be having. Um, that's it. So <laughs> I hope you guys consider buying this and um, I'll see you soon. Cheers. It is now time to introduce all the sections from this course and also what you should be expecting once you're done with them. The first one being the introduction. So this one. In this one, you ain't gonna have much done, actually. You're just gonna have an empty project, and that's okay, because we're going over most of the introduction stuff, right? So um, nothing there, just a blank project, blank empty project. In the second section, visual and artist tool. By the end of that, you're gonna have a 3D scene with 3D assets, with colors, with models, and also a shader that will allow you to bend the world. In the third section, we move over to building to your phone. So you can have something tangible, something that you can play with when you're not on your computer that you can try it out. Um, you're going to have a build on your phone and you're going to learn how to create one. So throughout the course, if you'd like to test it on your device, that will be possible from the third section. Now over to the fourth section, that's the world generation section. In this one, we will go over creating chunks of gameplay that are going to be placed one after the other and that will also be pulled, so they'll be optimal. Section number five is going to be about the new input system. That's where we're going to import a new package from Unity that is not in the base installation of Unity. We'll import it and then we'll learn how to parse taps and also swipes on your phone. 
Section number six is where we really dive into the code and we implement a state machine pattern. That's where you'll start seeing the player move around and also the player by the end of that section, he will also have animation hooked to his different states of moving. Number seven is about the game flow. So you'll be able to go from one state to another. In this example, menu over to game, over to def, back to menu, back to game, and so on. So you're gonna be able to have a flow, a constant flow that you can go from one state to another, yeah. Number eight is the game menu. So you will start implementing UI for those different states. So for the menu, for the game, and also for dying, there's gonna be a, a UI appearing every time. So you'll be able to transition from one state to another using buttons, and also you have additional information that comes from this menu. Number nine is about data and how we save this data. So in this one, we'll be keeping track of the score, how many fishes the person has, um, and also these will be saved over to our device on the serialized state. So it's going to be very important that we go through this one. So every time that we play our game, every time we boot a new game session, we take the progress we've had from the previous game session and apply it directly on this one. So we can just keep on going. Number 10 is actually my favorite. That's why we implement the shop. And the reason it's my favorite is because we go through everything that we've been through before that it's one big rewind, it's one big revision of what we've done in the past and we re-implement it in a new module on top of our game. So by that time we'll have a menu, we'll have the game, we'll have dying state, we'll have a reviving as well. But then on top of that, once we have these four, we'll just say, hey, let's add a new module to our game, let's add a new part to our game and that part will be the shop. So we'll go through all the other steps that we've done before, but very fast and in such a way that it's just like big revision. Once we're done with that, we're going to move on to number 11, which is monetization. In this one, we'll implement the new package from Unity, once again, the new package um, for advertisements. So we can start making some money off people that play our game. And finally, number 12 is the polishing round. So our game by that time is going to have content. Maybe it's not going to look too good. It's going to have gameplay chunks. Maybe they're not going to be so fun, but by the 12th section, we're going to go over, change the lighting, change the font, change everything to make our game store ready. And after that, we can be looking at section number 13, in which we will be publishing. However, section 13, 14, and 15, which is publishing to Google Play, Google services, and then the Apple Store, they're not going to be available as the moment I release the course, but maybe by the time you're watching this, they're available. Just do note that the next three sections are going to be about putting that on the store. Um, Google services is about creating achievements and also leaderboard and Apple Store is about putting that on iOS. So that pretty much wraps it up. If you're still interested, please follow me along to the next video. Cheers. So we're finally ready to get started. Before we do, actually, I'd like to share you the source code for the project in case something goes wrong and you don't feel like asking a question. Uh, sometimes it happens, we're quite anti-social person from time to time. Uh, you'll have access to source code. You can go look directly, do a difference in between the two scripts. Maybe it's just a syntax error. Maybe it's just a small thing that you overlook. Um, the source code will be out there. It's in the resource section of this video right here. So if you'd like to go see that, so it's for you guys, it's on GitLab. If you'd like to go grab the code, it's in the description down below. One final note for real this time, one final note before we get started with the course is that uh, we've been running a online community for quite a while now and um, this could act as additional resource group. So if you'd like to get in touch with people, if you'd like to get in touch with other game dev, uh, other cool people that are around, uh, ask questions sometimes, showcase some of your work, uh, listen to some video, listen to some music with other people. We have a online community that is really close to my heart and that has been alive for quite a while now. So if you'd like to join that, I do encourage you to do so. There's a link in, again, in the description down below. And I do encourage, however, if you wish to join that, um, that you read the rules because it's it's an online community so we have our own little set of rules there. Just don't be rude to other people. Common sense abide. That being said, now we're really ready to get started. The next video is going to be me on my computer um, talking to the screen. So I'll see you there. Cheers. It is now the time to have a look at the engine we will be using for this game. Now, if you don't have Unity already, if you don't have Unity Hub or any individual version, please head over to the store.unity.com slash download. You will also be able to find this link in the resource down below. And also in the resource down below, if you're looking for an older version of Unity, there will also be a link for that as well. Okay, so on this link, 
This is a link to download what we call the Unity Hub. And Unity Hub will be uh, additional software that runs on your machine that will let you grab different versions of Unity and manage all of that together. Now, if you want to use this for free, um, you have to agree to the terms and services. Um, basically, it asks you, do you make over $100,000 um, if you're using this for personal? And if you're not, if you're using this for corporate, then you're going to need a specific license for it. But we'll get more into that as we download this thing. So let's go ahead and download Unity Hub. It's something that is already done on my end. If you have a Mac, you can click here and also download that um, for the Mac. And once you have Unity Hub installed, it's going to look something like this. So this is Unity Hub. And in my case over here, since I already have a installed version of Unity, so 19.4, and I also have a project, um, I have something um, that shows up a little bit different than you do if it's the first time for you installing this. So what I do recommend before you go any further is to actually sign in and create a Unity ID, so a Unity account in this case. Um, the reason I'd like you to do that is so first you can attach a licensing model to your account, but also so you have access to saving on the cloud um, through Unity Collaborate for free. So I'm going to go ahead and sign in. And once I'm signed in, you will see that I have access to the rest of my projects on the cloud. And that's, that's a lot of them. <laughs> now, once more, if it's your first time using Unity, you probably don't have a license just yet. So it's very important that you go ahead and um, it's going to ask you to activate a license. There is activate a license or there's also manual activation. Um, if you're hooked up on the internet, which I bet you are if you're watching this, uh, go ahead and click Activate New License. It's going to ask you a simple question. Are you using this for personal or professional? Do you make more or less than $100,000 in gross revenue? Click Done, and your, your license will be updated or activated. Once that is completed, you will now have access to um, installing the engine. So I clicked back, and now I have access to the install. And let's talk quickly about the Unity version. So you should see the add button at the top here. If you don't have anything, click on it. Here are the current version available. And it's um, it's very interesting how Unity goes and develop these. First up, let me explain what type of version we have. We have a regular version like this one has nothing next to it. We have the LTS, which stands for long term support. We have the alpha and we have the beta. When you are developing a project that you think is going to take quite a while or you want this course to be relevant in the future, um, I do want you to, to think about which version you're going to be using. Um, personally, as somebody that likes to experiment with Unity quite a lot, I'm always meddling around in the alpha or beta. But if I want to create something that is going to have to, to be published by the end of the year or something of the sort, a project that is commercial, um, oftentimes, you will want to opt for something that is LTS for long-term support because bug fix will be applied to this. Everything will be applied to this. So everything mandatory will be applied to this and it's considered a version that works very well. Now, if we go under the alpha or the beta, uh, chances are some things are broken. <laughs> um, let's be honest. Sometimes um, they do an update to Unity that breaks something else. I remember recently they broke the mobile build and also the key store. So I like to stay with LTS uh, when it comes down to publishing something 100%. But I do, I do hope that um, you have some fun. You go experiment with new packages that are only available in alpha or beta because that's always, um, that's always very nice as well. But for the purpose of this project, I will be using the LTS version. So click Next. And then it's very important that you download a couple of tools. Since we are going to be building this for mobile phone, um, in my case, the Android, I will be taking and checking all of these three, making sure I do have the open GDK and the Android SDK. Um, I'm using Microsoft Visual Studio for coding. So of course I want to have this one on. If you're doing iOS, please go ahead and click this. Um, I don't think we need anything else in there. If you want to mess around with Windows build, you could, but I personally don't have a Windows phone. And if it's your first time using Unity, um, you have the option to download the documentation. But to be honest, it's very accessible from the internet. And um, most of the time, I just Google stuff directly from their documentation. And it's much easier than using the one that you download. So I'm going to save myself a couple of meg and uh, just go without it.
If you are choosing Visual Studio, just like me for your IDE, Integrated Development Environment, then go ahead, accept the term and um, license conditions. Yep, I already have all of that, so I should be set already. And this is actually going to start a download for you. Now, one thing I'd like to point out, um, I'm going to be using 19.4.2. It's the LTS, but to be honest, I'll be using the latest LTS as long as the project goes. Um, I like to upgrade as long as we have um, an LTS tag. I like to upgrade my version. Um, but for example, I would not move on to 2020 as of right now because it's still in beta and I would not want anything to break in the middle. Um, something quite interesting that you might not know regarding Unity and how they do the versioning. They actually have to publish, and um, it's something that they've, they've been doing recently since 2018, they have to publish at least one version every quarter. So if we have a look over here, this version we're using is 19.4, so 2019.4, which means it's the last version of 2019. There's never going to be a 2019.5. It's only going to be 0.4. And if we have a look in the future, we have 20.1, 2020.2. That's because we've started the second quarter of 2020. And there is a new release um, to be scheduled at the third quarter. So in, in, um, in two months from now, there should be 2020.3 coming out, which is most likely going to be an alpha. That being said, we now have to wait for Unity to fully download. And you should be expecting black boxes showing up like a command prompt that happens when Unity installs. Um, one thing I'd like to point out is that in the past, I've had issues with um, downloading Unity while I was on VPN. So maybe if that's one of your problem, uh, try to disable your VPN and then install Unity. And if you're facing any other issue, please leave it in the course comments down below and we will go ahead and try to help you out. Okay, I'll see you in the next video. Welcome to the second section of this course where we actually start doing things. So we actually create our project and we move on to adding a little bit of art. So this section is gonna be all about adding art to our projects. So when we get coding, we have something to look at. I think that's very important to, um, to have a visual outcome of what we're gonna be doing as fast as possible. So let's go ahead. We have the Unity Hub open over here. Um, I also have the Unity version I've installed directly a couple of minutes ago. What we're gonna do is we are going to go under projects and create a new project with the latest version we just installed. So in my case, that's 2019.4.2, which is LTS right now. So I'm going to go ahead and it asks you a couple of different things here. Do you want to create a project with a template 2D, 3D, 3D with extra, HDRP, or the universal render pipeline? Now, this one over here is the one we'll be using, the universal render pipeline. It used to be called Lightweight render pipeline and um, they've changed the name of it because it had a negative connotation to it um, as in it has less powerful graphic than the HDRP which is actually true but here's the big difference if we're going for HDRP we would be creating a game that is more photorealistic so something maybe amongst the line of the new Call of Duties or you know games where you think this is the real life and and everything looks very good the lighting is close to perfect, close to similar as in real life. Um, but that's not what we're going for. Um, we're going for UWRP, so um, Universal Render Pipeline. I don't think there's a W in there. URP, right. We're going for Universal Render Pipeline because we're going for something a little bit more cartoony, uh, a little bit more Nintendo, you could say. So Nintendo games, they usually don't go with high definition. Um, they'd rather have more of a custom custom look, custom, cartoony, hand-painted, stuff like that. And um, it's also more lightweight, so it's going to give more performances for our mobile device. So that being said, um, I've chosen this template. I'm going to give this the name, the 2020 Runner Tutorial. Of course, you can call it something different on your end. Um, I like having no space in between. What you could do is add underscore if that bothers you or dashes. Um, but sometime when you're doing some operation in those folders, having spaces in between is going to make things complicated if you're approaching um, this through the command line, for example. So I'm going to go ahead and create this project. I'll actually put it on desktop. And here we go. All right. So once everything is completed, the project is created. 
you will end up um, seeing all of this. So there's a couple of things in there. It's basically the universal render pipeline template. So they want to show you exactly what this thing can do. And if you wish, you could play on uh, press on start and move around with your mouse and see how the lighting behave. I believe you can also change the directional light. Have a couple of things um, and, and you know, just play around with this template. Um, I actually don't like having stuff in there and I don't like this layout. If it's your first time using Unity, then I recommend that you use my layout, the exact same one I'm about to show you. Um, and if it's not your first time, of course, you are used to something different, go ahead and use that, uh, whatever feels the best for you. Now, um, as I've mentioned, if it is your first time, I invite you to go towards the right hand side of the engine over here at the top and click on default. And I'll be going with a tall layout, just like so. Now, I like the tall layout for one reason, and it's the fact that I can have both my hierarchy and my project in the same row like this. And when it comes down to the project itself, I like right clicking on it and having the one column layout. So it looks more like a, a Windows Explorer down here. Now, one more thing I'd like to do is I'd like you to pull the game window and actually anchor it on the left hand side like so. So you click, hold and you drag wherever you want. So as we create our game over here in the scene window, we can have an immediate preview of what goes on on the mobile version. OK, and uh, one more thing I'd like to do is clean up this project before we move any further. So if you could please go ahead, maybe delete all the example assets from the project, um, delete the material, delete the presets, the scene folder. I'll keep it, but I'll actually delete the scene script. I'll delete the script, but keep the folder. Now there's a bunch of profiles right here. Um, I invite you to delete all of these tutorial info, and also the readme. So there is nothing left um, except three folders, actually. And we have a scene over here with stuff in it. I do recommend that you hit Control N, which is going to create a new scene. If we go here, you can also do it from the menu. And here we go. We have a clean project. You know what? Let's go ahead and save this scene. So hit Control S or if you prefer, save and create a scene that is called game. I will grab this one and put it in the scene folder. From this point on, we should now be able to create um, our game using a very, very fresh project. The only real thing we kept from the, um, the render pipeline template is if we go under to window and do note that you'll have to do this if you're starting from an existing project, go to window package manager and install the universal render pipeline over here from the package manager. Um, if you don't see it, make sure that you toggle all packages and you give it a little bit of time to load and you can find it in here in a bunch of packages available to you. But in my project right now, we have the universal render pipeline. Before we move on to importing assets, 3D assets, and actually seeing them in action using the universal render pipeline, um, we have to create a couple of settings because we've deleted those a couple of seconds ago. So I invite you to right click on settings, go over to create, and then we can find, I believe it's rendering, universal render pipeline, and a pipeline asset. We can call this one the universal render pipeline asset, just like so. Now you'll see two new assets showing up in your settings. To make sure that our project actually uses these, we have to go under Edit, Project Settings, under Graphics, and we're going to drag and drop our pipeline asset. And now the project is actually using the uh, Universal Render Pipeline asset to render everything. This now means that the whole rendering of our project is actually being handled by this asset over here, and it has a couple of settings on the right-hand side. Um, so every time you do a modification to these settings, you'll be able to see some actual change. So if we go over here and we decide that the quality of the render scale is different, you see over here in my render that uh, things are different. If I, if I decide that my render scale is 10% of what it's supposed to be, then in this case, I'll get a more blurry look for the whole project. And uh, the lighting is also being installed here, shadows and so on. 
We will definitely come back to these when we have more assets because right now it's very difficult to decide what type of shadow you'll be using, what type of settings you'll be using in general, because we don't have an actual scene. We don't have assets to look at. I've just put the cube in there, but you know that's never enough to, to give a general feel to the game. So we'll definitely come back to this, but make sure that it is there. It's being set to use the Universal Render Pipeline asset because we'll need that in the next video. Now included in the resources for this video, you will find a link to the documentation regarding the Universal Render Pipeline. Um, and you'll have more information on it regarding, for example, the features. So if you'd like to know what is the difference in between this and um, the built-in render pipeline, so everything beneath what we have, so you'll find out things such as the color texture is on, um, you have static batching, and more information. Do know that some of these are being uh, developed. So for example, in research over here, in research, you have a couple of things that changes. Now, the big reason we're using the um, this pipeline and not the built-in one is because this one is going to persist in the future. It gives us the scriptable rendering pipeline, which is also very cool. It, it means that you will have control at a very low level of how you want to render your game. And that makes it a lot better if you're trying to do effects such as tune shading or if you're trying to curve the whole world, it gives you a place where you can do that on a much lower level so it's much less expensive. And that is pretty much it. So any other question, please leave it in the um, course comments down below. And I'll see you in the next video where we'll start importing a couple of assets. In this video, we will go ahead and include a couple of 3D assets that were already made for this course. Since we're not doing a 3D course, since we're not showing you how to use a Blender or 3ds Max, um, we already have some assets ready because we want to have a um, we want to have a direct impact on your game. So as soon as we start coding, we'd like to see visually what goes on with uh, decent assets. So this is why they are being provided, and I'll show you exactly how to get them today for free. If you have more um, question regarding how you can use these assets, maybe in the commercial sense, you can go over to our website and click on the license button over here. Uh, basically, it says that everything is free to use commercially and, and so on. Uh, we do appreciate that if you do it commercially, however, to leave a link or at least mention the website. Okay, but it's not needed. So let's go ahead and head over to the website. So epitome.cc or epitome.games, both of them is going to work. Head over to the download section and the package name is going to be called 2020 Subway Skater Course. If you prefer, you can just type in 2020 in the search. It's the first one here. You can hit download and it's going to give you a package file. Now, package file are great because I have Unity open right here um, from the previous video, and I can just double click on the package file I've just downloaded, so this one, and automatically it's going to give me all of these um, assets, and it's going to give me a prompt that I can just click on import, and everything should be in my project already as soon as this is completed, of course. And here we go. So we have a couple more things. Um, we have an artwork folder that includes some PSD files. So for Photoshop, you can modify this if you wish. Um, the assets might be different in your case because chances are I've, I've repolished them before, um, before you're seeing this course. Right now, I have an early version of this. But by the time that you download this and you watch, uh, most likely you're going to see the same exact thing, but with better art and better icons because sometimes Sometimes I struggle at making art, so I need some help. <laughs> okay, next up, we have three different material. You'll see that two of them are actually not showing, so they're pink, and we'll fix that um, when we start making shaders. And then we have models, bunch of models for the environment, for example, a bear, firewood, glacier, igloo, bunch of nice 3D models. And I'm just going to drop them in here, of course, delete all of that in a moment. We have a gameplay asset. So these are really measured and created for gameplay. For example, um, this, is a, this is something you can get on. And if you have another one over here, for example, a rock you can jump over. And we have letters just in case you want to spell something out in 3D, just like the title, the splash screen of this game is going to be made with these letters. And finally, the penguin. 
Now, the penguin is going to be the main character, which is why it has its own folder, and also it has a animator, which um, is already made, but we'll go over and we'll recreate all of that together. So here it is, that's the main character of our game. Now you're going to realize that all of these, for example, the penguin, it doesn't have any color on it. And that's because it's using a material that doesn't have any color on it. So it's very important that we go ahead and we actually fix our, our uh, materials. So going back under the material folder, the one that pretty much every single asset use, actually all the assets from the folder, it uses either the atlas and for the letter, it uses the letters. But this is the one that um, that is used by everybody. So the one called Atlas. And if you want to, we can go over to why and how this was done in the future video. It's going to be an optional video. But right now, I want you to go ahead and drag and drop this on top of the penguin. And you'll see that we have some issues. Those issues, so the pink here, is actually due because the shader over here is not found. So if I head over to the top over here, it says hidden internal error shader, which is not, is not what we want, obviously. Um, in the future, we will want a shader that does a lot of things. So it renders the color and it's going to bend the world. But right now we don't have that logic in there. So what we can do is just do some simple rendering of a texture. So if we head over to universal render pipeline and we choose, for example, lit, then we'll go back to having at least a color. But this time, let's go and include a base map in there. You'll find out that's all the buttons we've included, all the new icons we've included. The one we're really interested in is the Atlas texture. And you're going to see now that um, the penguin does have its color, its actual proper color, coming out of this small texture over here. So if I double click on it, I just want to open it so you can see what it's being sampled from, it's this small texture over here. So the penguin is actually being drawn using these. Um, it's a 64 by 64, and it does everything we need. <laughs> so our whole game, all the assets included in that folder are all actually pooling from this. Now to give you another example, I'll go ahead and I'll drag a normal block. That's one for the gameplay. And it's right there. I'll go ahead and I'll drag and drop the Atlas material on it. And you'll see that it now takes its color. Um, it all uses the same exact texture, the same exact material, which is the Atlas material. The technique of using a single material for everything in an Atlas is something very, very old. It's something that a lot of people um, probably did in the past um, using a very, very small texture, 64 by 64. It's a technique that is old, but still very, very efficient today. And it makes sure that um, we don't run into too much problem when it comes down to the performances, because we're only using one material, which means we have patching happening on pretty much anything that isn't affected by the light. And also the texture in memory doesn't take a lot of space. So it's a very, very efficient way to do things. Now, if you are curious on how we went and we did that, how we created those assets to do this, please go ahead and watch the optional video um, at the bottom of this section. If you're not interested, it is not a problem. Just move on to the next video in which we start adding animations to this penguin. We are now going to have a look at animations in Unity. So as mentioned prior, we are quickly going to go over art related stuff so we can jump into the code and have things moving. Now, um, looking at animations, we do have some of them under the model penguin and under these are the animation they are actually just like a mesh so for example this is a penguin and it has no animation in it um, it does have a penguin avatar it does have a rig but it has no motion and by motion i mean for example if we open up the run you'll find this over here this is a motion this is the um uh, this is how it is being represented. And it's really important to actually know that this is animation imported from another software. If you'd like to create an animation from Unity, you can always right click anywhere, create animation. Now, if you're curious on how it looks, the animation window is just like a keyframe tool that you would be using, for example, in video editing. If you double click on the animation you either created or one of them that you imported, you'll be able to see them 
inside of the animation window. Now this one is a empty animation we just created. So let me quickly delete and let's have a look at the jump. And as you can see, um, it is quite confusing at first. If you look on the left side, this is how the bones will react to the animation. So you'll see that the hips are going to move um, in X, Y, and Z. And it is quite a bunch of information. It's really, really hard to read, um, especially something that comes from another software. If you haven't made this one by hand, it's going to be fairly hard to read. And you can also view as curves. So this is how our jump looks like. All of these values are bound to a certain axis and also bound to a certain bone. So for example, um, we modify the so for example, we modify the rotation of the left leg, and this is how it looks like. So that's just the left leg um, during a certain time of the jump. And the jump is roughly 1.5 second long. So one thing that is important to look at is the import settings. So when you click on one of these, um, if it's something that you imported from somewhere else, in this example, we imported it from a tool called Mixamo. And uh, there's an optional video on that if you'd like. It's a very cool tool that gives you free animation. Um, it is very important you have a look at the import settings because it includes a couple of things you'd like to have. Let's start over here with the model. Now, something that is quite cool is that if you have a look at the penguin itself, you see him. You see that he has a mesh. You see a visual. If I take the jump and I drag and drop him right here, you'll see that we do have an object. There's a rig. Inside of the rig, there's a spine and, you know, uh, a neck, a head. All of these, they do exist. However, there is no mesh attached to it. And that is a fairly cool optimization technique where you don't import the mesh every time you import an animation. Instead, you just import the bone structure and you make the bone move with a mesh that already exists. So in this case, this penguin over here, um, he doesn't need anything. He just needs to have the rig and you are going to take the bone values and play it inside of this mesh. And um, so when we see over here on the left hand side, the model, it's actually not being um, imported at all. So um, I believe we could change anything here and it wouldn't do anything because we did not import the model. However, if we change it in Penguin, as you can see, uh, it's going to change things. So if I decide that my scale factor is 50, then it's going to be reduced by half its size. I'm going to put it back on 100. Now, one other part we're interested in here is the rig itself. So on our base mesh, on the penguin, the one that contains the model, um, it's fairly important that we decide what type of rig this is. Now, moving on to the rig section. Under here, you'll find that there's a couple of different animation types. Um, the two that are quite interesting, especially for mobile game, is the generic one, and also the legacy one. Why exactly do I like the legacy one? Well, it is because the old system, the legacy system of Unity is quite optimal for certain things. If you had an object that, on, that had only one animation clip, it doesn't have multiple state, it's just a simple animation that plays in a loop or it just plays once, you would opt for the legacy. In terms of performances, it's much easier for Unity, it's much faster for Unity to run this under a legacy. Now, if you're going to run something a little bit more complex, just like this penguin, he can run, he can be on idle, he can jump, then you want to go under generic and use the mechanism, um, the mechanism animation system. But today, since we're making something that uses multiple animation and blending in between these animation, we're going to be looking at using the generic version. And then finally, the one we're interested in the most is the animation tab. And you'll see here, there's nothing in here. And that's because we're looking at Penguin. Penguin itself is just the model and the rig. It's not the animation. The animation are all split in different clips. So if I click, for example, under jump, I will find the animation. I'll find the import animation window. I'll find um, a couple of more values here. I'll find the clips. So. You can have multiple clips if you wish. Um, for example, there is a optimization technique where you render only one animation, but you chain them. And um, if, I asked, if I am to describe this a little bit better, 
is you would have a animation clip inside of Maya where your character would run for like 30 frames and then it would walk for another 30, it would jump right after and it would fall all in one clip. And then you would come here in Unity and say, hey, you know what? Um, the walking is the first 30 seconds, uh, sorry, 30 frames. And then from 30 to 60, that's the falling and so on. So you would decide it over here and then you would say, hey, that's the part where we're walking. Hey, that's the part where we're running and so on. So you would modify these. But um, in our case, we separate all the animation under their own um, 3D object. So we are going to go ahead and make sure this is the full value. Now, something else very important is this button over here called loop time, and it's a Boolean. This is actually to make sure your animation is going to loop. And sometimes that's wanted, but sometimes that is not wanted. Now I'll give you an example for this penguin to run and I'll actually go ahead and drag and drop the animator on top of the penguin um, just to make sure we have some animation in there. And now you will see him moving. And as you can tell, we have an animation right here. That's the idle animation that repeats itself. And that is extremely important because if it wouldn't, then, you know, after the animation, it would just stop there and look quite weird. However, there is some other animation, for example, I'm just going to pop this one out, um, the death animation. So if I am to trigger death, the penguin falls and he dies. But then if that would loop, it would give a very, very odd result. For example, I'm going to toggle the loop time, make sure he dies, and imagine this would loop. So you're dead, and then this would play on over and over again. So in this case, looping the animation is definitely not something we want. So I'll make sure to toggle this one off. Okay, so we did a brief overview on the animation in Unity and also the import setting. We will come back and look at the animator window. So what I've just shown right here. We just had a brief look at animations in Unity. To make everything work together, however, we need some type of controller. We need somebody that say, hey, you should play this animation now. And if something happens, you play this animation now. And sometimes even blend two animation together. So as we go from walking to running, blend the two together so it looks, it looks good, it looks nice, and it doesn't just snap. And this thing is actually called the animator. Um, it's this item right here that is part of the penguin folder. But you know what? Today we are going to create an animator from scratch. We do have one right here in reference, just in case, but we are going to create one from scratch. Now I invite you to actually, if you don't have the animator on top of your penguin, go ahead and either drag and drop the animator clip, or you can go ahead and add component animator. Now, if you import assets from somewhere else, so if you import assets, for example, from 3ds Max, you might see this thing already on there. And you might be thinking, hey, this, this object maybe could be animated. Maybe this is a big overhead. Maybe uh, this is costly. Um, the truth in the matter is that nothing happens if you don't have a controller. So if this is set to none, this object just like doesn't exist whatsoever. So technically, you wouldn't have to remove it um, to save performances. When the, the project is built, this is not going to be assumed. Now, um, in our case, we wanted to create one today. So we wanted to create a, an actual controller. To do so, we can right click, create. Oh, by the way, yeah. right click in your project folder, create the animator controller. And I'm going to call this one Penguin Animator. 2.0. Just note that by the end of the video, I'm going to wipe this one completely and we'll use the previous one, the one that is part of the package. But I wanted to go through the window and the best way to do so is to actually do it. So start from scratch. Now, um, if you'd like to open up the animator window, what you can do is simply double click on it. So double click on your animator or go over to window, animation, animator. I'm going to anchor this one outside of the Unity box. This is a empty animator window. It always contains three items by default. First, the entry. So when you press on play, 
a exit if you wish for your animation state machine to end at one point so if your player dies and it has no way of reviving whatsoever um, and also the any state which is fairly fairly useful and we'll see what it does in a second now if you want to add stuff in there you have to right click and either create a substate machine or a state we are going to be using state and um now, as of right now, our animation window does not play anything. Our state is in entry, and it, it might as well just go from entry to exit. Like it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. So to be sure, to make sure that we actually go inside of a state, we're going to right-click, create an empty state, and let's call this one. Um, you can modify it by clicking here in the inspector. We'll call this one idle. So now technically we go from entry to idle, but really nothing is in there as of the moment. Um, one thing I'd like to show you is that we can actually get live feed from the game with the auto live link button activated at the top here. But for that to happen, we need to have an object that uses our animator. So let's go back on the penguin and then under the control over here, let's grab the penguin animator 2.0. While I have this one selected, I'm going to play the game. So right now I don't see anything. I'm going to select the penguin and then you'll see that idle is actually being played. If I unselect my penguin, it's still going to maintain this one. But if I was to double click on the base object, so the root object, um, it's not bound to anything. If you want to see the object in action and where it is in the flow, you really have to select that object in the inspector. And that is the live link. So right now we are stuck in a idle position, but this is just the state. It's not actually the motion. It's not actually the, the animation clip. So what we can do is now head over at the top right and say, hey, this is actually the idle animation. And you'll see that the player just snapped completely. Now he is playing this short little animation. So that's fairly cool. Now we're stuck here and we're not going anywhere. Um, if we were to stop this, you're going to realize that these settings from the animator are actually being saved at uh, runtime as well. So I don't have to stop the engine. I don't have to modify it after. It's actually being saved as I modify it. So that's, that's a fairly cool feature. Now, looking at our inspector, we don't have any transition away from this. So that's, that could be something cool. So if we want to move away from just being idle all the time, uh, we should create another state. So I'm going to go ahead and create the running state. And the way we create a transition in between the two is by right clicking on the source, make transition and click on the destination. And just like this, we should go from one to the other. So idle is being played. And once it's completed, we go into running and then running is just nothing. As you could see here, it just went back to the default balls. So let's make sure we go under running and give him that sweet little run animation. And here we go. So we're stuck in there. Now, obviously, we would not really want that to happen in the game because we want to be the one to define, hey, you should start running now. When I press on play, you should start running. But if I decide to stay in the in the lobby or in the the, the, the beginning screen for like five minutes, then we should be on idle for the five minutes. The way we go ahead and we tackle this is by clicking on this arrow in between. Now, this gives us um, all these settings on the right hand side, but the one we're really interested in here is conditions. So we need a condition to start running. We want to add something, but you're going to realize that if we click on the plus sign for transition, or sorry, con condition, parameter does not exist. So we now have to introduce a new concept to this whole thing, and it's the one for parameters right here on the left hand side. So I will be clicking on parameters and unfortunately we cannot add any of these during play mode. So I'll turn it off and I'll create a new float, int, bool, or trigger. Um, for starter, I'll believe I'll create a new one called running or run. To begin, we're going to start by creating ourselves a float parameter. Its information will be sending to the state machine um, every now and then. This one is going to be called speed. So what we could do now with this number we have here 
is say, hey, if our speed is above one, let's go ahead and start running. And that's exactly what I'll do. So now we have a parameter. I can go back here, click on condition, and say, is speed greater than, for example, one? Yes, okay, then we go ahead and we start running. Um, one cool thing when you're playing this with the auto live link is that we can actually modify these uh, without having to trigger it through code just yet. So if we're just testing around and we say, hey, um, set the speed of this player to like five or 10, then we're gonna do it right here. And you're gonna see the character running from that point on. Now, one thing that is very subtle that we have to look at is right here. So you see the animation is playing. I turn it to 10 and we're still not running because the animation has to complete first before we are being pushed into running. And that's not the behavior we want because as soon as we start, you know, as the game start, as we set a speed to our player, we would like to start running immediately. And this is where the Boolean over here called has exit time um, actually comes in. So I'm going to disable this one, press play. And now the second that I turn this to 10, it's going to start running right away. And just like this, we are going to be able to make this move with our code. Okay. Um, next thing we have to introduce is the any state. So with any state, it's basically, you can have a condition um, just like this one called at any moment or being verified every single frame. So for example, if we decide to jump, so I'll create myself a new state, call it jump, and a create a link in between these two. So I make a transition in between any state and jump. It is important when you go from any state to have at least one condition. So here, I don't really have any condition. I only have speed for parameters. So I'll create a new trigger, call it jump. And now with this new trigger, I'll put a condition between the two and I'll say, hey, if the trigger jump exists, then go and switch to the jump um, animation. And also I'll make sure to set the motion to jump. What this means is that, um, you know, wherever you are at any moment, we are always gonna be looking to go into jump. So this condition right here, the jump condition is always being tested. So even if we're running right now, or even if we're idle, it has no connection with jump. But if I press on the jump trigger, it's gonna jump. Now, unfortunately, after that, nothing happens simply because we're, we're stuck there. Um, the only other thing that could happen, the only exit we could have is another jump because we're still looking for this one. We're always looking for a transition outside of any state. So if I trigger this again, jump is being played again. Now with all of that in mind, I'm gonna go ahead and create the rest of this fairly quickly. We have the dev state, which use the dev animation. We also have the sliding. And finally, we have the respawn, which actually uses the jump motion. So all of these are here. There is a condition in between all of them at every single moment. And these parameter are the following. So we have the slide, we have running, respawn, def. Oh, and there is also another one I use, it is Boolean. It's for knowing whether if the player is on the ground. So it's called is grounded. Oh, and one more, one more trigger that is called fall. So the condition for dying is def. The condition for sliding is slide. Condition for respawn is, of course, respawn. And then um, if we look at the other state machine, I do have flow coming out of respawn, not def. Jump is a yes and also slide is a yes. The condition in between these is when we trigger running, then we go back to running from slide. If we trigger is grounded from the jump, then we go back to running and respawn. If is grounded is true, we go back to running. So with that in mind, we can recreate this like so. So slide here was set on running 
and respawn was set on grounded and jump was also set on grounded so i've just recreated the same state machine we're using with um the original the only difference i believe oh right now the only difference is the has exit time i want to toggle this off for every single one of them now the only difference in between the one we've created and the one that already exists is the speed at which we blend in between animation and let me give you an example here um there's additional settings that we haven't played around with too much here but if i go from any state to jumping you'll see that if you look very very carefully you'll see that it takes a little bit of time before we get up and then we jump um this is actually being controlled on the right hand side over here and i could make that instant if i just took this and i put it all the way over here and then if i go to a jump it's 100 percent going to jump immediately like in the full jump poles however if we drag this out and we just put say the end of the jump clip we can end up with a result that is much different where we basically <laughs> almost don't see um the legs lifting off it we have a, a weird behavior here <laughs> so um this is the only difference in between the two it takes a little bit of tweaking as you can see we can move that a little bit on this side maybe it look better yeah it feels a little bit better still not fast enough um, but this is the only difference in between the two. And that is why I wanted to make sure that I use the one that I spent a little bit of time on to make it you know, look decent. So what I'll do to wrap up this video is I'll go ahead, go on my penguin, remove the animator I currently have and put the old one in there. And we will now be able to go from here using these animation. Okay. So that being done, we'll have some animation with the penguin um, for us to use in the near future. Now, the next step we should tackle is maybe create a small environment and play around with the settings and the shaders. So I'll see you fairly shortly. In this next step, we're going to go over something that is not necessarily required, but it's something I highly encourage you to do. And it's to create a small, very small environment in which we can preview our models because in a very near future, we will be playing around with the shadow settings and with the, um, the lightweight rendering pipeline settings or the universal render pipeline settings. So in order to view those changes properly, I'd like us to go ahead and um, just lay down a piece of environment, which we could also use for our starter screen. So I'm gonna go ahead and just base everything around the center of the world, that is zero, zero, zero. And I'll create myself a 3D object that is a plane, and that's gonna be my floor. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and just make sure I anchor this back at the center of the world. Here it is. And I'll start laying down some of the objects that we have in our model folder, um, especially in the environment, because they're not gonna be used for anything else really, but just the looks. Maybe drop a cabin in here. This one is quite big, so I reduce the size to say half of it. So 0 0.5 on all axis. And you don't have to be, you don't have to snap this anywhere. You don't have to make sure it's pixel perfect. Um, this is really just for looks. So I'm gonna go ahead and just maybe turn this around a little bit. Um, which angle should I be facing? So knowing that our character is gonna be running in the Z axis forward, so in this direction, um, I'll want this to be angling like so. So in this angle, it's pretty good because then what we can do is when we start a game, we can have a look at our penguin like right here. And then when we hit play, we start running in that direction. So it's like a small transition that might um, that might happen uh, with the camera. What else could we do? We could use um, we could swap up the light just a little bit so we can see better. We could use fishing ground. So I invite you to play around with this and create a very small environment around the player, so we can actually um, play with the settings. The the render pipeline settings just afterward. Now, if your material don't work just like me, make sure you go ahead and drag and drop this on top of every single one of it. Um, so this is the Atlas texture. It's actually the one included inside of the environment folder. And this is the one that should be applied to everything. So as you can see here, I just modified this one. And um, you can see that the result is being pushed over to every single object that has these. So now it looks a little bit better. Now, one thing I'll do before I close this one off is that I'll go over to my material and there is a snow material that I'll just put 
on top of my floor. Um, now, of course, this, this shader is not ready for this. Um, so let me go ahead and fix it. Universal render pipeline. We're going to be using a lit and we'll be using the snow texture. So something very simple like this. Um, it's not perfect. The snow doesn't look too great at the moment, but we can look into fixing this um, once we go ahead and apply the real changes. So at this point, we should have enough model on the screen to start tweaking with the, um, the rendering settings and have a better result because right now we're looking at this and it's really hard to tell. You can see that the shadow is here, but it's all jaggy. Uh, the texture are, are all jaggy as well. Uh, we need to address this and that's exactly what we'll be doing in the next video. We now have an environment that contains a little bit of asset. It contains a couple of things we can have a good look at while we tweak our URP render settings. And that's exactly what we'll do right now. So headed over to my settings folder, I do have the asset over here called the Universal Render Pipeline Asset. And if we click on it, we'll see a huge drop down on the right hand side. Uh, it contains pretty much everything we're going to be tweaking around with today, starting with general. The general contain a render list, which I am not going to get into this video. However, there is an optional video that will explain um, different type of render you can use and you can stack them on top of each other. That is the power of the, uh, the scriptable rendering pipeline, but it's not something we'll get into this because it's a little bit of advanced topic. Um, going under quality, the rest are, um, wait, <laughs> let me go over these again. Uh, so the depth texture, if you plan on using depth texture um, for any reason really in the future, if you have a shader that uses a depth, it needs to know how far away an object is from camera. You have to enable this so your camera produces one depth texture. Um, same thing for opaque texture. This pretty much act as a grab pass. It's pretty much the exact thing as if you were doing a grab pass. So um, those don't actually, if you're not familiar with shaders, those leave them off since you're not using them. Um, it's, it's something really that uh, if you make shaders, you want to maybe grab information from what you're rendering, and this is a way to do it. So this is basically just save a texture in memory every single time we render something. Um, and it can be used to produce nice effects such as uh, frosted glass or reflections and that kind of stuff. Now for Terran Alls, I actually don't know what this is, but if we hover this, the URP will remove all Terran Hall shader variant when you build this for Inti Player. This decreases build time. You know what? It decreases build time. I'm going to remove it since I don't use Terran anyway. Um, headed down in quality, we have the high definition range here, or the high definition range. Yeah, that, that has to be it. <laughs> um, the lighting, which is actually going to push um, your brightness a little bit higher than it should. So I don't want to use this. If you were to create really high photorealistic scenes, then you probably want to, to use this. But in our case here, it's a very simple game um, and we're not gonna be super photorealistic. We're not gonna take it outside of the usual color range. So it's not something we need to enable. And by not enabling it, we save quite a bit of memory. Um, next up, we have the anti-aliasing. Let's have a look at anti-aliasing. So if I zoom in, oh, I have to zoom in with the camera. Um, if we go very, very close to an edge like, like this, and we have a look on the game scene, and I zoom in a bit, you'll see this jagged line over here. What anti-aliasing does is actually it takes this line and it blurs it out a little bit. So if you have a look here, we go from disabled to X2, X4, and X8. So it makes it a little bit smoother. And uh, believe it or not, it is quite inexpensive operation. It's definitely not something that we'll see on our mobile device. So um, as you can tell here, I'm very, very, very zoomed in on this object and will never encounter this kind of zoom during our game. Um, and I can barely see the difference in between the highest setting and the lowest. So that's a no for us. I'll move back my camera now. Um, next up, what we have is the, I believe it was the render scale. Uh, if you'd like to downscale your game, um, you can do it here. It's the equivalent of saying, if you render your game 100 pixel by 100 pixel, well, let's do it 10 by 10 instead. Or you can put it on two. So say if you're rendering 100 by 100, but that would make it 200 by 200. Um, so it's a good way to upscale or downscale your game. Next up, we have the lighting tab. And this one is, is the most important one to understand. If you're moving over from the old version of Unity, the old version of lighting, the old version of um, rendering, I could say, 
Um, this is where you'll want to focus and, and make sure you fully understand this. Um, I'm just going to quickly disable the additional light because that's fairly important. Main light is your main light. It's actually, um, it's actually defined as the brightest directional light in the scene, I believe. Yeah, if you hover this, it says main light is the brightest directional light. And if additional light is disabled, you realize that, hey, um, you know, I have this directional light here. I can play around with it. If I duplicate one and I move it around, it doesn't have any effect whatsoever. And that's because that's not the main light. The main light is right here. And if I move this one, will not matter. Um, so if you find yourself lost because one of your light doesn't work, that's most likely the case because one of them is acting as the main light and there is no additional light uh, involved. Now, if you'd like to have two different lights, two different directional light, you would have to enable this part down here, additional lights. Now I can actually play with two different directional light if I wish so. It is, however, not the case. So I went ahead and I deleted it. Um, next up in the settings, we have cast shadow, which is quite self-explanatory. Would you like your light to cast shadow? Yep or no. Um, it's actually something you, we might want to go for. No shadow for mobile game is first very optimal because you don't have to, to run shadows and shadows is a expensive operation and um, it looks good. So if you have and painted texture, sometimes you decide to paint the shadow within the texture and it makes it looks like it has shadow even though it doesn't. Um, that can be very, very cool. That can be very beneficial. Um, so as you can see, we can play around with the lighting and we don't have shadow, but there is still shadowy part to your, to your object. So it might actually be a good idea to run without shadows. And it's something that is completely up to you, but do note that if you don't enable it, well, you save a lot of memory, but in case you want to enable it, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start tweaking with the settings a bit. So, um, shadow resolution, you can play around with it. You'll see exactly what it is. The highest definition the more um, fidelity your shadow is going to have with the object it's being cast off. And the lower, well, it's going to look like this. Now, um, shadow, as I've just mentioned, is a very expensive operation. And if you're to run it on mobile devices, I would not recommend going above, well, I want to say 512. Uh, but yeah, 256, 512. In my case, if I am to run shadow, I run it at 512 at the maximum. And that's for high-end devices. If, if not, you know, 256 is just fine. Um, next up, we have the additional lights. Now, um, we could disable it altogether if we don't plan on using any more lights. Um, and that could be the case. It's really up to you. But for example, if I'd like to just have something lit up within my, like in the small house over here, like a point light, well, obviously nothing happens because the whole rendering um, only knows that there is a directional light, nothing else. And this one could be used for baked light, but really we're not, we're not baking any light in this case. So I'd have to toggle this on. And then from this point on, I now have access to a small light within my house here. And it's the exact same thing as above. So you have access to cast shadow, shadow resolution is here, and you play around with these settings. For the sake of this tutorial, I'll actually disable it. I, I don't actually want to have additional light in this case. Um, I'll just keep one for my whole game, I believe, and it's going to be a little bit more optimal. And maybe in the future, if it looks better, I'll go ahead and I'll disable the shadows as well. But for the moment, we're going to go ahead and keep them on because the next section has all to do with shadows. Now, remember, those shadows are 512, so the texture is, um, is actually 512, but it looks quite jagged. What you can do is you can simply ask for having soft shadow, which make it look a little bit better for a mobile game. Um, and I actually like that quite a lot. But in this case, I will go ahead and I will keep the shadows because we'll need them for this next section, which is actually called shadows. And we are going to start with the first setting over here called distance. Now, distance has to do with which distance do you actually see these shadows. So if we are to quickly just reduce this over time. And you know what, just to make this a little bit more clear, I'll, I'll make the shadow very, very um, good quality. And I'll go ahead and I'll move down distance. And you're going to see that with a low distance, as I zoom in, you can now start seeing the shadow pop up slowly. And um, our game is quite, it, it goes quite far, like in terms of distance. Um, so we want to keep that to a certain number, maybe even 70 or 75 or one, 100 might be 
good enough, actually. Um, but if you feel like uh, we don't need to render that far away, um, what you can do is actually create level of details. So you could say, hey, yeah, we're going to take a 100, but you know the shadows that are a little bit further away from me, let's render them with less quality. And the ones that are very far in the back, again, let's render them with less quality. Now, I'll go with a distance that is roughly 50 for a game because we go quite far um, in, in the z-axis. We go quite far, so we might want to have shadows um, in the far distance. Now, feel free to play around with these cascade settings. I'm actually not going to use one, and I'm actually going to use soft shadows on top of that. And it's going to make things a little bit more expensive by using soft shadows. But at the same time, um, it is going to allow me to reduce this texture resolution by quite a lot because we're on 4K right now. Rendering 4K shadow is obviously way too much. It is just a matter of playing around the settings, see what fits your game the most. But uh, one tip I can give you is always have a look on the left hand side. So in your game view, that's the most important. Um, and not this scene, because this scene is not representative of what is going to be the real, what, what the cameras really see. Moving on, we have the post-processing settings, which we will come back to. We haven't played around with post-processing just yet, so not really useful. We play around with the settings just yet. And then finally, with the advanced settings, it asks if you want to have a batcher for descriptable rendering pipeline. Yep, dynamic batching, I would also enable that. Um, usually, I would enable that, but here, I'm not sure if we need it since everything should be batched already. Um, it doesn't have to be dynamic, however. We only have one light and everything is on the same shader. So I'm going to check this, but I doubt that it's going to change anything because everything should already be batched together. Um, and then debug level shader variant is not something we're going to be playing around with in the scope of this course. All right, so now we've set the rendering settings. Um, to give a better feel to our scene, what we could do next, and something that heavily, heavily affects it, is the lights. So the lighting, how everything looks. Because we have just one main light, this should be quite, uh, quite simple to do, actually. So I'm actually going to change the light color to have a bright white, actually a pure white, just like this. And I don't, I'm not actually going to play with anything else, maybe with the shadows a little bit. I don't want to have too much shadows. If you play with these settings, you'll see that um, you, we can have uh, shadows that are very, very uh, opaque versus having something that's a little bit less opaque. I like having something very subtle, maybe like this, so 0 0.75. However, it is completely up to your preferences. And if you go over to the um, the sky folder, I actually left a sky box in there with a couple of settings over here. And it's a material that I've, I've created. Um, it's extremely simple to create. In fact, if you want to do it, you can always right click create material and change the shader for skybox, which uh, let me check. It's skybox and then procedural in this case. And set everything here manually, but I've made one um, and you can simply drag and drop it in the sky. And it's going to look something like this. So it gives us a very bright sky and it gives us a very bright horizon. Um, if you do modify the angle of the sun, though, you're going to see that it shifted. It shifts quite a lot. It can look very, very weird. But at the same time, it actually it can give you some nice, really nice effect at the end of the game. Maybe if you run for long enough, uh, you could go to hell or something. I don't know. <laughs> but that being said, let's save this. And we have a much better feel with this game already. We have much better colors. We have much better ambience. And that is actually where we're going to wrap up this one. And I'll see you in the next video. It is now time to have a look at Shader Graph, which is a artist tool that permits you to create shaders. Um, back in the days, it wasn't that easy to create shader. You'll see it's quite, quite simple now, but uh, you had to write HLSL code, which stands for high level shader language, or um, I'm not sure what the other one was. Well, it's not as complicated as it used to be. So. To try this out today, we're going to go through the shader graph and I'll actually create a folder inside of artwork or maybe just outside of assets completely and we'll call it rendering. I will then right click on rendering, create shader and then we'll have to look at the second section over here. The five firsts are regarding the old ways of, uh, of creating shader. It still works today. You can actually create shader like that, but it's going to be really hard to make work with the individual rendering pipeline. In the meantime, these five over here 
are um, built for shader graph, you could say. Um, 2D renderer is really for creating 2D shaders. In this case, we don't really, our game is not 2D, so we're not interested in that. Unlit would give you a master node that has nothing to do with lighting. It stands for physically based rendering, which is a really, um, if you're trying to create something that is very photorealistic, that's the one you would take. But let's have a look quickly because I just want to make sure you understand what goes on behind these. Um, if you are to create a unlit and if you are to create a PBR, the only difference you'll see is that the master node, so the product in the middle, is going to be PBR master. And for the unlit, it's going to be unlit master. So really, um, these are just settings that, um, that will change the master node. But for today, we are going to create a PBR graph. Um, you might be thinking, hey, we're not creating something that is very photorealistic, but we're still going to be creating something that has lighting in it. So I'd like to go ahead and um, create a PBR graph if we feel like it's a little bit better to go with no lighting whatsoever. So if we don't like the shadows and we don't like anything else that has to do with that, and, and the light, um, then we could go ahead and switch to a different master node. But for the moment, and as we're only testing shader graph today, let's go ahead and create a PBR graph and I'll call it shader test. Okay, now it's very important that when you do create a shader um, and you want to test it out, this now becomes a shader inside of your material shader list, which means if I want to use this on, for example, this igloo, I will have to right click rendering, create myself a new material, and I can call this one the same name, so shader test. It doesn't have to be the same name, that's just like a preference that I have. Um, and then we're gonna head at the top here, go under, where is our, oh, here it is, so shader graph, and we are going to use our shader test. Now I have this one, I can drag and drop it right on top of the igloo. And now this igloo now uses our shader test graph. Okay, let's give it a look. Let's double click on this one and see what happened. The object is actually being rendered using this PBR master node. And you will see on the left hand side over here and on the right hand side, these over here are basically um, inputs. So it's rendering with a certain amount of alpha, certain amount of occlusion, Italic, emission, normal, albedo, all that kind of good stuff. Now, just to see the changes as we are changing them over here, as we do some changes here, just to see them, I'll actually move my camera. So this one, I'll move it to see the igloo in a nice frame for my game window. So what we see here on the left hand side, it's going to be a way to work that is going to be a little bit more efficient. Okay, so this igloo right now being rendered by this exactly. If we just click somewhere and we decide, hey, you know the albedo, I want it to be on like bright blue like that and hit save asset, you'll see that this changes color. And that's because the albedo now has something different. You can play around with that as much as you wish. But that's not really the point today. We're trying to figure out what to do with this shader graph. So the next thing we will do is try to figure out how this window works a little bit better. You'll find at the top left over here, this is what we call the blackboard. So you can toggle it on and off just by clicking blackboard at the top right side. We also have the main preview, which is down here. Main preview is, is self-explanatory really. So if you change something, you'll see the change um, happen directly on this object. And also do note that you can rotate it around, which is really hard to see right now because we don't, we only have one color. Uh, and you can also change it to a different model. So capsule, acquire, or even a custom mesh if you wish. So we can see rendering being done to this thing. Um, now, what is really cool is a blackboard at the top hand side here. This blackboard will let us actually use um, inputs. So different type of inputs for our shader. And I'll give you a quick preview of that. In case we would like to specify the color directly here, because you know that's the case for some other shader. If you're trying to do a normal uh, standard shader, let's do URP lit, you'll have a lot of input over here. You can say, hey, actually my base map is this, it's that, it's all of these. You actually choose specifically for this material. And you could have another material called shader test two that uses a different texture. 
So now I'll go back and I'll show you how to do that. So um, the inputs are actually being done through the Blackboard over here. So I could decide, hey, um, let's add a new color, for example. And that color is going to be the base color of our mesh. Now, if we save this asset, you'll see at the top hand side over here that we have a setting. And this is for my material. So I say, hey, my base color is actually the full alpha yellow. And I hit save. Um, actually, I don't need to hit save because that's, that's shader material here. Um, but you're going to realize that still, even though I, I've defined a base color, I'm still rendering with this red. And that's because the red is the one that is connected to the PBR master. And now we have to find a way to say, hey, um, I want this color, the base color, to be put right here in the albedo. We can do that by actually click and dragging this right inside of the graph. And now we end up with two different nodes. And I can say, hey, I'm going to connect this one with the albedo by just clicking here and dragging this all the way there. And you're going to realize that um, base color is actually four and albedo is three. Albedo is only looking for RGB, but base color has RBGA, so it has alpha on top of it. But it's still going to work just fine. So now if I am to save this, it's actually going to render with the color that I specify here. So this is all done, not through this window, the small window we had here, but through the material, which means, if you remember, if I am to create a new material, call it shader test, say number two, shader test two, and apply it to, for example, this tree in the background, It uses the exact same thing, so the exact same shader graph, shader test. We now have two different, um, two different material that uses the same shader and has different color because of that. So this is actually how we go ahead and we input a, um, a parameter. Now, before we close this off, I'd like to actually show you how to go around and work with this window in maybe a little bit of more efficient manner. Some of the key bind you can use is just like the clipboard. So I can do Control C for copy and paste the base color. I can do Control C for cut and paste it somewhere else. I can press on F while I have a node selected to focus on it. And the most important key bind, the one you like the most, is just pressing on spacebar and it's going to give you the list of nodes you can create. And there is quite a lot of nodes you can create. So for example, the one over here, it's called base color. It's actually a property. I can find it under property and the only one we have is base color. So we could have created it um, this way instead. You're going to realize you can play with a lot of different things. For example, I could say I can create a checkerboard and you know what? That will be my albedo instead. Now we end up with this type of result, which is really not, not that good because my UV are all collapsed. Now, what would be the best thing to do here is actually delete, for example, the base color and go with a texture 2D instead and just call it main texture, for example. Um, I can drag and drop it here, put it under the albedo. Oh. Actually, you cannot put it directly like that. You have to go through another object. Um, another way to create a dialog window just like this, to create a node, is just by clicking somewhere and then releasing it really in the Blackboard, uh, which is going to let you, for example, do an input texture and you can sample a normal texture. And I'm going to output the RGB into the albedo, which now means Whatever the texture we define here is going to be put directly under the albedo. So I need my atlas and we are back. And now just like that, we are back to a very basic, just apply the texture to my mesh type of deal. Um, some of the things that are maybe interesting to look at is that every time you have a node like this, on the left hand side, you will find input parameters, which means you can modify what the texture is in this case. Um, you can have different sampler and on the output, you can actually say, Hey, um, this is where the blue is. And this is where the red is. You can like output a single channel. For example, 
One thing that I just did is that I made sure to drag and drop my texture in the default, not because it's really useful, you can always change it anywhere, but just because it gives me a preview directly here. Um, and now what I wanted to say is that on the right hand side over here is the settings you can actually export from whatever texture you have. So here you can export the RGBA, which stands for red, green, blue, and then the alpha channel of this texture. Um, all of them together is going to give you a vector four, and we're putting that vector four inside of albedo three, which means we're actually not using the last one. So alpha is right here and it can be put anywhere you wish. So if you had a little bit of transparency, you could put it directly here in alpha. You'll see that we really don't have that here. But if we are to use another icon, for example, this one has transparency, we hit save. Um, it doesn't do anything, but that's simply because our PBR master is not configured to do transparent. If we click on the small gear at the top, then we could actually switch this to say, hey, we would like to have a transparent surface. And then we end up with really weird results. So we'd have to play around with it quite a lot to make it work um, in our favor to have alpha. But that's not the goal for today. So we did a very quick overview of everything, really. I'm going to put it back on something normal so we have a nice starting point for the next video. And with this, we are now going to dive in even deeper to create ourselves a shader that modifies the actual vertex value. So it changes the vertex position. Um, simple reason is we'd like to bend the world. So this input over here is going to help us bend the world. All right, I'll see you then. So previously, we created a shader test, um, a graph, a material, two material, in fact, and we just played around with uh, the shader that is. So what we plan on doing today is actually start creating our real shader that is going to be um, that's going to be used throughout the whole game. It's a technique that you might want to do for optimization, but uh, in case it's it's not possible to put everything under a same shader, then of course having one more doesn't really hurt you that much. But it's some um, it's some good practice, just like how we put all the objects under this one texture over here. We can also do that for shader and that's what we intend to do for this mobile game. So without further ado, I'm actually going to remove everything that we've created in the last episode. So one, two, three, everything in the rendering folder is going to go. And we'll see that these two objects, they lost reference. That's simply because, of course, um, they're attached to a material that no longer exists. So I'm going to go ahead, right click on rendering, create myself a new shader, PBR shader. I feel like calling it Atlas or Main or Main Atlas. Actually, I'll just call it Main. Yeah, that sounds a little bit better because we're going to be using more than one material outside of this. One of them is going to be for the snow on the floor as well. Um, so I'll just call this one Main. And let's go ahead and just produce a simple shader that we can apply to everything else. So here is what we'll do. We're going to go and create a new texture to at the top here and it's going to be the main texture. I'll make sure to drag and drop this right in here, and we are going to put that in a sampler 2D. So sampler 2D, and it will look something like this. I'm going to go ahead and also put the default texture so we can do um, a little bit of previewing as we work. And let's just drag and drop this in the albedo. And just like that, already we should have recreated what we had previously. So we have a shader called main, and it just puts the texture on top of the objects. And since that is the case, I'm going to go ahead and just make sure that everything in this scene actually uses the same shader. So I can see that my objects right here, it's actually using um, Atlas texture. So where is this one actually? Let's try and find this one. I'm going to right click on it, select material, and it's under the model, environment, material, and Atlas texture. Now, once I'm on there, I'm going to go ahead and change the shader to use the one we just created. So shader graph main. And you'll see that um, since we plugged in our main texture, it didn't change much. It's actually very, very similar. And I'll make sure to actually drag and drop this on top of the igloo and also on top of the tree as well. Now, um, one more thing. I also want to change the snow material to use our shader because we said everything should be under the same shader. Let's right click, select this material. I'll, I'll go down here and I'll make sure to change it to main as well. But 
uh, of course, the main texture in this case is going to be the snow. Now we do get one problem. So we're going to run to the first problem that, um, that comes with this. This is our snow material. Um, and we're going to have a couple of things that are going to be scaled up and maybe scaled down. And you'll see that if we'd like to have like the snow look a little bit better or a little bit more detailed, we'll need to scale down the object as well. And that's not, that's not really cool because usually um, what happens with a, you know, a shader like this, a typical shader like this, if we go under lit, um, it gives you the option to actually do tiling and offset. So if you'd like to have more detail, you can just style it. And that's exactly what we're going to go and add to our shader. So quickly, I'll put that back on main. And we're going to go under our shader once more. And over here, this means we'll have to play with the UVs. Now, there is something called tiling and offset, actually. So we can go ahead and just hit spacebar, tiling and offset. So it takes three different parameters, a tiling and also an offset. So it's exactly as we just seen um, under the different shaders, the, the actual general purpose one. And of course, it outs it. So let's go ahead and add it just like this, see what happens. You're going to see that um, nothing really changed. And if we were to play with the offset a bit, you are going to run into this type of trouble. Now I've offset everything and, and we have some weird color. Um, obviously, offset might not be what we want to do here. Actually, it is not what we want to do here. But if we are to tile, you're going to realize that we're affecting much more than just the snow. So this means um, this object right here, the tiling, is going to have to be an outside parameter so it can change depending on which material it is. So it can be unique to its own material. So I'll go ahead, create a new um, boom, 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 vector one. Vector one stands for a single value, in fact, and we'll call it tiling. I'll drag and drop this here, put it under the tiling. Um, I'm actually tiling in both X and Y at the same time. I didn't plan on using um, two-dimension tiling, but if you want to do that, then of course you can just create yourself a vector two instead. And I, can, I can also create myself another one for um, the offset and just drag it just down there. Okay. Now with this in mind, we can now save once more. Oh, we're having some type of issue here. Um, so the tiling was actually 1-1 one, one earlier, so I can put that on default 1, save it, and it doesn't seem to work. What about the offset? Hmm. Okay, so it feels like even though we've saved it as a default parameter, it didn't actually add it down here. So it's going to be very important to go back and um, change it, change it to 1. And now you'll see that even if we do this, we move the offset, it's going to work great for the snow, so we can get a better offset. Actually, you can move that snow as well if you like it to move. Um, you can do all of that on this very specific material and not actually move the offset for the rest of the material, which gives you a really weird effect, actually. Now, one thing you might realize, and might not be the case on your end, uh, but it might be, is that if we tile a little bit too far, we actually reach the end of the texture and then it's always going to be this color. So you see the number going up on the right hand side, but we always reach the same color, which simply means we're at the end of the texture. And if you'd like that to, uh, to not happen, actually, you can select your texture in your import settings and make sure it's actually put on, um, we can do repeat. So the Atlas texture would not scale up, would not actually go beyond that point. But as you can see now, it repeats itself. So we're going to have infinite color. And yeah, it just looked very, very weird. Um, but you know, at one point, you started seeing that. <laughs> uh, so that, that's that for this texture. But I do not need it for the Atlas. I actually don't need it to repeat. So I'll just put it on the clamp. Um, however, you're going to realize that it is actually set on repeat for the snow. And that's why this one didn't have this problem. You can actually tile it as much as you want. That being said, we're actually done with the albedo part of this shader. So you can say the easiest part is actually done. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put a tiling of five on the snow and let's call it a day. In the next one, we'll start playing around with the vertex position. Now it is time we move away from albedo, which is where we were for the color, and we move on to the vertex position. By changing the vertex position, you'll see that there will be an offset on every single pixel you see here. Um, there will be an offset to what? Um, it's actually going to be rendered at. So let me give you a quick, very quick example. 
if we are to just take the object space, that's the default. So that's where it is being placed within the scene. And if we change that, for example, for vector three, zero, like so, then uh, all the objects are going to be put at the same space. So all the object using this very specific shader, all the vertices are now standing at the world position, the world zero, 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 which obviously if all the vertices are actually on top of each other, we're not going to see any triangles. They're just going to be all crashed down like within here. Um, it is also go good to note that even though we will see them technically appear over here, um, you can still select them the same way as you would normally. So it does not change the collider. It does not change um, where the pixels are in the scene. It just changes them where you see. Uh, it just changes them visually, you could say. So to go a little bit further with that example, with a better, <laughs> actually a better example, um, by default, it's actually using the object space. So let's go back into object space, or I believe in this case, it's position. So the node is called position and the space will use object space. So technically, if we are to just go here and override, press save, this is what we had prior. This is actually, now to be a little bit more clear with my example, what I'd like to do is actually do a little bit of arithmetic on this position. So let's modify it before it reaches this point. What we could do is add them together. So we could do um, add position with another vector tree that we defined manually. Now you're going to see here that um, the inputs are actually one, one. But if you go and you drag this here, it's actually going to give you a modified version of that node where it's now three, three. And if you were to drag a vector four, you would have the four, four as well. Um, so sometimes it's worth just dragging this on top of the node and see if it actually takes it. So for example, we are going to say, hey, um, all the vertices, yep, put them all together here. So that's my vertex position. Put them in the first one and also add a vector zero, one, zero. So technically, if we are to drag the add over here, put it there, every vertex we see are going to be incremented by one. And now you can notice that every single object, they do have, they have the same position as they had prior, but now um, they're rendering. So only the rendering part is always one meter higher in y okay so we know how to modify that that's not so cool let's do something a little bit more fun right so let's go ahead and add something that changes over time such as time so if i go over here and i input time in the search um we have a couple of options for example we have sin costs and also just the overall time um if we are to just modify for example the y with the sin time, sin being a wave, we are going to see quite a fun behavior. So you can sit over here happening in the preview. And let's save. And we get this kind of result. Now, um, if you're not moving the, the scene at all, if you're not moving the camera, it's not going to be rendered. But of course, if we press play, it should be very, very smooth. So let's give this a look. And now our game is technically breathing. Okay, so we've played around with this a little bit. Now it's time to go and try to curve the world. So our game is being played on the z-axis. I'd like the z-axis to be curved um, over time. So here is what I'll do next. I'll take my floor. Actually, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll modify um, this. So it just sends in the normal object position as of right now. I will take my floor and duplicate it a couple of times in the z-axis because that's the one we would like to curve if you're wondering i copied using Control c Control v and then i'm moving around um, with Control toggled in so it locks into the axis and it gives me um gives me snapped values okay so we had a good idea a little bit earlier where we would take the position that it's currently in and then we would add something um, so I'll recreate the same exact small layout we've had because that's actually quite important. We are going to be um, taking just an offset in Y, uh, just like we did earlier, but we'll have to calculate it in a better way. So what's going to end up happening is we are going to calculate how far away we are from the camera. And then depending on the distance in between the camera, so this vision I have right here, and say, for example, that pixel, we will take that 
um, in, in the Z axis. And then we'll actually increment what we currently have. So this position with a certain Y value. So it goes a little bit higher, but that will all depend on the camera. So just putting my note back on this. So it's very important to remember that what we're doing here, these two nodes together are just setting you up so we can, um, we can reuse the object position. We can reuse what the values are here, because if we are to set um, straight values without going through this, then we're not adding on top of where they are in the scene. We're just setting their values uh, directly. Okay. That being said, um, we need to calculate something regarding the camera position and also the world position of the object. So we'll need two new nodes. First position, but instead of using the object space, we will be using the absolute world and we will need also the camera node. Now, camera gives you a couple of things. We are interested in the position. Now, I want you to imagine this as 3D objects in your scene because we're using the absolute world values and we're using the um, we're we're using these values so they behave just like objects in your scene. So when we say camera position three, we are looking at these number here, so the position number. And when we're saying the absolute world position of, for example, this floor, we're talking about zero, zero, 010 in this case. So let's actually take these node and subtract them. So we will go ahead and create ourselves a node called subtract. And we'll make sure we take the um, destination minus the position, which means this one minus the camera position, or I did that wrong. Yeah. And then we're going to take the camera position and remove the actual position of the vertex. So if you're getting confused, we can swap them around like so. And this will give us the distance in vector three in between the vertex. We're trying to modify this frame and also the position of the camera. But we don't actually need anything else but just the, the Z value in this case. So what we could do is put it through a split. Um, it's called split. It's basically if you were to create a new vector three and you want to split it in different ways. So we have X, Y, and Z, and we're only interested in Z. So now we have that Z value. We can put it through another, um, another node. So I'll just move this a little bit towards the left. So what we're interested in here is the difference in Z. So that's distance, um, in terms of our game, so we go we go in the Z axis, we run towards the Z axis. We'd like to know how far away um, this is from the camera. But what we're going to be modifying is not the Z. Actually, we're not going to be pushing objects further away. Um, instead, we are going to be taking the Z and we'll be modifying the Y. So that means I'm actually going to create a vector three. And I'll say, hey, your Z, put it in the Y like so. If you're getting confused here because we're having a vector four, um, you know, it's really up to you. You can have vector four here as well. It might be a little bit easier to understand. Um, so that Z goes into the Y. And then you know what? Let's just add it, see what happens. I'm going to save the asset. Oof, and we're getting we're getting kind of the behavior we'd like, but it's just um, it's very linear and it's very uh, Weird to look at. So the further we get away from the object, um, the higher they are. And that's exactly what we'd like to have as a behavior. But obviously, this is not going to cut it for our game. Um, we we don't want to have something that is super linear. So we have to go back and do some um, do some arithmetic. So the next thing I'd like to address is um, the linear. So you see how this this just goes in a linear fashion. It just goes from um, from a higher value, always in the same manner. I'd like to have a smooth curve, so having more of a, a quadratic uh, equation in there. So what we could do is we could split them apart right around here. And before I put it inside of the vector four, I'm going to go in here and do a power. So we could do a power of two. I'll drag and drop this right here. I actually don't need to have such a big preview for power, so I'll collapse it. Um, then I'll use this for the Y. Or actually, because this is going to give us a very, very big number very fast. Yep. <laughs> um, 
I'm also going to multiply it by a such such a small amount that it's not going to be that bad. So let's do multiply next. And we're going to do power goes right here. And multiply output goes in the y axis. And I'll just move this a little bit better. We never have enough space when we're doing this initially. <laughs> but now in terms of the power, uh, it'd be good to have some way to control the intensity of this. So what I'll do is I'll open up the blackboard and I'll create a new vector one called curvature. And by default, I'm going to put a very small value. So for example, double zero and then one after digit. Drag it here and here we go. Hit save. It's already getting a lot better. So if we just move away, we'll see that it, it goes up like so. But it all like it doesn't go up all at the same time, which is what bothers me right now. Um, but just, just to give it a look uh, very, very quickly, I will take, for example, um, this snow. Just up the curvature, see what kind of results we get. And we have to up it very, very slowly. But in terms of the axis, this is a this is a smoother curve, so that's quite fun. Yep, much better. And we'll have to multiply this by um, a transformation matrix that is going to flip the normals. And we can do that by going here, transformation matrix, and getting the out like so. I went ahead and I've saved it, and I'm just going to up the curve on the snow, on the snow shader, but also on the atlas shader. And we end up with something like this, which is actually what we want. <laughs> now, it might be hard to play around in the scene with this because, like, for example, this igloo is over here, but we see it at the top there. But when we go ahead and we play our game, we are going to run and it's going to look like this. Oh. I always go beneath the world, as you can see. But if I were to angle a bit better, you always stay right on top of the surface. Uh, which also lead us to see that our player is clearly not being affected by this shader. So let's select him and let's make sure he has the proper shader. And here he is. So I've just applied the Atlas texture material to the penguin and now he is right there. Uh, well, physically he's right there, but visually he's right there. <laughs> okay, so that is how we just bended the world. And um, if you are to create a bigger environment, you'll see it much clearer than, than we do right now. But as we go through this game, as we walk forward, the world just comes down and then we can do our action and everything beyond that point just goes up. And that's pretty much it. So I'll see you guys in the next one. Welcome to the third section, which is the final section before we get into coding, finally. Um, in this section, we're going to make sure we can build this game, this pretty much small scene, onto our device, and we will be using an Android device. Now, if you are using um, iOS, I do plan on making another version of this video, but it's going to be under the optional. So look for iOS build, um, how to build with iOS lesson under this very specific section, so under section number three. And now for the Android folks, we're going to be using the route in which we use the Unity built-in SDK. And also in the optional, um, there's going to be an optional regarding the, uh, the manual install of the SDK. So if you're using the Android SDK from their website and um, you want to build it using the manual approach. Uh, but Unity actually gives us, with the new installs, it gives us a really good way to just build to Android without even having to worry. So... Um, I format my computer every now and then, every maybe 10 days or so, and I don't even need to install the Android SDK anymore. I just installed Unity and I built my phone directly. So let's have a look at what it gives us. Um, for this example, I'll make sure to go and uh, install a new version of Unity. But if you follow the tutorial earlier, you should have the Android build support, which is right here. Um, and I believe we are on point two. So this is the version we're using right here. We can see add module and we can make sure that we select these two that is what we'll need for the android so in case you don't have that and you'd like to move to the lts um, you can just click here and make sure those are toggled in i also made sure to include ios support but if you are planning on building to ios uh, sorry to android only don't put it um, it's quite a big big download so i wouldn't put it in there if you wish not to build to ios 
So um, if you made sure that you have these, so the module, you can now close this off. To make sure we have these installed, you can just have a look under your version and um, look for the module, or you could also go, and I encourage you to do that, to edit um, preferences and external tool. If you scroll down at the bottom here, JDK installed with Unity, Android SDK tool installed with Unity, the NDK installed with Unity, and also Gradle. So everything here installed with Unity. If you have verified that you have all of these, then it's time to move on to the next video in which we will configure the game to actually be published to um, an iOS or Android device. Now, before you publish to mobile, you have a couple of things you have to prepare. And the first thing I'd like you to do is go under File, Build Setting, and switch over to iOS or Android. So we will click here and make sure we can switch platform. This will not show up if you didn't install the, um, the Android build support. So Make sure you have that. We have did that in the previous episode, if you don't remember how. Um, just make sure you switch. It's going to take a little bit of time. So after a little bit, the engine should have uh, re-imported everything. Um, now what I do suggest you do is, if you're going to be building to Portrait, uh, which is what we'll do, is to switch your game aspect over here. So your, um, your aspect resolution, I would switch it for something like 2560 by 14. 40, which is going to give us this ratio um, in which we can start modeling our game around. So this is going to be like a portrait mode. I'm also going to move my camera over to see the penguin since he's the only one in there that has an animation. Um, and by doing that, when I do boot this on my phone, I'll be, I'll be seeing something that moves at least. So it doesn't look like it's frozen. By the way, if you're curious what I'm doing right now, I'm holding Control, Shift, and F while having camera selected, which is going to place it at the location um, I was. So control, shift, and F to move it like so. OK. Next up, we're going to go under File, Build Settings. And then we're back on Android, but now select Player Settings on the right-hand side. And you'll see that this pops up. So this is the Project Settings window. And it's very important that we fill in as much information as we can in there. The name of the company, in this case, is going to be the Epitome Games, which is, you can put anything, really. Uh, product name is going to work for me. The product version 0.1 is good. And um, you can decide to put a icon for your game. If you're not putting anything, it's going to put in the uh, Unity default icon. Now, going down here, uh, you'll see that you have the icon setting. And these icon setting are just for overrides. So if you are to parse this in the 16 by 16, you, know, you, you can actually change that. But if, for example, you'd like to have a bigger icon when it's being displayed on, say, a iPad, and you'd like to have a different smaller icon, you can check override and actually change any of these if you wish. So maybe your uh, it's your full character here in the 1024 by 1024, but once we go to a smaller scale, maybe it's just his face or something. So keep making sure you are under um, Android and not PC or iOS in this case. Next up, we have the resolution and presentation. It's going to differ in between the different types. So that's why I, I want to make sure that we're all on Android. Um, over here, I'm going to uncheck everything but portrait. So when I play the game, it doesn't want to um, switch rotation in the middle. So if I, if I tilt my phone on one side, it doesn't actually switch. You can also set a default orientation of portrait. It's going to um, disable everything else. Um, show loading indicator, I actually don't like doing that. You can put it in there if you wish. Um, it's just a matter of, of something you see while the game is loading. But usually it's very, very fast and you barely see it. The splash image has to do with um, once you boot the game, you're going to see a Made with Unity logo, but then you can also have your own logo on top of that if you wish. Or if you played for Unity Pro, you can disable this altogether. Now, um, here is where it gets interesting. So under the other setting, we are going to change quite a couple of things in here. We're going to start with the color space. We have the linear and also gamma space. Since we're building for mobile, I do recommend we switch over to gamma, like I just did. So if you are to do that, you're going to see a, um, a little bit of time before it reimports all your texture we can work on making our game looks a little bit better, but it's something that is important to do at the beginning. 
Um, we're quite at the beginning, so, so we're not too late. So let's keep looking. Uh, Multi-threaded rendering, we would like to have that, of course. Static batching as well. Compute scanning, yes. I will be skipping over the light maps because we're not using any. And I'll also skip the frame timing stats since we're not doing any kind of um, kind of debug for the moment. So most of the time when you go through this menu, you can get nice explanation on what um, the settings are if you just mouse over. And Vulcan, we are not going to be using Vulcan. What we really want to modify is over here under the identification. So this section over here um, usually goes like this. COM, the name of your company and the name of your product. And it's actually going to be very important that you remember this because this is what um, is going to be the unique identifier for your app worldwide. So if I try to push a game with this package name under my phone, and then I go on another computer and I have the same package name for a different game, they are going to be overridden. So the first game, even though it's something else completely, if I'm using the same package name, the first one will be overridden. So it's very, very important that you have a unique product name for every time you have a new package. Um, this one will do for me. So that being said, um, I'm actually glad because before they didn't set it automatically, but it seems like now they actually do it. So this one is good. 0 0.1 is the good version, and we also have a bundle version code. Um, I want you to be aware that every time that we're going to be making updates to our game, um, once it's published on the Google Play Store, we will need to increment this every time because Google will not accept a package that has the same version or the same code version as a previous one. So if you're to make an update, you have to increment this by say, 0.1. And the code version has to increment by one as well, at the minimum. So for our case, we're not on the Google Play Store just yet, so this will do. Now for the scripting backend, I'll switch that over to L2 CPP, and that's because we will need the two architecture for Google Play. It's now a new requirement that requires you to have the 64-bit um, the as well as the 32. So I'll make sure to click on ARM64 once I have IL2 CPP um, enabled. Um, this is also very recent from Google Play, and we have to comply. And we can then move over to the publishing settings. This is something we will leave for a little bit further down the road. And the simple reason here is because we're still making the application, we're still debugging the application. We don't intend to put it on Google Play as of right now. We need to complete the whole code and we have to make sure everything looks good before we do that. But once we do, this is where we'll decide, hey, um, we're ready to put it on the Google Play Store and we need to have some sort of way to lock it, lock it to us. So using a key store, we can, um, you can see that some kind of SSH file where only us have access to key store and we have to input a password to sign our application. And once our application is signed, then Google Play will know that it is us that is making an update and we can actually update this game. So um, just a quick story. If you are to sell your application to someone in the future, you'll have to provide them, yes, with the Google Play account that hosts it, but also with the Google, um, not Google, the key store. <laughs> and also the password that goes with your product. Uh, and finally, we have the XR settings, which stands for the AR and VR. Um, no plan of doing that within this, this course, at least. So we can leave it as is. And our game is now ready to be built on phones. Hey guys, this episode, we're gonna be looking at pushing to our phone, but we have to prepare this phone before we push to it. If you just buy it off the shelf right now, you will not be able to push a Unity build um, to that phone right away. We need to do some little bit of setup first. So I have my pixel device here. You should be seeing it on the screen. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to not do that. <laughs> I'm going to pull my window here at the top until I enter my device setting. So what's going to be important for you is to enter the device setting in here for this very specific phone, it would be clicking the gear. So this could be at different places. I know that if you have a Samsung device, it's not located exactly the same place that this one is. Um, so just make sure you go ahead and you look for your settings. If you don't know, please go ahead and just Google it. What you have to do next is scroll at the very bottom all the way over to the about phone section. So this one right here, I'm going to click on it. And with that said, skip all this information and go at the very bottom once again, and you're going to tap 
double tap, triple tap, you're gonna keep on tapping this button here that says build number. Now, for me, I already have my developer mode uh, enabled, so it doesn't do anything. It just keeps telling me that I don't need to do that. I'm already a developer, so. Um, but for you, if it's the first time that you do this, you are going to unlock the developer mode for your phone. So now you can go back one step. At the very top here, I'll be looking for developer option. So there's a search bar. I'm just going to input that here. Go under developer option. And then I'm going to have to scroll down all the way until I see USB debugging. And it's going to be very important that we enable this. So that is what is going to allow us to push build to our phone. So having the USB debugging enabled. So once this is completed, all you will have to do now is hook this in your computer, the one that you're having Unity on, build, and then you'll realize that the first time you build over, it's going to ask you if you allow this very specific computer to push stuff onto your device. You're going to say yes, and then just right after that, you're going to have a build on your phone. And that's all you have to do. So I'll see you guys in the next section. Cheers. In the previous section, we managed to push this to our phone. Now it's time to actually dive into what makes the game an actual game. So we're going to be looking at making gameplay prefabs today. And those gameplay prefab will be, um, will be basically element of gameplay that will make your game either fun, hard, uh, complicated, uh, headache level, or just, just in general, not fun. <laughs> it really depends. If you're good at making those gameplay prefab, it's going to show and it's going to be, um, it's going to make your game quite more fun, uh, depending on your skill at making those. And I just realized that I've been using the wrong material for that while. Um, actually, we, there's no problem in having these two material, but um, I remember that we're using the Atlas texture one that we've created uh, instead of just the one called Atlas. And I'd like to start using this one here because it's on the top level and it's not related to the models down here. Um, so here's what I'll do. I'll just make sure I copy the curvature value in this one and I'll apply it here at the top, which means this one will now um, have the 0 0.5 curvature as well. So that being said, we have this block and what is important to do is the following. We are going to create ourselves a new folder called prefab. And I'll create another folder within that called element. So those are going to be element um, of prefab. So you could call it building blocks. Once you drag the, the block like so, so you click, hold and drag the block inside of element, make sure you save the original prefab. Now it doesn't end here. So once we have the element, the block element, the block prefab, we are going to double click inside of it and it's going to open inside of the nested prefab editor. And this is where we're actually gonna have to do a little bit of work. So depending on this object, depending on the shape of this object, we are gonna have to create a collider. So on the same objects so on the block itself, I will be creating a box collider. And I see that it actually fits the object quite well. Maybe this is a little bit too high. Um, what I can do is I can edit the collider and just bring that down just a tiny bit, like so. That's a little bit too much though. There. There we go. So it matches the collider better. We will need to have a collider on this object for the sole purpose that it needs to, um, you know, our player needs to stand on it. Um, and we can maybe squeeze it a little bit so it's really good on the sides. There we go. And we should be golden now. So saving this, I'm going to head back and we have our first gameplay prefab. So I'm going to keep going for the next one is the blocker. Um, I'll go ahead and I'll drag and drop my material on top of it. So this atlas, um, drag and drop in the element, open. And this one is a little bit more tricky. So we're going to need more than one collider most likely. So I do recommend you use a box collider still. It's the second cheapest collider, the first one being the uh, sphere collider. So if you were to use like the mesh collider on this, you're going to be computing a lot of information that you don't necessarily need. So I do suggest you use this one. And um, do remember that for this one, for this, um, this very specific object, you'll want to make it collide with these um, poles at the same time. So here's what I'll do. I have one box slider that looks good. I'll use the second one and then uh, with the second one, collapse it on this side. 
Oops, like so. And we'll go for a third box for letter actually. So here it is. It's actually more efficient to do this than um, than having a mesh collider. So having three box collider like this is less expensive than having a non-convex shape as a collider. And we are good to go. That being said, um, now once we go outside of the of the prefab itself, you're going to see that the colliders are here. Okay, amazing. Next up. Coin, diamond, fish, um, I'll skip all of them. The only three that I'll do for the rest of this uh, video is going to be the following. So the ramp ice, ramp wood, and also the rock. I'll start with the ice. I'll actually I'll apply the material to everything first. I will drag and drop all of these at the same time. Oh, I can't. So here we'll do it one by one. And we're going to head inside of them by double clicking directly inside of the project folder. I double click on ramp ice. And then from that point on, I can go at the box collider. And then you'll realize that this one um, is going to need a sort of rotation. This is not going to cut it if we just leave it that way. But at the same time, there is no way to actually rotate a collider. So um, the only option we have at this point is either have a mesh collider, which is going to create a very, very defined, um, as we've mentioned, a very, very defined object. So if we put it on the wireframe, it's hard to tell, but it's going to be a lot of polygon here that's going to be um, taken care. And it's not a convex shape as well. So it's going to be very expensive. Um, that's one option. It's not the option that I like. So the one that I would like in this case is instead of having just this ramp ice, we have this as the graphic. So this is how it looks. And beneath it, we have an empty gape object that is actually a box collider. Now that, that box collider can be rotated at, um, at your need. So here it is. I have this box collider. I can now say, move it here, for example, extend it like so. I'll make sure to get the proper size. And now I'll move its transform right where it should be. So something like that. Now, the cool thing about our game is that we don't really have to care what's beyond this point because we only go in one direction. So after this point, you know, we can have this without causing any trouble um, to our game. And just to make sure that it actually goes within the floor. I'll just extend this a little bit more. And now we happen to have a collider for this object as well. And the cool thing as well is um, if we if we feel like it's not right, the angle is, too, is um, too steep. Since it is a prefab, we'll just have to change it here and it's going to change it for the rest of our game before we go any further and, uh, and create a whole bunch of gameplay prefabs. So um, to save a little bit of time, I'll copy this object that I've created, go under ramp wood, and I'll paste it right beneath. Um, there is an offset that we have to figure out though, so I'll make sure to reset that for both of them. Now, I would like to move this object towards the left, but the gizmo goes in this direction. What I can do is I can change the, uh, the pivot point from local to global, and that lets me move it smoothly like that. Okay, let's go back to heist. I just want to make sure that I don't have this offset. And here we go. Perfect. And finally, we have the rock. Now, um, the rock is a tad too big. Like, the, the player can't jump that. That's very, very high. So I'll just scale it down to, say, 0 0.3 on all axes. And I'll put a box collider on it, which is going to cover this. And it's, you know, it's good enough might want to make it a little bit uh, smaller so it's easier for the player to jump over it like so and here we go we now have a bunch of gameplay prefabs actually sorry gameplay elements in the next one we will go ahead and create gameplay prefabs 
So previously, we created ourselves five different gameplay elements, and here they are. So that's the block, the blocker, the ramp ice, and the ramp wood, plus the rock. Now, what we'll be doing today is we are going to actually create gameplay prefab. And under the prefab folder, I'll create myself another folder called gameplay. And these are going to be chunks. Now, these chunks are uh, chunks that we'll spawn. For example, we'll spawn one right here, one right there, and there, and so on. So these will continue being spawned over time. And being good at making these is going to make a big difference on whether your game is fun or not. So let's go ahead and to get started, I will right click and create myself a new game object, empty game object, and I'll call it chunk. I'll place it at the origin of the world, and then I'll move it over to my gameplay prefab um, folder. And now we have an empty game object just uh, sitting here. And it's gonna be very important that at this point on, whenever we do changes, we are going to um, enter the nested prefab editor. So I'll go ahead and actually just move this a tiny bit towards the right. So it's at five exactly, or at the end of this road. And I'm going to enter the prefab. So either click on this arrow, open, or double click on chunk. Now, once we're in here, we can start laying down the actual prefab. And um, for the moment, since we don't have any floor, I will go ahead and I'll create myself a 3D plane. Um, it's not always going to remain that way, but for the moment, that's that will do the job. So one thing I'd like to do is before we go and we create our gameplay prefab, is just to move this over five meter in the front. So um, our prefab actually starts right here, but I want to have an offset a little bit. So I want to make sure that I don't go on this side. When we spawn this, it doesn't overlap with the previous piece. You'll see the difference if you are under pivot. So if you have the pivot option at the top left here, uh, when you select chunk, you'll see the beginning of the chunk and then you have the plane. And what I'll also do is we'll have the option to create different type of length for our plane. So you can have that uses, for example, here 20 meters. And um, to do that, I just duplicated my floor and I just kept moving forward with it. Now it's time to start laying down the gameplay element and make sure you don't do the same mistake I just did a couple of seconds ago. Um, you didn't see it, I'm going to cut it in the video, but I've started importing models from the model folder and that's not what we want. So we created ourselves um, gameplay elements and we should be using the one we have right here in this folder. So I'm gonna go ahead and just reproduce what I had a couple of seconds ago. Uh, for the moment, you might think that the curvature really doesn't help just to see where you're placing things. So you might remove it for the time being. And I am going to go ahead and just put it, say, right there. I'll create another block. Put it three meters apart um, in terms of the X axis. And that's because our lanes are every three meters. So there's going to be a lane here, there, and there as well. Um, something else we could do is say, for example, put this right at the front so we have a way to get on top of this object and maybe the player can jump here and collect um, fishes later if he, if we actually can put some on there and then let's do a blocker on the right hand side so he just he doesn't get to just walk for free in this lane he has to do at least one action okay so this could be one gameplay prefab this could be one chunk and once we have this, I suggest we go back to the scene, have a look. Okay, so it looks something like that. When our player moves forward, he is going to have to either get on top of this, uh, that, that, or that. And that right here is one chunk. And now, <laughs> if you want to have a game that looks very different and that is a little bit more fun, then you want to randomize these quite a bit. So you want to create a different version of them. And then once we spawn them, we will have a randomized version. So to keep on going, I'll go ahead and I'll create myself a chunk two, for example. We can rename this one to chunk one. And for chunk two, I'll just move it at the origin, five meters apart. And I'll actually just go here and I'll start laying down um, another chunk. So drag and drop. Let's go in here. I'll put some floor down to make sure I save a little bit of time. I can go back in my first chunk, take the two planes, which act as the floor. 
put them here. And I want you to remember that that's not always going to be the case. So we're going to have our own floor later on. But for the moment, just so we can see where we're placing our elements, then um, I'm just I'm placing this down here. That's the sole purpose. So eventually these will go. Um, and that being said, we can start laying down a couple of elements in here. So maybe a rock here and a rock there. Maybe like so. So at the end of the wooden ramp, you would still have to jump else you're going to fall on the rock. So that could be something. And I've just realized that I have something missing in here. Um, there's another element that I didn't put in the right place, but say around here, this log was a gameplay element. It was actually crafted to be very, very similar to the block. So I'm actually going to take this, the log, I'll go outside, take the log, um, make sure it has the right shader on it, and I'll save this in my gameplay elements folder, like so. We can then enter it, put it at the origin, and um, I'm actually seeing this is on the wrong side. We could flip it over if we if we want to. Like so, add a box glider to it and just resize this so it's a little bit more convenient. There we go. This will give us a little bit of a um, different look for our blocks at least, so that that's going to be good. Okay, so now we have a new block we can use. And I'm seeing here that the chunk is actually apart it's not at the right place um, you can see here that the pivot point is right here but once we go inside it has displacement of five meter exactly so let me go back inside of here and move this over five meters so our chunk starts right here and then the rest so oh, i missed it and the rest starts on top if we go back to the scene you'll see that it is now fixed all right, so I'll go back in the chunk and add a little bit of detail with, for example, the log that we integrated last time. Maybe I'll want to have it here. And another one here, which will force the player in the middle lane. So this chunk right here seems to have um, an issue with its pivot point. So as you can tell, the pivot point is right in the center, and then you have one full meter here and a little bit more, but not on the right hand side. So the collider is not really adjusted with this, and it's just overall a little bit too big. Um, so what we can do is open up that log and first mess around with the collider a bit so it's a little bit more um, sharp. It's a little bit more, it makes a little bit more sense. And just like this, we, we replace the collider. But visually, I still think this is off. So what we can do when we have assets like this we want to keep in our game um, is we can split the, the collider part and the visual part. Actually, no, sorry. We can split the visual part um, all together. So I can actually decide to, for example, grab this log, put it under the log, and now I'll try to turn this one into a empty game object. So put that at the origin of the world. That's fine. Um, I don't want to have the mesh collider. I don't want to have the mesh renderer. I don't want to have anything on there. It's just a placeholder, really. So now I can start fixing this log by just swapping it over, putting it back to where it should be, and just visually making sure that um, it makes sense, really. So roughly around here, I believe, would make a little bit more sense. And we keep all the information we had earlier. So, you know, we still have a, a material on it. We still have the mesh render. We still have the collider. But the one that drives everything is this empty game object. The one that drives its position is this empty game object. And if we are to go back in the scene, um, we can tell it's a, a tad better, but not quite yet. So we can go back, move the log inside of it roughly like that. Go back to the scene and you'll see that now I have a little bit too much on the other side. So that should do it. Yep, we now have proper spacing in between them. And that could be our second chunk already. So with that in mind, 
We are not going to stop here, but I do encourage you to make a lot of these and do, do understand as well that you can make them as long as you want. So we've made them 20 meters right now, but in the next video, we'll do a script that um, we, we will actually decide um, what is the length of our prefab on a chunk basis. So you can have one that's 30, you can have one that's 10, you can have one that's five. Like we don't actually need to, uh, you don't need to respect the 20 meter limit that we've set here. All right, with that said, in the next video, we will finally start tackling um, code. So we will create our first script in the next one. So I'll see you there. For a good amount of time, we were just placing assets around. We were just making sure we had some visual to look at. But then finally, we can start looking into writing some code. And I don't want to do a big, um, a big introduction to coding. You, if you are here, you most likely know how to do C-sharp code. But I'll go very slowly initially. Um, so we have these pieces here, these chunks, and these chunk will act as its own object, you could say. Um, we would need to store information of these chunks, such as how large are they? Um, in the end, we are going to have some kind of engine that is going to, to run over time and say, hey, uh, the player is 20 meter in front of the initial spawning position. Then we would want uh, to be spawning something that is, say, 30 meter. That's cool. OK, then the next piece is going to be at 50 meter. So these chunk, um, we're going to be putting them as object. So a chunk is going to be an object. It is going to contain, um, for example, it's going to contain a certain length. So we know, hey, this chunk is exactly 20 meter. So when our world spawner actually goes and, and spawn these objects, then um, it is going to, to know that it's 20 meter. And the next piece can be 20 meter after that and this kind of information. So without further ado, I'm actually going to create a folder called um, world generation. And I'll create a new C sharp script called chunk. Just like that, we're going to have our first script called chunk.cs. And I will double click on it to open it in Visual Studio. If you don't use Visual Studio, that's totally fine. If you use Visual Studio code, that's also cool. Um, if you would like to change with which editor pops up when you double click, you can always go under Edit External Tools, uh, sorry, Project Setting. It's not Project Setting. OK, so Edit, Preferences, External Tool, and you can change it right here. So on my computer right now, I have um, Studio 19 and Studio Code. So I actually like using uh, the Studio 19 because I'm on Windows. If you're on Mac, you can't do that. So I would recommend that you use 19. OK. So our first script is going to be quite, quite simple. I'm going to start by removing the two um, using statement at the beginning here. We're not going to be using system collection or just system itself. Everything we're going to do is quite simple. And also, you're going to see me during the whole course that I like to just delete everything in the script and just start fresh. But most of the time, I just rewrite the start and the update anyway. So um, now you're aware. One thing that we'll need to know, and I've mentioned, is we're going to need to know the length of this chunk. So we could call it chunk length. And I store it inside of a float. The first thing I'll go ahead and I'll create is a public float, which uh, is going to be the length of this prefab. We can call it chunk length, like so. Now, um, just by having this object right here, this one is public. It is going to show up in the inspector. Um, we could technically go here and do a serialized field private float. It will still show up in the inspector. You can still modify it. But in the future, I would like to be able to access this from my world editor, my world spawner, actually. And then this object is going to have two functions. One is going to be for um, showing the chunk, so initiating the chunk, just showing, okay, putting it on active. And one is going to be for hiding, because we're going to be spawning these. But then um, once we run past them, once it's like a chunk that we already cross. We are not going to delete them. In fact, we are going to just disable them and hide them for a moment until we need them again. This is a optimization technique called pooling, and we will implement that here. So to do so, we could do show chunk and another one called hide chunk. I made sure to return void right now, but um, you know what? We could actually return ourselves. We might want to use this in the other in the other script using this. So every time I will do return this. 
Okay, now for a show chunk, it's going to be fairly simple. All we want to do is take the game object of this, um, well, of, of this basically this script, and do a set active false. Now it's going to be fairly simple here. All we really have to do is take the game object and set active to true. Same thing down here, but of course, instead of setting active to true, we do false. And that's it. That's actually it. And you'll see this more and more um, with our script uh, going further. We want to keep things very, very simple. And it's a it's a way we do code here that is um, that is much appreciated from all the YouTube videos that I've made in the past. People seem to really appreciate how easy and how clean we keep them. Um, and it's, it's what we're going to be doing going forward uh, to the best of my ability, at least. So we have a simple object that has two function and a simple float. With that in mind, we can now go ahead, go on our chunk and drag and drop this component because it inherits from a uh, model behavior and just put it here. Now um, we could say 20 because that's the length of this chunk. And the other one is also 20. So what we just did right here is that we've created these two chunks and we've added the script to them and we've inputted the chunk length manually. Um, something we might want to visit in the future, and if we do, um, which we will most likely will, is to actually calculate the length of this without having to, to write it manually. So um, maybe just calculate the length, see with all the objects within this one, if they're out of boundaries, um, and then maybe floor that to the nearest five. So if we have, say, uh, an object over here, it's going to detect that it goes that far, and then the length can be put on 30 in this case. Um, we might do that, and if we are to do that, I'll put that on a optional video in here. But for the moment, this will do the job. And let's make sure we actually save these prefabs. So on these, override, make sure they are saved. And we're then ready to move on to the next phase. In this video, we are going to actually create, start creating them um, in front of the start location. So I'll be just moving these two chunks. Actually, what we could do is completely delete them because now they're going to be instantiated directly from script. And we are going to start laying down that script. I did mention that we're trying to keep everything simple, but some of the things are going to be a little bit more complicated. So this new script that I've just created, worldgeneration.cs, is going to contain a total of six functions. It's not, it's not very complicated, but still, um, it's a big step up from the previous one, which only had two. So I'm cleaning it up as I usually do. And I will lay down a private void start. I will also lay down a private void update, um, followed by a private void scan position. And I'll explain what this one does in a second. Another one called spawn new chunk. Another one called delete um, chunk or delete last chunk. And finally, a big global function is going to be public for resetting the whole thing when we die or when we want to play again. OK, so one by one with these two. These two, you probably know what they do already. So that's something you've set only once at the beginning of your game. It's a start. The update is going to be um, constantly being ran every single frame. Scan position is going to be looking for the camera position and it's going to keep asking the camera, are we far enough um, to the point where I need to spawn a new chunk? So in the update, we're always going to be calling scan position like so, unless we enter some sort of the game is paused or the game is not currently active. So this one we can already fill in and we can already wrap up the update. It's only there so we can try and scan the position. Next up, we got spawn new chunk. So if we are beyond a certain point, so if the scan position determines that we are to some extent far enough um, from the last chunk behind us and we need to spawn a new one so we don't see the empty in front of us, then we're going to spawn it. And delete will not technically delete it, but it's going to take the, the first chunk, the one we just passed, and make sure to disable it. So it's going to call its um, hide function right here. OK. Are we ready to get started? I believe we are. So going at the very top of our script, we are going to start laying down um, fields that we'll use. The first one is going to be called chunk spawn z. Now this object, this uh, not object, this float will actually contain 
where is the last spawn chunk so we can actually spawn it um spawn the next one after that so it's going to be a matter of keeping track of where we are generating stuff in the world right now knowing that we start at zero um next up we need to keep a list of all the actual active chunks um that is so the chunk we spawn and then we despawn we keep them all in the list and if we need to spawn another one of a similar chunk then we're going to go ahead and uh, pick one from the active list so those are all spawned they might be inactive during the gameplay but they are still within the list and at one point um it won't be spawning chunks anymore and we won't have any spike in the performances this next one i'll actually put it under the um the gameplay section and it's going to be a private queue of type chunk so the type we just created um in the previous video and we call it active chunks. Now this one is going to contain all the one that are currently active. So um, so it is a queue. So if we spawn index one, two, three, um, we can we can then go back at the beginning and say, hey, pop the first one, and we're gonna put something back on top. So it it's a queue. So we can take out the first one that um, got spawned when we try to despawn these. But then on top of that. We are going to keep a list of chunk again that is just the pool so the chunk pool because once we take them out um chances are we we want to keep them in memory somewhere um because we don't dispound them we don't destroy them we just set active to false so we can reuse them in the future and uh, create that pool behavior that being said we pretty much have all these fields here that we can't configure, so all the private field. And then just beneath that, I will create a section for configurable field. And now for these fields, while they will be private, I will make sure I can serialize field them at the beginning so we can modify them within the inspector. The first one being first chunk spawn position. So depending on how much uh, space you took while you were making that little scene around our player, so depending on how much space you took here, um, you can modify the first spawn uh, chunk position to just spawn a little bit further. Okay, quite simple. Next one is gonna be a private int, oh, <laughs> int chunk on screen. So how many chunk are we gonna have on the screen at the same time? Um, three is a good number if we wanna test out. Uh, at the end of the day, we might wanna have five. If you see performance issue, we can drop that down to four or three. But let's actually start with, with a big number. Um, we can modify that directly in the inspector, by the way. So that's not an issue. But the reason I want to start with a big number is so we can have a nice amount of spawn object at the beginning. We can visualize it fully, especially with the shader. So next up, we have a float for despawn distance. That will stand for how far away do we have to go after a chunk before we despawn it. So I say roughly five meter will do. Since it's a float, let's just go ahead and add the, uh, the F next to it. And finally, the last two we will be using are a little bit outside of this section here, um, but they are a list of game object for the list of prefabs, a chunk prefabs, which will contain uh, the full list of everything we can spawn. And then private transform, and that's going to be the camera transform. So these two we will set manually, and we technically wouldn't have to change them at all, uh, unless we add more chunk in the future, which we will. We only have two right now. Um, so we're going to be playing around with these five. And in fact, I bet it's time to take a small look inside of the editor, see if everything compiles right now. It seems like it does, so we don't seem to have any issues uh, compiling this. And yep, let's go back. It's good sometimes to go, just go ahead and check if um, if everything compiles, if you don't have any error, any syntax error. All right, so with all of these and without any syntax error, we're now ready to start tackling um, the body of these. And the start is going to be fairly simple. We have two things to do here, and we'll note them at the top. Check if we have an empty chunk prefab um, list. If if we do, then we can't spend anything, and that's going to be a problem. So we're just going to log an error. Um, and finally, try to assign the camera if it's not already assigned. So 
camera transform here. That's the two things we have to do. And let's actually go ahead and tackle them right now. Those are fairly simple uh, function. So chunk prefab, if the count of that is equal to zero, then we have a problem and we can just safely say that it's not going to work out. So we could throw an exception, but I'll just stick with doing a log error and say no chunk prefab found on the world generator. Please assign some chunks. And then I'll return. I don't need to go any further than that. At this point, it just means that it's, um, we call it a designer error. Next up, we're going to look on the camera. So if camera transform does not exist, so if it doesn't exist, you put the exclamation mark in front of it. So if it does not exist, if it's equal to null, because we probably didn't set it, then let's go ahead and do camera transform is not going to be equal, oops, is not going to be equal to camera.main.transform. If that works out, that's perfect. Uh, but, but let's just write it down here, not as a log error, but just as a normal log. We've assigned camera transform um, automatically to the camera.main. You might want to change this uh, if you have multiple camera. So that is what it is going to do at the beginning. Okay, the sole purpose of our start is now completed. So is the update. We have four more functions to go and they're quite big. So please tag along. We can get through this. Um, the hardest one is actually the next one. This is the one that is a little bit hard to complex because it contains a little bit of math. All right, now for the scan position, um, functionality wise, it's very simple. If our camera goes beyond a certain point, then we go ahead and we spawn a new chunk. So we do new chunk and we also delete the previous one. Um, but that's only if only we go beyond a certain point. So if we are far enough, then go ahead and um, spawn a new chunk and delete the other one. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and remove this and try to go a little bit cleaner. <laughs> there it is. So. Our condition right here is going to be all about trying to find whether or not the camera is far enough. And for this, I'll declare a small float. I'll call it camera Z. And it's going to be equal to the camera transform um, position dot Z. And you're going to realize here I just did the mistake. We can simply do this. OK, so with the camera transform Z, we are going to know we are going to need to know a little bit more information. Now we're going to need more information than just where the camera is. We're also going to need information on where is the last chunk that has been spawned and how long is it? So this is where we're going to be using um, the chunk object, the one we've created. And I'll call this last chunk active chunks dot peak. So peak basically goes at the very, um, at the very last object in the queue and Peak simply returns. So instead of doing something such as uh, it's the index active chunks dot length uh, minus one or count minus one, um, it does that through dot peak. In fact, you probably can have a description of it if we just over this. Nope. Okay. So just trust my word here. It takes the last element in the queue. With this in mind, we can now start looking into uh, making your function. So we're going to need to know, hey, are we beyond um, beyond the chunk? If we are beyond the chunk, are we beyond its length? And if so, are we beyond its disbound distance as well? So um, on the left side is going to be camera Z. If that number is bigger or equal, then last chunk dot transform dot position dot Z. So right here, we are now on top of where the chunk is going to be spawned. We don't have its distance, however, so we're going to do last chunk dot prefab length. Oh, sorry, chunk length. And then if we just leave it at this, then as soon as we leave the chunk, it's going to despawn immediately. Um, and we want to give it a small buffer because sometimes you might see it despawn if you have an object that is uh, very tall or was in front of the camera. So we can do despawn distance just like so. And that's it. So every frame, we're going to be looking at spawning a new chunk and deleting the last chunk in case we go beyond a certain point. 
All right, so we can wrap up this one and we are now at the most complicated one, the most complicated um, function for this whole script. And I'm gonna try and break it apart. We are going to first um, get a random index by looking into the, the list of prefab we have available to us. We'll get a random one from the list. So first step is gonna be get a random index for which prefab to spawn. That's the first step, followed by does it already exist within our active chunk, within our pool, not the active chunk, within our pool. Um, if it does, reuse it. And if it doesn't, then go ahead and just place the object and show it. It's pretty much as easy as that, but it's still the most complicated function we have here. So um, the first step is going to be to grab a random index. We can do int random index and do random.range, which will pull a number in between uh, a minimum and maximum. In our case, we want something in between zero and the amount of um, prefab inside of the chunk prefab. So a dot count over here. OK, we have our random index, fairly simple. So to keep things a little bit easier and a little bit more clean, um, I suggest we actually do that within a different video. So what we'll do is for the moment, I will simply declare a chunk um, that we'll call just chunk, and we'll put that to null. Um, just do note that we're going to come back to this part in the next video, just so we can look within the list, see if we have already something that exists and that is not active. But for the moment, we're just going to assume that we did not find any of that. So one additional step that I forgot to mention here is if it does not exist within our pool, if we were not able to find something that is um, that is within our pool and that is not active, then we'll need to create it. And that's what we'll be doing right here. So create a chunk if we were not able to find one to reuse. OK. That being said, we are now going to start writing this code. It's going to be fairly simple. So if we found nothing, so if chunk is equal to null, we could also say if not chunk, then we have to use the um, the game object, the mono behavior function called instantiate. So instantiate like so. Um, we'll do chunk prefab, which is our list of prefab at the index random index. And we actually want to set a parent. Now, um, the whole world should be contained within the world generation object in, in my head. I think that's the best case scenario. We don't want to leave that on the scene level because I think that's going to be very messy. So instead, I'll put it under transform. Um, do note that the second, when you send a second parameter here, it asks for a transform and they name it parent. So this is going to be put under the active objects, uh, the active object which has the world generation script on it. OK, now that we've created it, it's time to actually grab the chunk component on it. So I'll say chunk is equal to geo get component type of chunk. And now we have a reference to this, and we won't be losing it because um, it's going to be stored within the pool. So right after that, place the object and then show it. Um, we're going to do chunk. Game object transform position. Can we just do dot transform? Yeah, so position is equal to a new vector tree. Zero in X, zero in Y, but then we want to put the chunk spawn Z because we spawn it after everything else. And then at this point, we can say, hey, the chunk spawn Z, we're going to prepare you for the next object. So when the next object comes, you're going to be spawned at whatever you are now plus the length, the chunk length of this current chunk. So if we're on 10 and this chunk is 20, this is going to be set on 30. So next time we spawn something, it goes right at a good place. And also, um, let's keep let's store the value to reuse in our pool. So we do that by just saying active chunks, so the ones that are active, nq chunk. And also, finally, chunk, show chunk, which is our function, our custom function we have inside um, chunk.cs. 
So let's quickly go through it really fast because that's the most complex function for today. Um, the first thing we do is we grab a random index in between zero and how many uh, prefab we have available to us. We look if there is one available in our pool that matches our criteria. So it's a disabled object that has the same index as us. Um, if there is not, we create that chunk, we grab its chunk component, and then we place it in the world. We make sure to increment our chunk spawn Z, and then we put it inside of our queue, so the active chunk, so we know which one are active and which one are not. And finally, we call the show chunk. Um, technically, since we, we just instantiated then we don't necessarily need to do this um, because a, the default of an object that is instantiated is going to be put on, uh, you know, it's going to be in, enabled here. That's all we do. But um, in the future, once we start hiding chunks, then it's not going to be that simple. So we need to make sure that we actually call it. Okay. All right, the last two functions are quite fast to do, and I'm gonna, I know this is getting tiring because it's a very long video, but I'll do it fairly quickly. Um, I'll first grab a reference of a chunk for the active chunk.dq. Now, what this does is it takes the first one we've put, so the, the oldest chunk, and um, it removes it from the list. But at the same time as it removes it, it also gives you a reference. So you have a reference to the last one that just got removed from the list. Once we have that reference, we can call our neat function we've made called height chunk. And then we can add it to our pool. So chunk pool dot add this one. And that's all we do. So uh, make sure we remove it from the list that is active, hide it, and add it to the pool. As simple as that. So when we reset the world, we want to reset the chunk spawn Z but we also want to delete all the chunks and just reformat um, a new world after that. So to explain in blunter terms, we have to delete everything from the list, reset our chunk spawn Z, and then spawn again, maybe three to five objects, depending on how many we have under our chunk on screen object, uh, sorry, value. So it's very simple. Chunk spawn Z is gonna be equal to the first chunk spawn position. That's good. And then followed by two for loop. So I'll just have them created here for me. Um, instead of saying is equal to zero, I'll say active chunks dot count. We're going to iterate on this as long as I is not equal to zero. And we'll do I minus minus. So we're going backward. Uh, we're iterating through the amount of active chunks backward. I think a for each would have done it, but since we're disabling objects and we're removing from the queue, uh, chances are we might get a high enumerator error. So all we have to do is delete last chunk in this case. And since we only have one function in this, we don't need to put the brackets around it. That being said, once this is completed, we're going to spawn new chunks again. So again, the same thing int i is equal to zero, as long as it's smaller than the amount of chunks on screen. So if we say five, then it's going to be five. We are going to spawn new ones, so new chunks, like so. And we've done it. We've made the world generation script just like that. Um, we're going to have to come back in the future and, and tweak this a little bit more. Um, for example, down here for the pooling. And we'll have to come back to spawn additional type of chunks once we're done. So this one we're not done with completely, but we've done the biggest part and it's going to it's going to work already. So if we're going to go back, it's time now to implement this. And I believe I'll do this in the next video so we're not confused. So if you see any syntax error, if your code doesn't compile right now, I do suggest that you go ahead and um, you grab the script from the resources. But until then, I'll see you on the next video where we will actually implement this. Yes. All right, so previously, we were able to add the world generation um, script. We actually created it from scratch. Now, what we're gonna be doing today is we are going to be implementing it in the game. And if you have any issues with this script, if you had any problem, just make sure you look at the previous video resources because the script is going to be in there. You can download it and you can copy paste it um, if you wish, else this is the whole thing we did. I'm not going to go through because it was uh, it was well covered in the previous one. So it is now time to implement this object. And to do so, 
I will right click, create myself a new um, object, empty game object that I'll call world generation. And if you remember, when we were to spawn new chunks, we were actually going to do it under transform, which means whatever object that the, the script uh, was under. So as I drag and drop the world generation script on top of this, we will now know that this object in the future will contain all the chunks spawn in that direction. So positive Z. And if you remember, we had a little bit of tweaking to do. We gave ourselves a couple of things. So uh, for example, chunk on screen meant that we had to spawn five chunks. The spawn distance meant that um, we had to wait five meter before we would spawn the previous object. And the one that is very important right now is the chunk prefab. Um, we have two of those at the moment, and they are under, where are they under actually? <laughs> Artwork? No, uh, prefabs, here they are. And chunk one and chunk two. So I'll drag and drop them here. Camera transform, I'll manually put it in there. But do note that if we're not putting in there, the script would find one under camera.main. And I'm going to hit play, just see what happens. And unfortunately, it says queue is empty. So we do have some issue. So what actually happens here is the queue is empty because it's trying to do something that um, does not work right now. So knowing that there is only two entry point right now to our game, because we're not referencing this from anywhere else, we only have the start and the update. So looking at start, nothing really happens here that could be causing any problems. So most likely update, update is calling scan position, and it might be looking to uh, actually spawn a chunk right away. Now, to address this problem, I will go up here and do a private void awake. The reason this is, um, and that we didn't put it in the previous one, is because this is eventually going to be removed. I will want to be able to control my world generation script a little bit further down the line um, from another script, one that would control the whole flow of the game. But at the moment, um, there is really nothing that controls more than this. So we're starting with the world generation. We're starting with the visual. Um, and I will be putting a small note in here. And I'll call it to delete. And I like to do a double dollar sign because at the end of the project, uh, if there is thing that I forget, if there is function that I forget, I always do a find all on the double dollar sign. And I look for these. And here it is. So this region here will be deleted eventually. But do note that in a awake call, not the start, so I believe you could put it in the start. Yeah, yeah, you could technically put it in the start. But uh, just to separate them right now, I'll do a reset world. And do note that in the reset world, we actually spawn some new chunks. So we spawn whatever amount that we want to have on the screen. So we spawn them here. Technically, this is going to fail the queue and we won't run into any problem. So that being said, it is now time to press the shiny play button. And it's a mess. <laughs> it's a total mess. But as you can see, we spawned a total of five chunks. We can see them here. One, two, three, four, five. Um, they are spawned at a weird angle. Well, I don't know why I put minus 10, but it was definitely not minus 10. It was 10. And we see that there is a variation. So we have the first chunk, and then we also have the second one here as well. Now, obviously, to create, to create some more randomized effect, um, we are going to need more chunks in the future, but I believe as we work on this, this is enough. So that being said, let's go ahead and tweak this a little bit more. Um, the, first, the first spawn position for chunk should be 10 and not minus 10. I'll play this again, see what it does. Okay, actually it should be five. And there we go. So that already looks a little bit better. Now, the second thing that is a problem to us is the fact that these chunk, all, they actually use the old way of rendering. So um, they just use a normal albedo and it doesn't have any curvature. So if you guys remember, um, under the atlas here, under this material, while we were working on this, we actually set that back on zero for the sole purpose that it was really hard to work with if it had the curve, it was really hard to place. So I'm going to go ahead and put that back on what it was. So for this case, it was 0, 0, 0, actually 0 0.005. And I've put it back right here. I am actually I could be putting it on the floor as well, but we did mention that this floor is eventually going to go away. 
But for the purpose of just looking at if it works or not, I'm going to go ahead and drag the snow shader on top of these plane, like so. So that's it for chunk one. Now for chunk two, um, these ones should already be updated. So yeah, that's updated, but not the floor. So I'll drag the snow material on top of that. And we can now go back, press play. And this is what we end up with. A lot of uh, tweaking has to do with the lighting. So we have to switch the light direction. But as you see over here, the police is coming for us. No, I'm just kidding. Um, as you see over here, as we move forward, we're having this type of behavior and that is fairly cool. Now, something else that we want to test out and I'll test it out right now is I look in this direction while I'm in the play mode, control shift F while I select the camera. And now the camera is going to be right here with me. And I'm going to try and move this one um, only on the Z axis. So global Z axis. And as I move, I want to see another chunk being spawned. There we go. And it's happening. So it's a little bit hard to tell because I'm, um, I'm going in definitely in the wrong direction, not the wrong direction, but in a weird angle. Uh, let's see if we can fix that. So as I move up like so, use the glow ball instead. And yep, so you can see here on this side, on the left hand side, that as I move forward, I keep spawning different chunks. Now, the problem is right here is that we keep creating new chunks. We're not reusing the one that we had in the past. As you can see, uh, as we move forward, we are going to have a lot of those just being spawned. And, you know, the faster we go, we end up with a very, very big memory overhead. And that's not something we'd like to have. So um, obviously, we'll have to look into pulling as soon as possible because that's just too many objects, but I'm glad that the camera, even though I push it very far, does catch up and does eventually create these uh, without any issue. Um, and you're going to notice that maybe we want to look into, let's see where we are. Maybe we want to look into uh, either upping the curvature so we really don't see this at the end, or maybe incrementing the amount of, um, of chunks we have on screen. So chunk on screen could be a little bit higher here in this case. If you like to put that higher right now, feel free to do so. So I put that on seven and now it's spawning a total of seven chunks. Okay, so I'm glad this one works. In the next video, we're going to be looking into pooling these objects um, so we don't, we don't create a new one every time and it's not a big memory overhead, um, as you can see here. So I'll see you in the next one. Okay, so previously we were able to create all of these chunks uh, one by one and they kept on spawning, as you can see, and they kept on being uh, just being placed at the proper place. Now, the problem we had is that uh, we were not reusing our old chunk. For example, here, chunk one and chunk two, they are hidden, but they actually never come back. So we never turn them on again and place them a little bit further. So today we're going to be looking into optimizing this and we'll do this in a very, very simple fashion. So if you remember in our world generation script, we had to go over here in the spawn new chunk. And over here we said, we said that we'll come back here for the sole purpose that um, I wanted to make them separate so you can see how simple pooling can be. Now, um, we'll do it in a single line, but the pooling mechanic is actually includes this part where we spawn it and also this part where um, we put them inside of a queue right here. Oh, and one more uh, when we go and we delete the chunk, we add them to the pool. So our pooling mechanic is basically these lines plus this one. And now we have to be looking into our list. So we have a list on the right hand side over here. I'll press on play so we can see it. We have a list that is uh, right now empty. And as we move the camera, as soon as we delete one of these, like roughly right now, this one becomes part of the chunk pull list. And we need to know, okay, so chunk number two or chunk two is in the list right now. We need to look for it and then we need to activate it. So here is what we'll be doing. We are going to boot up our script and over here we will write chunk pool dot find. 
Now, this is part of Link you, but it's actually quite fun to use. So here's what we'll do. It's a little bit complicated. We'll call our chunk X, and then we'll do a delegate into um, our condition. So basically, if I'm to explain this very simply, um, chunk pool is a list. And when I do a find, I can then declare this as an element on, of the list. And as soon as it finds one that will match whatever condition we put on the right here, it will return this one. So X in this case is um, an element, it's a chunk. So imagine we're doing a for loop and this is the first time we do it. That's um, chunk pool at the index zero. If it doesn't match, we'll move on to chunk pool at the index one. If it doesn't match, two, three, four, and so on. So the condition is going to be the following. We're going to start by looking if the object is not active. So x.gameObject.active self. And I'll put the exclamation mark in front of it. So what this will do right here is it will grab any objects in our pool that is not active. Now, the problem with this, as I run this, you'll see first our behavior, um, we have a chunk that is disabled right now, and then we move on. As you can see, it re-enables that chunk. Then we move on again, it re-enables the other chunk. But what if um, what if we actually had the index one? It doesn't know that actually, it's just gonna go through the list one by one and just replay the same thing. Definitely not something we want. Um, so we need to add another condition to this. We can't just be happy with grabbing whatever one is not active. We actually have to know if it's um, if it's the proper index we'd like, because we use a random index over here. Um, so if we were meant to spawn the second index and we're just grabbing the first one, it doesn't really make any sense. So we'll need to add a end operator here, an additional condition. Now, um, there is multiple way we could have went and did this. We could have stored the index within the chunk.cs. This is actually what I've done prior. But I realized that we can do it in a much more efficient manner. Um, that is just to look up the name, really. So uh, we're going to have different name for every chunk. Uh, we can just do it that way. We could do it with a hash of the prefab, but that's a little bit more complex. So I don't want to get into that. Um, so here's what we'll do. X dot name is, um, should be equal to the random, actually the, the chunk prefab at the index, random index, oops, random index dot name. Um, one problem that we, we have into this is that x dot name is actually going to be chunk one, for example, and then in parentheses clone. So if you guys remember, um, when we run this, we actually have the name clone next to it, which means it, as we are to, to actually go forward with this, um, you're going to see that we keep on creating and it's not reusing anything simply because we're never getting a match because our prefab is called chunk one, but the name of this is called chunk one clone. So we can just add that on top of this here. Um, I'll just wrap this up like so. Plus. And that's something Unity do. I'm not too proud of it, but hey, clone just like so. So I'm matching with the name actually, and I found this a little bit better than just keeping the index. It's not as efficient of just keep like as just keeping the index in chunk, but it's very very light because it doesn't happen every frame. It only happens when we go beyond a certain point, and it's much easier to work with, and it keeps our chunk.cs script. Um, cleaner. So now as we go through this, do we get any, oh, it doesn't work because I didn't put the capital letter because it's a string match. It has to match exactly the same. So capital C on clone. And as I mentioned, um, a more efficient way to do this is just keeping the prefab index within chunk.cs and look for that. But it's, I find that we're going to have to modify our chunk.cs, which is very simple right now. And I would not like to do that. Um, and as you can see, we are spawning things back like so. And as we move into the future, so look at my Z index over here. As we move into this direction, we are going to keep playing with what we already have and barely 
ever have to instantiate anything else unless we get really unlucky and we get a um, couple of uh, chunk one all in a row we are going to be playing with the same and you can see here in the camera in the camera preview we keep getting prefabs we're going to be playing with the same exact prefab the whole time even if our player makes it all the way to say that far 24,000, you can see it computing right now and it's eventually going to catch up but yeah it takes a bit of time to get there i moved quite fast eventually we made it and the chunks they're all right here and that is how we do pooling so even after a long time we still have only this and we're not spawning uh, we're not spawning too many chunks and that's it guys so in the next couple of episodes we're going to go back through that flow back in the world generation.cs and it will actually spawn um, things on the sides here so it actually looks good on the side and it's a little bit more different so that being said i'll see you guys in the next one in the previous episode we looked into spawning all of these chunks in an efficient manner so reusing them from pool and today we are actually going to spawn some more chunks but um we are going to need to redo the whole process we've done, but we'll do it fairly quickly in one episode. And those chunks we will be spawning are for the left side and also the right hand side over here. They will um, they will act as collider. So we will add some collider to them on the right and left side so the player can't leave this place. And also on top of that, they will do scenery. So um, the reason I wanted to split them from the middle lane, you could say, it's just so we can have some diversity. So if you are to spawn, for example, this prefab, it's not always going to be the same scenic around it. So if there's an iceberg here, if there's a whale, um, it's not always going to be the same if this chunk spawns. So that being said, it is now time to start creating that. So I will start by just creating myself a new folder under the, uh, the prefab folder, and I will call it scenery. with a capital S. And then I'll create myself a empty game object that is gonna be reset at the origin and I'll just call it scene chunk one. Um, now with that in mind, what we'll need to do, what is very important that we do is that we create collider on the left and um, the right side. So I'll add a box collider. Let's see if we can move the center of it towards minus five in this case. Um, Yep, yeah, so minus five, let's do a bigger size in Z. So we want to have 10 in Z and also in Y as well. So I'll just put something crazy like 50. And with that, we now have our first glider. Let's um, go ahead and create another one. And I'll just copy these value, paste them here. And instead of five, I'll do, instead of minus five, I'll do five. And now at this point, our scene chunk now uh, contains these two collider okay but that's not what really um that's not what we're here for really we are here to actually place some floor and place some element of scenery and just like with the previous chunk right now we don't have the moving floor but we can still create a plane for the moment that we will use for this purpose so i'm going to create a new 3d plane move it over here at minus 10 move another one at 10 we could go ahead and add the uh, the snow material to it, like so. And also do note that when we do have our, our bigger floor, um, it's going to extend much further towards the left and towards the right. OK, so we have something that looks a little bit like this at the moment. It's one object that contains the left plane and the right plane. Now, our goal is going to be to do something very similar we've done with the gameplay but instead of using gameplay elements we will use um, scenery scenery prefabs so i'll go ahead and i'll create another folder called it um, scene element go down under model and now this time instead of taking from the gameplay folder we will take from this scene over here this uh, environment so this environment folder and now we will choose. So we have things such as a sear or glacier. We can put them like so. And I have a feeling that these, you might not want to actually put them under the scene element unless you feel like. Uh, but at the moment, it seems like they actually, yeah, they actually look good and have the right material. <laughs> so 
So from that folder, just go ahead and pick a couple of things. Um, you will need to just make this look somewhat, somewhat good. Do note that they don't affect the gameplay whatsoever. They're only here to look, uh, to look good on the side to give some different scenery in the background, like you can have snowmen and nobody's going to notice. There it is, big snowman. Um, and that would be, for example, one scene chunk. Um, and of course, you would have to decorate the other side as well, so it doesn't look weird. So we can do that. Maybe add a sign. Also, if it bothers you, you might want to remove the curvature for the moment. And it actually bothers me, so I'll go ahead and I'll do that. That's a tad better, um, at least for editing purpose. Now, I'm going quite fast, but do remember that you have to make sure that these are under the right, the right scene chunk. So, sign 2, snowman, spike 3, 3, dead. Um, they're all supposed to be under a scene chunk. It's very important that they are saved as part of the prefab. And when you move this, you move everything. Um, what else could we do? We could do a igloo there. And add a little bit of trees. Okay, so that right here could be um, one scene chunk, and I'll just make sure to place it at, for example, zero. And it does, oh, wait, I forgot igloos and the trees. Let's put them right here. And let's put that back on zero. See what happens. So it does look like it matches just fine. Uh, I don't think we're going to be spawning any, anything right here on this side. This is going to be reserved for the initial location. But um, we have the scene chunk number one. I would like you to go ahead and save it. So I grab this, save under uh, scenery. And I might as well just remove the scene element. Um, I forgot. And I just went in and I removed the uh, the scene element folder. Um, turns out we're just going to be dragging them from environment because we do have the right material in there. And it's just, uh, just going to be a little bit easy. By the end of the tutorial, though, we might want to go and override everything. So we only use one single material like this one. But at the moment, I believe as we're working on this and as we're creating the scene chunks, it's going to save us a little bit of time. So I'm going to put that back on the proper curvature. I'll hit save. Make sure this one is saved as well. Yep. And from that point on, I can delete. Now it is time to go in our code and actually make sure we spawn another set of chunks. Now, what we could do, and what I've actually done um, prior to recording this, is I just had a uh, duplicated code, which I believe is not the best way to go around and do things. Um, so here, for example, I had the active chunks for the scene, and I was just duplicating that over. I had three pieces. That's why I have a section called gameplay, because another section was called scene. But I figured out that maybe we don't want to do that. Maybe we want to keep our code um, cleaner instead. So here's something that I recommend you do instead. Um, we are, instead of creating um, duplicated code instead of world generation, we'll keep them clean the way it is right now. And instead, I am going to right click, create a new C sharp script, call it scene chunk generation, open it in Visual Studio. And instead of doing all of that, Look at this. We are simply going to remove everything. In fact, we can put that on the same line if you wish. And we are going to inherit from world generation. Like so. That's all we need to do. One line. And uh, with that in mind, because our script works very well with, with chunks and um, the same system is being applied, uh, we can drag and drop the scene chunk generation right here. And because we inherit, we're going to inherit from uh, the, the same function. We can say, okay, this one spawns on five. We have a chunk prefab size of one, and this is our main camera transform. And it's going to be very important here that we drag and drop our scene chunk. But on top of that, we also need to add, and this is something I did offline. So uh, make sure you go here on the scene chunk and you add the chunk script to it. And this one is 10 meter, uh, if you remember. Yeah, so it's 10 meter. It's not it's not spanning over 20 meter. It's only 10 in this case. And with that in mind, let's just go ahead and press play, see what happens. We have generated this much. 
and oh, the floor doesn't follow, so that is on us to go fix. Um, the floor material right here should have a curvature of 0, 0, 005. There we go. Just put it anywhere. Um, to be honest, it doesn't matter which place you change it. And then let's hit play again. And voila, we have done it. We now have things spawning on the left hand side and on the right hand side. Now, obviously, the lighting isn't too good and it's always the same scene chunk. So maybe you want to go ahead and create another one. I'll do that myself. So I'll quickly create another one. So it doesn't always look like the same thing, um, quite important. But that's actually where the lesson will end. Unless you want to stick around and look at me create, <laughs> create something fairly quickly. Um, this is the whole content for this lesson. So if you wish, make sure you go ahead and skip to the next one. OK, and for those who don't want to skip, I'm going to quickly go ahead and create a scene chunk number two. And do note that the more chunk you create, the better your game is going to look, the more random it's going to seem. And uh, that's just a big plus overall. So what did we do exactly? We had left plane, right plane. We also had two colliders. So I'll copy that over. I'll also make sure to copy the box collider component. Go back here, paste it. Um, we'll add a second one, paste the value as well, but switch this value over. Right, so we have these two. We could spawn a cabin, smaller one, of course, with firewood in front and a friend seal. What up? Just chilling around it, um, followed by maybe a log, smaller log. This is the one we use for gameplay, so. It gotta be it gotta be looking different. So maybe from this angle, player won't notice. Oh, <laughs> there, that's better. I'm just going ahead and I'm putting a little bit of uh, anything to be honest at this point. If you're wondering what I'm doing here is um, I'm actually holding the V key. So by holding V, it snaps to pixels. So I can just drag this, hold V, and it, you see it's going to snap on every single vertices. Um, you won't see it visually, but you'll see it on the collider. And then I can just move it using that. And it's going to snap on the other pixels on the floor. So this will work. Add a little bit more trees. They don't have to be the same size. And here we go, it's quite random. It doesn't look the best. I could be spending more time, but I just really want to see a difference in between the two chunk at the moment. So I'm going to go ahead and make sure this one has the chunk as well. So 10, 10 in length. Um, we can save this, I can now delete it. Go under my chunk generation. Say so I have a list of two. Drag and drop this in here. Press play and we should be able to see two different type of chunks. And do we actually see it? Yeah, so the first one is the cabin, as you can tell. And then we're followed by, um, hmm, by problems, actually. <laughs> it seems like it doesn't have the right distance in between them. It seems like it didn't save the fact that I've put a, um, a junk component on it. So it, when it spawned, it assumed that it was zero. So that's not, not fairly cool. Um, if I press play again, you can now see that it's much different. So I have proper spacing in between them. And we have two different types. As we move forward, we should have them spawning in different fashion and, of course, uh, pooling if needed. Yep, so that is it. And um, we are pretty much done with the world generation. Now, the next thing we'll have to do regarding the world generation is just create more entertaining um, gameplay prefab and also more better looking uh, scene chunks. But that's pretty much it. So I'll see you guys in the next section. 
In the previous section, we made sure to instantiate the world as the camera moved. So if I was to press on play and then take my camera and move it around, we would have the scene generate itself over time. So like this. And that was fun and all, but now it is now time to have our player start running through this. However, there is one more prerequisite before we get to that point, and it's going to be the inputs. So this chapter or this section is all about inputs management with the new system, a new system that is brand new from 2020. Actually, it was there a little bit previously, uh, but um, it now got officially released on 2020. So that is what we'll have a look at right now. Another reason I like this system so much more than the previous one is that it's much more optimal because it is event-based. So um, we look for event within devices. These events um, are, for example, mouse movement. But when I'm not moving my mouse, it's not querying anything. It's not running any code. Only when I move my mouse will I get the mouse position. And um, it's all small tweaks like that that make it much more, more efficient to use. So let's go ahead and enable this input system. And to do so, we have to go get it as a package because Unity now works with small modules. Um, if you like to have something, most of the time you have to install it like a big feature. You have to install it through the package, which is great because you don't have a lot of overhead if you're not using any. So let's go under Window, Package Manager, and we're going to be looking for the input system. Now I've already included mine, so I'll just remove and show you exactly how it's done. Um, basically, you have the package manager. Go ahead. Wait until all the packages are loaded. You have to be connected to the internet and then input system in the input field. So let's do it again together. Input here, make sure you are on all package. You find input system and as you can see, it's version 1.0.0 release on April 29th of 2020. So you click install at the bottom right. This will take some time and not only that, but at the end, it will ask you to restart Unity and it's very, very important that you do so. So you will have to restart Unity once you're done. Um, for me, it didn't ask because I, were, I was already put on the, um, the new input system because I previously had the, the package installed. So make sure you click it off and then reboot your project in Unity. Um, you will be asked to enable the new input system. Again, it's very important you do so. By enabling the new input system, you're going to disable the old one. So we remove that overhead completely and we're going to enable the new one. So the, it's going to be possible for us to use the new one. Um, that's all we actually have to do within this one. Once the package is installed, I do suggest you create a new folder on their script, call it inputs. And we're going to go ahead under the edit menu, project settings. You will find the input system package now here and also the input manager. The input manager should have this error sign on it because this is disabled and we're no longer using the old inputs. Instead, you'll want to go under the input system package and let's create a setting asset. Um, it has created a input system dot input ses uh, settings inside of my project folder. I'll go ahead and I'll drag and drop that in the new folder I just made. And these are basically configuration you can have. So this new input system, when is it going to update? In dynamic update, fixed update, or manually. Manually would mean that you have to call it through code in either a dynamic update or a fixed update. So um, I, I go for dynamic update, the regular one. I actually, all these settings right here, I leave them on default. Those are things such as DAP radius, which means how many pixels in between um, two touch before they are considered just one. If you have a weird two ended finger, that might be a. <laughs> Might be something you want to play around with. Um, double tap time, uh, default tap time. All these things, I encourage you to just mouse over if you plan on using them. Dead zone is the most useful for me when I make joystick games. So when I make games with gamepad, um, other than that, the rest are really just other settings that you can have a look at. Um, and the one important part down here is the supported devices. So which devices do you support? There is such things such as the mouse, the keyboard, the touch screen, that's all things we will be using. Um, so if you don't put anything in there, it's actually going to assume that every input received are supported. And I do encourage you to leave it empty at the moment until we're, at, we're done with the actual game. 
So once we're done testing with everything, once we're done testing with Unity and with the browser and we're publishing our game, then maybe we can come here and say, hey, the only, the only device we actually support is touchscreen and nothing else. But until then, since we need to test within the engine and also within the PC and maybe using a remote as well, then let's leave that open. And hit save, close this off, and I will see you guys in the next one where we are going to start tackling a input action. This next part is about creating an input action. It will be an asset that helps you generate some code that will then uh, decide which input are being looked for. To get started, we have to right click on our folder, create, and at the bottom of the menu, you'll find input action is now available. I'll call this one um, runner input action. And we're going to open it by a double click. This window will now pop up and this will be our friend for the rest of this video. I'll try to quickly go over it, but um, if we have a brief look at how the window is set up, you'll find here on the left hand side action maps. These action map will contain actions and these actions will have properties. So they, it goes from left to right. So um, before I get into action map, however, let's have a look at the control scheme. At the top left over here, you will find control scheme. I do suggest you add one of them and you can call it, for example, this one will be my computer control. So when I'm on my computer, I have access to these two devices, the keyboard and the mouse, not the virtual mouse, a real mouse. And I won't put that on uh, required, however. So that would be the computer scheme. I will add another one for mobile. This one will only have touch screen because that's all we have on mobile. Um, I'm curious though if there's a gyroscope. Yeah, there's a gyroscope as well, but we won't be using it. I was just wondering if um, if we had these. Okay, cool. So mobile will not be required either. Save. And now we have two scheme. So um, this scheme basically means, hey, you will have access to certain devices. And you can look at the, uh, the list of devices. You had it pretty much over here. These are all the devices you can have and that, that are being supported right now. Um, if you'd like, uh, this, this input system is actually open source on GitHub and you could add your own devices if you had your own type of, for example, I don't think HoloLens is being, no, oh, never mind. It is being supported. Okay. <laughs> never mind. Uh, but you could go ahead and code your own chip in there. So that being said, once we have these schemes, I will now suggest you go back on setting this on all control schemes because this act as a filter, we will now begin to create our action map. I would like you to see the action map as um, a set of inputs that you use within a certain context. For example, I could have a game that has an intro screen, and in, in the intro screen, you could like move stuff around in a certain way. You could move your mouse, it moves the background too. And then in the second screen, the gameplay, it's a completely new thing, and I can disregard everything um, input wise, I can disregard everything related to the intro screen. Those are different action maps being used at different times. Um, I could even think that um, you, you could have a different action map for every single type of movement your player can have. Um, not that I recommend that, but for example, you could have a player that shape shift into a bird and it's a whole different action set in there. Um, that being said, we only have one in our case. We only have the gameplay. And in fact, the intro screen is part of the gameplay as well. So we are going to create one action map called gameplay. And now you see, as soon as we created that, we now have access to a bunch of things on the right hand side. And these are the actions. Now, these actions are not button themselves. So if I'm looking to track, for example, we'll do a couple of examples in here. If I'm looking to track a, um, a mouse click, I'm not going to write left button in here. I'm actually going to say, hey, that's, that's a tap or that's a click. Tap, click. Um, that will be the action. And then how can I produce a tap? I can produce it by clicking on my touch screen, but I can also produce it by clicking on my left mouse button. So this is where the binding comes from down here. And in my binding, I can now choose my binding and find, hey, that's a left button. So left button for mouse, that's good. I'll add a new one, so add binding. And this is a touch screen 
this is a press actually this is a tap it's hard to find um so touch number zero slash tap okay so one action called tap can be executed in two different ways so either through a left button with the mouse or a touch zero tap okay cool now this action will return a certain type of thing so it will return a certain type of value in this case it is considered as a type of button which means every time i press on the button or i click on my left mouse in this case it is going to send the value over to whoever is ready to receive it um there's three different type of action you can have either button which we just explained so value is a little bit harder to explain it actually looks for the previous value and if it didn't change then it's not going to send it over so it's only looking for changes and finally pass through is as soon as the event is called the value is just passed through and we don't even look if there was any changes we don't do any of that so um, that's that's really useful for things such as the mouse mouse position um, value is really useful for things such as holding WASD on the keyboard for moving around and button when the action is actually just a tap or click. Next up, we have the interaction. So the interaction is actually going to modify your input in such ways that it's only going to be, uh, it's only going to be called on one of these five, um, you could say condition. So we can do press and here you'll find it's only a press or it's a release only so or press and release so both can be true here if we're doing a tap we can tap wait release and it could be considered as two buttons so you know what let's add an interaction that does press only over here and finally the processor is actually the value you're sending over do you want to clamp it normalize invert or put a dead zone on it so it's like after the all action is done you're trying to retrieve a value over here it's true or false because we're a type of button um we can't really clamp a true or false we can't really normalize we can invert it however uh, but that's pretty much it okay so that's a tap a tap if, is fairly simple because it's a type of button and you know it's a true or false not too bad well, let's go into something a little bit more complex so we're going to create a new action and that action is actually going to be the cursor position. So um, let's do touch position. Since we're building something for mobile, I know we're integrating the um, the computer control as well, but we'll just call it the names they need to be for mobile. This action will have a different type because here we're not trying to send a true or false. We're actually trying to send a vector too. So we'll go over here. We'll change our value to our type, sorry, to pass through. And the control type, that's sort of the um, the return value, will now be under vector two. And with that in mind, we can add. Actually, we don't need to add an interaction here, so I'm going to remove it. And this means that since we have a pass through value, as soon as the binding changes, um, or or is actually being called by, for example, moving the mouse, then we will receive that value. These binding are quite simple. Here they are. They are called position, both for the touch screen and also the mouse. So I'll add this one here. I'll add a new binding again. This is position for the touch screen. Okay. So um, one thing I didn't mention for the tap is over here, the control scheme. I forgot to actually check this. Um, for the left mouse button, we can only use it when we are on the computer scheme and for the touch zero tap that's only on mobile same thing for down here so position mouse is only on computer and position touch screen is only on mobile so what this is going to do is if you're booting the, the game on your mobile it will not detect any mouse it will not detect any of these uh, required computer devices and it will just not look for these so it's a nice way to optimize a little bit more even um, you can now find that uh, you can modify controls. Sorry, you can filter this list based on your scheme, like so. And if you don't input anything, you'll see that they are being considered as global. So make sure you click on the proper one so they're not global. Unless you want it, of course. Um, one more thing that I, I want to do before we move on is I want to show you that all of these are actually blittable types. So all of these, if you click on the small two here, you'll see that they all have a string 
definition. So touchscreen is the device because it's in between these brackets. And then position would be the name of the control. Mouse position. Touchscreen, touch zero, then dash tap. Because the touchscreen can have multiple um, touches on it, and then they can all have their multiple tap. So here we're really looking for touch zero, and that might cause us a problem. For some reason, uh, maybe you have one finger that legs on the screen and you still want to register a tap with the second one. What you can do, and I do recommend that you do, is go over here, remove the zero, and press the start button instead. That's the wild start to say any touch will do in, his, in this case. Then make sure to hit enter, and you'll find that it has saved with the wild star. If, by the way, if you don't have anything that um, that registers, for example, touch one, two, three, four, whatever, enter, um, it still looks good. So you gotta be really careful. But this one is from the documentation, so make sure you write it exactly like this: touch star tap. All right, so that's enough tests. Now let's go ahead and create the inputs we will need for pretty much the rest of our game. And those are the end drag and also the start drag. So I've created two, two of these, two new input scheme. And the action type will actually be, I believe those one are pass through buttons. So both of them pass through buttons and the interaction within it is very important. That's what it's going to change. So for the start drag, I am looking to press only and on the end drag, it's gonna be the release only. The inputs I'll be looking at, so the actual inputs are both the left button on the mouse, which is a computer only scheme, and the touch screen press. So I'll add another binding, go over here, touch screen, touch star, and then press, which is a binding only for mobile. Um, this one will not require any type of interaction. Down here, left button, so left button again. It's going to be the same thing, basically. So left button, computer only. Add one more binding. This is touch press for mobile only. And just like so, we have created all the inputs we need for our game. Very, very small, but it's actually going to be very efficient. So let's go ahead and click Save Asset. You also had the option to auto save every time you had uh, a modification, but I don't recommend you do that because it's quite laggy when you work with the inputs. So just make sure you save at the end. Final thing we'll need to do for this one is click on the runner input action. Make sure we generate a C-sharp class. Um, the default setting is actually the folder I'm in. So I'm going to hit apply. And it now has created what we'll need to use for our script. So it created a C-sharp script that is quite long. It has been uh, generated. And it's a big JSON file that, as you can see, has all the control we actually put in there. So my left mouse button is here. And uh, you could go ahead and read that. Quite a lot of code, but everything is there. And that's what we need to do today. And I'm quite happy we didn't have to write all of this. Instead, we had something that helped us create it, the input action. So that being said, in the next one, we will start looking at importing them within our own script and then using those globally within the application. We are now going to create our own version of the input manager. This will sit in the middle of all the calls we do to input and the runner input action we've created in the previous video. So I'm going to start right away by creating a new C -sharp script called the input manager. And I'll open it as we usually do. Um, I'm going to clean up everything at the top here. This is going to inherit from model behavior. Yep, so I'll put back in the engine. I'll clean up everything else and let's get started. So um, we are going to create something um, that is a static instance. Now, we don't do that quite often. And when we do, we, we got to make sure that it's an object that will only be um, at a single place in, in the game. So it's not going to be a script that is spawn twice you could say so this input manager will be on an object and that object will persist throughout the whole game it's going to be a static instance um, you could see it as some sort of singleton but it's not going to be a full-fledged singleton in this case so to make sure that there is only one 
of these in the scene. I'll start with a private static input manager instance, like so. And then we'll create the public instance over here. So public static input manager instance. And we'll only do a get here. It's very important that we only do a get, else uh, we might have other script that will overwrite this by accident. And that's not what we want. So the only person right now who can set instance would be our self, um, our private self. So anything that happens within this script. And in fact, let's go ahead and do that right now. We'll do it in a private void awake. We'll say instance is equal to this, and we'll say don't destroy on load. By doing this, oh, actually, let's specify what we don't destroy, this whole game object. Um, by doing this, whenever this object will be spawned anywhere in the map, it is going to set itself as the static instance. And, um, and then after that, uh, from other script, we can call instance with a capital, but we can't say that instance with a capital is equal to something else. So we won't be overriding it. Um, there is other implementation that are much better of the singleton, but I don't like showing them here uh, because it might confuse people a little bit. And that is how we're going to get our static instance. Now do know there is much cleaner way of doing this, you could say. Uh, for example, when I'm on my own, I usually use the mono singleton. Uh, it's, it's a script that is wide known. Um, and you just have that in your project somewhere, and then you can call mono singleton here and do input manager. Uh, and just like that, you'll have an instance that is inherited from here. But I am not going to do this in a course for the sole purpose that um, I want you to be to be exposed to this. I don't want to add a layer of complexity hidden behind a templatable uh, class that you inherit. So instead, let's keep it this way. It's a little bit less clean. And if you're interested, I do encourage that you just grab the script, put it somewhere in your in your um, in your project, and do as I just showed you. Only if you're interested in having this be a little bit more complex, <laughs> but uh, having that complexity makes it so you lose these three lines here and even this one. Okay, end of talk. The next thing we'll need is the action scheme. So the action schemes. I'll put an S, but I'm not going to have more than one. <laughs> actually, we only have the runner input action. This is actually created from um, oh, action scheme. This is created from the script we've generated in the previous episode. So this class is generated, as you can see, if I press F12, generated automatically from this asset. All right, so here we don't actually need to assign it to anything. So I'm not going to really like make that public or make that serializable and drag and drop the thing. Instead, what will happen is um, we are going to create one with the new call. So we're going to construct one. The way we'll do it, and I want to do it in a separate function, called setup controls. And we'll call that from the awake. So basically, this is a extension of the awake, but I'm just splitting them apart because this one is, is only related to the control. I'll do action, action scheme is going to be equal to a new runner input action. And this will create our object over here. Now the constructor is over here um, in the generated. So what happened when we create a new runner input action? It basically creates this asset from the JSON file. So it's like, it seems to be hard coded. You also get all of these, um, but that is how the system work. So it sets the JSON file based on what we've edited in the previous video. Okay. Now on top of that, um, what, what actually happens now that we have the action scheme is that there is um, different action events being, uh, being out there, part of this object now and we are going to bind ourselves to them. So we're going to register different actions to whatever function we have. Let's have a look. So action scheme dot, and then you'll find dot gameplay. So this is the action scheme. And then within that, we'll find all the action we define, such as tap, uh, I believe was position, touch position, and uh, drag. So start and end drag. So I'm going to go ahead and actually register all of them, even though we're not going to be using tap, I'll register it like this. So when tap is, now you'll see there's one here called canceled. We're looking for events, by the way. So you can, you can just click here and it's going to sort them. There's only three different event, started, perform, or cancel. So in our case, when start is perform, we can then add a context 
on tap is going to be the name of my function, like so. Now, this looks a little bit odd, but bear with me and double click on on tap. Control dot will help you generate a method. So private void on tap, like so. Oh, and we should actually keep our context. So let's actually remove that. Let me input context here, then generate my function. Yep, now we get the input action called back context. Context. I believe we can remove this, maybe. No, we can't. Okay, let's keep it. All right, so this is for the tap action. Next up, we're going to use another one. So action scheme, gameplay again. Uh, we'll do touch position when this one is performed. We're going to add the following function to it. On um, position. Then we'll send the context. In this case, context will be useful. Create a new function. Yep, we've got this one. Next up, we've got the drags. So start drag over here. Dot perform plus equal context. On start drag. Send in the context once more. I'll copy that and I'll do end drag here. Make sure I generate both of these functions. And there we go. So we just created the four recipient of um, these events. So when these events are being called, then these function will be triggered. All right, awesome. So we've got all of these now. Um, it's actually going to be time for us to define the field we'll be pulling from other script. So I'll just collapse these together. And at the very top here, I'll create myself a new region. And that's going to be for public properties. These are properties that will be um, get only, so we won't be able to set them. And they will actually point toward um, during this frame. Are we tapping? Are we swiping left, right, down, up? And where is our mouse position? So for example, I'll do a public vector to, um, let's call it touch position. And here we'll do get and we'll return a, um, a private value. So here that will be touch position, not in capitals. And actually, that makes me think that we'll also need the privates. So I'll copy that over. The private value will be right here. So these will be private. Vector 2 will be touch position like so. And we don't need the rest. Now, the way this is set up, if we need to get the touch position from anywhere in our code, we can go like this. We can say input manager dot instance touch position, and we'll have it right here. That's going to be the vector too. Now, of course, we don't need to do that here because we're already in instance. Like we, we already have all of that, and we actually can call the private value if we wish. Um, so we don't need to do that here. But in the future, from other script, we'll need to go through this very specific getter. Which is good now because you get to have an abstract layer in case um, in case you want to add something on top of that. My, I mean, I, I'm not thinking of anything right now. But um, for example, let me do let me do something else that might be a little bit more evident to you. So we could do, and I invite you to do the same because that's going to be useful. Private boolean tap to know whether or not um, we're tapping during this frame. So public boolean tap. Get return the private value we just created. So by doing this here, yep, we have the, the private boolean tap, which will contain the, the right value. And we have this one, which returns the private value. OK, that's totally fine. But um, when we call it from outside, so when we call it from another script, for example, from junk.cs, and we want to do something like instance, I'm oh, sorry, input manager, instance tap, like so, we don't have access to tap with a small capital, well, without a capital, but we have access to the property. And what this gives us is the opportunity for, at one point, if you wish so, you can actually count the amount of tap there is. So you could go here and say, hey, private in tap count, it's going to be equal to zero at first. And then once, every time that somebody calls tap, you could go ahead and say, well, before you return tap, let me just, uh, let me just make sure that I do tap count plus plus first. I just sneak that line of code in there in my getter. Not that I will be using the tap count, but you get the point.
Plus, it's also a good practice because we are now hiding the one that contains the real value. And when we're exposing this, we're only exposing the get part. So somebody else, uh, so another script, for example, will be looking for tap. He won't be able to say tap is equal to something. The only person who can say tap is equal to something is actually no one. Nobody can actually set this value. We only return the private value. And the private value, the only person who can set it, is going to be us. So this script, this private script here. So this is the idea behind um, making these get only and also having the privates. It's just good practice. And it also shields you from other people um, overwriting your code. Next up, I'll be creating a new vector too called start drag. Um, but I don't believe I'll be using this outside of this script, so I won't be exposing it, which means I won't be creating a public property for this one. And finally, there is four different values that I'll be using. Swipe left, private pool, swipe right, private pool, swipe up, and of course, you got it, swipe down. These will all be private, but I'll also be exposing them at the top here. So all of these can now become public. If you're curious, um, holding Alt on my keyboard makes me multi-select in Visual Studio, so that's always fun. And then I'll change these for capital S, and of course, start writing the return value, which is going to be the same thing, but of course, with the smaller letter. Here's a small typo. There we go. One last thing we have to do regarding this specific input system is to enable the action set. So over here, you'll see when we do a setup control, um, we have the action scheme and all of that. But we need to do something else in between that. We need to activate looking for these input. And also, if we decide at one point to disable the input manager, we also need to disable looking for these input um, just so we can save a little bit of bandwidth. So at the very bottom here, I'll create a public void on enable and also public void on disable. These are callback from Unity since we're in model behavior and will be called automatically if we enable the object. So um, if the object, the game object is not active and we turn it on, then it's going to call on enable. And if we turn it off, of course, it will call on disable. Now my action scheme can be enabled as well like so, and it can be disabled. I invite you to do so, so you can save a little bit of bandwidth um, when we do turn them on or off. OK, and just like this, we will wrap up this episode. In the next one, we will be looking at these four functions here. We'll be looking at implementing these four, and then um, maybe testing or maybe testing in a future video. So we'll see then. Cheers. In the previous video, we started implementing the input manager. In this one, we will implement these four functions right here. We'll go from the easiest one to the hardest. Um, they're pretty much all easy, but I'd like to isolate this video just so we have the swipe logic being contained in there in this single video. So let's go ahead and start looking at how we're going to parse all of this logic. Now, what we'll be setting is actually these private values. If you guys remember, we've created all of these private values so our public property could contain them and other script could call them. So what is important for us to set are all of these. So we're going to find a way to set all of these um, in these four functions here. But we are missing one single function. And that single function is called the reset. <laughs> so under the awake, I'll do something else. I'll first create a private void late update. And then I'll create a private void reset inputs. I like to wrap functions in other functions like so. In my late update, I will be calling reset inputs. Technically, um, that's the only thing that will go within the late update as of right now. But if you wish, you could put something else in there. I just like to isolate uh, logic so we understand what this function does properly. Um, and in, in this reset input, here is what is going to happen. First up, tap is going to be equal to false. Also. Swipe left is going to be equal to false and swipe right and swipe up, swipe down and so on. So you get the point. We're just going to reset all the input to be put on false. 
If you want to be a little bit fancy, you can go ahead and do something like so. Oh, swipe right, which swipe right is going to be equal to swipe up, and then swipe up is going to be equal to swipe down, and swipe down will be equal to false. So in a one-liner, one weird, ugly one-liner, we are able to reset all the Boolean values. The only thing we did not reset in here is the touch position and also the start drag, which um, we will do within these four. Now, just to make sure that you're on track with what we're currently doing here, um, every single frame, we are going to be looking for events. These events will be parsed in a dynamic update, as um, as we know, because that has been set within the uh, the input settings. In a dynamic update, not a late update, dynamic update, we will be setting these. So uh, if we're tapping, tap is going to be equal to true. And then at the end, not really the end, but like at the later time during the frame, we're going to be putting it back to false. So timing wise, we will have a small problem in which we'll address um, very quickly after this. So let's go ahead now that we have our recent input. Let's go ahead and start coding these. We'll go from the, the easiest one to the hardest. First up, um, on tap. We actually don't need the context in this one. We can just say tap is equal to true. And that is it. We actually don't need to do anything else. The second easiest one is on position. We have to get the value from context and put it under position. So touch position is going to be equal to the context and here we will be reading the value type of vector two. And like so, we will be getting the position of our cursor, of our mouse, of our touch screen, uh, where our finger is basically. Okay, next up is um, the star drag. So for star drag, star drag is gonna be equal to mouse position. Oh, not, not, not mouse position, debug, sorry. Touch position, here we go. And make sure you put the one that doesn't have a capital. It it doesn't matter if you do, but um, you are saving one one cycle, one CPU cycle, because you're not calling it from here. Then here goes into. Oh, I just did a huge mistake. Okay, there we go. Touch position with a small t. That could have created an infinite loop. So I'm glad I found it here before I press and play. But um, yeah, <laughs> if you actually call this with the capital T. It goes inside of here, then inside of there. We don't need to do that because we are in the private script. We are in the private parts of uh, the script, you could say. OK, um, next up, we have on and drag. And this is actually where all the logic really happens. This is where we do our swipe logic. Uh, and this one will be complicated. We will start by getting a delta position on where our cursor is based on where we started our drag. So we'll do a vector two. Delta, and we'll do touch position minus the start drag. That will give us where our cursor has traveled ever since we pressed for the first time. Uh, well, not the first time, but last time we pressed. <laughs> then what we'll do is we'll get the square distance of that uh, delta, so squared magnitude. I'm doing square because I don't want to do magnitude. I don't want to have to do the square root because it's an expensive operation. So instead, we'll just do, um, we will use a square distance instead. Now, let's go ahead and do if the square distance is bigger than a certain amount. So that's going to be how far do you have to swipe before it is actually being considered a swipe. Um, this one we have not, we don't have it anywhere, I believe. Um, I do have in my notes here that I've been using a hard value of 50, so 50. That's not 50 pixels. That's actually um, you have to do the square root of that to find how how real how many real pixel this is. But you know what? Let's scroll up at the top here, and and create a serializable field here. So configuration serialize field private float square swipe dead zone, and I'll put that on 50 here. We can now replace this value with the following and keep on coding. So this if right here gives us two different routes. Either this is a confirmed swipe because we, we've been, um, we went far enough with our finger that we are now confirmed as a swipe or we've just released before we had the time to do a swipe. And if that's the case, then I'd like to do the following. I'd like to say start drag 
is going to be equal back to zero. So we reset this if um, if we're done. So even if we have a swipe, when, once we're done, we reset that back to zero. Okay. Now, assuming we have a swipe, we have to know in which direction the swipe is. So let's go ahead and do a little bit of maths. We'll start with x, matf.absolute, delta dot x, and we'll do the same thing for y. This will give us the absolute value. So if it was minus 5, it's now 5. If it was minus 3.25, then it's now 3.25. Uh, this just removes all the negative value and turn them into positive. Knowing that, we can now check if x was bigger than y. It means we're either going left or right. Now, if that's not the case, it would mean that we have to go either up or down. So this is left or right. And here, this is up or down. And I keep making typos. OK. If we know that our swipe distance in x is bigger than y, it means we're going left or right. At this point, the only thing that will tell us if it was left or right will be our value but without the absolute on it. So we got to make sure we are not doing an absolute on this call. So if this delta dot x is positive, it will mean that we're going right. And if it's not, it means we're going left. So if delta dot x is bigger than zero, then swipe right will be equal to true, else swipe left is going to be equal to true. We'll do the same logic down here, but with delta y, of course. If delta y is positive, swipe up, else swipe down. And do remember, we don't need to set them on false because the reset input on every single late update will do it for us. And that is it, actually. We don't need to do anything else for the drag logic. What we will be doing next is um, we're going to address something that might not be a problem, but might also be a problem depending on how lucky you are. Um, and that's the execution in which the script are being rendered. So if I was to do a timeline, we have um, at the beginning here, we have the awake, uh, usually wait. So if I was to do a quick timeline over here, we have the dynamic update, which um, it has our input manager that processes, processes, process. Okay, cool. I can't write <laughs> the inputs. So the swipes. And um, then we have the input manager resets these inputs. The problem we can, we can run into at this point is that um, now the problem that arises here is depending on the order in which the script are being, um, are being processed, if this is my player motor, uses these inputs to move, then we're completely fine here because the input manager will set the flags to say, hey, there was a swipe. And then the player motor will say, okay, there was a swipe, I can now move. However, if you're unlucky and it looks like this instead, um, at the beginning of the frame, the player will say, okay, do we have any inputs? No, they're always on false. Then the input manager will set them, nobody will use them, and then he will reset. So next frame, even if we had a swipe, um, the player motor will not know. So it's very important that we go in our setting and we actually change when the input manager is being processed. It should be processed at the very, very beginning of the frame. Our input should be the first thing that comes in play when we're running the whole dynamic update loop. So to do so, um, and you know what, I'll actually leave this, in, this example in here. Um, to do so, we are going to go under Edit, Project, Settings, and under the script execution order, I'll add something, and that something will be, we'll have to find here, the input manager, like right here. And I'll make sure to drag and drop this right before, or right after, sorry, the Unity Engine input system player input. I'll put it right in here. So everything that is after that would be considered something that is positive, for example, our player motor, and will be parsed properly. So knowing this, I'll hit apply. And our input should now work. All right. Now, in terms of the inputs, if they work or not, we will be testing them in the optional. Optional. There's an optional video just beneath this one in this section. If you'd like to skip it, 
uh, we'll test it in the player motor as well. So once we start creating the control for movement um, for a player, we will apply them here, of course. So we'll be having the chance to test them there. But in case you want to go a little bit deeper in this section and uh, just create a script that will that will test these, then feel free to do so. It's the next one. Otherwise, I'll see you in the player movement section. Welcome to a brand new section in which we're going to tackle the player movement. In the previous one, we managed to create a nice world that was automatically generated and also um, have our inputs listened to. We were not using them just yet, but at least they were being listened to. And in this section, we are going to be making our character move. Now, please bear with me. It's, um, it's not complicated code per se, but it's a little bit more in depth than uh, what we've been doing thus far. It's going to use a state machine, which is a design pattern that will allow us to separate our code in such a way that um, it's going to be readable. And also, you can build more on top of it without clustering um, too much. So without further ado, I am going to go under the script, right click and create a new folder called player motor. All the magic will happen right in here. In this first video, we will create the motor script, the, the script that controls it all. And then um, after that, we're going to branch into making different states, such as running, falling, jumping, walking, uh, dead, idle, all this kind of stuff. Um, but in the first, very first video, we are making the base script. And it's going to be quite, uh, that's where most of the logic goes in. So it's, it's going to be quite complex, actually. So this one is going to be called player motor. And we are going to open it up and get ready to code because we got quite a lot of field to declare at first. Um, the script is going to be split into section, as always. We are going to, at the top, declare all the fields we'll need and then use them in separate function, just beneath it. So I'm going to start by cleaning it, everything up, and we're going to head into um, we're going to head into making those fields, declaring those fields. So I will start by declaring a couple of fields that will be hidden in the inspector, so hide in the inspector, but they will be public. Um, the reason they will be public is because I'd like to access them from somewhere else. Um, so that being said, the first one is called move vector. The second one is going to be a vertical velocity, which is a float. Third one is, uh, what was it? It is grounded. So whether or not we are grounded, I'll go ahead and I'll explain all of them once I'm done um, declaring. So is grounded. And finally, the last one that is public, but also hidden in the inspector is the current lane. OK, so let's go over these four fields. Move vector is how far away are we going to move this frame? This is very specific to this frame. We're going to move exactly this far away. Vertical velocity is going to be um, is going to be all about my velocity when I'm jumping or when I'm falling. So if I'm jumping, this will be positive. If I'm on the floor, this will be uh, minus one or something very very little. So it keeps us on the floor. It acts as some sort of gravity. Um, and if it's negative, we're free falling. Grounded is to know whether or not we're touching the floor. And current lane is whether or not, not whether or not, but it's a int that will be um, used like so. So minus one is going to be left, center lane will be zero, and one will be the right lane. OK. And then right after that, we got a total of five field um, that we have to declare, five float, actually. And those will all be configurable um, field. First one is going to be a distance in between lane. The way we've created our prefab, we made sure to keep three meter in between each lane. So I'll do that here as well. Next one is the base run speed. How fast do you run every second forward? Second one is going to be the base sideway speed. This is going to be a little bit faster. So I'd like to move faster left and right than forward at first. Uh, because switching lane should be fast. It's an action the player wants to do. So let's let's try and make it really fast and make it snappy. Next up, we have the gravity. So how fast are we going to reach the floor when we jump? Or, and how fast is our jump going to be? Um, so if you're jumping, how, how long are you going to stay going up for until you start falling? And finally, terminal velocity. Oops. Terminal velocity which is roughly around 20. So these are settings I've used for my other games, and it works perfectly fine. Um, did I forget something? Yes, I actually overwritten the base sideways speed. My bad. 
And the final field is going to be reference. So public character controller. I'm keeping a reference to the character controller so I can call the dot move on it. So here, hidden fields. Here are the configurable fields. And here is the reference. Now we have that. Um, I'm going to start by declaring a private void start. So when we start, let's go and grab a reference to the character controller, just like so. Now we do have that reference. We can move on and create the update. This is where all the magic happens. So this is where we should be moving our character. However, I like to keep my function in uh, different capsules, so encapsulated and um, I feel like we should split that apart and actually create another one called oops, private void update motor and just call update motor in the update. So in case we want to do something else later on, um, then we can just put stuff in the update and it's going to be well separated. So in the update motor, what do we have to do? There's going to be roughly four steps to do here. Um, first off, check if we're grounded. And the reason I'd like to do it once per frame is because it is a, an operation that costs something to do. So, so we already have this information in controller is grounded. However, uh, our state will be asking this question quite a lot. Are we grounded? Are we grounded? So might as well keep it in, um, in cache for the frame. So we can say is grounded is going to be equal to control is grounded. And instead of calling this all the time, I'll just be calling the one that we made. OK, so this is just for optimization. Second step is going to be about asking our state, how should we be moving right now? So how should we be moving based on the state? We actually don't have that information just yet. We don't have the concept of states. Um, then are we trying to change state? Again, we don't have that information, so we're just going to leave it blank. And for the final step, the most beneficial one move the player in which we'll do a controller that move move vector times time the delta time we will go over this once more we have four different steps first let's cache some value second we're going to ask our state and now i'll give you an example our state could be walking running jumping falling death uh, are we idle we ask someone else how we should be moving right now so another script is going to take care of knowing how to move around uh, based on different inputs that we send it. So for example, are we swiping left? Third step is about, are we trying to change state? So assume we're walking and the walking state realize that we're swiping up um, and we're on the floor, then we would be trying to jump. So here is going to keep looking in the walking state. It's going to keep looking. Are we swiping up? If so, OK, then go ahead and, and enter the jump state. And then on next frame here, we'll be able to move according to the jump state. That is pretty much it. So we've made the big chunk of update motor. Um, yeah, yeah, actually. For this to work, though, we're going to need a couple of more concepts in here. The state concept is the most important one. OK, so we covered a good chunk of the player motor. To keep going, however, we're going to need to introduce the concept of states. And that's something I'd like to do separately in a different video. So this is actually where we'll be ending this one. Keep all of these in mind. Right now, the script obviously doesn't do anything. It's going to get a reference to controller um, and, and move regarding to move vector, but that's never actually being assigned. So nothing is really happening at the moment. But keep in mind that in the next video, we're going to introduce states, and those states will be modifying the move vector. So I'll see you there. So previously, we started creating the player motor, but we did not complete it. Uh, we still had concepts that were not introduced just, uh, just yet, such as the state. So in this episode, we are going to go over this and actually create this concept. Um, and it's the state machine design pattern, which is quite a useful one in our case. I'm going to create it in a different folder driver. I'll be calling this one state under player motor. And to introduce this, we are going to do the theory as we create the base state. So please just follow along for a bit and you'll understand a little bit more what happens once we, we open this one up and um, we put it through the flow. We now have a new script that is called base state. It inherits from model behavior and that's totally fine. We'll just keep it this way. Um, what this base state is going to do, it's going to be the parent class for walking, for jumping, for falling, 
it's going to be the parent that pretty much guides how state can behave. So all the function we're going to be declaring within here are going to be inherited by walking, jumping, falling, death, idle, respawn, and all those different movement state. Um, so let's go ahead. Uh, to implement a state machine, usually the most popular concept is to have three different functions that will be there for whatever state machine you're doing. It doesn't have to be a movement one. It could be a bus AI. It could be anything, really. Um, but usually you always see the following three. First one is called construct, like so. Second one is destruct. And third one is transition. And you know what? Um, since I'm not implementing anything in here, I'm just going to go ahead and leave them on the same line. There we go. OK, so every time that we have a state, it will have the following function, construct, destruct, and transition. Construct will usually be called once we first enter the state. Destruct will be called once we leave the state. And transition will be called in an update loop constantly to know whether or not we should be switching to different state. For example, we're entering the jumping state. Once we enter the jumping state, we'd like to set our vertical velocity to a certain amount. And then um, every frame, we're going to be checking in the transition, is our velocity right now equal to zero or might, like smaller than zero? If so, we should be transitioning over to the falling state. And if we do transition over to the falling state, we're going to call destruct before we go. So those are all, I don't want to call them endpoint, but those are all steps that you will go through with every single state every time. So this will give you a nice code cave where you can input stuff um, as you're switching frames. Not frame, state. OK, cool. It's getting messed up in my word here. Um, however, there is something, this is like for all the state machine. Now, something specific to our game and movement in this case is the player motor. I'll keep your reference to the motor here at all time. If you're not familiar, protected is basically the exact same thing as declaring a field private. However, your children will have access to it. So the walking state, walking state will have access, falling state will have access. As long as they inherit from base state, they will have access to motor. And finally, one more function that is only going to be uh, specific to our game is the following process motion. And this one is the one that we'll call directly from the update motor. Uh, this is one. This is the one that will determine how to move depending on which state we are in. What I'm doing right now is I'm just um, creating a debug function that will that will say, hey, um, if this is not implemented, so if there is nothing within that function in the children, we're just going to say, hey, it has not been implemented, and we're going to return a zero. OK, so right now, this might be a little bit hard to wrap your head around. Uh, and I'm going to make it a little bit more complex by adding the abstract T word. If you don't know what it means, uh, it basically means that you cannot just put this script on top of somebody else. It cannot exist on its own. It needs to be inherited. So uh, base state, I save this, everything is saved. If I am to just drag and drop this on top of the player, it's going to say, no, you're not allowed to create this state on its own. It has to be a children. It cannot be abstract. OK, so going forward with this, um, to understand a little bit better how base state is going to work, we're going to implement a new state. So I'm going to right click, create the running state. And we're going to go ahead and, and implement that. So we have a new state right here called running state. All we have to do, really, is the following. Change the model behavior inheritance to base state like so. And just by doing this, we now have access to a couple of things. Motor, oops, well, we should have access to motor at least. Well, we're not in a scope, so we're not going to have access here. Um, but we have, um, we inherited from the, these four functions, and they're all, all virtual, which means we can override all of them. Now, for the example of running state, we, we don't need to do anything when we uh, start running, and we don't need to do anything when we stop running. So construct and destruct. There is no need to override these because there's just nothing we do right now. Eventually, we're going to be triggering animation from them. Um, but right now, to keep things simple, 
we just need to implement the following transition to know whether or not we should be switching and process motion. That's for knowing how to move. So going back in my script, I'll do a public override. Let's do process motion first and public override transition. I'm going to remove the base. We're not going to be calling the base. We're going to be implementing it always like this. So now let's think about this. How do we move our player? Um, we move our player. Well, first off, let's let's declare a vector. So for example, we can do M for move, move vector. We're going to start with a vector 3.0 and eventually return M. Now, how is our player moving around when he's just running? I will go ahead and declare that in X, I'll leave it to zero right now. We'll come back and make him change lane. But at the moment, when we are move, we're not moving in X at the moment. Uh, secondly, in Y, we are on the floor right now. So I always want to have a small force that will keep me on the floor. And finally, in Z, we'd like to move at a certain speed. That speed is defined in motor. So I'll do motor dot base run speed like so. And we've just did our math. So in X, we're not moving at all. In Y, we are applying a small force towards the floor. And in Z, we're moving at the base run speed. That's all we need to know right now. Now for transition, I'd like to look for a couple of things here. Um, are we swiping left? Are we swiping right? Or are we swiping up? Left would mean that please you know, change lane. Right would mean change lane on the other side. And up would mean uh, change to jumping, actually. So I'll do the following condition. If input manager instance swipe left, I'll do something here. Right now, we don't have anything to change the lane, so I'll just open the brackets. I'll copy this over. Same thing for swipe right. And once more, but this time for swipe up. So here, change, oh, change lane, go left, change lane, go right, and here it's actually changed to jumping state. And you know what? I forgot something here. Uh, if we're swiping up and we are grounded, then we're allowed to jump. If we're not grounded, I don't want to be able to jump. That'd just be weird. Um, that being said, are we ready now to go implement these? I think so. So to make everything work, we'll have to go back in the player motor and um, first apply the process motion and also call transition and make sure we implement these three. So that's the three last thing we have to do. Um, fill in the steps in player motor, implement changing lane and implement changing state. So let's go ahead and do that. Player motor, how should we be moving right now? Based on the state, which means we'll need a reference to that state. And that's where we introduce our new friend, state. Written like so. This new state will be declared in the start initially because we need the starting state. We need the default state. And it's going to be the following. So get component um, running state. Because remember, we can't just apply the base state here since it is abstract. Once we have a reference, we'll call construct. Even though we know it doesn't do anything right now, we'll still call it. OK. Then moving forward, right about here, this is where we're going to be asking the state. So move vector process motion, state that process motion. We're asking the state to process the current logic within the running state, which is this right here. And it will return how we should be moving if we're running. And then right here, make sure we call the transition. It's something we have to call every single frame to know whether or not we're changing. Um, our problem right now is that even though we are swiping left, right, up, um, we don't have any implementation of first changing lane and second uh, changing the, what's the other thing? State. Yeah. So down here in the player motor, I'll go ahead and I'll create the following function, change lane, which will take an int called direction. Could take a Boolean as well. Could take uh, any type of parent or string if you wish. Really doesn't matter. Um, and then a public void change state, which will take in a base state as a parameter, just like so. When we change the lane, we just have to say, oh, 
current lane is going to be equal to current lane plus direction. But since we're only having three lane in our game, so I'm going to clamp it like so with a map f that clamp the value is the following. So current lane plus direction minus one and then one. So we're clamping on both the left side minus one and the right side one. That's it. So change lane has been implemented. Um, the logic on, on moving our player around will be done in the next video, but at least right now we are changing the int that will then know what lanes we're on. So that being said, uh, we are going to implement change state. Here's what we have to do. It's really fun. First, you call the current state. You say destroy, and then you say, hey, the current state is now equal to s, and then you do s, or sorry, state dot construct. That's all we have to do. <laughs> Um, let's go back in running state and implement this now that we have these function. Here, it's a motor dot change lane minus one. And here it's motor dot change lane one. And finally, here is the following. So motor dot change state. And then we run into a problem because we don't have jumping right now. So it's going to be jumping state written like this. But since we don't have it, we're going to have to leave it on the bench for now, and we'll come back to it. OK, are we ready to actually apply this? I think we're ready. Um, we're going to get an early result, and we're still not moving left to right, but uh, we'll see that in, in the next one. So I'm going to go right over to my penguin, make sure I add everything I need. Um, you shouldn't have the, the character controller. I just did a little bit of testing here. That's why it's there. Uh, but we'll be applying the player motor. You'll see that we have all of these fields we can modify and then add the running state as well. Then I'll hit play. It's going to tell me, hey, you don't have a character motor. So yeah, so go ahead and add the character controller. I'll move mine up. Here it is. Oh, and you also have to realize that uh, <laughs> this is going to happen. So you might want to you might want to change that a little bit. So the center should be at 0 0.5 and the radius should be at 0 0.25, maybe height on the one. And do know the bigger you make the radius, the harder your game is going to be, obviously. So I'll put that on 0 0.2 like so. OK. What do we run into right now? So the running state seems to not be defined. Let's see what happens. Oh, I missed something really big. Actually, I forgot something in the base state. I actually forgot to assign the motor. That's very, very important. So my bad on this. What we should be doing here in the awake call is assigning this motor by doing a get component player motor. And now we should be good. Make sure you do that in the base state and not the running state. You could be doing it in the running state. It would work, but it would not be clean, and you would have to redo it every time there's a new state. So obviously, you want the, um, you want the parent to have this reference instead. OK, so once we start with this, once we have the button press, our player moves forward, and then he gets stuck within the first rug that is in place. But at least he's moving. At least you know that the player motor is successfully calling another script right here to run. And for example, you, would, you could do something like this, and you'd see that he'd be moving towards the right side just a tiny bit. So you know that another script is controlling the behavior of your penguin. And for some reason, mine is not moving. Maybe I saved a little bit too quick. Yeah, that has to be it. OK, yeah, as you can see, he moved a tad bit towards the right hand side. And if I was to put him here, slowly but surely, he's moving towards the right. So that's actually where we're going to be ending um, this episode. In the next one, we're going to go implement the changing of lanes, which is going to be very, very important for a player to move around and also to test the transition. Right now, we're not really testing if we're swiping up left or right. We can't really see anything. Uh, but technically, it should change the um, the current lane if we're swiping left or right, which is just the int right now. OK, so that being said, I'll see you in the next one.
In this episode, we're putting everything together, including the snapping to a certain lane and making sure our player can move left to right using input. So we're just making sure everything works within this one. Um, before we mow, we go and we tackle something else, such as a jumping state. So it's going to be a fairly simple, fairly fast episode, and we're going to start within the player motor because that's where some of the logic, logic will happen. So the logic of snapping to a certain lane, this is where it will happen. And I'll input that right in between the optic motor and also the change lane, because this one will be public. And I'll be returning a float. This function will be called snap to lane. And it will make sure that the player goes exactly where it should be. I will start by declaring myself a float called r for a return value. I like to do that sometimes, uh, so I can just return r like so. And here we will branch in between two different logic. Um, the first logic is going to be the following. So I'll do an if statement. If we're not directly on top of a lane, or actually the lane we're supposed to be on, um, then do something else r is just going to be equal to zero. We actually don't need to move at all in x. So um, let's go ahead and write this statement. If we're not directly where we should be, which could translate itself as transform the position is actually position of x is not equal to my current lane times the distance in between lane. For example, if my current lane is minus one, times three, because the distance in between lane is three, then minus three. If we're not exactly at minus three, let's enter this if branch and make sure we move exactly where we should be. And this is how we're going to be taking care of this logic. We're going to start by, um, oh, sorry. We're going to start by declaring a delta to desired position, which would translate as how far away do we need to go before we're exactly where we need to be right now. And we can do this by, um, knowing this value so current lane times distance between lane this is where we should be minus where we are right now so transform position dot x with this we know exactly how far away we have to go before we're exactly where we need to be and we'll start declaring the r value based of that so i'll do a small ternary operator here i'll be looking at the delta the desired, desired position if that's bigger than zero it means we have a positive value so I'll put r is equal to 1 right here. And if it's not bigger than 0, then we're going negative. So I'll say minus 1. So at this point, r is equal, either equal to 1 or minus 1. And then I'll multiply that. So time is equal by the base sideways speed. Knowing this value, uh, for example, this is 10, I believe. Yeah, 10. Now we're either at minus 10 or plus 10. And we can just go ahead and move in the proper direction. So that's totally fine. It's going to be multiplied by time the delta time. So we're not going to run into a problem that uh, you know it goes way too far away um, on a certain axis. So this right here could work. But technically, once we reach a certain point, we're going to see some jittering going left and right because it's going to go a little bit too far towards the right. And then it's going to see that the delta is now like negative. And it's going to go too far towards left. And then it's going to see that the positive value is there. Then it's going to go too far towards the right. It's going to keep jittering. So what we have to do, if this is actually, if our distance right here, the base side of speed, goes further than where we should be, then we need to clamp it to exactly where it should be so it stops. So here's how we'll be doing this we will calculate the actual distance traveled, I'll just call it actual distance, by doing r time, time the delta time, because we know that eventually this value will get multiplied by time the delta time. So this right here is exactly how far we'll move this frame. And now what's left to do is to check whether or not the actual distance goes further than the delta to desired position. And if that's the case, we're going to have to clamp it down. So if matf.absolute I like to put that on absolute because these values might either be positive or negative. I'll make sure they are all positive within my operation here. So if the actual distance, if that's bigger than the absolute of the delta to desired position, which means is how far we actually move away, is it bigger than where how much we have to move before we reach the exact spot? If that's the case, then we're going to say delta to desired position 
times 1 divided by time the delta time. Okay, if you don't trust me, here are the mathematics. So for example, um, time of delta time is usually something like 0 0.001 for me. Here we have base sideways speed. So if we have to go right, our base sideways speed is going to be r is equal to 10 because that's 10 and we have 1. Now we can calculate the actual distance by saying 10 times 0 0.001 and we're going to end up with 0 0.01. So that's how far we're actually going to travel this frame. Um, for example, now, if the delta to desired position is actually on 0 0.005, so we are moving further away than how much we should move, then what we do is the following. We grab this value, and we do times 1 divided by time the delta time. So here, I'll do it in the calculator here. 1 divided by 0 0.001, we end up with 1,000. And this is 1,000 on this right-hand side. And here's 0 0.005, so times 0 0.005. We end up with 5. Initially, we had 10 here. Now we end up with 5 because we're halfway, we're halfway through. So this calculates the exact distance we have to go. And that's it. We've made our function. And that was the most complex function we had to create in here. And we are going to go and use it. So back under my running state now, we, we know exactly what to do with this number. We can say motor snap to lane. And that's perfect because now we're changing here. We're changing the current lane value with our swipe left and swipe right, which should be called because technically transition is there. Um, we should see this in effect directly in our game now. So going back in the game, let's see. Everything is there. I have the running state, the player motor, animator, and also the character controller. Let's press play and see if we run into any trouble. So my player should be right here. And I'm going to swipe right. And he moved towards this side. And he snapped perfectly fine. So let's see. His transform is exactly on three. If I move left exactly on zero. If I move left again, exactly on minus three. Sometime when you move back to zero, you might get the weird um, ellipsin value. So like a value that says minus E something. Uh, don't be scared of that. It basically means zero, but it's just that the rounding of the number in computer, in the computer world might mess this up sometimes. But as you can see, it works exactly as it should. Um, however, our camera is not stuck to us. So let's do something this episode. Since we have not implemented our camera system just yet, let's make sure we actually follow our penguin around with this camera. And I'll be doing so by moving this over directly on top of my penguin. So I'll go ahead and I'll take my camera and drag it directly on top of the penguin, which should lead to the following result. We're starting to have something that works. And um, yeah, our world is being auto-generated because remember, that um, the world is not actually attached to player, it's actually attached to camera. So when the camera moves, then you get to see this behavior work. Um, and obviously, we might want to change the distance at which we have to spawn stuff for the scenery, but the rest seems to be just fine. And I can move left, I can move right. I'll have a lot of collider to fix, like this one here, we get stuck. So we'll have to go in this prefab and just make sure the collider is a little bit beneath this. Uh, but before we go and we start fixing these things, I believe we should finish writing the whole controller with a jump and also with a falling state. Um, yeah, <laughs> so that being said, we will see each other in the next episode in which we will tackle the jumping behavior. So I'll see you there. In this episode, we're going to be tackling two different states, the jumping state and also the falling state. They pretty much behave the same exact way. But uh, we'd like to know whether or not we're in a jumping or falling state sometimes, especially if you have different animation between the two, and maybe you want to have some additional logic in there as well. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and right click, create new, new states, two of them. So first one will be the jumping state, followed immediately by the falling state. And we will create the jumping one first and move directly inside of jumping right after. So double click on jumping state and you'll see how easy it is to implement. Now that we have all, almost all the pieces, there's one piece left 
that we'll have to create in the player motor. But um, we have most of the pieces left to do. So let's do a public override void construct. We'll be changing construct in this case, and also public override process motion. And finally, public override transition. These are the three we're going to be overwriting. Now, one of the cool thing that has to do with uh, the way we split our script apart and also how this state machine work is that we can actually declare a field right here. For example, we can declare a public float jump force and have it apply only this state. So if we had two players running around um, and we want them, one of them to jump higher than the other, we just have to go directly on this component, which will be on top of the player and change it for that player only. So it's a nice way to split. Again, we can split the field in different ways. So we don't have to put that directly on the player motor. These are fields that affect all the state. And this over here is field that will only affect the jumping state here. So um, that being said, let's go ahead and, and implement those. Fairly simple. Once we enter the state, once we enter the jumping state, we have to set the vertical velocity of the motor to jump force in this case. For the process motion, we're going to need to do two things. First, apply some gravity. And second, override the following that we have here. So I just copied over what I had in running state, but don't worry, you don't have to do that. Fairly simple to just, just rewrite all of that if you wish. Um, here, apply gravity. And second, create our return vector. So at the moment, uh, apply gravity. We don't have any code for that. We'll create it in a second. So when it comes down to applying the gravity, it's something that should be fairly, fairly simple. And it will look like this. Motor vertical velocity is minus equal to the gravity times time the delta time. The reason I do times the delta time here is to make sure that the gravity uh, is going to be in a, a whole separate value, this vertical velocity. So I want to make sure it's synchronized just like the other value. That being said, uh, this code will be reused at a couple of places. For example, we'll reuse the same exact code for when we're falling. And I don't like to write the same code twice. It's actually not a very good practice. Uh, even though it's only one line, I like to keep it separately somewhere else. Uh, so if I have to rewrite this for some reason later on, um, I can overwrite everything else, like uh, every other place that has this. So what I'll do, I'll actually grab this line of code and I'll put it under the player motor here. And I'll do the following public void apply gravity. And I'll paste it, remove the motor. We don't need to reference that. Don't need to reference that as well. And I'll simply be calling that from the jumping state instead. So I'll say motor dot apply gravity. And now we just put that under a different field, a different function that I will also call from falling, so I won't have to write the same code. OK, what else do we need now? OK, let's go ahead and create our return vector. Snap to lane in X is going to remain the same. Now, in terms of Y, this is where it changes. Everything changes around here. So the Y component is actually going to be equal to the vertical velocity. And Z, Z is going to remain the same, unless you want to slow down a little bit um, while, while you're <laughs> jumping. I don't know why you do that. but uh, you know, you can control that here if you wish. So that's pretty much all we had to do for process motion. And finally, transition. One thing that I don't want to do. So for transition over here, we made sure we, we can change lane left, right. I actually don't want that um, in the jumping state. Instead, the only thing I'll be looking for is not even inputs. I'll be looking for the following. Is our vertical velocity, so our force in Y, is it now smaller than zero? And if it is, go ahead and change state for falling. So if we stop going up at one point, which we will, because gravity affects us, we are going to enter the falling state. It's not going to work right now because falling state does not inherit from base state, but it will in a second. So if I just press F12 on this one, change it here, the jumping state now works. OK. Um, before I go and I code the falling state, I'm going to go back under running, make sure I uncomment this. 
and I'm going to give it a test. I want to, to see if everything works well before I move on to creating the following state. So pressing on play here, I can move around left, right, yeah. And here I'm going to jump. And oh, we are actually going to run into a problem for the sole reason that we did not include this on top of our um, player here. So here's what I'll do. Make sure I have my running state, jumping, and also falling. Let's uh, preemptively do it here. Then I can press play. You'll see my jump force is public, so I can modify that here if I wish. And I'm currently falling a little bit. I'll let myself fall so we can see this clearly. And I'm going to jump now. So here, as you can see, we jumped and then we, we got stuck in the air. And the reason we're stuck in the air is because process motion is actually not implemented in falling state. That's right. So we moved on from walking to jumping, then into falling. So we were able to call the falling state. The problem is that we don't have any code in falling state. So it's actually, it doesn't know how to behave. And here is the fun part. This is actually something I was looking forward to doing uh, in quite a while. Creating the falling state. Let's see how simple it is going to be to create a falling state with this system. We're going to override two things. So override process motion and also public override transition. For this one, I'll go and I'll grab whatever I have here in the jumping state, apply it here, and let's have a look. Yes, we apply the gravity. Yes, we create a return value. Yes, we still snap to lane. This is still equal to velocity. In this case, it's going to be um, negative, which is still good. We still want that. Oh, actually, we could clamp it. Yeah, so it's going to be equal to vertical velocity. Hum, I just realized something. We're going to go back under the player motor for a bit. Uh, and also Z, we apply the speed forward. That's totally fine. So we don't need to change anything within the process motion. But under transition, here is what we're going to be looking for. Are we grounded? If we are grounded, let's go ahead and uh, change state to running state. That's all. That's how simple it was to implement the following state. Basically copy paste and we just different transition. Really, that's all. Uh, something I've realized that uh, is not going to change much if you forget about it, but let's go ahead and do it under vertical, uh, sorry, under gravity. I'd like to clamp this with my terminal velocity. So if vertical velocity is now smaller than the minus terminal velocity, I'm going to say it's equal to it, to minus terminal velocity. Uh, this way, if it goes beyond 20, then our speed is going to be capped at 20 meters a second, which is quite a lot, actually, but still. Uh, I don't think we'll ever realize this or see this simply because we we don't reach terminal velocity unless you're falling in a hole and you didn't plan for that. But uh, yeah. OK, we should now be good to go to have a full loop of this player running around, jumping, falling, and then going back into the running state, which is the most important part. So having a full circle. So let's go ahead and see how it works. Oh, wait, we see a problem right here. Um, so if I am to jump, I do the full loop. So jump here, then I fall, and that's perfect. I can jump again once I'm in the walking state. However, if I just decide to fall off like so, without jumping prior, you'll see this problem. We're just floating in the air, and we're technically right here. This is technically in the walking state uh, for the sole purpose that we didn't jump. So there was no way to transition away from running state here. There is nothing that says, hey, um, go to falling state if there's no floor beneath you <laughs> so that's what we'll do here in my running state input manager in actually no wait <laughs> is grounded if we are not grounded like so then go ahead and change my state to falling there we go so that's all we were missing here and i'm going to remove the uh these extras now, if we're not grounded, we will go straight to the falling state, which will mean that vertical velocity will be applied. Now, we seem to have a small issue where we fall extremely fast if we, um, if we don't jump prior. Let me just give you an example. Right here, you'll see it. We will fall extremely fast off this if we're able to get on it, which I guess is not the case right now. 
Um, but what really happens here, and I'll, I'll explain it the best I can, is uh, we never reset the, the vertical velocity after falling is done. So once we reach the floor, we never reset the vertical velocity. So if you end up like running like this, it's really hard to do it, but if we move this way, you'll see it really snaps very fast to the floor because the vertical velocity is still quite high, uh, which means that under my running state, when I enter the state, I'm actually going to put that back on zero. So once we hit the floor, let's actually reset our vertical velocity. And I can do it like this. So with a public override construct, and I can say my vertical velocity at this point is going to be equal to zero. So with this code in place now, um, once we reach the floor, once we enter the walking state, we are eating the shock that happens. You hit the floor, we eat the shock, our vertical velocity is now back to zero, which makes a lot of sense. And that's actually where we're going to be ending this episode. We're starting to get a nice little flow. Of course, the animation are not in there yet. That's going to be a step we'll have to do. We'll have to fix some of the prefab because sometimes we just don't go up and that's really annoying. Uh, maybe we'll fix that directly on the character controller. But um, that will be for the final episode of this section, where we just make sure everything works and uh, tackle all these small issues. Until then, we still have a couple of states to create, such as the respawn state, the idle state, and the dev state. So that's what we'll move on to do next. So just stick along. We're almost done, and we're about to get a very nice result. So I'll see you guys in the next one. In the last episode, we left off with the jumping and also the falling state. In this one, we're going to tackle the sliding state. So the one that is going to make our collider a little bit smaller and allow us to go beneath those, um, those obstacles we have in our course. So let's go ahead and right click on state. We are going to go and do the exact same thing we always do when there's a new state. So um, call it sliding state. And we're gonna make sure this one inherits from base state. So let's double click, open it in our best editor and we are going to change and here it is, it's now open. As always, I like to clean up everything. So let me get rid of all of that. We're gonna be using base state. And what are we gonna override in this case? Well, um, let's declare a couple of fields first before we override. There's a couple of parameters we'd like to be able to control. So how long is the slide going to be for? Um, for example, if our slide is one second, um, it's gonna give one second for the player to go beneath the object. Now, of course, the longer this is, the easier it's going to be for him. Um, the less you have to time exactly, uh, be frame perfect to go beneath the object. And uh, that's pretty much it. <laughs> so um, in terms of other data we'd like to keep, there's three other data I'd like to keep internally for the logic of this to work. So it's going to be collider logic. So private vector three, initial center. And you'll see why we do that in a second. Private float initial size. And also I'm going to keep a float for slide start. Now, respectively, those three are, where is the center of our character controller? What is its um, original size? So how big is the radius originally? And then when exactly, this is time.time. .time, so when exactly does the slide start? And let's go ahead and start overriding things. Uh, this one is a lot more complex than the rest of the state, simply because we're modifying the uh, the character controller on the fly. So we're going to start with a construct override. Whenever we enter the sliding state, I will go and start the slide with slide start time is equal, actually is equal to time dot time, which is going to give us a exact timestamp of when we enter the state. This is going to be useful so we can transition out of it eventually. Now, um, as we're constructing this, let's also make sure we have the initial uh, size, which is going to be equal to motor.controller.height. So we access right here, what we do is we access the, um, the character controller, and there's a reference of it on the motor. Next up, the initial center, motor controller center. And then what we do, once we save these, once we have the data for where the character controller is, and I'm just going to show it to you at the same time so you understand what I'm talking about, those fields are um, they're exposed, so you'll be able to see them as well. Uh, here they are. So we had height, which is this one, and we had center, which is this one. So when we modify height, for example, 2, 
or in this case 20, our penguin grows, like the, the collider grows. So what we're going to be expecting to do um, when we go in a slide mode is maybe reduce that to 0 0.5. So he's definitely smaller and he can go through beneath object. But we're also going to have to move the center so it snaps to the floor, like so. Um, so these two values are going to be the one we're going to modify. So right here we have center and height. Here they are, center.height. Now, when we enter slide mode, well, we're going to modify these. So we just grab a reference to them. Now we're going to say, hey, um, you know, the height is going to be equal to, for example, initial um, size divided by two. Or if you'd like to be a little bit more compiler friendly, you're going to do um, a times instead. Actually, if you want to be even more fancy than that, you can do a byte shift. I don't know why I just went on a tangent, but okay. Um, that being said, same thing for the height. So motor.controller.center initial center, oops, initial center, can't type. And we're going to divide that by two. So these values are going to be uh, divided by two as soon as we start. So what I just shown you here, zero height, 0 0.5, and also uh, center is going to be like this. So we end up having this small collider instead of this big one. Now, um, the reason we kept them in, in memory is simply so we can put them back to what they were in a public override destruct. So here, in the destruct, I'll simply grab this, paste it, and remove the divided by two. So simple enough, we just go back to the size we were initially. Now, it's time for transition, because transition is going to be a bit different. Um, than, than usual. So if I go and I override my transition, we'd like to be able to do a couple of things. So when I'm sliding, I'm actually going to allow the person to um, to to slide left and right, so in between lanes. So I'm going to keep the logic we have here. So being able to change lane is going to be possible while sliding. Now there's going to be additional logic in here. So for example, if we're sliding up and at one point we fall off an object, so if we're no longer grounded, I'd like to get into a falling state. So get component type of falling state, just like so. OK, so that's the first one. Um, second, if I am currently sliding and I'm jumping and I'm trying to swipe up, so input manager instance swipe up, if the person managed to do a quick swipe up, then let's go into a jumping state. So you can jump off that state. And finally, one more. If the time ran out, we're just going to go back to walking state so, or running state, my bad. Now, how do, we, um, how do we actually say, did the time run out? We do it this way. So the current time right now minus when we started. So remember, this is a timestamp as well. Um, so the time right now minus when we started gives us how how long has it been since we started sliding? If that's more than the slide duration, then we can go ahead and enter the running state. And that's pretty much all we need here. Um, we're going to be testing it out right now. The only problem is that you won't be able to see it physically. Or yeah, well, I don't want to say physically, but you won't be able to see it because there is no animation around it. And uh, since we're changing our, our side of the controller to a point where it's still going to be on the floor, and it's going to be very, very hard to tell unless um, we pause the game and we look at the, uh, the actual uh, character controller. Um, so let's go ahead. I'm going to add this sliding state right here. And you know what? Just for testing purpose, I'll put the slide duration on five seconds. And I just realized we have nothing to go into that. So um, let's go back to a running state. And here, this is the running state, by the way. If we actually swipe down, I'd like to change to um, a sliding state. So if input manager swipe down, let's enter a sliding state. And um, right now I'm thinking, should we have any other means to enter the sliding state? And I don't think so. I think the only time you can enter a sliding state would be when you're running. So I think it's the only place where we actually need to branch into this state. That being said, let's try it again. Remember, I have a five second slide here. So I'm going to jump and try to slide over here. Oh, and it says process motion not implemented 
in that state. That's actually correct. I forgot to implement the process motion. But uh, I've paused the game. Let's have a look at the... Okay, so the, the, the controller didn't get tinier. So it feels like there's an error here because I, I feel like I'm going to the state too fast and I'm coming out too fast as well. Um, so let's check this out. I have a feeling that what might happen is because we are not actually pushing our player towards the floor, so process motion actually just stops us from moving at all, um, that we enter a falling state for some reason because we're no longer grounded. That is my theory, and um, that, that's what I think is happening. So what we're going to need to do is actually code the process motion. That's going to be very, very important. So um, that being said, let's go down here, public override process motion. And what we'll be doing here is something very similar as running. So I'll just go grab whatever we have in running. We're going to snap to a lane. We're going to make sure we're pushed towards the floor and we are going to slide forward. Let's see if this works now. Okay, so I'm not getting any error, and I feel like, if I just paused the game, by the way, I feel like my controller, yeah, it's a lot smaller. So if we just leave this running, and we enter a different state, you saw that it went back to normal. So I'm looking at the green outline here, and I'm going to do it again here. So slide, pause the game, and as you can see, we have this small dude here. Um, this is going to be very important for these type of objects over here. Now, I have a feeling that we actually go beneath them, even though we're... Uh, we're not sliding, so let's see this. Oh, there was a small a small hiccup here, but um, it's not enough. So let me go on the prefab real quick and make sure this is smaller. A good thing with the fact that we've made prefab out of BB is I can just modify one, and it's going to modify all of them. So I'm going to take the box collider, this one, and just push it a bit further down, like so. And we're going to try this again. So, oh, I'm kind of unlucky. I need to uh, have one of these spawn right now so we can test this out. And there should be one right here in the next prefab. Yep, here it is. So let's go in that lane and we should get stuck. Yep, so we're stuck here. Now, until I slide down, I should not be able to go beneath it. Now, obviously, we'll have, we're will have we going to have to tackle uh, these prefabs so they look a little bit more realistic. but. Let's go and swipe down. And as you can see, I went beneath it just fine. Eventually, uh, in fact, very, very soon, these are going to be killing us. So if we run into it, we should be pretty much dead. But um, as far as this episode is concerned, I'm going to go back on my sliding state, make sure it's only one second, save this, and we are now going to have our sliding state. All right. So I'll catch you in the next one where we're going to start implementing the um, I could I think we're going to be implementing the respawn and also the death, but uh, very soon we're going to be implementing the animation. So this looks a lot better. Anyway, see you there. In the previous video, we look into creating the sliding state, and it's something we now have part of our toolkit. Um, we then have to create two more states. Those are the respawn state, the death state. But it's not something we'll be doing right now. I thought about doing them right now, but I decided that we should move them a little bit uh, further in the tutorial when we have trigger for those. So at the moment, we have no way of dying. We have no way of resp respawning. This logic is not in there. And our prefab, they don't really kill us at the moment. We just walk through them until we decide to either move or slide beneath them. So what we'll be doing today is we'll head back to the, to the animator. And we'll make sure that whatever we have right now, so falling, jumping, running, and sliding, those have attached animation to them, and um, we, we can make sure it's being called properly. It's a fairly, fairly simple video, uh, and it goes back to what we already saw in the past regarding the animator, so this state machine over here. So we'll be using these following parameters, the one that are included inside of the animator, something we saw a little bit earlier, I think, in section number two. So going forward, we'll be using all of these states, we'll be opening all of these um, scripts, and we will be plugging in the animator in there. So going forward, in order to actually hook this animator, the one that we see here on the screen, um, we'll have to go ahead and have a reference to it. Now, it's something that we could put under base state, but in base state, well, we have a reference to the motor, and we might actually want to use it here instead. So what we'll be doing 
is um, inside of the player motor, I'll be creating a public animator, which is going to be the, I'll just call it anim for animator. This one will be set directly in the start. So in the start, just beneath the controller assignment, I'll say anim is equal to get component type of animator. And now we have a reference to all of that. Um, this one is public. So do note that once we go inside of our state, for example, the running state, we can go anywhere and say, hey, motor.anim.set trigger or set boolean or set speed, all of that is going to be possible from this point on. With that in mind, let's go back to the four states we currently have. So I left them open here. We now have the sliding, falling, jumping, and running state. I'll start with the sliding one. And what we'll be doing right here is the, the following. So under construct, I'm going to be calling the motor.anim. And I'll actually do a, um, a question mark here, which means if it's null, we're going to stop right here. But if it's not null, let's continue. And we're going to do a set trigger. Trigger is going to be called slide or sliding. I'm not quite sure that we, we can actually double check in here. So here, the trigger is called slide with a capital P. So let's go back. Here it is. Now I can save this once more. And I believe that's actually all we need. Oh, no, wait. So once we're done with the sliding, we can also set the trigger back for running. Like so. So we should have everything we need for the sliding behavior to actually take place. Now, um, next up, we should go over to the falling. And when we enter our fall state, I'll actually have to override the construct. So once we enter the fall state, we can go ahead and set a trigger for that. So motor.anim set trigger. And um, I believe it's called just fall. Yep, so here it is, just fall. Um, I believe that's all we need for falling. Next up, we have the jumping state, which I'll just copy what I have over here. It's going to be in the construct as well. And here it is being called jump with a capital J. And we can now give this a try. Um, at the beginning, there should be a problem with the fact that uh, we, you know, as you can see here, we're not running. Um, this is something that will be triggered later on once we um, we actually decide to start the game, because do remember that once we press play, we're not going to jump right into the, the content right away. There's going to be a screen stopping us. There will be two buttons, one asking for uh, if you wish to play, and the other one asking if you wish to go to the shop. So once we click play, then we're going to set the running trigger. And then from that point on, we're going to head into jump. Then falling is being called. And I am not actually transitioning properly right now outside of jumping. So we're stuck in the jumping state, which is kind of odd because we have fall triggered right here and let's see what's the condition is grounded is equal to true so should, we should actually be going back because now we're technically grounded we should be headed back directly inside of the running state so this turned out to be quite a simple issue it was because is grounded was not actually being set so on every single frame that i'm actually running the state machine i'd like to keep a couple of values always updated and those are the speed at which i'm going and also if I am grounded or not. So these two here will, should actually be updated every single frame, not by a state, but by information we have outside of the state. So directly on the player motor. That being said, I'm now gonna head back instead of player motor. And as we are updating the whole motor here, um, I kind of feel like doing it in between transition here. Let's feed our state machine or animation actually feed our animator some values and those will be the following so animator dot set boolean is grounded by is grounded let's see i think i didn't put a capital no i did put a capital okay i've always put capital that's good um next up was the set speed so set float speed and that would be um we would actually have to take the absolute value of vector z but Z is always going to be a, actually, no, Z is not always going to be absolute value because for the def state, I wish to do some, some kind of um, bouncing back, which means once we go back towards the camera, uh, this is actually going to be a negative Z value. So I'll do a matf.absolute on move vector.z. 
And just like so, I think we just enable the whole machine to work as a whole. So if we have a look here, um, at the beginning, we'll be setting a speed. Well, first we'll, en we'll enter the idle state. And then once we start running, we'll be setting a speed. The speed is going to be greater than zero, which will put us in the running state. And then from that point on, depending on whatever action you have, um, you'll go into one of these states. So let's give this a try. I am running, just not in the right direction. Um, that's a jump and then back into running. Let's try sliding. Yep. So everything seems to work just fine in terms of the animation, except of course the fact that we're completely backward. <laughs> but yeah, this makes a lot more sense than before. So now the problem we're running into is that it's completely backward and that's only because the penguin itself is actually looking um, in a 180 degree angle away from where it should go. So if I put it back on zero and I flip the camera to the other side, like so, flip its rotation as well, we'll now have something that makes a little bit more sense. But do know that we're about to change this camera as well. So we're about to go and modify this one um, to use in the machine instead. But it's a lot better now. We're starting to have a little bit of more, uh, the game is starting to look a little bit better than, than it used to for sure. And then we'll quickly go into Snip Machine, make sure our camera are well adjusted. And um, then we can start implementing some of the, the logic behind the game, such as dying, respawning, um, and a little bit of the UI as well. That being said, we are going to wrap up this section fairly soon with the next video. And the next video is going to be all about adjustment. So things like uh, the lighting not being all right, the, uh, the actual prefab not spawning enough of it. So we, we actually see this behind. Um, and also everything that has to do with the collider. So you see here, I get stuck in the ramp just because the collider is not properly set up. Um, and maybe because my, my slope angle on the character controller is not accepting a wide enough range of uh, angles. So uh, next video is going to be a wrap up in which we're just going to make sure everything is a little bit more polished before we head into camera. It's important that um, when we start playing around with the camera, everything looks decent, decent enough for you to position it uh, properly for the final product. So we're not done yet with the player section, but we will be soon enough. And I'll see you guys in the next one. So welcome to what is going to be the final episode of the player section, um, in which we're actually going to uh, to do a little bit of polishing. We're going to be correcting some prefabs so they look a lot better on the camera. And when we do play, um, well, it, it just looks better. So if we press on play now, you're going to realize that we have a couple of issues. First, we see the blue over here. So we see the skybox. Definitely not something we want. Um, we see items popping up so that we can fix at the same time. Um, what else? We have these very, very huge prefab that, you know, they don't really work properly in terms of what we see versus what they are. So we're going to be scaling them down and also doing a bunch of little changes on the slopes. So um, yes, we've already made our gameplay prefab, but do know that we made prefabs out of the prefab we were using. So if we head in the, in the folder over here, you'll find out that yes, scene chunks, here they are, and the gameplay chunk, here they are, but we can actually scale this down individually because that's also a, a prefab. So I'm going to open up the, um, the blocker prefab, this one, and I'm actually going to just scale it down on all the axes and just save. Now with that in mind, uh, it should have been reflected in pretty much every single thing that we have. So including here. Now, the next thing I'll do is I'll fix the slope over here. So it matches the item a little bit better. And also it goes at the exact same height as this one. So if I was to just take this and maybe put the pivot point on the local axis and just move it up. Let's see, is that on the same level as the other? Uh, maybe a little bit more this way. So just play around with the prefab a bit. And do know that it's on 45 degree angle. And what I'll be doing now is I'll head over to my player, just right here. Here you'll be able to see that the slope limit is 45. So that makes it very, very clutch. I'm going to up it to 50. So when I run into that, I never get stuck. And as you can see, it's a little bit smoother here. Now I've done the changes, but not on this one. Um, I might want to go and actually add um, some changes on this prefab as well. So let me just see if they are looking similar. Here it is. And this one, this one seems to be okay. Maybe I want to up it just a tiny bit like so. 
and this is in the ground. Next up, we're going to head over to our world generation and over on the scene generation, um, we saw that five of them is not enough. So as soon as we start running, you can see that it, we, we see more than one. So obviously we'll need a little bit more. So maybe up that to seven or eight. I'm going to go with eight because they're quite small right now. Um, make sure you change that while you're not in the play mode. And this problem should already be fixed. So, okay, so this problem is done, but we can still see it a, a little bit sometime. If I jump too high, like around here, sometime you'll be able to see the blue and you see it on the left hand side. Um, everything that has to do with that, we will fix in, in um, I believe it would be the second or the next video. Simply because what I'd like to do is make sure I change all my floor. I get rid of all the plane and I just create one big plane. But that's something we'll do in a in a different um, integration, actually, than in the next one. But until then, we're going to keep on fixing um, some of the issues. And right here, I believe that we could go ahead and play with the lighting and make our game look a lot better, as you can tell, by just shifting the light toward this direction to um, whatever you like. So actually, what I'm doing right now is I'm changing it in the play mode. But I am just looking at what is good. And then once I have it, I'll copy those value like this. I, I actually like this quite a lot here. So I'll grab my transform on my directional light, copy my component, stop, and then paste my component value. And we'll end up with something like this. Now, most likely, we're going to have to um, relight this little section here and make it look uh, better and maybe add a different light here. But for the moment, let's just focus on the gameplay. And already here, it looks a lot better. If we have a try here on these, um, let's see if this looks a little better. So yeah, obviously, if you hit this, you die. And then if you slide down, we actually don't fit. So mm, okay, that collider is going to need to be a, a, tad, um, a tad smaller. Yeah, it's very, very clutch. So. Um, let's head back and actually just up this a tiny bit. It's really important that you actually test those out as well. Yeah. So here it is. We're just going to up and we should be good to go. Yep. Yeah, so we can get beneath them without any problem. One last thing that we have to do in this video. And um, it's going to be preparation work for once we have uh, def logic, but at the moment we don't have any def logic. Uh, it's going to be preparation work for the next part, um, which has to do with putting colliders, def colliders, so thing that will actually hurt you. So if I head over to this block, or any block for that matter, um, I need to know in which direction they are being spawned right now. So let's um, let's see on a gameplay chunk. It looks like it's being spawned in this manner. And um, so if you see here, the pivot point is on the right hand side and on the opposite is where it's actually being spawned. So with that in mind, I'm going to head over to this block. Know that this side over here is where um, or that's the actual front. I'm going to create a new collider beneath this object. So empty game object, maybe a cube for now, and then we'll remove the mesh. Just put it in front and scale it the way I wish. And that's going to be a zone that will kill you. So let's make sure it looks somewhat um, the proper size. So maybe something like this. And if you run into this, you are going to, to die. So <laughs> here it is. Now, um, one thing that's going to be very important is to put this on a different layer, a different collision layer. And right now I'll leave the mesh, but do note that we're going to turn it off and it's just going to be a bounding box at one point. Um, so as I've just mentioned, on the right hand side over here at the top right, you'll be able to find no layer regarding depth. So let's create a new one. Go under add layer. I'll add one, call it depth. And we will put this one on the depth layer. Okay. So now all my block should have this in front of it. Yeah. And as you can see, you're not going to hit it if you just fall in this. And actually, you go so fast that you never really fall in this anyway. Um, and here, however, if you run to this one, you are going to die. So be aware of that. Next up, let's see, where else do we need a death collider? We don't need anything that kills you here. We, however, need something on the rock. 
and the rock as a whole could be a def collider. So here I'll just put that on def. Next up, we have the log. So that's the same thing as the first one. Actually, I'll just grab this one here and put it like so. And position it roughly to where it should be, so where it should actually kill you. So something like this. Yeah, OK, good. Um, now that we have this, I think we have everything. Oh, we're missing one, the blocker here. This whole thing should be a dev collider. So if you're hitting these border, you should die. And also, if you're hitting this one, you should also die. All right, so we have that in store. I'm going to go ahead and remove the last two, uh, the last two meshes on this one. Just turn them off. I'm actually not going to remove them completely in case we need to modify in the future. And they should now exist. Awesome. All right, so this should be it for this episode within the, um, the player section. In the next one, uh, because we're going to have one more, we're actually going to make a floor that follows us so we can start removing it around from um, our prefab and we can have one floor, just one plane that is 10 by 10 and um, scale it up, have a different offset, have a different sampling size on our texture and make sure it covers the whole ground. All right, so I'll see you in the next one. Okay, so previously we played around with the prefabs, making sure that they are, um, they are ready for a game, that they're a little bit better to go over in case it's a slope. And, uh, and we played with the lighting a little bit. What we'd like to do in this final, the real final episode of the player section is have the floor follow the player. And that is so we can clean up the rest of our prefabs and we can remove the floor. Um, and also make sure we don't spawn a bunch of these because they're quite expensive, actually. So what we're going to be doing now is, um, first up, we will grab the floor out of the level. We'll grab the floor and we'll just put him outside of everything. And I'll call it snow floor. Um, what we're going to do is remove the mesh collider because we have a we have a mesh that has a little bit more of a vertices than it should. Uh, as you can see here, it's overlapping. Uh, we're actually going to remove that and uh, do note that those are important. We we don't want to just go grab a um, we don't want to just make a, a four vertices plane in our case because we have to bend it with this shader. So it's important that it has a little bit more vertices than um than a four vertex corner plane. So yeah, that being said, we are going to go ahead and just remove the mesh collider. That is, however, not needed. We can use a box collider instead, which is um, a little bit less expensive on the CPU. Now with this snow floor, I'm also going to create a script called the exact same thing, so snow floor. And the logic around it is going to be quite simple. So here it is. I'm just going to drag it under, I believe it could be under world generation. And we are going to edit the script. Now, here is what we're going to need. So let's get rid of everything at the top. Make sure we have a couple of reference. Those references will be two serialized field. One of them is going to be a private transform. That is going to be the ground itself. And also another one that is going to be the material. So material. In a private void update, so every single frame I'll actually use the ground. Oh, my bad. I'm actually, I meant to say here the player and not the ground. So I'll be grabbing a transform, the transform of the player to know where he is. And then I'll be placing uh, my floor beneath him. And now we're going to be setting the position of the floor. So the floor is just transform. And our transform the position as a floor is going to be equal to the, it's going to be equal to the player Z. But we want to stay on the Y axis zero and also on the X axis zero. So what you could do is, Either do a new vector and then zero zero and then player dot transform position, or you could just say, if you don't want to have to write the new keyword, you can say vector three dot forward times position dot c like so. Now, if we're to play this, this is the behavior we're going to see. Unassigned reference. Okay, well that's not a good start, <laughs> but. Um, let's go ahead and um, add the material in there. The transform is going to be the penguin transform, like so. 
Now you'll see that we're moving along with our floor and it's right beneath us. It looks awful, but that's only because um, obviously there is still a lot of other planes around. So it's time for us to go and clean up those planes here under the first chunk. I'll remove this and I'll remove the second one. Hit save, second chunk, same thing. Hit save and then the scenery chunks. Oh, I did have, um, I believe I did have the mesh collider here. Were they any useful? I don't believe so. We had other colliders. Um, I believe we had other colliders. Yep, here they are. So left plane, right plane, gone. Same thing here. Okay, now let's play this again. All right, looking a lot worse than it used to, but as you can see here, as I'm moving, um, at least it's staying in the middle uh, on the x-axis, and also the behavior we're looking for is actually is actually working just just fine. Um, what we'll need to do next is make sure we scale this one up, so it's going to be important that it actually covers the whole screen. So I'll go back on my snow floor and I'll make it say 20, 20, 20. Okay, as you can see, obviously there is some issues with the shader, <laughs> but um, we're getting there slowly. What if we make it 10, 10, 10? So 10 on all axes makes it a little bit, um, it, it doesn't it doesn't work with 10 on the, all the axes uh, because it's a little bit short, but at the same time, as you can see, it it's, looks like it's still eating a little bit of the model. So what we would need to do, so what we could do here is uh, make a collage of four different floors. And that's a weird way to put it, but let's actually give it a try. So here, snow floor would actually be um, the parent object. And on the parent object, I'm going to make three children. So one, two, three, four, two, four. This one, I'll get rid on the parent, I'll get rid of the mesh render and I will get rid of, of nothing actually. So only get rid of the mesh render, then put the other snow floor beneath him. Under this, we can um, remove the collider and also remove the snow floor. So on all of them, no collider and also no snow floor. And let's move them around a tad bit. So um, I'll go back and I'll put that on 111 so I can edit better. But here, how it is going to look like. First floor is going to be right about there. So minus five, five. Second is going to be five, five, minus five, minus five. And this one is five, minus five. So I hope you understand that the only reason I did that is so I could get more vertices. So a tad more vertices to play around with when I do scale this one up. So now if I go back to game and I am to scale this to 10, 10, 10, we should not have the same behavior as we just did. So um, it's going to be a, a tad easier first to see the end of it. And second, um, it should not eat as much as the model if we just go a little bit further than it, it did before. And it also allows us to scale it down. So let's see. 7.5 seems to work for me. Yep. And even when I jump, I don't see. Any glitches, any visual glitches? What if I do 666? The smaller you go, the better it's going to be uh, with the shader because you're going to have more vertices in a smaller, uh, in a smaller region. Okay, so this actually works fine with me. And now what we'll be doing next is uh, make sure that the, the texture on the floor, it doesn't stick with us. It actually looks like it's moving and that's a very fun part to do. So what we have to do next is actually uh, tile the material with the shader we've made. So with that in mind, let me scale that back to 666, even maybe 555 or 5.5. 5. Yeah, even that seems to be where, oh, no, never mind. <laughs> I saw the, I saw the skybox. So back on 666. Now we had a second property on this material that is uh, the snow, snow material right here. And this is where we're actually gonna have to play around with um, the tiling that we've made in the past. So, so now what we have to do is play around with the tiling until this looks good. And let's see, maybe 
15, 15 or 20 seems to be um, the proper size. So if we do 15, it looks something like this. And that's already a lot better than it used to be. So I'm going to leave that on 15. Next up is the following. As the game is running, as my player is progressing, we're going to have to play around with the material setting and make sure that the offset actually moves with us. So as you can see here, we have to move this in a certain axis. Now, um, something that I don't seem um, to have done here is separate those axes. So maybe we'll have to go back in the shader and just make sure we're moving on the Y axis and not the, the, not the X, because right now, as I'm moving the offset, it goes in diagonal, so it goes like this. So from bottom left to top right. Instead, I just like to increase it in a linear manner on the Y axis. So first, yeah, first, let's go ahead and split this under, under the shader. Now it's something we can do simply because we we made this shader, so let's go ahead and double click on main. That was the name of the shader. If you can't find it, it's beneath the rendering folder. And we were to change the offset right here. In this box, we used to send only one parameter, so one float that would go in both of the offset. Even though this was a um, this was a vector two, we sent it only one number, and it just reproduced itself under the two component of it. So right here, under my blackboard, I have the offset that is a vector one. And what I feel like doing is actually uh, deleting it completely and creating a offset with a vector two instead. So offset, um, but this time it is a vector two. So if I am to drag it here, I can now put it under here and it should, it should be a tad different what they give us under the inspector settings. So let me save this. No issue has been found. Let's open this one up. And now we have a actually a vector four. How come the, is this a vector four now? Okay, it says vector two, but it's giving me a vector four. Either way, we have what we need here. Um, as we change Z and W, nothing happens, but X and Y, uh, we get to have those changes. So maybe that's a bug on my end. I'm not sure. Either way, um, as we run forward, we're going to have to reduce the offset of Y continuously until the, the game is actually done. So let's give this a try. We are going to head back to our script. And right here, um, we are going to do the, the following. So we're going to call the material and say set property, I believe, or set float. Hmm. Set vector, maybe? Yeah, so set vector. This one is called offset, and the value is going to be something um, something that has to do with the player position in the z-axis. So I believe we could try um, a new vector two. X is always going to be zero, and here let's put temporarily let's put minus the transform position dot z. See what this gives us. Now, if I am to hit play. We are not getting the behavior expected whatsoever, so I'm wondering why this is the case. Uh, set vector offset. Let's see, how do we call this one? Yeah, so it is called offset. It is exposed. Maybe the reference here is what we're looking for and not that name. It can happen that this is it. Yeah, I believe this is it. So let me grab the reference, see if that's the problem. Now, if that's issue, we can rename it. No problem. OK, that was definitely the problem. So as you can see here now. Um, all right. So as you can see here, um, I'm clearly going way too fast. But um, this is the reference we need to, to, to change. This is the name of the offset. So what, let me just rename that to offset itself. Um, oh, and what's the problem here? OK, uh, let's call it something else. Snow offset. It seems to cause a lot of issue with the rest of the scripts. And that's what we're going to be calling it. Now, in terms of the um, hmm, in terms of the speed at which this should go, now that we know that we're moving in the right direction and this is uh, this is a dynamic field that will change eventually, uh, as long as we go forward, this is going to change. So this is going to be our dynamic value. 
Uh, now we would need to multiply it with a certain constant that has to do with um, the sizing of our texture and also um, how big we scaled this, uh, the, these, these objects. So this floor here is, for example, this one is six. And then beneath it, uh, these are all six. So technically, we should consider that th those are all six in scale. And then there's the number 15 here for the tiling purpose. Um, so I'm not quite sure how we're going to do these, Matt. Let's, let's see what makes sense. So if we're to do, no, that doesn't make sense. Um, what I'm going to do is actually make this a public value and we're going to play around with it at runtime. So public float, uh, offset speed. And for the moment, let's put 0 0.2, see what this gives us. So if I am to run this and I, I go on my snow floor, I see this one looks already a lot better, but we're still moving a little bit forward uh, too fast. So which means we would have to increment, I believe. So on 0 0.25, it actually looks good. On 0 0.25, it, it doesn't look like it's moving whatsoever. And that's the behavior we're looking for. So it must not look like it's moving. Unless you like that effect, really. Um, I believe you could say that you're like falling down a avalanche. So really, the value that works for me really well was 0 0.25. And then it just looks like it's, it's right there. It's staked on the floor. So I'm going to go ahead and do 0 0.25. To make sure I don't lose this value, I'll also change it here in my script as well. Uh, but make sure it is reflected under here, under the inspector. So um, this pretty much concludes this episode. What we really had to do is make sure we had one big floor that every time we look around, um, looks like we have infinite floor. And instead of having a couple of planes, so a lot of different planes, now we only have four and they're going to persist for the rest of the game. And if we actually run into a wall, the scrolling is going to stop. So as you can see, it doesn't look like it's moving. And that's the behavior we're looking for. And uh, that's it. So um, thank you so much for watching this section. In the next one, we're going to start playing with the game flow. So we're going to have some logic in there that makes it so uh, you can actually die. You can have different camera angle. You can um, respawn. And maybe I believe we're going to be tackling a little bit of, uh, of the whole flow of the application. So we're going to have a dev screen. And then maybe the response state is going to be in there as well. Uh, that being said, I'll see you guys there. Cheers. Hi, guys. Welcome back. We're now entering the game flow section of this course in which we're going to be tackling a couple of things. First, um, the cameras. So moving cameras in between different state of the game. That's also going to be a big concept. Uh, one of the big reasons why we're having this right after the player is because we're going to have a very similar system driving our game. So another very, very small this time, a state machine that is very small, but it's going to tackle a couple of things. So I'll, I'll give you an example. There is a state where we're playing the game right now, but there's also a state where we're idle at the beginning of the game, where you get to choose um, if you want to, to start playing or go to the shop. There's going to be a state for the shop. There's going to be a state for when you're dead. All this kind of good stuff. So um, going forward, we're going to try and make the video as small as possible because they are. there's not going to be so much content, but everything that we do is going to be um, compounding. So it's going to be something that you must not miss and you got to be very careful. So what I'll attempt to do, and I do invite you to check as well, is every time we do a change towards the end of the video, we're always going to be testing the game. And if you're not getting the same behavior as I do, it might be worth rewatching a short video. Now, that being said, most of the work we're going to be doing in this section is going to be in the same folder for scripting. So if we head over to scripting, we're going to create a new folder and call it game flow. Oops, there we go. Um, and we can go ahead and right, right click create the first script, which is going to be a game manager. Now do know that once we, uh, we create a game manager, you're going to see a different icon. This is a .cs script, a normal script, just like all the other script we've made. But it's something that is built in the engine in Unity that when you call a script game manager, it's going to end up having this little gear here. Don't worry so much about it. There's no change. It's the exact same thing as before. It's just known practice that, you know, sometime you have a script that is called Game Manager. And it's a neat little addition to see that, you know, this is kind of a, a recurring thing. So um, it's recurring so often in so different, so many different games that they just made an override for that icon, which is a neat little touch. 
Um, and beneath that, that folder, I'll create another folder called state, or you can call it game state. And I'm going to create another .cs script and call it game state as well. So we have two new scripts. One of them is called the game manager and the other one is the game state. I'm going to start with the game state. We're going to go and lay down um, a state machine just like we've did for a player. So something very simple that has three things, construct, destruct, and also some sort of transition. So let's try to do it quickly. I'm going to remove these two at the top. This is going to be a abstract class. So you can't just spawn it on its own. And it's going to have a public virtual void construct. I'll copy this over. It's also going to have a destruct and also a update. So destruct. And we called it transition for um, the previous one here. I'll just call it update state. So it's something that's going to be called every single frame. And then at the top here, I'll do a private void awake and we'll get a reference to our game manager. So the person who's going to be controlling the state in this case, or the whole state machine is going to be the game manager itself. So do remember here on our player, it's the player motor that has a reference to the base state. On, on um, actually for the game states, it's going to be the game manager that has a reference to these. And we'll, it will do a two-way reference here. So if I go to the top, I'm going to create a protected game manager, call it the brain or, um, yeah, call it brain actually. Yeah, it looks quite cool. <laughs> and I'll say brain is equal to get component type of game manager. Okay. Now with that in mind, we can close this one off. We're actually done with this script for pretty much forever because it's the, uh, it's the base script. So I'll close this off and I'll actually go and create a new object in my scene call it the game manager. Maybe you want to give it a certain color as well. So maybe you're a yellow like so. And I'll add the game manager script to it, just like so. And that's where we're going to leave thing for now. Um, I just want you to guys to understand that we are starting another state machine pattern in another object that is very similar to what we've done, but this time it's going to be controlling the state of the whole game. Um, we used to control in the movement. Now we control the state of the game. Do note that a state machine could be used to control the behavior of a certain boss uh, with some logic behind it. Um, it. It could be used in a lot of different contexts. And here we'll be using to wrap our whole application around it. So I'll see you in the next one in which we're going to start coding our very first game state. In this video, we're going to be tackling our very first state for the game. The video is actually going to be a bit longer than the rest of the other states, simply because we have to lay down the groundwork on the game manager to switch in between state and also to make sure we can call it from um, different places. So we are actually going to start this off not by creating the state, but by opening up the game manager and laying down some of the code. So as always, let's start by cleaning this one up. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be creating some sort of singleton, just like we've done with a couple of other scripts. I don't have one open right now, um, but it's the private instance and also the public uh, static instance. So I'll do a public static game manager called it instance with a getter that returns instance, but not with a, a uh, not with a capital. Instead. It's going to be with a small letter that is going to be defined right here, like so. Now, here's a quick reminder that um, we put a get here, but not a set, simply because we'd like people to be able to access this instance, but not to set it. Setting it is going to be something that will done will be done um, internally right here through a awake call, actually. So private void awake instance is going to be equal to this. Now, another reference we'll need here is a game state, just like we've defined in the last episode. And we'll call this one state. Doesn't have to be more complex than that. Um, what else do we need here? We don't actually need much. We're going to need a private void update to constantly change the state. Or actually, not change, but um, update it. So update state. And a public void change state, which will, of course, take in a game state S in this case. In which we're going to do the exact same thing we've done in the player motor. So if you guys remember, Destroy, 
set the new state, and then construct. Exact same thing here. And that's it. That's actually all we needed in our game manager. We'll come back uh, very shortly once we have our first state, because we need to define a default one. But at the moment, that's not the case. We don't have one for that. So let's close this one off. We're going to head over to our game state folder and declare the very first state. So um, let's call it game state initialize or init. I'll have this one open right now, and here it is. Let's make sure we inherit from game state, and that is where we can do our overrides. But of course, only if those overrides are needed. Now, there ain't much um, that we have to do here at the moment because the behavior we have in the game um, have it so we start running right away uh, with our player. We'd like to actually change this behavior completely. We don't want this to happen anymore. We need to make sure that the player doesn't start running right away, that our player is not active, he's in a idle state instead. So some of the logic we'll have to do is actually going to be over on the player motor. So we have some, some uh, refactoring to do, basically. So in the meantime, something we can do is the following. We can override the update. And it's not going to be like that forever, but for the moment, let's override the update and say if input, uh, let's use our input manager. So if input manager instance swipe, or let's just say tap, if we tap, let's go ahead and call our brain and do a change state and go to something else that we don't have just yet. So um, that state is going to be something like get component type of game state um, game, maybe. So actually running the game and playing the runner game. Um, that is obviously something we don't have at the moment. So let's go ahead and comment this out. But do know that we're going to come back very shortly to this because we'll need to find a way to enter the game. Um, that being said, let's anchor this one. And our next step is going to make sure that our player does not start running anymore. How should we tackle this problem? Well, I believe we should go over to our player controller player motor actually, and open this one up. And where do we start running exactly? Well, initially, we start running because we are in a running state. In the player motor script, we're going to add a boolean that just says, hey, are we paused or are we not? Um, there will be multiple instances in which our player should not be moving. Assuming we press on the pause button in case there's one, in that case, you don't want to be moving ahead. You don't want to be moving forward. If our player is dead, he should not be moving forward. If we're popped up in a certain menu for some reason, we don't want to be moving forward. And also, if the game hasn't start, we don't want to be moving forward. So we can create a new Boolean um, under the player motor that I just called is pause. And by default, I'd like to set this one to true. Maybe we should do that in the start, actually. So in my start, is pause is going to be equal to true. Now, I'll actually go under the update and block everything. So if we are not paused, so if not paused, then we're going to update the motor. Otherwise, let's not update, which is going to make sure that um, in case we are paused, then we are not going to update. Now, with this new logic in there, when I press play, technically, we should not be able to move anymore. And that's the case. We're not moving. However, we're getting no reference exception. And I believe that is because, let's double click on it, um, we have no state. And we're trying to update the state. So that's a normal thing. Let's head over to the game manager. Make sure we put our new game state initialized on here. I'll open this one up again, the game manager. And I'll assign this one to, um, to a default state. So here, state is going to be equal to get component type of game state init. And it's also, as a good practice, construct this state. Now we should have a reference, and we will not get this error anymore. And also, good news, our player should not be able to move. And the cool thing is, since we're not moving, our speed is on zero, which means our player is going to play this default animation, which, uh, which just makes it look good. <laughs> he just looks cool now. Now the next step has to do with the game state initialize moving over to game state game. Um, if you guys remember here, we created a couple of 
line of code here that we're not using just yet because we don't have a game state game. Um, but in the next video, we're going to be creating one and we're going to make sure this transition happens because our game game state initialized right now, it really doesn't do anything, which is, you know, when, when the game is initialized, we're going to have a couple of buttons to play around with, but there ain't much that needs to happen here. So that's totally fine. So in the next one, we'll go ahead and we'll code the game state game and we can start the transition in between the two. So I'll see you guys there. In this video, we're going to be creating a simple game state that will launch the player into the game. So to do this, it's going to be fairly simple. We're going to right click on the folder and create a new state once more. This one is going to be called game state game, which is obviously um, the weirdest name for a script we're going to have in the whole course. So just please bear with me <laughs> as, uh, as we create it. It's going to be fairly simple. So game state it actually game state game is going to inherit from game state. And what we have to do here in the previous episode, we had our game state initialized that swapped over from initialize to game state game. Um, now that this one exists, what I'll do is I'll just comment this one out so it can actually run. That being said, what do we do in game state game? Well, we have a player that is uh, currently paused. And we need to make sure this one is enabled so he can start running as soon as this one is created, which means not created, sorry, but swapped over to. So uh, we'll have to override the construct in this case. This, however, puts us in a weird place because we don't really know how to access the player for here. And uh, we don't want to use the find object type of player motor because that's just, eh, that's not so cool. Um, so I'd like to get a reference to my player that lives a little bit longer than, than just this scope actually. So what I have a feeling we'll be doing is keeping a reference to the player since we only have one inside of the game manager that we'll be able to call from anywhere really. So under here, under the game manager, I'll go ahead and I'll create myself a couple of public field and by couple, I mean only one actually, <laughs> player motor and get the reference to the player motor. Um, I'll actually set that manually through the inspector we could actually set it in the awake through a find object of type. We could grab a reference in any other reason. Like you could grab a uh, find object with tag, tag player. There is a bunch of ways you can do that, get a reference. But you know what? I'll go with the good old drag and drop. So on my game manager, taking the penguin, putting it right here. Since I'm here, I'm also going to drag the game state game. So we don't have that no reference a little bit later on. That being said, now that I have access to this, I should be able to say game manager instance motor, which gives us access to, you guessed it, the player motor. And here I have a private Boolean that is paused and it is private. A um, couple of ways we could actually go and fix this. You could say that this is now public and access it directly from the script. Um, however, I'd like to keep this one hidden. Just for good practice, I like to leave that one in the scope and instead create a couple of properties, uh, not properties, but function down here that will have to do with pausing and unpausing the player. So pause player. And also another one for resume player. And I can just say is pause is going to be equal to false. And when I pause the player, is pause is going to be equal to true. Um, see, I am actually, I'm not going to be using pause player thus far, maybe later on. Actually, yes, I will be using it later on, but I'm still declaring them just in case that in the future I need to, to go through a certain loop. I never want to be assigning this value. I like to go through a function instead because chances are we'll do more than just one thing when we come here. For example, when we pause a player, maybe we want to disable a couple of colliders to keep the, the game running faster. Maybe we want to... Um, uh, hide and show some UI, there is a chance we want to do more than just setting a Boolean here. So that's why I, I left them inside of a, um, a function instead of just swapping over a Boolean, which um, leads me to do the following in game state game. Resume player like so. Once a game is constructed, actually once a game state game is constructed, I will now have access to a player that is not paused. So let's give this a try, right? The flow will go like this. First, the game is launched, and then the game manager will initialize itself with the game state in it. 
every single frame, we will be looking to update the state. Now remember, in game state init, we're looking for a tap. If a tap happens, we'll be changing um, the state to game state game. Once this one is constructed, the player will be unfrozen or resume. So let's try this out. See if our logic makes sense. So the game is generated. I'm going to press on my mouse click and then he starts running. So we have the behavior we want actually already. And that is where we're going to be ending this video. There's a couple of more states to do, but here is a very basic flow in between the two. And you know, um, when we're going to be done with the game flow section, we'll have an actual game. Right now, it's only going from one state to another and it's being stuck there. But the goal here is to make sure we have a flow in between the applications. So once we die, we then we can go back to the initialized state and go back to the game. In a single session, we'll be able to do a full circle. And that's really what we're looking for before the end of this section. So I'll see you in the next one. Cheers. Welcome back. In the last episode, we created the game state game, which was a very simple script. Um, now, today, we're going to be creating one that is going to be a little bit a little bit harder uh, because we're going to go in two different sections. We have to create the state in which the player dies. And for this, we will play with three different scripts. One for the game state, one for the player state, which we haven't created during the player section. And um, we have to go back also in the player motor to detect some collision. So three big scripts to play around with. And I think we're going to start with the player death state. So under the player motor, I will create a new C sharp script and call it the death state. So that's going to be everything movement related. And um, what I'll be doing is I'll just create the base script thus far, and we won't we won't do anything in there just yet. But let's just make sure we lay that down and it inherits from base state. That being said, it's now part of our namespace. I can call it and I can spawn it. Um, what I want to do is head over to the player motor and start detecting collision. Now, um, we're lucky because there is something called, I believe it is uh, the on controller collider hit. It's a function we have access to because we're using a character controller. It's, um, it's the following, so public void on character, actually on controller collider hit. And um, it's a function that's only available if you are using a character controller. That's something that Unity gives you. As soon as something hits that character controller, then we receive a data structure that is a controller collider hit. If you have a peek at it, it has uh, whoever it hit, I believe where it hit it, and a couple more information that's going to be very useful. So with this information, we'll be able to know if the thing we've hit is on the def layer. So I'll declare a string right here, call it hit layer name. And I'll call the layer mask um, static. I could call it, is it class, static class? Static struct, OK. So static structure, and I call layer to name here. And it basically takes in a int. It's actually returning you whatever uh, name is associated with certain index. So it's like a lookup to a certain index. Now, that index is stored within the hit. So it.layer, or game object.layer. And that's going to be the layer int um, of the object we are colliding with. So for example, if we're colliding with the def box, we're going to have a certain int. If that int um, matches what we have in the dictionary, then it's going to return def over here. So our string will say def. And from that point on, we can look up, hey, is that layer name def? If so, then the player needs to die. And that means the following. It means a change state for um, get component type of, do we have a def state? Yeah, we just created one. So def state, just like so. Um, and then I was thinking maybe about pausing the player, but I, I actually want to create a small animation when you die where you bounce back. And then we can tell our dev state to not process uh, going any further in front of you. So I believe that could be cool. Um, that being said, this code right here should put our player in a dev state. And to test it out, what we can do is head over to here. And for example, we can override um, process motion and just put a debug.log in here. 
death. It's quite dark, but let's give it a try. <laughs> so, technically, if our player hits a collider that has a death on it, we should enter the death state. Oh, and we got a no reference because obviously we created a new state, but we didn't apply it to our object, and it happens to me all the time. So I just made sure to drag and drop the dev state on top of him. Let's go here. And here we are stuck in the dev state, as you can see. And we can't we can't like go outside of it, we can't do anything because there is no transition within that state. But as you can see, it works well. Now the player should be stuck at that point. He should be stuck within his dev state. However, the game is not um, is not yet in a dev state. And here is what I would not like to do exactly. Um, I would not like to enter the dev state right away. So if we're entering that uh, the dev state, and I could say game manager instance, um, and I want to change it to, for example, uh, the dev state, which I believe you can do here a find object of type game state that def or I can just do I'll do it a little bit cleaner right so game manager instance uh, then get component could I just do it right here no okay instance that get component type of um, game state def which does not exist just yet I could do that right here and I'll leave it in comments because I'd like not to spawn a dev state right away. Um, I would assume that in the future, the dev state is going to create some sort of UI. It will pop up something that requires an action from the player. So maybe the UI will come down and it will ask you, hey, do you want to replay or do you want to go back to the menu? Something of the sort. Um, and if it happens at the exact same time as you die, it's going to be like, okay, you're hitting the wall and then you're triggered right now. Do you want to play again? Um, while this could be the behavior you'd like to have for your game, in, in mine, I'd like to wait just a little bit. I'd like to play some sort of animation, um, as I've mentioned, the bouncing back animation. And once that is completed, then we can enter the game state death. So I'll comment this one out. Um, remind me to create this. Actually, I will remind myself to create this. And instead, what I'll start playing around with, so what I'll be doing now is create some kind of... Um, I'll create some kind of animation with code. So it's not something that I'll go in the editor and I'll do it. Uh, it's something we'll be creating through mathematics. And it's going to be something based off a vector three that I'll call knockback force, which I'll constantly apply to my player. So that's going to be like the move vector. And I'd like this to uh, not move the player on the X axis. However, put him a little bit high in the air. So four in, in the Y, maybe that's the jump force and push him backward on the z-axis, so minus 3 in this case. With this in mind, um, I do have gravity. Gravity is on the motor itself, which I inherit, so that's going to be fine. What else could I do? Um, I think we're ready to start coding this animation. All we needed is this, really. So well, here's what I'll be doing. Um, hmm. We will declare a vector 3, just like we do. And I'm actually going to copy some code I have over for for example, from the running state. I'll copy that here. We start with a vector 3, 0. That's actually not fine with me. We actually like to start with the knockback force. And that knockback force, I will apply some maths to it every single frame. So I'll say knockback force is going to be equal to um, a new vector 3 every time. So we're always going to have zero here, so I'll leave zero. Then I'll use whatever value we had in the pass minus some sort of gravity. So minus equal motor.gravity times time dot delta time. That's for the y component. You can split this in, in different lines if you wish. Uh, that's going to be a little bit easier to understand. Um, so that's the x component. Doesn't change. Y component, it's whatever force we define here minus the gravity every single frame. And then for the Z, what could we do for the Z? We could up that by the velocity, maybe? So something like that. So uh, I'll, I'll just use a constant right now. So 2F times time that delta time. And do we need to do anything? I don't think we're going to need to do anything here. Uh, we can just return the knockback. Or actually, we're going to need to do something here. We're going to have to make sure that the knockback force 
um, here, I gain speed on the Z axis. Initially, my speed is minus three, and then I gain speed. I want to make sure that this does not go past one. So we start in negative, and we want to stay negative until we hit zero. So here's what we'll do. If our knockback force dot Z goes beyond the zero, I want to make sure that my knockback force is clamped. So I'll say knockback force dot Z is going to be equal to zero. And then from that point on, once that happens, then I can put this line of code here. Because only then, only when this is done, this animation is done, we can change state and go to the game state def, which does not exist just yet. So let's leave it in comment, but that's where it's going to be. OK, this was a lot of code, a lot of maths, a lot of theory. Let's hope that everything works perfectly on the first try. And it's not bad. Um, I did expect the player to go up in the and up in the air, but it really didn't. And as you can see, my knockback force here is going crazy. It's going and incrementing quite fast. So maybe I I want to make sure that this does not happen. And I have a feeling that the problem came from these default value here. I had some default value four minus three minus three in place. That's not what I want. I want zero four and minus three. So. Maybe that came from um, the inspector causing the issue. So let's give this a second look. There you go. That's much better. And that's actually what I wanted to, to see. Um, and if you want to give it a try, just play around with the numbers. Have a look with this formula. I'm going to put 15 here. So our player is going to jump really high in the air as he hits this. Obviously not so realistic, but it does give it a certain style. So play around with this value. Um, if you want to be pushed back a lot further, you can also increment the minus 3. For example, minus 6. And he's eventually going to stop and sit there. Um, I think we're missing, we're not missing much to make this happen. We're missing a animation and we do have access to one animation and it's called the death animation. So let's head back in the construct call the motor dot anim and we'd like to always put that question mark here in case we don't have a reference to the anim um, and set that trigger to i believe which is def with a capital t like so okay with that in mind we are going to launch this once more and there we go this looks a lot better so this makes a lot of sense um, of course, the only issue we have here is the fact that we're dead and really nothing happens from this point on. We can't transition out. And I believe that's a good that's a good way to put it. So if you cannot transition outside of death, um, we should be able to control it from somewhere else. And that is where this line of code comes in. We need to tell the game to do something. So the game state needs to change. And that is where we are finally going to create that game state death. And to the game state folder, Finally, that's what we're here for in the first place, and create the game state def. And now our code here works. Well, except the fact that it still does not inherit from game state. So let's go here, put it, um, and now it works. OK, as always, we'd like to clean up everything. And now from the game state def, we'd like to control a couple of things, and those thing will be the following. Um, entering another game session, replaying the game from where we are at right now in case the player decides to watch an ad or something of the sort, and uh, maybe just going back to uh, the menu. So three things, either replay the game, um, replay the game from the same point you're on, and uh, go back to the menu. And all these things can be controlled within the game state def. Now, for the moment, the only thing we can really do, because we don't have any UI we can click on, um, we can use a couple of things. We can override the um, the update state and just put some stuff in regard to our inputs right here. So I can say input manager instance tap. If we decide to tap, then what could we do when we tap? Um, should we start over from where we at? Or should we go to the menu? Here's what we'll do. If we swipe down, we will go back to the menu and that's going to be public 
function I'll call here. So I'll just call it to menu. So if we swipe down, we're going to call it to menu. And if we swipe up, swipe up, we're going to replay the game, I believe. Now we just have to find a way to go to these uh, without any issue. So um, we could do the following. So if we do a resume game, we need to respawn the player where it was initially. And for that, we can have access to the game manager instance motor respawn player. We have resume player. Let's call respawn player, which is going to be a new function we'll have to lay down within the motor. And will we need anything else? Um, yeah, we'll need to change the state of the game back to game. So brain change state to get component type of game state game, like so. Now, once we go to the menu, um, upon going to the menu, what we'll need is to set the game state to initialize. So game state initialize and let's see what else will we need i don't think we'll need anything else actually just changing it uh, will trigger enough action that will put us back on the other state okay so i believe everything here is is perfect we are going to need to respond the player however so put the player back in a certain state which we can do by going and implementing the respawn player function So upon respawning the player, this is where I'm going to be uh, wanting the player to change its state to uh, game component type of the respawn state, which unfortunately does not exist just yet. So it's another one of these where uh, we're going to have to code it because we didn't do it in the player motor. And now I was debating whether or not I should be doing it in the same video, and I believe that we should because it's all related to the uh, to the dev state. So. Uh, let's actually go ahead and head over to our player once more, create a new state for him, and that new state is going to be the final one called the respawn state. And once more, it will, of course, inherit from base state, and it would have a couple of logic in here. Um, the goal of this state is to make sure that we spawn the player very high in the air. And the reason for that is um, if we spawn him at the bottom because he ran into a wall, He's just going to run into the same wall immediately if we put him back exactly where he was. So it's going to be important for it to not be exactly there. Now, as far as the respawn player state goes, it's something we'll be implementing in the next video. But right now, I'd just like to see if it works. So I'll just go ahead and say respawn. Um, the reason I'll be doing it in the a, in a next video is simply because it's going to be quite a, a topic as well. Uh, maybe a three or four minute video on its own, simply because we'll need a new player state. Just like we needed a new player state for dying in this one, uh, we'll need a new player state for respawning. The goal behind it is that we spawn somewhere else than where we died for the sole purpose that if we spawn in the same place, we just can die again. Um, so let's give this a try. If I hit the wall, I'm now in a dev state for the game as well. And as you can see here, we have issues, most likely because I'm missing a couple of things. So. Uh, first, on the game manager, I'm missing the game state def. That was that seemed to be the first problem. And second, it feels like I had a null reference here as well. Oh yeah, uh, it's the same thing. So as I was changing the state, um, I did not find anything for game state def. So I did have a null reference there as well. Now if I give this one more try, and we run to the wall. Upon dying here, I'll have two options. Either I swipe up for respawning, so swipe up, it's going to say respawn, and then I shouldn't be able to do anything really. Oh, actually, I can spam respawn, so something is not right here. This is being called, but then the change state um, does not seem to occur because I am not changing state. I'm still calling the private void update state here. So what could be the issue? Let me check. I have a feeling that I know what's happening. So it feels like um, I'm going back inside of the game state game and then I get stuck in the loop because the player keeps hitting the same object. It puts me back in, in the, the game state death loop all the time. So if I was to take this guess, uh, it means that if I override the, uh, the construct, I should get spam 
by the construct and that is not a good thing so I'll just say def construct oh and I'm not getting unity engine here so let me just make sure we have it there we go so sorry to enter this debug session but it's something I have to do here um, so this is being called every single frame which means that I'll do a control search on game say def and I'll find out where we call it. We call it over here. Our player in a dev state constantly ask this person to just um, to go over here and, and change the state. So something that I feel like doing here is once we enter the game state def, then at that point we can pause the player. So here on the game state def construct here, I will say, um, let's have a reference to the player. How should we do that? We have one on the game manager, I believe, so motor. And here we can pause the player. Or maybe we can even create another function that does that, but uh, I'm player def maybe, but pause player will do it quite well. And I think that's gonna be fixing our issue we have here. Let's give this a try. If not, I will look stupid, so it better work. Okay, so, we're not being spam anymore because I removed the debug.log, but let's give this a try. If I swipe up, I get respawned, and then I'm going to clear this and try to swipe up again. Okay, so I'm still being respawned, which means I'm still in that state. <laughs> so I came back and I put another dev construct in there. See, uh, see if this actually works, yeah. Um, what I have in mind here is uh, I'm just going to go back and see what happened. Dev construct is only called once. But, oh, see here, I respawn, and then I'm put back in dev construct. So what happened is when I respawn, I feel like um, upon respawning, let's see, we, we, um, we resume the player, so let's see. This happened, that's totally fine. Okay, and then game state game starts over again. And from that point on, our player is resumed. Okay, so that's totally on my back. It's actually intended behavior, so that's good to know. <laughs> um, but do do remember that once we resume the game uh, later on, we will spawn far up in the hair, and that will not happen. But okay, so this part works well. Now the swipe down and going to menu. If I am to clear my log and do a swipe down, technically I should be in the menu state, and then if I tap, yep, dev construct because I respawn again. So both here, they work well. And just to show that they work well, um, I'm gonna go here on the swipe down when it goes to menu, game state init, I'll go here, oops, wrong button. And upon creating that state, which of course we'll build on later, um, I'll do a debug.log. And you know what? Something I could have done even before that, <laughs> on the base state, on all the construct for every single state that is game state, for the moment, I'll just put a debug.log and say something of the sort. Constructing, constructing, can't type English, this.name. And with that in mind, it means that every time I call construct, unless I overwrite it here, just like I do, um, say over here, it's going to say constructing that state. And just for the purpose of this, I'll call the base constructor here. Okay. All right, back in our loop, final test before we head on to the next video. Sorry, this was a long one. We constructing, oh, when we're constructing the game manager. Okay, small typo, my bad. Let's fix this quickly. <laughs> this two string, I believe is what we needed here because we'd like to get this. This is actually, the class and not the game object. When I just do this.name, it gets the name of the game object, which in this case is the game manager, but I like to get this, this being the class while I'm calling it within the class. So constructing game manager game state initialize here. If I press on tap, technically I should have called um, game state game, but I believe we're also overriding it. So yeah, over here we override game state uh, game. So we could go and say base.construct and give this our final try for real this time. Game state initialize, we start game state game, we die, game state def, we try to respawn, we enter game state game, but then right away we're put in def. 
that's totally fine. And here we go down, we're in the menu, so everything should be stall. And then we tap, enter game, into death, because of course, uh, well, we're on the floor. <laughs> so our behavior works just fine, it just doesn't look good thus far. Um, and, and that's something we'll fix very, very shortly. But we have a full loop, a full circle happening. Uh, logic just isn't in there yet, but um, bear with me because in the next one, we will implement the respawn logic and also the respawn uh, state. So after that, it's going to look a lot better. And then we can start maybe inputting some of the cameras, which is going to give it a whole new feel. But guys, I'll see you in the next one. Cheers. Hey guys, last time we left off, we were in the middle of creating a state for when the player is being respawned. At the moment, we had a behavior in which every time we would go and die, we would try and restart the game um, to the point where it was, but then we never reset the player position and we never put him in the air and he would just end up dying again. So today we're going to be creating that state, a special state that would only happen when you decide to respawn the player. So let's head over to the state folder, create a new C sharp, and it's going to be a respawn state. Um, this one is going to have a couple of mathematics in there, and I believe it's also going to have uh, some kind of hot fix because we're going to run, uh, we're going to do a workaround some bug that is in the Unity engine as this version goes. So we're currently in 19.1, I believe, and it hasn't been fixed in 2020, as far as I can recall. So that being said, we are going to inherit from base state, as we always do, and we're going to start overriding a couple of things. Uh, most of what we're going to be doing in this one happens immediately once we enter the state. So we'd like to teleport our player up so very high in the air so it can avoid all the obstacle. And to do so, we're going to override construct. So here's what we'll do. We'll take the transform dot position of the player and we will put it somewhere at the top here. So I'll do a new vector uh, 3, 0 and x. We'll spawn it directly. Um, so we're going to spawn him directly in the middle lane. In terms of um, the height at which we, we should spawn him, that's going to be something that varies. So I'll create myself a field here. Oh, sorry, not something that varies, but something that gets uh, configured. So private float, vertical distance. And let's try to spawn him at 25 meter in the air. Now, as far as the, um, the z-axis, if we are respawning, we should be exactly where we were on the z-axis. So motor, transform, position, z. OK, um, should we give this a try? I think we should actually stop right here and give this a try. Let's hook in our respawn state. And I believe we did that in the game state def. Is that it? Hmm. So whenever we were to respawn the player, under the player motor, we did a debug.log.respawn. Right here, we're going to be doing the following. Change state to the respawn state, just like so. And let's make sure we add it on our player as well. So we can see the behavior of this. And the reason I'd like to show you that behavior is because you, you'll see what um, the bug is. There's a small bug I was talking about. So as we run into this wall, we're going to die, and then we're going to swipe up, choose to respawn. And you'll see that, well, I mean, the construct has been called, obviously, because we are in the respawn state, as it says right here. But we have not been teleported. And uh, that's an issue. That's an issue because we said, hey, our transform to the position, it should be right here. And that's clearly not where we are. So this behavior actually comes from us moving the position directly without going through the motor.controller. Um, usually, what you would do is something of the sort. So motor.controller.move, and then you would move a certain motion. But do note that this is a more complex function um, than just moving absolutely. Like it says right here, it's not actually moving um, the exact same way as just moving the position. When you just move the position, you ignore everything. So you ignore colliders, you ignore um, everything that has to do with physics, you just place an object in the world. When we do a dot move, it actually accounts for those. And if you have a ceiling above you, then you're not going to be able to be put up in the sky uh, because you're going to be blocked there. So we are going to not use dot move. Instead, we'd like to teleport directly like we've been doing. 
But before that, here is the workaround that I found. We're actually going to disable the controller, move him, and then re-enable the controller. Just like so. Let's give this a try, see if it works. So we are, we die, and then up in the air. And as you can see, we are now being teleported way higher in the air. And obviously we have a little bit of problem when it comes down to, uh, to spawning this here at the top in terms of what we see, but it's something we'll address once we start playing around with camera. I'd like to have a different camera angle when I start falling, uh, not just the same one. But right now, as you can see, we have been teleported in the air. Our workaround was a success. But of course, there's still a couple of things to play around with here. And that first thing is the process motion. As it says right here, process motion is not being implemented in response state. And obviously, we have to do so. So let's go ahead and overwrite that. So we have some sort of movement at least. And let me just grab whatever I have in the running state. I don't know why I like to use this one, but copy. Now, um, what should we do in the process motion? Now, in terms of processing that certain motion here, um, it's going to be very, very similar to the jumping state, actually. But I'll allow the person to change lane, uh, which I think we do here. OK, no, we don't. Um, but here is what we'll do. I'm actually going to grab everything that I have in the jumping state instead. My bad for making you copy twice if you're following carefully. Um, we're going to start by applying the gravity, create our vector, snap to lane that we've chosen, apply the vertical velocity, and also we have the base run speed. Um, yeah, I believe that's all we would need here. Obviously, we'll also need to do a little bit of transition. So I do encourage you to go ahead and uh, maybe grab this one. So falling set is a little bit better here because we want to keep this uh, is grounded call when we're going to go back to the floor. We'd like to, uh, we would like to be put back on the running state. So I grabbed the exact same transition as I had in the running state. And what I'd like to do is actually, when you're falling, it'd be good to, to guess and choose where you're going to be landing in between each of the, the lane. Uh, so you don't fall on something else that's going to kill you. So you have an actual control while you're spawning. So I'll head back in the running state, I believe. Yep. And grab the swipe left and also swipe right. And I think we've got everything we need here. Uh, maybe I'd like to, oh no, yeah, I would like to also reset my vertical velocity here. So motor.vertical velocity is going to be equal to zero. We're going to start and we're not going to fall very, very fast initially. Also do note that we're never going to fall really, really fast because apply gravity clamps the, the gravity to our terminal velocity. So we're never going to go faster than 20 meter a second on the on the y-axis, which is quite fast already. So, uh, but do know that we're never going to go beyond that point, which is good. Okay. That being said, let's give it a try. And I'm going to swipe up. And there we go. Let's keep trying this. So can I swipe? I actually can't um, change lane right now, which is a which is bothersome to me. I don't know why. But I don't seem to be able to uh, change the lane. So let's try and figure out why that is. Maybe something I've done here that I forgot is to actually change the current lane as well. So current lane should be put on zero simply because we are um, we're spawning on the zero axis here. So I just manually changed that as well. I don't think that's going to save everything, but let's give it a try. Okay, so I was able to change lane, but only once I've hit the floor. So clearly something's happening as I'm falling. That doesn't allow me to uh, to change the lane. And it also seems like I'm not being pushed back anymore when I die for the second time. Like I should have that nice little bouncing animation back. Okay, so before I fix that immediate problem, I'm also going to trigger a certain animation here. So it, it looks a little bit better and I can... Uh, Maybe maybe this gives me a better idea of what's going on. Uh, we're going to set the trigger to respawn. I believe we did have a parameter trigger that would allow this to happen. 
And let's give this one more try. So as we are respawning, we're falling into a certain state. Animation needs to be corrected. And then once we hit the death state again for our player, clearly it's happening because we're getting the animation. The only problem is that it really doesn't do uh, the bounce back. So some values need to be reset somehow. And here is the problem that I found uh, with this very specific problem here. Our knockback force is a scoped value, and we never, we never delete um, dev state. We never, we only have it once because it's a little bit more optimal to have it once. So we don't instantiate this on the fly. Therefore, when we modify the knockback force, it actually stays a certain way. So uh, let's make sure that every time we construct this, we reset it to the default value, the base value. Um, so what I'd like to do here. Mm, we, we would need to save this in a different value. Uh, let's do private vector three, current knockback. And that current knockback, every time we construct, would be set to the knockback force. And this is the one we would be modifying every single time. So let me just modify all of that to current knockback. And that should do it. So that should fix it. Okay, one of the problems should be addressed with this. So as we die, spawn up, die again. Okay, we get this now and we can respawn. Um, animation will need a little bit of fixing, but before we do that, let's try and have our player uh, change lane. Right now, I'm currently trying to swipe left, 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 and I'm not getting any, um, any changement of lane which is a, a issue for me. So let's try and figure out what goes on. One of the problems that I possibly see it is maybe that we transition over to this uh, running state a little bit too fast. I actually haven't seen it, but um, if we were to track the flow, this is what I think is happening. We enter the respawn, we're in the death state, we enter the respawn state. On the very next frame, we are being put in the running state because it thinks it's grounded probably because we move this um, like in a cheat way, like we move this using the transform.position. And then what probably happens is as it is in the walking state, it realizes we're falling and then it goes into a running state or sorry, falling state. So a bunch of things actually happening here, I believe. And we could test this out just by um, doing exactly what we've done with the previous states. We could just go in the away and do a debug.log here. Um, but we would have to go back. So I'm just going to assume that what I've said is true. And with that in mind, it means that I could go, for example, in the debug state and say, am I falling? And if this message pops up while we are in the middle of the respawn state, it would mean that it's actually happening. So I just clear my console as I'm going to reset this. It says, am I falling? Which means we have constructed the falling state. And our problem comes 100% from this call here. So we are swapping over to the running state on the very first frame. So we're going to have to find a way to work around this. And what we could do with this is create some sort of immunity. So we might be immune for a certain time to that very specific thing. And it's a very simple concept to do. And here's how we can implement this. We can create a new private float, call it immunity time, maybe 0 0.5 second, or it could be a lot more than that. Actually, it could be like a whole second. And in the construct, oh, and my bad, this one would be, um, you can modify this one, why not? And then I'd have another float for start time. In the construct, I would say start time is equal to time dot time, which gives us a timestamp of and um, exactly when this respawn state has been created. And then in my, um, in my transition, I would look for two things. First, are we grounded? And time.time .time minus when we started, so that's the time difference in between when we started and now, is that bigger than the immunity time? If so, then carry on, and you're now allowed to go in the running state. And that should address our very last bug that we've had with this state. So 
as you can see, I can move left and right now as I am in the respawn state. The only thing we're missing to make this look a little bit better is a different camera angle. So we know exactly where we land. And that is pretty much it. So we should be done with the respawn state, which looks a lot better than used to in the previous episode. And the next step is going to be to start hooking up our different cameras. It's going to be something that makes a very big difference. So please stick along with the next video. It's going to give you a much better feel for the game. So I'll see you guys there. Welcome to what should be the last episode of the game flow section in which we are going to code a little bit of things in the game manager. And uh, we are also going to import a package in regard to cameras. So our goal today is going to be to create different type of cameras and also allow the switch in between these camera to happen. Um, and we'll code that directly in the game states over here. So that being said, let's go ahead and open the window package manager uh, window and we will find the cinema machine. Of course, make sure that you accept all the packages and that you're connected to the internet. Here, cinema machine um, is what we'll be using. It's actually a tool that will pretty much override all our cameras and will give us nice little effect and also give us a, a good way to work with camera. It is a tool that is very, very fun to use. So I do invite you to install it with the bottom right button here. Once you have that package, I do invite you to create a new game object that you will just call camera or maybe camera with an S because there's going to be multiple camera in here. And just have that empty game object sit there. Maybe you want to put a new color to it. Um, and this object is going to contain all the other cameras within it. And I believe we're going to have around four different camera for a game. One for when we boot the game. So the initialize uh, camera one for the shop, one for the game, and one while we are respawning. Now you will also notice that at the very top in your Unity menu here, you will now have the Cinema Machine menu, and it has a couple of things here. And I do invite you to look at the optional videos in this section to, to know more about these camera. But what we'll be mostly using here are virtual camera. Um, and I believe that is pretty much it for this one. So I'm gonna create my first virtual camera. And here's what we'll do. We'll first rename this camera for camera, maybe underscore initialize, and then we'll make it a children of camera, just so I can know where all my cameras are. So this one is sitting right here on top of the other object. I will then move this camera, and you will realize that moving this virtual camera actually moved my real camera. And um, that's the behavior we'd like to have, but at the same time, it might confuse you a little bit. So It'd be cool if you just go back on Penguin, take the main camera and just pull it out on its own now. We are no longer the children of the Penguin. Um, this camera now behaves on its own. And if you try to move the main camera, you'll see that it doesn't do anything. It doesn't want to move because the main camera is no longer being controlled by its own transform. It's actually being controlled by whoever has the priority. So as I try to move the object, that doesn't really have the main camera on it, but only has a virtual camera. This is actually moving the real camera now as well. So it's important to know that um, the main camera is now connected to the virtual camera systems. And that is because the main camera has a cinema machine brain attached to it. And if you were to disable that, then you go back to having a typical normal camera that you can move around. But really what makes this work with the, the virtual camera is the cinema machine brain. And as soon as you've created a camera in here, a virtual camera, it actually added this component automatically. And sometimes it's a little bit annoying because it doesn't tell you, but um, I'm telling you now that on your main camera, this has now popped up. You have a couple of things here you can play around with. Um, show debug text might be very important to you because it's going to tell you which camera really has the control over the main camera right now. So at the top left, you'll see that the main camera is being controlled by camera underscore initialize. The rest of the parameter I'll ignore for the moment and we'll explore more of them in the optional video section. For the moment, it's really important that we know that our camera initialize actually drives the main camera. And to prove, uh, to prove my point a little bit further, here's what we'll do. We will start laying down the game camera as well. So I just duplicated this object and I'm going to call this one camera game and let's take the game camera 
and actually look at the player or something like that. So we see a difference in between the initialize. Initialize is just going to be, oh, let's do it the other way around, actually. So for initialize, I'll be looking at the player, something like that. And for game, I'll be looking in front of the player, like so. So that would be the game camera. And as you can see, the CM main camera actually is being controlled by camera game. And if I am to disable this one, it's going to jump to the most, um, the closest one you could say. And as I toggle them on and off, you'll see the camera actually switches automatically in between them. Now, what determines which one has priority is actually a component called priority right here. So for example, if you'd like to have the initialized camera have priority over initialize, then you can just up that number a little bit and you'll see the difference. In terms of our implementation of Cine Machine, we're actually not going to be using priority. Instead, what we'll do is, as I've just shown, we are going to disable and re-enable um, camera depending on which one we need. For example, if we're in the game, we're going to disable all the camera, and then this will go directly to this one. Okay. All right, so we will be laying down the two other camera very shortly, but before we do that, I'd like to get into, um, I would like to get into making these work first. So what I'll be doing next is we will start coding a small, very small function within the game manager in order to change these function, change these cameras. So we'll need two things in order to do that. First, a function that allows you to change in between the camera and also the list of all the game objects we'd like to turn off. Uh, we could do it in a couple of ways. We could have a public list, a public array. We could have uh, just a reference to parent. For this one, I'll actually use, say, a public array. So we can do public game object, uh, type of game object, and it's just going to be all the cameras. So with this in mind, I can now save head back into my game, find the game manager, and declare a list of, um, of four. One for initialize, then into game, then shop. So I'll just duplicate these right now. One for shop, and one for respawn. Let's add them. And right now, these are all the same. So game, shop, and respawn, they're all the same. Please don't worry about that. We'll be configuring them very, very shortly. And do note the order here. So initialize is 0, game is 1, 2 for shop, and then 3 for respawn. Because I'll create myself a small helper uh, enum at the top here. Public enum, camera. Um, we can start with initialize is 0, game was 2. Oh, sorry, one, shop was two, and respawn was three. And having it called just camera is not going to work. So uh, we could call it camera or game camera. That could do it. Just camera itself would, um, would be a conflict with Unity's definition of camera. So we have to name it something else. The reason I want to, to do actually have this is for the following. When I create my public void change camera, instead of sending it a int, let me have a game camera being sent instead. So this is going to be a tad easier to call from outside. Now, all we have to do here is run a for each of all the cameras. So all the game object geo in cameras, oops, cameras like so, and disable all of them. So set active false. And then finally, re-enable the one that we're using. So camera at the index uh, int c dot set active true. So what's happening here if if I send uh, for example camera shop shop is equal to two. So when I cast this to an int it gives me two and then I do set active to true. Should be fair enough. Okay. Now, um, what we need to do is start implementing this around our game states. So when we enter initialize, game state initialize, we'd like to have the um, initial camera. So we can do a public override construct 
in call game manager instance change camera camera type of initialize that's really all we need to do and i'm going to copy this over because we'll use this code again in the following state which should be game state game here we go so same thing as before but here we are going to be changing the camera to the game camera and I'm not going to go any further right now. I'd just like to test this out, see if it works uh, properly. So when I press on play, I have the initialized camera. And then when I swap, it goes to the other camera, which it did work. It was very long, but it did work. And also, um, I don't know if you guys realize, but it was not actually following my player around. Here, my player is, is going. It's doing its thing right now, but uh, the camera is not following him, so definitely that's a problem. Now, in order to configure this, we have to jump into the game camera, so this one, and tell it to follow something. That something right here will be the player, of course. So I'll add the penguin in here. And then this is where we get to play around with the angle we would like to have. So we now have a follow target. It's time to start playing around with the settings the body of that follow and also the aim the body is where the uh, the camera is going to be positioned in the space the aim is going to be its rotation so for example here we would like to have some a certain offset so i'm just moving on the y-axis it's going to be important you play around with this and you find the one that you like the most the settings you like the most here are the one that i've been playing around with for for a bit now and if you're tired of seeing the guide so this thing you can enable disable it at the top right side here so what I have is um, the following. I am on transposer. I'm locking my target with the world up. Five minus five are my offset for the position. And then for the composer, um, I, I went with six. So the track offset in Z is six. And I left the, uh, the default settings down there, the one that uh, already existed. So that's what I have for the game camera. And I'm quite, um, I'm quite satisfied and also made sure to save during play. And that's the behavior I have for the game camera, which is, I believe that's exactly what I wanted. Now, um, one of the problems we have right here is how long it takes in between the switch for the initialized camera to the game camera. Uh, one thing that is really cool with this system is that you can actually customize that very switch in between these two specifically. So if I am to go under uh, my brain, so my camera brain, here it is. Under the Snip Machine brain, there is a custom blend. So you can do a blend for everything. In case I want to do a cut, I can just put cut and you'll see that it's going to, that's the default blend. It's just going to go straight to the camera. And that, that will be applied to every single camera right now. But maybe that's not what we want. Instead, uh, let's do a easy in out of, say, 0 0.5 second for all of them. But in case we want to change things specifically in between, say, the initialized camera and also the game camera, we can create a custom blend, which is, which is actually uh, exactly what it sounds like. So it's a custom blend in between two different camera. And I'm going to put that under, under scripts and also the game flow, game state maybe, or maybe no, domain camera blend. Here it is, under game flow. And if we open this one up, you get to actually choose what you want to do here. So for example, we can do from initialize. So the initialize camera to the game camera. If you pull that up, you'll see you can decide to do say easy in out of 0 0.75 second, which is a little bit longer than the default one. And it's going to take a little bit longer to load this one. So that's exactly how we can do that. Now, in terms of the rest of the camera, I know I've been renting for quite a while now, but uh, we can easily hook in those other camera very, very fast. So if I was to go back on initialize, the camera shop, not so much, but at least the respawn, that is something we can do for sure right now. So here is what I'll do. I'll actually copy the Slim Machine virtual camera. I'll copy that over, the one for game, and I'll go apply it. So paste component value to the respawn camera. So at least it keeps these settings. Let me just reset everything we had. So it goes back to this. Um, it's now time for me to actually swap over to the camera respawn. 
And to do so, I believe we would do it in the, should we do it in a game state def? No, this should be triggered in when the player actually enters the respawn state. So when we enter the respawn state for the player, this is the movement. In the motor, in the construct state, we are going to be calling our new camera. So game manager instance change camera with camera type of respawn. So that will be done in the construct of the respawn state. And right away, you'll see that we'll swap in between the game and the respawn camera. So that's good. Um, but this one is not configured at the moment. So it would be important we do so right now. And the behavior I would like to have for this one is simply to have it the exact same thing as the game, but to look at it from directly over the player almost. So if I am just to move the Z component to say maybe directly on top of him, so zero and Z, and just look down in a certain angle, like so. This is the behavior I'd be looking for. Now, obviously, we're going to be far high in the air like this. Maybe you want to move your player around to configure this a little bit better. And this could actually do it. So something that's going to look directly down, something like so. OK. Putting my player back to where it was. It's now time to give this a try. So let's hit respawn. And I have a feeling that it didn't work so well. So let's give it a try. Um, as you can see, we are under the game camera. So something definitely did not work here. We were expecting to enter the, uh, the other camera for some reason. Let's see what could have gone wrong. Okay, so I was able to found the issue here, and it has to do with timing at which I am calling this. Um, this actually should not be called within the response state because when we call the response state, we launch our game state once more. And sometimes we launch a game state because we are starting the game initially. And sometimes we start it because we respawn at the same point. And we only want to trigger on camera or in the second case. So I'll be moving this one in a different part of the code. Um, yes, it was being called, but the problem is that it was overwritten by this call right here on the game state game, which was the change camera. Instead, uh, we should only call this when the player is being revived. And we can do so under here, under the respawn player. That is a call that is, that is only called um, the moment that we have to respawn the player. This starts the respawn state. And uh, let me check something real quick. So going back to where this behavior starts, the respawning behavior actually starts from when you are dead. You need to be dead in order to revive. So what happened is when you decide to revive, right here with a swipe up, you are then put under resume game, which respawns the player and then put the game state back on game. And this is where I think we should swap them around and have the state being changed first. And then we head into respawn player, at which point we can say, OK, then go ahead and change the camera. Uh, we could do it here, but I'd prefer doing it under the, the respawn player. It makes a little bit more sense. So if I go under respawn player, I'm going to do a game manager. So game manager instance uh, change camera type of respawn. And I believe now if there is no logic that uh, that breaks this, so if there is no required logic and respawn player that changed the game state game, we should be fine. So let's give this a try. And I'm going to die here. We are under the game camera. As you can see here, it's only one that, that is active. So we're under here. Then we're being put under game, uh, sorry, camera respawn. It's also the case we see it at the top here. Uh, so this works. Now uh, we just have nothing going back to um, so once we leave the respawn state, we want to go back to being in the game state. So that's going to be very important. Uh, we do that. And let's actually do it right now. So under our response state, let's create a destruct call. So public override destruct. And under here, I will say the following. Game manager instance change camera type of game. Going back in game, I should have everything I need at this point.
Yep, exactly. So our home flow now works. The only problem is when we respawn, like immediately right here, we get a really weird behavior and we, we have a look at the sky. So what we can do here from what we've learned earlier is we could override that transition to be a cut. So if I go under my main camera, under my custom blend, I decide that my transition in between game to respawn is actually going to be a cut. Save this. And uh, do remember here that when, when we do die, so when we die over here, a UI should pop up, uh, should cover the screen, and then we're going to click on the button, and then this will happen. So we're instantly being teleported to the sky, and our camera is being swapped in, uh, in the respawn camera. So this behavior is a lot easier to deal with, as you could see. And there it is. So we were able to hook in the cameras in a single video. Sorry about how long this one was, but um, they're very, it's a very simple system once you get the hang of it and it's very fun to play around with. Uh, we're not completely done because we're, we'll come back to camera at one point because we need to have a shop camera. Maybe we want to tweak um, some, some camera. We want to tweak them a, a tad bit, but I'm not quite sure as of right now what else we should be doing until we have the shop. So let's leave it at that for now. And we now have. We now have a game that plays itself. We have a game flow. So, um, all right, guys, in the following section, I believe we're going to start tackling a little bit of the UI so we can start to see what goes on in the screen. Uh, we can start getting a cue of what to do. And also we have buttons to click in uh, at the beginning. So we just don't look like, um, you know, we're just there's secret commands that happens right here. All right, guys, so this does not actually conclude this uh, section. We still have one thing to look at in the, the next video, and it's going to be the fact that uh, we have a little bit of polishing to do here. If we decide to go back to the menu, so if we decide to not play again and go back to the menu, we end up with this weird bug where the player is all the way over there, and you know we don't have any floor over here, and it just looks very, very weird. So something we'll be fixing in the next video, and I, it's very important that you tag along for this one as well because it's part of the logic is the, re the whole resetting behavior of one, the world, second, the player. And I believe that's it. Yeah, the world and the player. So tune along with the next one. And uh, after that, we'll have a full, complete game flow we can play around with. I'll see you guys in the next one. Cheers. Welcome to the final episode of the game flow section in which we're going to fix this issue right here. Um, so when we decide to go back to the menu, um, we have two options first. We have the option to respawn when we die, and we also have the option to go back to, to the menu, which takes our player and should technically send him over here and back into the original flow. But that is not the case right now. So let's go ahead and hook ourselves in, in the code somewhere where we can reset the player position. And I believe we should do that when we're exiting the game state def. So once we leave the def, we are going to reset uh, pretty much a couple of things. So um, let's take the player position, for example, through the game manager instance motor. That's the game player. And we can set it's transform the position back to vector 3.0. And since we're not moving in that frame um, because the, the, the thing is going to be paused, then we get to um, we get to have a behavior here where we don't have to disable the controller first. So by doing this, we should actually take the player and move him exactly to back, back to the start um, once we enter the option to menu. And that happens, if you guys remember, when we swipe down. So our player, where is the player? He is right here. <laughs> However, the problem with, um, with this is the fact that, of course, his animation state is literally on the floor. So we would have to reset his old state machine because I remember we didn't actually hook anything back to the idle state. Um, so here's something we can do to fix this issue. We could go ahead and create a new parameter. And if you're downloading the file from the web, uh, this should already be done. Um, a trigger called idle, then hook it from any state to idle with uh, no exit time. And I'll make it instant. So I'll just crush that down like so. The condition will be idle. Saving this, I can now head back into my code and call this trigger. Set trigger idle. 
And by doing so, we'll be able to reset the state machine to where it should actually be. So if I am to play this now and we have a look, we're currently in the run state into the dev state. And now I'm going to swipe down back into the idle state, which gives us um, this, this behavior. And that's something we'd like. But as you can see here, I was able to respawn. So obviously something was wrong here. So currently, if I tap, I'm not actually moving. And I believe that is because our player is, um, for some reason, we can swipe out. So our player is definitely in the wrong state. So to get through this problem, we would have to actually switch the state of the player. So I would call a change state. Um, on this player, so again, game manager, instance, uh, motor, get component, if that's a very long call, uh, we're going to be in a running state because that's the default state we're in when we, when we start. And then maybe we want to pause him right away. So we have reset his state. Now let's pause the player. Quite a couple of things to do, and it's all inside of two menu. Now you're going to see here that we have four different calls to uh, game manager instance at motor. So that might be a little bit too heavy. So something we might want to do is head over to that motor and create a function instead with all of this inside. So that's exactly what I'll do here. So instance motor, and we will call it reset player. With that in mind, I will grab all of this, head into the player motor and create a function for resetting the player. So public void reset player. Paste all of that. We won't need any of these reference anymore. And yep, it feels, oh, here, we don't need that anymore either. Yeah, it looks a little bit better. Um, so let's see what happens if we run this code now. So I'm going to swipe down, it goes back here, press play, and it starts over again. So that seems to work just fine. Um, I feel like I have a little bit of glitch here in terms of cameras, so I don't know. Let me just pull that up so I can see the, the behavior. It seems to be hard for the camera to actually go back to initialize because for a single frame, it thinks that the player is here and then right after he's right there. So what I believe we'll do is a custom blend. Um, so when we reset, we'll do a custom blend in between the initialized, actually the game camera and also the initialized one. So going back on my main camera down here, the game camera over to the initialize is also going to be a cut, which should remove the small weird glitchy behavior I had when I decided to reset. And yep, we go straight back here. Don't seem to have any issue anymore. And um, I believe that's exactly what we need. Now, there's one problem that we haven't fixed and that we haven't even seen thus far. And to see it, I'll need to play the game a tiny bit. OK, and here we go. And the problem will manifest right here if I try to respawn. There's nothing in front of me. <laughs> and that's because the world is actually much further beyond that point. And uh, as you can tell, the, the, the things don't actually spawn until we get to that point. Um, that's because that's where our world manager thinks we are. And when we reset the world, when, when we reset the player, we don't actually reset the world. So we'll have to find a way to call the world manager and tell him to reset himself as well. So exactly where we do a reset player, I believe that was on um, the game state def. We're going to do the same thing here with the world manager. And we have an instance to this. I don't believe we do. So let's find out what we can do with the world manager. Oh, here it is. Um, we already had a function called reset world and we had to delete this as well. Okay. With that in mind, I will create a, a reference. So from the game manager, I'll create a reference to world generation. Now, let me just comment this out real quick. Go on my game manager. I do have a public clear player motor. I'll also have a public game, uh, actually world 
generation and call it world generation. Now with this, I can go back on my dev state, game state dev, and call the world by doing instance world generation. And there was a function already in there called reset world. And I'm, I'm eager to just see what this one does uh, without without going into detail right now. I'm just eager to see if we coded something that could work on the fly before. That'd be nice. And before I run this, I'm going to make sure to assign my reference under the game manager. So here it is. Let's go ahead and press play. I don't need to play the game for too long to, to see if it's going to work or not. I just need the, the first prefab to despawn. So just in any second now, there it is. Now if I die, swipe down. Okay, the world has not been regenerated. So let's go see what this does. This puts us back on where it should and it deletes a bunch of junk and it should spawn a bunch of junk. So for some reason, this was not, um, I believe this was not called. Okay, so I seem to understand what the problem is with this one. Um, the code we have in world generation works well. The only problem is that our camera is so far in the future, and as soon as we call this code, um, we get to have the code that creates new chunks. So what happened is those chunks are being created, but then they despawn uh, automatically because uh, scan position goes through, and then uh, we delete chunks. It's as simple as that. So something that would be good to do is that inside the um, the scan position, and it would only be good to do that uh, while we are currently uh, in the game state. So we don't need to scan the position at all in any other state than when we are in the game state. Uh, this is the scan position is only here to spawn and also despawn chunks based on where the camera is. Now, what happens is uh, during one single frame, it, it just runs this like couple of times and it deletes a couple of chunks that we see here. So it'd be nice to wrap this up in um, in a if statement, so this whole function here. And we could do so in the update. Now, um, let me think about where we could put that in. Technically, what we could do is we could be in the game state game and call the update from there because we do have access to that. So public override update state. And from here, we could say game instance actually, oops, game manager instance world generation. And then um, we can't call the update like that. So we'll have to rename it. So uh, scan position. Let me go back on the world generation. I'll make this one a public void. And I'll delete the update statement in here. So where is my game set game? Here it is. Same thing for the scene chunk generation, scan position. And with this, we should now have the problem corrected. Yep, and we'll have uh, we'll have to see what we do here with the void awake in a second. But let's first look at if this works or not. So only when the game is uh, running should we be able to scan the position. So let's see if that behavior is in work. Yep. So as you can see, things despawn. And if I want to run into the wall, we can still call the reset and reset work just well, as you can see. And we're back to normal, except the fact that we spawn on the wrong lane. So it's something we'll also have to fix in a second. But um, the, be the behavior we wanted is, is there. So everything is working as intended with this. And also we save a couple of um, CPU cycle because every single frame, we had two scripts uh, running scan position prior, and now we only have them running scan position when they are uh, when we are in a game state game. Now, in terms of reset world, I actually think that we should no longer um, have this code marked as to delete for the sole purpose that um, when I began um, writing this tutorial, I had a different logic go around this, but it seems that every time I re-record something that I've done in the past, uh, I always go and do a little bit of touches, uh, incremental touches to the code that makes it look a little bit better or is a little bit more understandable. So having it on the wake makes a lot of sense with the new implementation I've done. Now, obviously, I can't show you the old one, but 
um, this is no longer a piece of code that I want to get rid of. Actually, it works very well with that. If you're curious, before that, I had the scene chunk generation, also the world generation in the same script, and it was a real mess. So I've changed that to, to just have the scene, uh, scene chunk generation be a inherit from the world. Okay, so our last problem is the fact that I started in the wrong lane all the time when I was respawning. So for example here, I die, respawn, and it goes back to the lane I was. So that's a very, very simple fix. We are simply going to reset um, our current lane when we do die. So going back under the game state def, here I do reset player. On the reset player, I'm also going to set current lane is equal to zero. Do remember, I am in the player motor.cs right now. And I believe that is what we need to do to wrap up this section, the game flow section, and we will have a complete game flow. Yep, so the game flow is complete, and it's a very, very nice milestone for our game. It's a very nice, uh, yeah, no, it's a, nice, it's a good milestone for our game. You guys can be proud of yourself. We've made something that you can play and just, you know, start over again and play. And it just doesn't have any sense of progression right now, but at least uh, you have a full loop. And yeah, that's amazing. Okay, so. I'm very happy we're done with this part. In the next one, we can start laying down a little bit of the UI to make this more um, navigation friendly and make this more user friendly. Once that next section with the UI is completed, we are going to head into shop logic, saving data, collectible, and we're gonna look to wrap the game up after that. So thank you so much for watching this section and I will see you in the next one. Cheers. Welcome back. Today we are starting section number eight. So section number eight has to do with a UI. Right now our game looks a little bit bland. It has the thing we need, it has the gameplay we need. However, we'd like to receive more information and be able to interact with the, uh, the gameplay um, and maybe just the flow of the application without knowing that we have to swipe up or down. Like here, for example, swipe up for respawn. So buttons, all about buttons and also um, all about game uh, game UI, right? <laughs> so um, we're going to start with one very, very simple concept that I need to explain to you. Um, so you have that in mind when you create your canvas here in this course, but also for your own personal game. Um, that concept is very simple in Unity. Uh, this is Unity specific. When we create a UI object, this UI object, for example, I create an image here. This UI uh, object has to be sitting on top of something else called a canvas. And you will realize that when you are in a canvas, it's a little bit different. So the behavior is different. And what do I mean by that? Well, the, well let me just let me just look at this image. Maybe we'll change the color so we can actually see it a little bit better. Or you can put your game in 2D and that's going to give you a better idea of, of where this stands. Um, when we're playing around with UI, especially under a canvas, or I should say specifically under a canvas, we are no longer using the same uh, coordinate system. So yes, this object is sitting within the scene. However, as you can see here, all of these, they have transform. But this, the second we fall into UI, we are now using rec transform. And that's a whole new deal. So you'll be trying to set the position of this object, uh, for example, um, on top of the player, then you'll have to do a little bit of math. You have to use some helper function because it's not going to work right out of the gate. Um, you're going to be trying to set this in the middle of the screen. Well, where is the middle of the screen exactly if you're in 3D world coordinate? Uh, in that case, that would be screen screen size and um, screen size dot width divided by two and also screen height dot width divided by two. But you, you see how this is different. So. Um, do know that everything below that, so every UI element will have a rec transform, which stands for rectangle transform in this case. Um, it also has a canvas render. So if you don't have that, it just doesn't render to canvas and you will see that you can't remove it. That's totally fine. And then you'll have the actual UI element. This could be an image. This could be a text. Uh, let's not play around with test mesh pro just yet. We'll do that very soon though. Um, this can be pretty much anything in the UI object. And you'll realize that um, the first time we created a UI object, then we had a canvas created for us. However, the second time, 
if I just go somewhere else, button, it just falls back into the canvas we've had. Now, the important concept I want to talk about is the following. I'll just give you a fairly example, a, a really bad example maybe, but uh, please bear with me. Try to listen as close as possible. For example, we have one canvas over here. This canvas has two images and they are static. For example, I have a fish and also I have uh, the play button. These are right there, right? Once we start the engine and we decide to show this canvas, we have to render these image once. And then what's cool is that if they don't change, if they remain at the same spot, we don't call the renderer again. So we won't be redrawing this and it's going to be good on the CPU cycle. It's going to be good on the rendering cycle, on the graphic card, on the performances of your game in general. Um, and this is awesome because we have this canvas and we do a draw call only once. Now, if we decide to change, for example, the play icon to the shop icon at runtime, then here is what happens. Not only do we need to re-render this image, but also this one as well, because we re-render the whole canvas. And now you're starting to see that this might get tricky. For example, if our whole game UI, complete game UI, so maybe like 15 elements on our canvas are there just sitting, and then you decide to move one just a little bit towards the right like this, you re-render the whole thing and that becomes costly very, very fast. So when you go now and make your game in the future, um, please make sure that whenever you have something that moves on the canvas, for example, you have uh, a minimap on your canvas and you have to re-render every single frame, maybe you'll want to take that minimap and create its own canvas. There is no problem having more than one canvas. And I'll give you this example right here. You can go under UI and create a canvas and maybe call this one animated UI element. And this one could be the static, static elements. And here on this animated UI element, you could have something that moves every single frame, like an image that rotates, for example. So while this image rotates every single frame, we are redrawing the animated UI element canvas, but not the static element. This one, nothing has moved on it. So, hey, we're not moving it at all. We're not redrawing it. We're just using what we had in the previous frame. So that is the very important distinction I wanted to make and also tell you about. Um, we're going to be using a hybrid of that because we like our code. Well, first, our UI is not very heavy in the first place. We have very, very limited UI and it's static. Um, and what I want to say here is that we're going to be using an hybrid in which we're going to be using multiple canvas, but we're not going to be, for example, putting something that is dynamic. We're not going to be um, singling it out into a single canvas. Instead, we're going to have a canvas for every single state of the game, I believe. So um, one canvas when we are in the idle screen, another for when we're in the game, in the dev state, in the respawn state, and in the shop. So we're going to be splitting that apart, and it's going to make our video here, uh, the video course, much easier to follow and uh, just to create. So uh, I think I talked enough. Let's jump right into the action, and that's going to be in the next video. Cheers. It is now time for us to jump into making the very first uh, piece of UI we'll have for our game. And it's going to be the very simple one. So this video should be short enough. We're going to be placing around um, things for the main menu or the idle screen, uh, if we prefer to call it like that. Now, what we'll be doing is I'll create a new UI canvas. And on its own, this canvas will be the um, the canvas for main menu. Maybe you want to split it apart with underscore, if I can write, <laughs> main menu. Or that might be a bit too much. I'll just call it canvas menu. Okay, awesome. Um, what we'll need over here is the following. So for the canvas, we are going to be using the screen space overlay, which just means uh, the, the 2D space on your screen. So think about uh, pixel wide and also pixel in height. Now, the screen space camera is the exact same thing, but it uses the camera settings for, for example, if we use this one, uh, it's going to use whatever that needs to be uh, filtered there. So if it has a different field of view, it's going to be using that instead. And I just don't like using this one at all. <laughs> and then you also have a canvas for the world space. This one is quite funny because you can actually position it 
in the world. For example, if I am to create a, not a button, I'll create a full screen image. Make sure it scales on all axis. You can actually position it in the world. So as you can see here, it is actually positioned somewhere and I can move it around in 3D space. So this one is actually quite useful for a uh, different type of effects. So if you'd like to have like a UI on top of your character that follows him around, you can actually do that here. Um, however, not the case for us. We're going to switch back to screen space, which means it's just rendering on top of everything. Okay. Now that being, um, that being said, we can head down to canvas scaler. How is the canvas going to scale our UI? And again, for one more reference, I'll actually put, for example, I put something at the top left like so. So an image that is 100, 100 by, uh, no, it's 100 by 100, but it has this very specific offset. And let's do, for example, the shop icon. If we are to modify this, um, the UI scale mode, it is going to scale depending on one of these three parameters. So do we want to have constant pixel size, which means it's always going to remain the same exact pixel size. So you'll see this behavior when you modify the size of your preview screen, just like I'm doing right now. So if you're playing on a smaller phone, the image is still going to be as big as you would expect it to be. Now that's an option, or would you like the image to go smaller depending on the size of your screen? You can also do that with scale with screen size. So as you can see, as I scale down, the image also scales down. And finally, constant physical size, which means if I say to this icon, you're going to be two centimeter wise, it's actually going to be two centimeter wise all the time. Um, for a game, you probably guessed it, we're going to be using scale with screen size, and that's the case for pretty much everything on the market, almost. Um, there is a couple of exceptions, however. And remember that you are not locked to this decision. So if you do have a different canvas um, that needs constant physical size, then you can also have that, uh, just create another canvas, right? <laughs> but for us, the menu, we're gonna be using scale with screen size, and we're also gonna be defining what is the base size of our screen. So I'll give you an example. If we're making a game for iPod, not iPod, <laughs> iPhone X um, two, 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 in portrait mode, we will be using 1125 by 2436. That is the actual resolution of the iPhone 10, which looks something like that. Um, makes me realize that it's quite a wide screen now, but you'll want to be inputting it right here. So 1125, 2436, okay. So that being said, um, you have another option when you scale with screen size, and it's that, are you going to match with the height or the width? Um, you can do a, a small 0 0.5 here. If you're not too sure, it's, um, it's going to decide which one is the driving factor. Now, if you have a set aspect ratio like I do, like I always use, say, um, what is the, I, I think it's, nine by 16 or something like that, then uh, you know that, that ain't gonna matter much because you, you scale with both width and height at the same time. But if you are in free aspect and you decide, hey, you're gonna match only with width, then as I pull this, you're gonna see it get wider. But if I go down like so, it doesn't move because we're only matching with height. For us, we're gonna be matching at 0 0.5, but we're also gonna be locking our game to this very specific resolution. Um, if you're curious, when I do develop for mobile, I usually have two screens. I have the um, iPhone 10 portrait, but I also have the iPad at the same time. So I'm playing around with these different resolution. And also, uh, usually I do have a layout for that, but I switch in between these two. Okay. That being said, I believe we're set here and we can move on to actually creating our canvas. So very simple. Um, what I do plan for this game is that the splash screen will be in 3D space. And all I'll need on, on here is four different type of, uh, actually four top level item. One text that display the high score, one text that display the amount of uh, collectible I have, one button for play, and also one button for the shop. So let's deep dive into these four. So we are going to create the play button. That's the first thing we'll do. 
And to do that, I'll right click on canvas menu and I'll actually choose button, just like so. Now the button is quite small, it's in the middle of nowhere. Don't worry about that, it's time for us to fix it. Um, for the reference, I wanted to have my, um, my UI at the bottom right of the screen. So somewhere around here, I'd like to see my UI pop up and I just wanna have a simple, very simple square. So I can have enough space at the top here for the splash screen and I'll position my penguin here on the left hand side. So we look at him and we have the UI on the right. Uh, maybe my camera placement is not too good, but we can fix that in the future. So if I wanna put my button anchored here and good for all resolution, I will have to actually modify his anchor. So clicking on this play button, which I'll rename, I will choose the anchor and I'll just make sure to left click here and also shift left click. So it also moves the anchor. I can now put that on zero and you'll see my button is over there. In terms of width, um, let's go for something tad smaller. So maybe 400 uh, by 200, that might be too big. Maybe something like this, that, that looks like a pretty slick button. Of course, I'll have to play around with the size uh, until it works fine. And maybe I want to put my anchor at the bottom right instead and give it an offset in Y. So for example, I'll have something like this. Now this is satisfying to me in terms of the placement. I can now move on to the second element, which is the image. And I believe I do have some, um, some images I can, I can use here, uh, button number two. They might have changed by the time that I'm, because I'm not so satisfied with them, they might have changed by the time you receive this package and you download the asset of the course, but do note that it would be called button as well. So button one or button two, just use the one that looks the best to you. And um, I'll go ahead and I'll just, we have that here. Okay, awesome. Uh, we don't need to hook anything in there as of right now. Eventually we will have to, but let's go ahead and remove the text. Next up, what I'd like to create is some sort of text inside of the play, um, the play background, you could say, and then also create an image next to it. So we'll start with the image. That's going to be the icon. Take the icon, I'll use this play button right here. And I want to anchor this one on the left hand side. So I'm holding um, shift, then clicking on left mouse button, and I'm just gonna move that to zero. So it looks something like that at the moment. Give it a proper offset, maybe 50. And next up, create a UI. I'd like to use the Text Mesh Pro. Um, if you wanna use the Text Mesh Pro, you'll have to import the TMP Essential. Click on that button, we'll revisit uh, Text Mesh Pro uh, in optional video here but it's now, it now has became the, uh, the standard text to use when you're using Unity, so that's why we use it. And it has a lot more feature than the previous one. And now with text, it's quite, uh, it's not too difficult, but you have to get around on how it works. So for example here, the yellow zone is where you can input the text and you cannot really overflow that unless you tell it that you can. So here it says overflow. You can also make sure that it's ellipsis. You can have a mask, you can have have all of that. Um, in our case, we might want to truncate here. Or what we'll do, is we'll just make text that doesn't overflow. So that's also an option. Um, now, what I like to do with my text is just give it the whole size of the container. So for example, here, to give it the whole size, I left click on the anchor preset at the bottom right. And I just put everything back on zero, which now leaves me with a text that is the whole um, the whole screen, the whole button. And then I'll move my left anchor just so it's next to this button, like so. I'll give it a, a value that is um, rounded up, so 170 in this case. I'll type in what I need, so play, maybe in all caps. Um, tell the alignment I'd like to have it in the center, not the center like so, but the center here. And then maybe just play with the size a that bit. So it's not big enough. That might be big enough, but we might want to modify um, this to be a little bit further. So something like so. And we'll want to come back and play around with the font as well in the future. But as of right now, 
this is going to be our first button. I'll go ahead and I'll copy paste this and type in shop here. We'll move this, say, we'll move this down by roughly 300. So we're at 800 minus 300. Here we are at 500. And I'll go ahead and I'll modify the icon for the shop icon and the text for shop. So I'm starting to realize here that in, this actually is quite small. So maybe we'll want to play with the size a little bit more. So for example, 600 by 200. I'll apply the same here. So 600 by 200. And there's nothing uh, really, there's nothing stopping you. I like to make everything very, really, very flush, but there's nothing stopping you from just moving this outside manually as well, if you think it looks better. And then next up, we'd like to create some text for dynamic text later on. So for the high score, but also for the amount of collectibles we have. So here, I'll use a new text mesh pro, and that's going to be for the high score. And we'll position that very similar to how we position the text. So you know what? I'll just copy this red transform, apply it to my other red transform. And now I took this spot. Um, I'll go ahead and I'll just maybe position it here, make sure it has a rounded number. Yep, it does. I want this one to be a bit smaller, so maybe 75. Um, anchor it roughly at 950. And make sure my font size is big and also my alignment is at the bottom. And I can type in something like high score X, which of course will modify um, at runtime. Now that's pretty good. I'll take this one, copy it, and have the, um, the fish count. So I'll just call this one fish. Put it exactly on top of the shop. So let's see, 650 in this case. And I'm pretty much satisfied with the result of this experience. Now, of course, it did not, it does not actually look very good at the moment. And most of the problem we have with this UI is, is the font. The font is really um, not playing so good with the assets and maybe the background I want to change as well. So these will be two things we will be addressing in the future. I wanted to make sure we had a video that just looked at how we placed UI around. Now understand that we have not hooked any logic to that. It's something we'll do directly in the next video. And then after that, we will merge both the visual part and also the coding part in one and we'll go much faster. So this one, I understand this video was quite boring for most of you that played around with the UI. Um, but do note that the, the next one are gonna be much faster and we're gonna be hooking the code directly at the same time. So that being said, we will revisit the UI later on when we talk about fonts, but at the moment, this looks pretty good for a MVP, not MVP, for a um, first draft, you could say. So thank you guys, and I will see you in the next one. In the previous segment, we've laid down the visual for the canvas of the menu, the menu of the canvas, actually. And it was made out of four elements, the play button, the shop, the high score, and also the fish count, which we can see right here on the screen. Today, what we're going to do is take these and actually hook some, um, hook some logic to it. And the way we're going to do so is that for every single canvas we have, we also have a associated game state. For example, this is canvas menu, or I could have called it canvas initialize instead. That might have been a little bit easier to understand because it is matching the game state that is called initialize. So what I was thinking about in the architecture of this game was to actually um, link these two together. So create one state for every single uh, canvas. It's just a way that I'd like it to be. So uh, these two can be linked. Um, and also codeways, they can, they can be linked is what I'm trying to say. So whenever we have logic regarding these button, or for example, the high score has to be updated, we would like to put it inside of the following script. So the game state initialize script. As you can see, uh, we actually ended off the game flow um, section with not much, uh, not much logic in there. And that's because I wanted to make the logic of the UI in there as well. So that's not it. So we'll definitely have more than just that, obviously. Um, so that being said, it is what we're going to open up today. So the game state initialize over here, and we're going to hook in um, the action of these button to it. So for that, we will need a function for play button and for the high score. Sorry, no, the play button and also the shop. So when we click on these two, um, something happens. So we're going to start off with a public void and make sure those are public because we'll need to link the buttons to it. So that means we'll need to access them during, um, not during, but in the inspector. So public void on game 
click or on play click would make a tad more sense in this case. So when we press on, on the play button, same thing down here for on shop click. And we can just lay down the brackets and start writing down our function. Over here in the update state, uh, we were looking to change over to the state game. Um, that is no longer true. We're actually not going to need the update logic anymore. And instead, we will take this line of code and put it inside of the play because that's what happened when you play. And that's pretty much all we need in there for the moment, at least. Um, and the same thing would be true for the on shop click. So something like that. However, we don't have a game state for the shop at the moment. No, we don't. So um, let's just write it like so and comment it out. It's something we'll have to come back to. Uh, until then, let's just write adbog.log and say shop button has been clicked. Um, I can include Unity Engine to make sure this works. So here at the top. And that's actually all we need. <laughs> um, it's not much more code and actually we remove a good chunk of it, but uh, we also need one more thing. There is that UI, the famous canvas we've made. We'll need a reference to it and uh, we'll also need a reference to the high score and also the fish count text because those will need to be populated. So let's lay that down right here. We'll start with a public game object um, menu UI. A public, or we can make this one serializable, but um, hmm. Yeah, maybe serialize field private text mesh pro. UGY. That's actually the type of the, um, since I'm not using regular type, uh, sorry, not regular type, but regular text, I'm actually using text mesh pro and the full name of that component that displays the text, you'll see it in a second when I click on it, is text mesh pro dash text UI. And in the code, it's actually translated as, and you can see it here, so maybe edit this script. Um, it's actually text mesh pro UGUI. So that's the name of the class and that's what we'll be using. So going back here, I'll need a reference to text mesh pro UGUI and that won't pop up until you have the using TMP pro at the top here. So make sure you include that. Um, we'll do the high score text, copy that over and that will be the fish count text. All right. Um, now all of this will be set in the start. We will start with text. Do note that we don't have reference to um, the high score at the moment, but don't worry, we'll input that later. I'll just say, uh, say, uh, should I write high score like so, or high score? Uh, see, I get confused with that word. I, if I read it this way, I also remember that high score was written this way in RuneScape. I don't know. I'm just gonna. I'm just going to call it high score like so. OK, so we'll put the H, the GH actually in there. That's a mistake from being a French native speaker. So sorry about that. And for the moment, because we don't have that, I'll just write TBD like so. So high score plus DBD. Eventually, this is going to be replaced by a um, int value. Same thing down here for the fish count. So fish count. Fish, do we write fishes? I don't actually know. Let's just write fish. I don't think there is fishes. Uh, okay, so now I could really use an English major, but um, yeah, okay. So once we have all of that, here's what we do next. We make sure to enable the menu UI. So set active is gonna be set to true once we enter the state. That would also mean that we have to disable it when we leave. So public override void, uh, sorry, void destruct. And we're gonna call this line. But instead of true, of course, we'll type in false. And that will be, once we assign these um, directly in the inspector, that will be it, I believe. So let's give this a try. I'm going to head back to my game manager, drag and drop my menu UI, which is the whole canvas, actually. Um, high score text is right here. Fish is right here. The play button, we have to click on it, head down to button. The on-click list has to be appended. Drag and drop the game manager into game state initialize on play click. So that whole flow is quite complicated. Let's do it again. We click on shop. Under button, we append the event list called on-click. Drag and drop the game manager because it's the one that contains the game state initialize script on it. And I just lost. Okay, there it is. We 
we drag and drop game manager, and then we find the game state initialize class and on shop click like so. And just like that, we have a full UI loop. And um, something important as well is that you actually disable the canvas initialize at the beginning. Let's see if when we enter the state, it actually puts it on the screen. So as I press on play, we have this behavior. We have uh, lots of error coming from something completely different. And also we have the play button, which doesn't seem to do anything right now. And that is because the UI, uh, not the UI, sorry, the, the event system, which came with our UI, is actually using the old input module. As you can see here, the standalone input module. Let's replace it with the new input system. There is a button right here that you just have to click. You don't even have to look at what's inside of there. Let's collapse that down, press play again. And there we go. So no error. We are going to drag and drop, uh, not, not drag and drop, sorry. We're going, to, <laughs> we're going to click on play. And as you can see, then the game starts playing. And it's not because we tapped on the screen, because if we tap on the screen anywhere, it's not going to do anything. And when we click on shop, shop button has been clicked. High score has been changed to high score TBD. Fish has been changed to fish TBD. So our UI right here is ready. And that was the very first one. Um, quite simple stuff. And as I've mentioned in your previous video, as we move forward and we make those other canvases for the other states of the game, we're going to be doing it um, in one single video and we're going to be going a little bit quicker. So I hope you understood well what this one uh, entailed and we can then move on to completing this UI in, um, in a good amount of time. It's quite easy. So see you in the next one. Cheers. Hey, welcome back. Now we're going to head into making the canvas for the game scene, which should be quite a simple one. We don't need much things in there. So let's go ahead, right click, new canvas. Make sure it's not a, uh, a object under the initialized canvas. We are on the game canvas now. So to make sure I have the same settings, I'll just open this one, copy the canvas scaler, go over here and paste it. It's something quite important. Don't forget about doing that. Um, the canvas itself stays the way it is. Next up, we are going to head into the canvas game and create ourselves. Um, what I need is I'll need two piece of background. And then on top of that, I'll need to display some information. So it ain't going to be that complicated. Um, you'll see. We will start with a fish count. So again, we're going to be displaying the amount of fishes we have. And it's something that we'll use background one or background two, or you could call it button one or button two. Um, and I think I'll use this one now. So button two is a little bit darker. I'll anchor it at the top left. That's cool. Um, in terms of size, don't want to have something that's too big because it's quite, uh, it's not really important information, but still relevant to have on the screen. And I'll anchor this um say roughly minus 150 or 100 so it's at the top like so yeah so this works i'll copy that this one is going to be the score so we'll be displaying the score but this time i'll anchor it on the other side and it's going to look like that okay now inside of there i will right click add a new image and that will be my fish icon so this fish icon make sure i use the preserve aspect so i get the proper scaling uh, and then i can move it over to the left side maybe i want to make this a little bit bigger like so um since i'm on preserve aspect it's also going to make it uh look a little bit bigger on on the other axis as well which is totally fine and then next to it once we're done configuring this we can head into uh, the text. So I'll right click, add a new text mesh pro once more. Let's do bold text, really huge font. So maybe 80. And let's try to input a couple of digits in there. So as I like to do with text, I just like to scale on all the axes. Then just give it a proper offset. So for example, here, just next to the fish, like so. And then um, I can play with the alignment so it looks exactly where it should be. And what else could we do? We could uh, lower down the fish just a tiny bit, like so. 
Okay, rest is going to be the fun and maybe just the scaling of things. Maybe you want to make this a little bit wider or so um, to make sure my text isn't too big. So in case somebody has a lot of fishes, maybe I'll want to input the auto sizing. So yeah, the feature for auto sizing here, and that will make me um, drag this as well on this side. So maybe something of the sort will do the job. Now it's cool because auto size is going to position, not position, but it's going to Make sure your text is a good size, no matter what the situation is. So for example, if we have multiple zeros, this should not happen actually, this should be on the another line. Now one thing to note with auto size is if you have two words, for example, like this, if we go and we put a little X in front, you're going to receive, uh, you're going to receive this type of behavior, which is not really cool. You can lower down the size of the top if you'd like to put a space or even better. And what I'll do is I'll just make it one word. And now you can scale up as much as you want. And since it's one word, it has to be, it's forced on one uh, specific line. So I'll go with this option here because it looks good on both the X's. And most of the time, people are going to have a score like 10 or so, um, which will allow me to lower this down to maybe 400 again. Okay. Now, um, the other side in terms of score is just going to be one text. So I'll copy my text over to the other side, so to the score. Make sure I anchor it at the proper place. Uh, do a bunch of resizing. Maybe turn off auto size, alignment in the middle, or alignment on the right hand side, maybe. And your score could be something like that. Yeah. And that will do the job. So there's really nothing else to do in here. Uh, there ain't much in the scene. For the game which is totally fine because a lot of happen like uh, a lot of thing that happens if you actually die so that's going to pop up another canvas completely which uh, will give you the option to go to respawn or watch an ad or do all that kind of stuff so for the game scene um and a game state there ain't much left to do at this point but just like we did with the other one we'll have to go ahead and input a couple of things in the game state game now, the things we'll need is um, the text, so serialize field. I believe this is part of system, so that's why we're not getting any. Uh... Hmm. Let me check, probably mistyped it. So using system. Oh, my bad, it's part of Unity Engine. So using Unity Engine, and then I can go down here and say serialized field, uh, private text mesh. X Mesh Pro UGY and this is going to be the fish count. This is going to be the score count and finally we'll need one more, a public game object and that's going to be the game UI. Now as we've done earlier for the other one, so the game state for initialize, we are going to set the UI active or inactive. So I'll go down here. I'll copy my code from the other one. And here's what I'll do. So game UI set active in the construct and game UI set active false in the destruct. If we give this a try um, and we assign the values. So for example, here I have canvas game, oh sorry, game manager, canvas game. I'll assign the fish count text just make sure you grab grab the text part of it and the canvas game as the uh, the game ui now i can disable this start we have my first ui click here we have my second ui okay now the only thing left to do is to actually set these number here at the top to do so at the moment i'll go and i'll do the following so i'll do fish count is going to be equal to x tbd so to be determined oh sorry dot text and i'll also do the same thing for a score count because we're not updating any type of score at the moment which is totally fine we can come back here in the future but at least the code is going to be in there and we're going to have a preview of how to use it which is quite simple giving it one more try before we close this loop and here we go. So the text was modified at the top and we have what we need. All right. So I'm thinking about maybe dropping this down here. Uh, I feel like this is 
encroaching the space of where I should be looking, but it's a decision that if you want to do, it's quite simple to change. So I, I do invite you to modify it um, as much as you wish. Next up, we're going to have the dev menu. So stay tuned. It's directly in the next video. See you there. Welcome back to the UI section. We are now making the hardest piece of UI, which is going to be the dev screen. The reason it's going to be the hardest is because we have a lot of logic in there regarding um, in the future, it's going to be regarding add. But today, it's all going to be about uh, UI. And also, there's going to be an animation in that UI. I'll explain you real quick what the goal of this UI is. One is to display the amount of fish you obtain during this game session. Quite simple. Display your score. Also quite simple. Display the high score. Simple. And then two button. One of them will put you back in, in the main menu. And the other one, however, is going to be a timed button. So you'll have a certain amount of time to click it to revive your player. And that's going to be where uh, the bunch of the logic is going to be today. Now we will start by creating a text mesh pro UI. Um, that's going to be the high score at the very top. So that will just display the high score. Something that already exists. And we're just going to put some arbitrary number for the moment. I'd like to have something that is quite big in size. So maybe 60 in size uh, of the font. Uh, let's have a look. Yep, this looks, I don't want it to be too big, but this looks like a good amount of information that we can have. Um, and I, I'm not going to place this as of right now uh, because I want to show you something. So next up will be an image and that's just going to be a background. Um, and then on top of that will be, for example, our current score. So I want this to be quite big. So maybe 800 by 200 or 300. And then I'll just put the score on top of that. Okay. So the way I'd like this to happen is I'd like to have the high score on top, the image there, and then we just keep going down in that direction for the UI. And we can ensure that this is actually fine on all device resolution, and we can actually ensure that um, it's all constant everywhere. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, so what we could do, we could take the high score, say, hey, you have an anchor at the top. You're going to be at minus 200. Uh, and you have 15 heights, so this image is going to be also anchored at the top, 250. Um, and this, actually, let me fix that, 250. And we can go down like that and just keep remembering. But then if we decide to make this a tad smaller, then it just messes up everything else. And um, it's, not, it's not good. So there is a component in Unity that will let us um, fix this issue or help us with this issue. And on the canvas itself, I will add a vertical layout group. And this is actually going to take care of split my object apart. Right now, it's splitting them um, half and half. So every object beneath canvas dev has half of the screen for themselves. Not the behavior you would like to find, but hey, that's at least that's a start. <laughs> so right here on this vertical layout group, I will uncheck child force expand and child force height. And I will also make sure that my anchor is at upper center. Now like this, um, all the UI is going to move depending on the sizing that I give it. So for example here, I want this image, well, I want this text to be roughly 75 and maybe have a font size of also, uh, no, I'm not gonna say 75 here. Let me just adjust the width real quick. Let me just quickly adjust the width here so it's the same as the button, 800 because I'd like to have this anchor on, on the left side here, uh, maybe down there as well. Um, what I can do is I can give it a padding on the top side, and that's just going to put down everything, like everything beneath this point is going to put down. OK, now do know that this vertical layout group does not affect um, children of children. So right now we have the high score. We have an image that we're going to call score, and then we can put a text in there. And this one will not be affected because it's not uh, directly on the same level. So as we like to do, anchor it on all the axes. Now, I wonder why this is not being rendered right now, but there is text on top of that. OK, so I don't know why it didn't work prior to this. Uh, maybe you guys can point it out if you see the difference. But this text does not really care at all about being rendered on top of this object. However, if I take this high score and I copy it in here, that is not a problem. It will fit perfectly fine. Um, so I just took this high score and I'm going to center it. 
on both axes and type in some sort of score. Can make the font size quite bigger. This one should be the obvious one, so a lot bigger, yep. <laughs> and let's give this maybe a bold, not italic, but bold is enough. And that would be your score for this game. Okay. Now the next step I'd like to do is um, say how many fishes I've gotten during this this uh, this game, this session. And the way I'm going to do it is with another panel like so, but a smaller one. And I'll just call it fish. It's going to be the same exact uh, behavior here where um, we are going to have a panel and behind it a button, sorry, a text. Now you're going to realize that this one, I don't want to have it um, as big as it is, so I'll just split it in two. So 400 here and 150 here. Obviously my font is way too big. I'll go ahead and I'll modify that. And my fish count will be displayed here. And one issue that I have here is that I'd like these to be apart. And if I am to drag and drop this like somewhere else, I can't move it on the Y axis. That's because the vertical layer group is taking care of that. Um, it's actually taking care of positioning these. And that's not something I'd like for this very specific case. So what you can do when you have this kind of behavior, you can create an empty game object and just slide it in between here and give it the height that you wish. And then you have the desired result, which is quite good. So I'm going to move down everything just quickly. Maybe 300 is good. My fish count is going to be right there. Um, There's going to be a spacer, I like to call it. And then we're going to have another spacer. And then here we will add a big uh, play button or replay button in this case. So I'll create a new image, actually, sorry, a new button. That button will have an image component on it. This one will be the play, actually will be a background and then the play button. So maybe make this 250 by 250. On top of it, I'll create a new image, the play button, Scale it that bigger, so 150, 150, why not? Play icon, that's good. Um, we'll add a unclick event later on. And then where the biggest part of the UI will be is down there. So we'll put another spacer in between. And we will input something quite big here. So I'm thinking about making a circle, and I might not have the asset for that at the moment, but We'll get to that when we um, when we need it. So maybe maybe in the asset pack that you have that you've downloaded, uh, this one exists. It could be like a circle, but at the moment I'll use the default one for Unity, so knob. And inside of that knob, I will add the revive icon. So I'll head over to UI, image. My icon is going to be this penguin that has wings because he is reviving. make it roughly, well, I'm, I'm gonna make it quite big actually. And what I do plan on doing here is having a revive button like so, and then the image component as time goes will be, I believe it's called filled and will be going like this, like a timer. And if you don't click on it fast enough, you will lose a chance to revive. Know that this will be also linked to an ad so it incentivizes people to click on it because it has a, a certain cooldown. You want to act fast because you don't have much time to make a decision. And there's going to be an add link to it, which would lead to more clicks and uh, more revenue for your game, obviously. So um, maybe this one is another one I want to modify. So the first knob here is just going to be an image. And then beneath the revive button, we will have another of that image. So UI image as well with the knob. I'll make it big, so maybe, but big, but not as big as the last one. So maybe this type here. I'll change the color for the moment so we can see the difference. Oops. Here. And then what I'll do, as time goes down, I'll just move this like so. 
Okay. So this is the behavior that I, that I intend to have for this button. And now it is time for us to start implementing the rest. So let me just put that on a green actually. You know what? Let's do two things. It's going to go from green to red. Yeah, okay. That, yeah, that seems like a good idea. So we'll do that right now because we don't have any other assets. Um, that's the logic we're trying to have within this. The canvas dev is pretty much dead. Not dead, sorry. <laughs> Done. <laughs> and we can now head into coding this piece of software. Oh, and I forgot something. Um, I see that there's like, you have uh, the high score over here, your current score. I'd also like to put the total fish count. Why not? This seems like a good add. So I'll copy my high score, put it over my fish. Make sure this one has the same size. So wait, fish count, actually fish total. Um, this one is 400. So this one is also going to be 400. Smaller size, obviously. And we can type it like so, so total. And then type in a certain amount here. Okay, so that's going to be a, just additional logic, but it makes a lot of sense to me. Good. So with this in mind, we now have the, the visual we need. And it's now time to head over to the game manager, game state, dev, and start coding all of that, which is going to be the biggest uh, pain point for now. Let's start as we do usually with the game object for the UI. So public game object. Um, and we'll need to include Unity Engine, of course. Call it dev UI. We're going to follow this with the two um, text fields we have. Actually, we have four. So private text mesh pro UGY. And we will call this one, I believe this one was the high score. Current score is going to be the next one. Fish total, and then fish current or current fish. Now, on top of that, we will need more field for the logic where the circle um, goes down and also changes color. So here we'll need some uh, ba -ba -ba completion circle field. And those will be the following. So we're going to start with a serialized field, private image. Image is the type in uh, the Unity Engine dot UI. So make sure you include Unity Engine dot UI. Um, we'll call it completion circle. We are going to follow this with um, for example, we could be using a public float time to decision. So how long do we give our user before he has to decide? We could go with something quite fast, 2.5 seconds. So um, actually, the lower this is, the more likely they will click unless they don't know what they're clicking on. So obviously, you have to find a sweet, a sweet space here. We'll need a private float to know when we, we actually die, so death time. And I think that's all we need at the moment. I'm not quite sure, but yeah. Um, okay, let's go ahead and implement this. As we did with all the other UI, we're going to start by enabling it. So def UI set active true. Since we're here, let's not forget to disable it in a destruct. So override destruct. And we set active to false. The next thing we'll do is set all our text. So high score, current score, fish total, current fish. All of these, we need to set these. Um, and they're all text mesh pro objects. So they all require the dot text. And that's going to be equal to, um, what did we type in actually? We typed in high score total. OK, cool. Let's do that again. So high score, TBD. Current score is going to be high, it's actually going to be a number. So one, two, three, four, five. Fish total, total two dot TBD. And the current fish will be um, maybe something like 20, so a smaller number. So let's go with something like that. Um, and I'll just put it's like exclamation mark in front of it, not some question mark in front of it to know that it's temporary data. OK, so we've set all the text. We have done the, um, we've shown the UI. We've set the text. 
Now it's time to look at the complex logic behind completion circle. And to be honest, it's really not that complex. We just have to use the update state, which we were actually using in the past, of course, for swiping down when we go to menu or swiping up when we resume the game. Well, don't be afraid. Now this is gone. Uh, we have other things for these and we can remove them completely from the update state. We'll come back to, um, to these two function in a bit. But for the moment, let's have a look at the circle. Um, we are going to do the following. We're going to calculate a ratio that will be the time that uh, it is currently right now, minus the time we've died, which we've been doing quite a lot um, in this course. It's basically to tell you how long has it been since the second output, so the time here. How long has it been since we've died? If we divide that by the time to decision, time to decision, that will give us a ratio on how far we are um, in the decision-making process on a scale of zero to one. Now what we can do is actually play with the color. So the completion circle dot color could be a lerp, so color dot lerp in between a say color dot green and also a color dot red. The lerp is going to be the ratio. So at the end, we're going to say, okay, it's 0 0.5. If it's 0 0.5, it's going to be in between green and red, exactly in between. Next up, we also have to uh, change the fill amount to one minus the ratio. That will give us um, the disappearing logic behind it. And now if that ratio goes beyond one, it means we kind of have to disable this. So I'd like to do completion circle, game object, set active, false. And this way we can actually hide the button. They miss their chance. And maybe you want to add an animation on there because it's going to disappear way too fast, but don't worry about that at the moment. Do we have everything we need? I believe we pretty much do have everything we need except the two hooks to these resume button and also to menu. So it's going to be very important to, for us to go back in the engine and actually set all of these. Quite a lot of stuff. So we're going to start with the def UI, followed by the high score. The text within here, which I'll just call score. Uh, oops, I lost it. The fish total, current fish, forgot to rename my assets, something quite important to do. And finally, the completion circle, which in this case, which one would it be? I believe it would be this one on top, yeah. So the revive icon. We can drag and drop in right here. Um, but it's not over. We actually have to do more than that. This revive icon here, needs to be a button as well. So I know we have an image here, but we also need to add the button component, which we can then head on, go on the on click, add the game manager on top of that once more, find the game site def, and that will be not to menu, that will be a resume game here because we're resuming the current game, we're reviving the player. Let's head on the play button again, Add the manager in there. And this is the two menu. So giving this a try. Oh, first we forgot to um, to disable the canvas staff. So let's make sure we disable it. Press play. And I hope we didn't forget about anything. Oh, as I die, uh, I don't know if you guys saw, but it was quite fast. All the text had changed, however, so that's good. Okay, so we have a problem here in which we didn't set the depth timer. So that's totally normal, the behavior it just did. We add, we need to set the depth time in the constructor. So depth time is gonna be time dot time. And then I believe we're gonna be fine. So let's hit play. Run into a wall. Then we have 2.5 seconds to click on this and then I missed it because I'm quite bad. Let's play again. And it's no longer there. Hmm. Oh, because we disabled it in the past, that's why. So we're gonna have to re-enable this thing um, once we construct. So let's make sure that this completion circle is enabled here as well. So set active back to true. 
Okay. Let's hit play once more. Now we're going to run two and die. Let's just hit resume. It puts us in the revive state. And again, which is totally fine at the moment, we might want to limit that to one once we start playing ads so people don't abuse this to get high score. And if I am to play again in the same session, technically this button should still be here. Yep. So I'll let it disappear. Click play. Hit the rock again. And it's here. OK. So the whole flow of this works. Now, obviously, all the tags are not set because we don't have these, these value. We don't have a score being calculated. We don't have fishes being collected. But the UI is in place and is ready to take all of this. And we can now navigate in between these without any problem. Um, the only thing we can't do at the moment is, of course, the shop. So it's something we'll be tackling quite later on in, in, um, in later stage. We'll put the collectible in there first. We'll make sure we have saving logic uh, before we, we do any of that but see it as some sort of add-on to the game. Um, until then, we're going to keep working on this and making this look a little bit better every time we tackle a new task. So guys, thank you so much for watching this section. It's not the last time we do UI. We're going to go back to make the shop, obviously. We're going to make a splash screen, but um, we have all we need right now in terms of functional UI. So I'll see you in the next section. Welcome to the ninth section of this course. And this one is all about data, so additional data. We have our logic in there. We have our logic to play, to move around. Um, this one, however, is about the little thing you collect in the game, those fishes, and also the score, and also saving. So the biggest, uh, the, the three big subsection, you could call it, of this section is one, collectibles, two, score, and three, the save file. And without further ado, Let's just get right into it. The first one is going to be about collectibles. So this video is all about collectibles. Um, in order to get some collectibles in this game, we're going to have to create some. So uh, I invite you to actually lay down um, in the artwork, I believe there is a model for fish under gameplay. Here it is. So this model for fish, I'll actually anchor it at the center of the world. And actually look at the size. Is that a little bit too big for a fish? I believe so. The fish is actually bigger than the, the penguin. Not really cool. Um, just go ahead and uh, make it as big as you wish, really. So I would believe that maybe half that size is good for me. And once I have the proper size, and you know, it's right here, it exists, it's great. Um, see, so the material for this one is some sort of black. Maybe I want to switch that to yellow. We'll see um, in, in the future. It's not a big change if we have to do so. And I will drag it inside of the prefab folder. We might also need another folder for this one. Just call them. I want to call it gameplay, but that's, that's already taken. So just call it collectible. And drag and drop that in here. OK, so we have our fish collectible, which is right here. Um, in order for this to work, it's going to require a, a bit more. So here's what we will do. We will add a circle, not a circle, a sphere collider. The reason we use a sphere collider and not a mesh uh, is simply in terms of performances. Sphere collider is the easiest one to calculate. Out of all collider in the whole engine, a sphere is simply um, your position and your radius. And it's a fairly, uh, it's fairly easy test to make. So. With that in mind, maybe I no actually that's a big that's that's a good size. So I'll go ahead override my prefab, and we're going to create a tag for this one. So I'll add a new tag under the fish, and just call it fish. That should do it. Let's apply it to our fish. Override and apply. The next thing we'd like to do is actually take this collider right here and make sure it is on trigger. The reason we do this is so when our character runs into this, he doesn't get this place and he doesn't like has to move around it. Uh, it's not going to force our player to actually like slide next to it and then go on a different path. It's not going to get out of the lane um, because this character, actually this collider is going to be on trigger, which means you can freely walk through it without a problem and um, the collision data will be sent anyway uh, to this very specific object. Now, this object doesn't have any anything that actually cares about 
having collision um, listened to at least. So we're going to go ahead and make him care by creating a new component that we can just simply call fish. And I'll put that in my script folder for the moment. We can find him a place within the script folder, maybe by creating a new folder called gameplay. And now I'll just drag and drop that in here. Now our fish has a fish component and we need to listen for different changes. And by change, I mean collision. So here is our mono behavior script. And I'll just wipe everything as I always do. And you can have a look at these following function. We have over here on collision enter, and it says that it's being called when this collider or rigid body has begun touching another one. So like if there's a collision, this is going to be called on enter. So as soon as you enter collision, when you exit collision, you have another one for that. And while you are colliding and every single frame while you're colliding, you have another one for that. Now, don't confuse the on collision enter with what we have to use in this case, since we're not really treating collision. However, we're treating a trigger. So we have other set of callback here. Um, I wouldn't say callback. Let's just call them events in this case. Um, we have another set called on trigger enter, on trigger exit, on trigger stay. They behave the exact same way. However, they are for trigger collider and not just normal collider that will block your way. Um, if you see a difference in between 2D and the normal one, that's just because one of them is for the any type of collider that says 2D next to it. And of course, it's only being used in 2D. So private void on trigger enter. And here you get information about the other collider. That's why it's actually being called other. It's the other person colliding with you. So in this case, it would be the player. And we can check that by doing the following call. If other dot tag is equal equal to player. Assuming that we have a tag player tag on our player, I believe we do. We do not actually. <laughs> we uh, let's go ahead and take our penguin and make sure he is tag as player because that's our player and it's already built in. We don't even have to create that tag. Now, when that collision happens, let's call another function called pick up fish, which we'll just declare down here. So pick up fish. Um, the reason I would like to create a function just for that is because I, I just want to separate things. Um, and when we do pick up the fish, we could go and do a couple of things. We could play an animation. Uh, one thing for sure is that we have to increment. So increment the score or the fish count. We can increment the score. Play a sound. We can, what else could we do? Um, we could also trigger a animation. And that seems to be pretty much it right now. That's the only thing I have in mind. Um, okay, that's pretty good. At the moment, the only one we could immediately implement, I believe, since we don't have the score, we don't have the fish count, we don't cat, we don't have a audio machine, uh, is really just the animation. So I'll go ahead and I'll implement very quickly a animation in here. So I'll do a private animator and M, and I'll make sure to actually get this one in the start. So private void start and M is equal to get component. Oops, get component type of animator. By doing this, I will grab a reference to my animator. And when I do pick up the fish, I can call a certain trigger. So set trigger and just call it pickup. Okay. Now it's going to be about creating a small animation with this fish that happens when you pick him up. So if we go in here, we can lay down a animator. And then if we um, open up our animation window, so that's the regular animation window. I can create a new animation called uh, fish underscore idle. And then I'll do fish underscore pickup. And now we have two sets of animation for this one. I'll go ahead and I'll um, drag and drop these three inside of the prefab collectible right here. Now let's go ahead and do something with these. Um, so we have the normal fish, which is right here. Maybe we can give it a slight animation where it moves a little bit. So what I'm going to do is anchor this down here so you can, you can see a little bit better. I'm on fish idle. One thing that I realized might be a problem, actually will be a problem, is the fact that if we start animating this fish position, 
we're actually editing the world position and not the local position. Meaning that if we have fishes, say, around here in the map, and we tell it to animate on, on, on the world axis, which we are right now, they're just going to go back to the origin of the world and like start moving around here. Um, not the behavior we're looking for. So what I will be doing here is I'll actually go in my scene, anywhere really, and create a new game object. Make sure it is a top level object um, empty. And I will call it the fish collectible. And I will drag and drop my fish beneath it. I actually don't need a prefab like this one anymore. Uh, but the fish collectible as one will be dragged back in here. So you see, I've just created another prefab uh, that is just, it's the exact same thing, but it has a top level with nothing on it. And then the fish is beneath. What I will do next is I'll actually grab my animator, click old. You can do that in UT. I didn't know that for a while. Uh, actually, I can't do that with this component. Okay, that's a shame. I will remove my animator and I will head on the fish collectible and add it right here. Make sure I set it. And then I'll override it, apply all. By doing that, my logic stays on my, my fish model. Also, my visuals are still there. But now I can animate it um, in regard to the center of the world. So I'm going to go ahead and just move this fish back to where it should be in the center and then take his parent, move it somewhere I can see. And we will start animating this. So as far as the idle goes, I'm going to go ahead and start recording. For the idle, oh, by the way, when you record, hit, hit the record here and any movement that you do from this point on will affect um, this animation. So be really careful what you move. But uh, make sure, however, that you select the fish beneath. If you take the parent and you move him, you have the exact same problem that we just discussed. However, if you take the fish, you can go ahead and just start playing around with the animation a tad bit. So maybe rotate 125 like so. And then after a couple of uh, frames, you go back to not zero, I would say 90. Yep. And then a couple more frames. Mm. We could do 65, which gives us this, um, um, this sort of behavior right here, which isn't bad. Um, and then to make a full loop, we'll go back to say 130, and I'll just put that back on the 120. And it will look something like that. So that's not too bad. However, as you can see, there's like a small hiccup at the end. Um, we can we can address that in a second. But before I address this, I'm just going to go ahead and play with the y-axis. So I went at the y-axis, input zero. I'm going to go and say at the middle of animation, which is roughly at 45 second, maybe 0 0.2, and then back to zero here at the end. So very very standard animation that plays a little bit too fast in my opinion. If you want to make sure it plays slower you can select everything and then you have this blue uh, blue rectangle here that you can drag out and say hey this animation instead of one minute and uh, well actually one second and third 1.5 second is actually going to be three seconds and see it's already much smoother however we can make it even more smooth by now going under the curves and what isn't smooth in this animation is um, when it ends, so roughly around here. Oh, there it is. I had to zoom out quite a bit, but as you can see, what is messing up here is really those sharp, very, very sharp spike, which we definitely don't want. So um, we'll need to smooth them out, and they're right here. Yep, that's him. So he's a he's a culprit right here. So uh, let me check how I address this issue. Now, while you're navigating this, uh, you have the middle mouse, which will help you zoom. But then if you hold control, you will zoom, but like just on, on the horizontal axis, which is what I have to do here to get the proper data that I need. So uh, I might have played around with my animation wrong for some reason. It needs to do a really nice curve. So just go ahead and, and fix that manually if you have to. And for some reason, I think I have one over here. Yep, so that make a little bit more sense. Um, I, 
I wasn't sure why this would happen, but it's fixed now. So 165 here. And if you're curious, your, your data is on the left hand side. So over here, what my cursor is. So I remember it being 125 for this one. And it doesn't matter if it's not exactly where it should be. It's an animation. It's supposed to be more, a little bit more organic. And then when you press spacebar and you play it, it looks much better. Okay. So I just wanted to make something very simple. I'm not going to spend the whole day on this, but uh, that, that's it. <laughs> um, now, as far as the picking up goes, we can go ahead and record something very quick as well, which is going to be, say, for example, um, we can put it at 0 0.1 for the start in the Y axis. And I just want to make this disappear. So I'll modify the scale. It starts at 0 0.5 for me because that's that's scale decided. And then it's quickly going to go up and very, very quickly. So I'm talking about maybe a third of a second. And then it will go up in the air at maybe 1 in Y. And I'll just put the scale down to 0. So it completely disappears. So it, it looks like this, right? It's a very simple goes up and disappear logic. That can do it. Maybe it's a tad too fast. Um, I would agree that it might be a little bit too fast. So, and I don't feel it's like, like it's um, it's high enough. So maybe two. That's a good start. We could go ahead and play with some particle as well, but that's going to be enough for the very simple animation we're looking for. Okay. So uh, we don't have much things to, to play around with. As I've mentioned, we don't have the score, but at least we've input the animation in there and I'm really eager to try it out. Um, hopefully we can do that. So I'll just take my fish collectible, hope there is no model in the way and I'll hit play. You see what? There is no model in the way. So let me actually go ahead and collect them. Oh, I'm okay. I moved it a little bit. Um, outside of the lane. So let's try that again. Okay, now he's inside of the thing. Again. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so it seems like I have an issue here. What could it be? Um, for some reason, my is trigger is off, which is not the behavior I'd be looking for. So let's go ahead and add that. So is trigger is on make sure you add that while the game is not playing and also realize that there is a problem missing component exception there is no animator to the fish and that's completely normal that's because we moved the animator away so it's no longer on here but it's on the parent so get component in parent would do the job here now with that in mind let's hope we're lucky and get the proper prefab to spawn all right, let's give this a try. And it says that pickup doesn't exist. OK, so we forgot to do a couple more things. Um, in the animator itself, we forgot to actually program the animator. <laughs> so um, initially, the fish just goes idle. That's totally fine. And then at one point, any state will trigger fish pickup as long as trigger exists. So condition pickup. Um, however, there is no condition. So let's head over to parameter. Add trigger. That's going to be pick up. And we can simply choose it from the list, which means this should now be triggered. If we're lucky enough to get the proper, <laughs> the proper thing. OK. And there you go. So that was it. It was really hard to see. Maybe I want to change its color. Once it is yellow, uh, it might be a little bit easier to see. But we entered the picking up phase, which is good. OK, so um, right now we have a good start. I'd like to keep this going on the next episode where we actually uh, make sure to integrate this with the certain gameplay elements, so the gameplay chunks, and then also make sure that when we repeat those chunks in the future, um, these fishes are respawn because we reuse some of the same chunks. And you know, um, if we reuse the same chunk twice, then chances are if we picked up the fishes in the first one, they won't show up in the second one. So we have to address this issue. Um, yeah, so we'll do that in the next one. Cheers. Welcome back to the collectible subsection of this section in which we talk about this small fish right here.
we were discussing an issue at the end of the last episode in which if we are to put this on top of a gameplay prefab right now, um, this thing would disappear. Uh, if we collect it once and then we reuse the same prefab in the future, this thing might just as well disappear. So first, we will do that. <laughs> we will show this, this problem happening and then we'll fix it. But of course, the reason why I'd like to show it is because we have to place these fishes somewhere at one point. So um, under gameplay chunk number one, we could go ahead and actually place a fish prefab that we've created. So collectible. I could go ahead and place it somewhere roughly there. So maybe you would have to jump to get this one. And that's a fair place to put it. Now I'll go and I'll do the same thing in, in number two. So I'd like to put that somewhere in number two. Um, for example, we could put it after the rock. So it would require you to actually jump. And that could be the place where you put this fish. Okay. Now these two are being part of the game at this point. We just have to drag them in there and they should be part of the game. So you see one right here. Ah, uh, there it is. So we have the fish right here already being collected. I don't know if you guys see it, um, but if I zoom in, this fish is really small. It's actually already collected. And for some reason, it didn't play the animation all the way through. We can look into that uh, right after. But that's that's not a complete fish. As you can see, it, it's way too small. And that's because I keep collecting them. Um, the, this behavior is actually because, well, the animation was played. Uh, the fish collectible is there, and we reuse a chunk that was already used in the past. And that, that's where our problem actually comes from. So, oh, you, you see it now. It's actually being, it's actually spamming. There it is. That's a problem. It's actually spamming the animation in a loop. So we're going to resolve that as well right now. Um, so first issue is the pickup. Pickup, remove the loop, the loop time on it. That's the animation. So now it doesn't loop anymore. The second problem is that if we collect it, it's just going to disappear forever, not the behavior we'd like to have. Instead, every time that the chunk is being respawned, we'd like to reset this fish. And we can do so. We can do so with a bunch of different methods, but we'll explore something that I don't really do often, and it's the message, the sending message. Um, <laughs> I would like you to, to, to actually check this out. So on this chunk right here, we have a script called chunk. We already have a point um, in which we know we're showing the chunk. So right here, right? So we know that when we do show chunk, it's technically just like uh, respawning. It's like reinitializing that chunk. Well, what we could do is we could take this object, this game object, a chunk itself. So maybe this. And just on top of this, we can broadcast a message to everybody beneath it and say, hey, we're responding right now. You want to do something with this information? You can, you, you're free to do so. Uh, if not, I don't mind. We can actually do that. And by making like broadcasting that message to everybody, our fish can say, Hey, yeah, I do care about when you, you actually respond and I'm, you know, I'm going to respond as well. Um, that's, that's very much possible with the broadcast message, or I believe it's a send message. Is it broadcast? I believe it is broadcast. So um, under my chunk.cs, I'll go ahead and I'll do. Um, so you have the option to do broadcast message. That is not recommended. It's going to broadcast to everybody in your scene, and that's way too expensive. So make sure you target this very specific game object. So I'll do transform game object. Then I can broadcast a message to my children, basically. Um, and that message is going to be the name of the method. So we can do on. Oh, actually, on show chunk, like so. Um, just threading it this way is going to cause problem because by default, this function does not allow you to just send a message without having a receiver. So you have to specify in case in case you have a chunk that doesn't have a fish, this might be a problem. Um, unless you write the following parameter, you have the send message option that can come up as a second parameter, and that's don't require receiver. And by doing that, I'll now be allowed to have um, chunks that doesn't have any receiver on it. So check this out. Now we grab the on show chunk. We can head over to our fish and say the following. We write down a public void 
on show chunk and that will pretty much say uh, well we have to respawn this fish so um, we can set a trigger for idle we can put the animation back on idle that'd be great and let's just put a capital i here because we put a capital p to pick up um, do we need to do anything else i believe this is it um, I don't feel like we need to do anything else. Yeah, so yeah, let's go ahead and do that. So uh, let's go configure our animator right here. And just to make sure that I don't pick up this, this item twice during the same chunk, I'll add a couple more things to the animator. So let's go right here. I double click on the animator. I have idle, that's totally fine. Pick up is here. I'll add a new trigger for idle and link any state to that. Make sure also I have my proper condition in place. Okay, and I want to do one more thing just to make sure we don't pick this up twice. I'll open up the animation window, go on my fish, fish collectible. Um, how do I open the animation? I'll just drag this in the scene. Now I have access to the animation. I'd also like to record um, and make sure my fish. Sphere Collider is active when I'm idle. And when I'm on pickup, it's no longer active. So we don't hit up the uh, the same thing twice uh, in, the same, in the same go. So that should do it. OK, I am now ready to override this. Delete and give it a try. And now we'll give this a try. So I'm going to go ahead and go at the very beginning, see what is my first chunk and it's this one i believe i can't click it because of the shader <laughs> uh, here it is so that's the first one world generation chunk to clone that's the first one i'll look at my fish so here it is and we will just keep on moving so hopefully i can collect it first go yep and it should be turned off really soon so now as you can see here in my scene view it is being turned off and i'll just have to wait until this one pops up again um, which should be anytime, anytime soon now. And here it is, it's back. So as you guys can see, I have a fish and it doesn't seem to appear. So what could be the problem this time? Um, the scale in, is on zero and it seems like object was not set to the reference object, huh? Oh, and it turns out that I have a lot of null reference coming from this line because we spawned at the beginning. Okay, so that's right. We don't have the animator at this point. We can do a null check here. So on the animator, if you add the question mark, it's going to check if it's null first. And if it is, um, then it's not going to run the following code. So set trigger. What could be a problem here? It doesn't seem to go back to the proper state. And it says right here that fish idle is there. Oh, again, I get it. Okay, so the problem here is. Um, in the idle state, we never actually reset the size, so it's going to be on me to go back on my fish. And that's a mess up from last episode, so I'm really sorry about that. We have to make sure we um, set a size. So on fish idle, I'll make sure to put the scale of this fish be needed. So this one on 0 0.5. It just didn't have a keyframe, so it assumed the rest of the information we've input, but it did not, it did not actually reset the size. Um, which was a problem. So with that in mind, we can give it a, hopefully, a final try. So I managed to collect the first one. That's my first chunk here on the right-hand side. It disappeared. We'll wait a little bit for when it responds. And it's back up. Okay, so I'm going to double click on it, see if I can see it in the scene view. And my fish is here and it's whole. That's perfect. To make sure I can actually collect it again, I'm going to wait until my penguin runs into it. So where am I? I'm roughly around here. OK, that shouldn't take, shouldn't take that long. Hopefully I don't mess up. That'd be really awkward. And I believe here I am. And I collected it again. OK, that's good. Amazing. So. That logic is in there and it's working just fine. And that's where we're going to wrap up this episode. In the next one, we are going to be looking at saving the score and also incrementing um, 
the UI as well. So I will see you in the next one. In the last video, we made sure to implement the fish collectible. Um, now today we're going to be looking into implementing both the score and also one place where we get to keep all of that data. So one component, one C sharp class that would act as a container of all that data. So to do so, I will go ahead and right click on script and I'll lay down a new script that I'll call uh, game stat. And this one, just like a couple of other systems we have in our game, for example, the game manager in this case, um, we're going to do this very specific static instance here. So with that copied, I'm going to head back to my game stat, open it up, copy it right here, and replace the game manager by the game stat. Now we have a public static instance that we can access to from anywhere, really. And um, we're going to start laying down what we need in here. So two things we'll need for sure. One is the score, and then it's the amount of fish we have collected. And also we could do the amount of fish we have right now. So as a total, um, in fact, <laughs> let's, let's actually get everything in here. So I'll lay down a couple of fields here. Um, for score, we will start with a public float score then we can go with a public float high score move on to the fishes public int um, total fish public int fish collected this round this session I'd like to call it actually that's how we've been naming those play on um, play session actually thus far and we could also keep in mind the, um, the amount of points we're going to give every time you collect a fish. So maybe public float um, points per fish when you do collect them. And then finally, we'll wrap up the field declaration section with a action. That action will be the following public action on collect fish. So every time that we do collect a fish, we will trigger this action. Other people can subscribe to it if they wish. And um, every time it happens, then of course we send that call. This will be needed, for example, when we are um, on the UI for the game and then we collect the fish. Our UI will be subscribed to the game stat here. And as soon as we do collect that fish, then we get to, uh, to know that it's time for us to change the text on the screen. In fact, we can now send it the amount of fish that we have uh, during this session by actually adding parameter here for int. Now let's lay down the very first function we'll have in here, and that will be the public void collect fish. This will of course be called um, whenever we do collect the fish. And in there, one thing we'll have to make sure is that we actually call the event that we've made a second ago. Um, it will be called with the fish collected this session because we're sending in a int um, as a parameter. So so whomever is subscribed to on collect fish will receive a message every time that we collect one and also we receive the amount of fish we have this very specific round on top of invoking the event actually before we invoke the event let's actually increment the amount of fish we've collected this session just like so all right now it's time to calculate the score we're going to have for this game and it's going to be a very very simple formula and i'll actually do it in a update instead so private void update and here's what we're going to do. We're going to calculate the float, um, the float score or float S in this case, uh, with two things. First, we're going to check where we are in the map on the Z axis, which means this is going to be the distance we travel since the start. And then we're going to accumulate the amount of fishes we have and then multiply it by, uh, points per fish. So our score is going to look something like this player transform actually. Oops. Um, we need to find the player transformer, the player, which I believe is on top of the game manager instance. Do we have access to the player? Yeah, we have access to the molar dot transform dot position dot Z. And then we can multiply that with a score modifier based on the distance maybe. So I did not add that here, but let's go ahead and do that. So, um, distance modifier. For example, it could be 1.5. So every meter you make in the game, you receive 1.5 points. And then on top of that, we will add the uh, the score we're supposed to have with the fishes. So fish collected this session times points per fish. Now, if that score, if S is bigger 
or equal. I know let's just do bigger. If it's bigger than score, then we're going to say score is not equal to S. Um, and you would think that every single frame would be a higher score because we are further away in the distance Z. But the truth is um, we have a small, small thing when we die. We actually pull back a bit. And when that happens, our score would go down because we lose some distance. So uh, the, the check over here is just to make sure that when we, when we actually die, we keep the highest score where we have died and not when we pull back with the animation. So um, yeah, that's why it's there. We're going to put that back on zero eventually. So no worries about that. OK, and now one more thing that I just thought about. And um, you might be wondering why I'm thinking about this now. Uh, I do have notes when I make this video. However, I like to improve on the code that I've made the last time at the same time. So something I didn't plan out is that we'll also need an action for the score itself. So on score change. And the reason is when my score change, my UI has to be subscribed to that event and also look for the change. So it knows when to, to actually update the text on the screen. Um, prior to that, if we have a look at my old code, it, I actually had <laughs> reference to the text and I didn't think that was cool. I didn't think that was encapsulated. So here's what I wanted to do instead. We're going to put that in action and we will subscribe to it the exact same way as when we subscribe to uncollect fish. And that event would be called right in here. So when we're not playing, the score doesn't actually go up and we are not calling this. It's a little bit more optimal. So on score change, and we're going to invoke with the actual score. Um, now you might be thinking, well, Michael, this is not optimal either. And you're right. Uh, the reason this is not optimal is because every single frame in the update, we're going to be firing that event. And that's, that's going to be fast. So we're going to be updating the game. For example, if we do 60 frames a second, we are calling an event 60 frames per second, which is just way too insane. And on top of that, we do plan on having that event change uh, UI, which means the whole canvas will be redrawn 60 times uh, 60 times a second, which is way too much. It's going to be way too expensive. Now, it might work. It might work at 60 frames a second, and we won't see anything. We won't see any bump if we have a good device. But the, the matter of the fact is that it's still a very costly operation. So what we're going to do on top of all of that, we are going to add an internal cooldown. And this will be done with two new fields. And I'll just add internal cooldown right here. Call it private float last update, actually last score update. And also on top of that, we can do the update delta. So score update delta. Say we want to update every 0 0.2 seconds, which means instead of doing 60 frames a second, actually, instead of calling the update, um, 60 times a second, we'll be calling it five times, which is a lot more optimal and it's going to look good. So with that in mind, we can now add some code in here and do the following. If time that time um, minus last score update is bigger than the update delta, then we're going to call on score change and we're also going to set the last score update to now. All right, so this is starting to look pretty good. We have the update, we have the collect fish. We're missing two type of function with this script. One, the high score and the total fish. We need to find a way to report these. And also we need a way to reset these stats once we start a new session. So I'd actually, let's, let's do that right away. So public void reset session, which will have the following effect. So score is gonna be equal to zero. Fish collected this round is also going to be equal to zero. And will we need anything else? I don't think so, but maybe we want to. No, we, we actually don't need to. Do we need to change these? I believe we might want to change these as well. So maybe on score change is going to be invoke with score. And same thing for the other one. So on collect fish. Which is kind of bad because now that I think about it, uh, we're not collecting a fish here, so we don't want to do exactly what happens in here. Hmm. But we're using this only to call the text right now. So maybe I would just need to 
revisit how I call this function, but that will do. So fish collected this session. And this is a big reset, which should happen every time we enter the game state. Maybe, maybe every time we, we enter the game state? Probably not, because we re-enter the game state at the same time as we revive. So when we revive with our, with our penguin, uh, we would reset the thing. So that's not, that's not a good place to do it. Where else could we do it? We can probably do it in a game state initialize. So let's head back into the game flow, I would believe. And in the state initialize, when we do unplay click here, let's call it game stats dot instance dot reset session. Okay. All right. So we haven't seen this one just yet in action, and that's what we're going to make sure, make sure it exists right now. So headed back on my game manager, I will add the game stat. And just to make sure, I'll just go and up this one. So move up right above all my states, like so. And let's have a look at it as we're playing the game. So we start right off the get go with 0, 0, 15, actually not 15, but 1.5 for distance. And if we just hit play, we first have a problem with the, uh, with the null reference, but our score do go up. And as I collect the fish, nothing happens right now. Don't worry, we'll be addressing that in a moment. But at the moment, gamestat.instance restart session didn't do anything. So that talks to me that we've never actually set the instance of gamestat. So right here, instance is null, which means we have to go back, lay down a private void awake, and make sure instance is equal to this. OK, so small mistake here. Our second problem was that the fishes were not being accounted for. So as I collect a fish, if I don't miss, like here, we were not getting a total fish up and not getting a fish collected this session. Actually, we don't really care about total fish as of right now. We'll care about it once we end the game. But right now, we're going to head over to fish script. And when we pick up a fish, Let's call the game stats instance collect fish. Okay. And as we're playing, we collect our first fish and it's right here. So fish collected this round is there. We're at two right now. Um, points per fish were, was actually not set. So that was a problem as well. So maybe we want to set that to, for example, uh, 10. It should be a big reward. So. I'm going to make sure that on my game stat, this is being reflected by right clicking, hitting reset. And then once we collect the fish at this point, of course, we should have plus 10. And OK, I just died. OK, so our score did go up by 10, and that is great. That's exactly what we needed here. Next up, we need the UI to actually listen to this. And I think that's, that's going to be the biggest part, the one that makes a lot of changes to our game. So to do so, we will head over to our game manager, find the game state game, open it up. And in the construct, I will now be subscribing to the change events. So how do we do that? We go like this, game stat, instance, the name of our event, which I believe is um, is right here. So on collect fish and also on score change. So on collect fish plus equal, and then we can lay down either a lambda expression that could be cool, or um, just a new function itself. So to show you both, we're actually going to do both. Um, for example, and feel free to to use twice the same thing if you wish. Um, but I'm going to do here one for collect fish public, actually not public, private void collect fish or on collect fish is a little bit more accurate in this case. It takes in a int for the amount of fish collected. And then we can write code down here. 
So all we have to do for this one is just paste in the name of our function, like so. But if you'd like to do a lambda expression, you can go and do the following. So on score change, plus equal, open the bracket for parameters. In this case, the score parameter was, just call it S, do a equal arrow, and then you have your function right here that you can call. So in this case, it would be score count dot text is equal to s to string or just s actually s is a float so we have to do a to string okay so you have the both option um whichever you like is the best that, that's really up to you but at this point that's the one i'll be using i'll be using both actually so fish count that dex is going to be equal to the amount collected to string all right, let's give this a try. And as you can see here, I have one fish and my score is going up. Now, is it going up in the matter that I'd like it to be? Uh, not really. We, we might want to change that a little bit so it has a better display. But at least it's going up and we can see a big change within our game. Now, let's head into the code and clean this up a tiny bit. We have the construct over here. Um, in the destruct, I'll make sure to unsubscribe from this event, which makes me realize that, by the way, I cannot do that because I can't, <laughs> I can't destruct it. Uh, I cannot unsubscribe this way. So it's going to be important that we actually adopt this uh, method right here. I'm sorry about that. I just wanted to show you something more. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll actually take what I've made over here and I'll paste it down there and just add the unscore change. Reason being, as I've just mentioned, is that we're having issues um, unsubscribing for these, which is going to be important because we do that in a construct. So every time that we re-enter this, we would be subscribing the same function to the same event, and that's that's not cool. Unless, of course, you do minus equal on these once you're done with them. So one more thing we'll do to wrap up this video is to make sure that my two strings over here, they look actually a little bit better than they do right now. Um, we could go ahead and for the, for example, for the score, we could say two string, but you need to have a minimum amount of digits in here. And to do so, we can put it in quotes. Say we want to have uh, six zeros. We can do it this way, and it's going to make sure to actually format our string in such a way that if we have 25 of a score, it's going to write it this way. So let's give this a try so you can see what I'm talking about. And here you go. So it actually makes sure to input a couple of zeros at first. And I'd like to do that as so for also for this one here. So three zeros. And if we want to go even better than that, we could go back on the game stats, create two new public string, public string, score to text, and public string fish to text. And return the following. So score two string six zeros. Or actually seven in this case. Felt like there was a there was one missing from the space. And same thing for the amount of fish collected this session. By doing this, it will leave me one place where I can just change the amount of zeros, and um, it's going to be reflected everywhere in my game when I use it. Now going back on the game state. Here, I can just say game stats dot instance dot, um, which one was that? Fish to text. And here, score to text. Okay. And I think we're pretty much done for this one, yeah. Um, we've, been, we've been talking for a while. We can then go back after this and clean up our little mess for the next episode but at the moment i think we have enough and we can then move on to um, the third part which will be saving so i'll see you guys there welcome back to the last subsection of this section which is all going to be about saving and saving your data um, for this one we will be creating two scripts and they will be stored inside a new folder called save 
what we're going to be doing is we're going to have an object that controls saving and loading data. And we'll have another object that is just a data structure. And, uh, and that data structure will explain what are we going to save, exactly what it's going to be. So that being said, we are going to start with the data structure. I like to call it the save state. So everything in, in here, in this class, and it's going to be a fairly small one, um, will be things that we will save. So I just want to make sure that uh, you understand that everything put inside of here will be saved unless we tell it that it won't, um, which we will also do by the end of the tutorial. This one will not inherit from model behavior for the sole purpose that it's not an object that we'll just put on another object. It's just going to be a, it's a really, it's a real data structure or data class in this one. And one thing that will be really important with this data class is that it is a system.serializable class. Now, when we do that, when we actually lay down a class that is marked as serializable, we try to only use things, and when I say things, I mean types that are serializable. So pretty much all the basic types are. So int, float, um, byte, date, time, they, the really simple ones are really all serializable. And if they're not, if you're trying to add your own custom type into there, um, then you can overload something to make sure it is serializable. But for now, for us, really, we don't need to keep anything too complex. The thing we'll need to keep are the following. A public int high score. And I mark these as property. That's why I have a capital here. A public int fish. That's going to be a total amount of fish, by the way. And you know what? At the moment, that is all we need. Eventually, we'll need a little bit more. And um, ju just for show purpose, let's also add a date time. Why not? Uh, for the last save time. In case you want to put your save on the cloud, it's something you actually need um, to compare whether or not which one is, is the latest save. But I do not plan on making this to the cloud at the moment. But eventually, there's nothing stopping us from, from doing so. And there's a couple of tutorial on the YouTube channel um, that shows you how. It uses the same principle as a save state, so that's even better. OK, let's say that's all we need right now. Um, when I create my game, I would like to have the default save state in case we're not able to load any of those. So in case we don't have a saved, um, a saved play session prior, it's the first time we open the app. Now let's create a default one. So public save state, and that will be the constructor. And here, we'll just say, hey, uh, you know what? Fish is equal to 0. We're starting up fresh. And also high score is equal to 0. And the last time we save is actually right now. So last save time is going to be equal to date time dot now. And that's it. That's all we need in this class. Actually, you know what? Don't even need Unity engine dot uh, using Unity dot engine. That's all we need in this class right now. We're saving only three values: high score, fish, and of course, when is the last time that we've saved? All types are serializable, including date time. And uh, yeah, we're now ready to move to the save manager. Now, just like all the other managers we have in the game thus far, we will create a public static instance for those. So if we have a look at the game manager, I'll just copy over this code and make sure I actually paste it inside of the save manager. Of course, change the name of the class, and then we now have a, um, a public static instance. OK, a couple of fields that we will need for this one is one, how should we name our save state? So private cons, I'm going to make this one uh, cons because we're never going to be, ch you know, we're never actually going to change that unless you go directly into code. Um, how do we call our save file? Save file name. We could call it something like data dot um, subway skater save file. You can invent whatever format you'd like to have, actually. Uh, SS sounds good. So save state or save or subway skater, that also works. OK, so now from this point on, the goal of this class will be the following. Once the game starts, we will have to grab a file within our, our game folder, grab a file called data.cc, or ss, actually. <laughs> and we will have to deserialize it and then input it inside of our game. If there is no data, we create one. And also, every time that we call a certain function we'll create in here called save, we take our save state, we serialize it, and then we put it back to that file. 
So we will start with the easiest part. Private void awake. We're going to be looking for a file. Our goal of looking for a file will be to try and load the previous save state. Um, then what else will we need? That's it. That's actually all we have to do in the awake. Um, yeah. So we will call the load function, which doesn't exist right now. So we'll create it. So we private void load. And now what should we do in here? For our load, it is now time to pull on the gracious system.io to actually access file on our system. And we can do so um, like this with the new file stream. Now I don't have that access thus far, so let's just hit control and then dot on the keyboard using system.io. So in case if you missed it, it's right here. A new file stream, and then we send in the path, I believe. So not this one, yeah, the path. So that's our save file name, followed by the file mode. So file mode dot open in this case. And then file access, we would like only to be able to read. So we're opening the file and we're just trying to read it. This returns us a file stream. So we can go here, file stream, uh, call it file, and make it equal to that. Okay. Now, chances are this might fail. This might fail for the whole reason that uh, there's a chance that there is no file called data.ss in this folder. And if, if that's the case, then I'd like to actually just be able to wrap this up in a try catch. So this is what I'll do. I'll wrap this logic in a try catch. And if it doesn't work, then I'll just say something like debug.log save file not found. Let's create a new one and then call the save function that we don't have <laughs> at the moment. Um, we'll get to there in a second, so don't worry about this one just, just yet. Okay, so going back here, if we found a file, then let's actually assign our save state to it. Now, do note that we have actually never referenced our save state, so that's my bad here. We should have that as a field um, at the top, so public save state. And I'll just call it save. I don't need to be, it doesn't have to be more complex than that. It's just a public object that contains all the data for this very specific uh, application, actually. It contains everything for the whole application. Um, if we found something, let's say save is going to be equal to save state, we'll have to cast it because now we are trying to deserialize a file stream. Okay. Now, that might be a little bit complex um, at first sight, but just think about this. We have a file on our file system called data.ss. This is most likely a text file. It has string in it, right? A whole bunch of um, character in there. We are trying to make sure that this string or very, very long string is actually equal to our own save format. And we can achieve this with a deserialize. However, at this point, we've never actually decided which type of serialization we're going to go through. There's a couple of different ones. Um, you have a binary formatter. You can format in, uh, in memory. You can format in a bunch of different ways. One that I like quite a lot is the binary formatter. Now you're free to use whichever one you like. Uh, it doesn't really matter if you know how to serialize, deserialize, then <laughs> do, do whichever you like. But I'm going to show you how to use the binary one. Um, and to do so, I'll actually declare an instance here at the top. So a private binary formatter will need to include the following here. So runtime serialization formatter binary, and I'll just call it formatter. For this one, we actually need to instantiate it at the beginning, not instantiate, but create a new, um, a new instance of that class. So at the top in the awake, I'll say formatter is equal to a new binary formatter, just like this. OK, now with that in mind, we can go here, remove the comment, and say the following. I want you to, and I'll just remove this, make this a little bit more clear at the beginning. I want you to deserialize the object I will receive 
in the file stream. So formatter dot deserialize and then the stream itself. Now, um, as I've mentioned, this is going to return you a object. So you need to cast it in our case as a save state. Or you could just write it at the beginning here, like I've done earlier. Both are the same thing. Once you're done, you can actually go and close your file stream. So file to close, and you're pretty much uh, you're pretty much done. So you've got it. Maybe we would like to add an event to make sure that we know uh, when things are loaded. So just to do things in a good manner, we can go here and create two new action, public um, action, and then say save state on load. Same thing here, so on save. We will need to do using systems. And then we can call onload invoke with the save state. All right, so that is in case we found something. So if we found a file, then we're going to load it up and then replace the public save state save for the new data. Now, in case we didn't find anything, well, I would like to create that file actually. So we have our private void load, but now we also need to have our private void save. Or you know what? This one should actually be, actually they should, they should both be public so we can call it from outside sources. Yeah, let's do public void save and also public void load. Not that I think I'll be calling it, um, I don't know that I think that we'll need to load anytime soon, but saving for sure, we'll need to call it from outside a couple of times. So once we finish a game, uh, we need to save pretty much every time uh, because we might have new, a new total amount of new fishes. And right in here, we will start with a check. Are we being sent here because we go through the load uh, and we don't have anything to save? Or are we being uh, sent here through a overwrite? So let's check. There is no previous state found create a new one and we can do so by checking if state oh sorry not state but save is equal to null then we're going to create one with our default constructor so the one that sets our default value so fish is equal to zero high score is equal to zero and last save time is equal to now um, which is a bit weird because we're going to override right here so set the time at which we've tried saving and we can say save dot last save time is equal to date time dot now and then we're going to open the bridge in between the game and our file system so just like we've done earlier we're going to take this line of code and i'll just paste it here so open a file on our system and write to it. We're going to need a couple of different access in here. So instead of doing um, open, we will do open or create. And instead of writing, we will need a full on write access. Now we can actually write to this very specific file stream using the formatter. So formatter.serialize. We want to serialize um, this file stream, the one we just created. And then the object will be our save state. Once we're done, we can close the file stream. And finally, as a good measure, we can then call unsave invoke with our file state. OK, that's a lot of code, and we haven't really tried it out. So I'm hoping everything's going to work on the first go. I don't see why it wouldn't, but let's give this a try. To help you out, you can open up your folder over here. So I'm on my desktop and that's my, my project folder. Here you can find all the assets. Go back one step. So on your top level of the folder, you can now, well, first you will have to drop the save state on top of something. So here, for example, on top of the, uh, the game manager, of course, and then hit play. And it says, save file not found. Let's create a new one. OK, fair enough. Let's have a look. It created data.ss. If I am to open this up, for example, with uh, Visual Studio Code, 
It says the file is not displayed in the editor because it's either binary or used unsupported. Okay. Well, let's use another text editor. So Sublime, Sublime usually doesn't really care about these type of stuff. So let's see. And here we go. So that is our save state in binary. And now here you'll be able to find data about your save file. Now do note that it's not just binary. It also includes the, uh, the name of the class. So for example, save state. Uh, it has a couple more information than just the two field, the three field that we have in there. That's why it looks a lot more complex than it should be, but that's because it's it's actually carrying more info, um, such as the name of the classes. And now we have that. Let's go back in our game. I'm going to clear the console, see if on the second time it can open it up. And it seems like it has, so it should actually be loading up. Um, I don't think we'll be able to see it, but yeah, we're not able to see it, but it should have loaded up. Um, our previous save. Hey, Michael from the future here. I'd like to bring a correction to the save manager. Um, I've just tried this on my Android device and it didn't work properly because we were not saving the save file at the proper place. Now this works, uh, this, this works wonder on PC and the editor as well. Um, but once we enter the Android device, we'll need to specify something more in the save path. So here for the file stream, when I create it, I also want to add the persistent data path first and then my save file name. I'll need to do that in both the load and also the save over here. So make sure you bring that change here or else this is not going to work on your mobile devices. All right, so I hope you join me in the next episode in which we're going to be testing it out and also hooking our all of our text and in our high score on that, we will be hooking up the save to when we finish the game, when we need to save again, when we spend money, if we ever do uh, in the shop later on. We'll be hooking all of that up and um, we'll be testing it out in the next episode a little bit more thoroughly. So see you there. Welcome back to the final video in this subsection section, that is the data section, in which we save the data that we need for our game to persist over multiple uses. That being said, last time we left off, we had a save state that way we couldn't really see it, but we have a save state flying somewhere uh, and it keeps track of my score and also the amount of fishes that we have in this very specific game. Um, however, this is not connected anywhere. We actually never overwrite the high score. We never actually write any of that data um, really to the save file unless when we start the game. So that is not really something we'd like to have um, in the future. So just to make sure that we, we have something that works and it makes sense, today we're gonna be hooking this up to our game. And the first place that we could actually start this off is by saving um, saving when we actually end the game. And we will need to save pretty much every time we end the game for the sole purpose that we might have collected some fish and we'd like to add them to our bank. That being said, when do we save exactly? We save at the very specific moment that we click on this one button here. And that's pretty much when we click on, um, on the button to start over again in the game state Beth. So two menu right here. That's where everything happens. Um, and let's see. So scene, no, nope, nope. And let's see, have we ever hooked the reset? So our saving logic should be happening right here in the game state def. When we accept our def, when we don't hit resume game, um, it should be happening right here. Down there, all we have to do is the following. Game stats. Actually, sorry, no, that was the save manager. So save manager instance, and then we just call save. And I just realized I put a small, oh wait, no, save with a capital S, there we go. And now with this call, we should be able to save every time that we die. Um, I believe at the moment, since we're not buying anything, I believe that's the only place where we actually need to save. I think I'm, Okay, saying that, I don't think I'm wrong. Okay, but uh, later on, for example, when we're in the shop and we decide to buy an object for a certain amount of fishes, then we will also need to save right off the get-go. Now, one thing that comes to mind at this moment is that um, we, we actually never set the data inside of there, however. So we never say, hey, score is equal to this or um, high score is equal to this. And that's something we'll have to do when we decide to go back to the menu here as well. So prior to saving, um, set the high score if needed. 
And for this one, that will be fairly simple. We'll just compare the two int and whichever one is, is the biggest one, then uh, that one will win. Uh, let's go through the save manager, instance save dot high score. If this one is bigger, actually is smaller than the current score, current score here being a, I believe that's a string because that's, um, that's not the right thing here. Um, then the, the game stats instance score, if that's the case, then we're going to go ahead and say that the save manager instance save, that's the state high score is going to be equal to the game stat. Just like so. Here you'll find out that the high score is actually int. Uh, we decided to save it as an int and not a float value because I just want to keep something here a little bit more clean. However, uh, when we do run the game, um, we are not upping a int simply because the, the distance of our player is a float. However, we can come here and just make sure we cast it as an int. So that's possible. And also make sure to do it on the if call as well. All right, so that would be it right here for the um, the high score. We can now go and do the second part of this, which had to do with the amount of fishes we collect. So if we head back to the save, um, and then we get the amount of fish we have, we can do plus equal the amount of fish we have this session. So game stat instance uh, points per fish, I believe. And I think that's all we need here. What the problem is, it's um, so fish here is that and oh, wait, <laughs> that's not the points per fish I was looking for. It's the amount of fish I've collected this session. So fish collected this session. And for this one, we don't need to do a call. We always increment. And if we have to increment by zero, then I mean, we're not really changing at this point. Now I want to head into our game and see if this actually works. So if I am to press play, and leave the game running. Just collect a bit of fish and also make sure I have a high score. Um, and then I need to actually die here for the sole purpose that our save is being called when I press on this button. So I'm going to click on it and it says no reference exception. So that is going to be a problem. It seems like our save manager doesn't have a, a wake. So uh, it doesn't have an instance. And we forgot about that in the last episode again. My bad. We have to make sure we have an instance over here. Usually when I do create some sort of singleton like this, I use another class that I can just uh, inherit from and it does that all for me. Uh, I just didn't want to add this complexity in the course. So that being said, let's give this another try. And let's actually play this. So I have my first fish. And there we go. So I have a total of two fish. I'm going to make sure to die and click on the button, this one. And now we're back at the beginning. What I'll be doing when I enter this scene right now is to display the amount I have um, directly here on the game state initialize dex. So if we are to open the game state initialize, instead of saying high score dex, I'll do the following save manager instance save high score and we'll do a two string uh, just like we did for the other one we'll do under uh, twelve things is set seven zeros and same thing for the amount of fishes so oh we could also leave the uh, the text in the front I forgot about this one so that means maybe I don't want to have the zeros actually yeah so high score and here we'll do fish Plus save measure instance save the amount of fish we have. Okay. And if our whole loop works right now, I should have a total of uh, two fish, I believe. I have a total of two fish and a high score of 101. Let's give it a try again. So I died. Technically, I should have three fish. And I have only two right now. Hmm. It leads me to wonder, maybe it's just a timing issue. So I'll just uh, run into the wall right now, see if it's now on three. And it's now on three. So I, I guess that's a timing issue. We can go back to um, our gain state def. And before I change my, my brain here, 
Maybe I want to run all of this code prior to it. Yep, yeah, that's going to make a little bit more sense. So everything save related will be done immediately before I go back to my game state initialize. I'll give this one more try. We have three fish right now according to the game and I'm just going to die. Press this button and I now have a total of four. So it seems to work perfectly fine at this point. Okay. One last thing, just to make sure everything works, is I'm going to make sure I can override the 101, which was my high score at that point. Okay. So 130 should be my new high score. 131, here it is. All right, so we got pretty much everything we needed in terms of these texts. Um, one last thing we need to hook up before we leave is the following the dev screen. It's pretty much the same exact thing. So let's head back to our game state dev. So game state dev, this one actually. Hmm. And I just realized right here that we have a high score text um, that we might want to override in the construct of the dev state and not so much here. So I'll actually, I'll actually move only this section or maybe I should move both sections. Yeah, I'm actually going to move both section of this. Sorry about being so so moving this around so much. Um, but I'm actually going to set these and save every time that I actually die. So if we revive, it's still going to be there. I took my code and I'm going to input it right here. So prior to saving, we set the high score. That's totally fine. Um, then we set that. Yeah, the amount of fish is also good. And we can then modify this high score based on what we had um, just done over here. So we can say high score is going to be save state. Sorry, wait, save manager instance, save high score. And then the current score text can only be game state, uh, sorry, game stats instance score which we can also do to string, actually score to string or score to text, actually. Fish total will be save manager instance, save fishes, total fish. And the current fish will be stored in fish to text, like so. Okay, I believe that's all we're going to need. Yep. Um, something we can also do right here. If we do reach a new high score, we might want to change the color of this font maybe. So um, the high score dot text. Let's actually take that and say color is equal to color dot green, for example. Else, just put it back on color dot white. Okay. Yeah, that should do it. So I'm going to go ahead and just make sure I run into the wall. Total fish seven, high score 131. That's my current score. That makes sense. Yep, everything makes sense. Now I'm going to play again and make sure I beat my high score so I can look at my new green color. It's most likely a really awful color, but we'll give it a try. Um, I believe it was 131, so I should be beating it right now. And let's run to the wall. Text should be green. Oh, I took the wrong text. But yeah, that's exactly the behavior I'd like to have, but just on this text down here in the current text. So I'll just change the current score. And we'll be good to go. OK, I think that's it. I think we've done pretty much everything we needed in terms of hooking up the data. Hey guys, Michael from the future once more. Um, as we start playing around with the save state and as we start setting stuff in the construct of multiple of our state, for example, in this episode, we did stuff in the game state game, I believe, um, we might encounter one problem that uh, the code looks like this in your end, um, where this is being called and the construct of the states are being called prior to the save state loading. So it's going to be very important for us to under the save manager, 
put this in a private void awake. So this is run first. And then under the game manager, when we create our state, put that under a start. So it is being run second. This is how we're going to maintain the order of um, what, what runs first. So the state should be, the save state should be running first, should be created, should be loaded, and then everything that has to do with these um, are next. So in the next section, we are going to do a little bit of polishing of the game. So we're going to pimp it up a little bit, make sure that our shadow looks nice, make sure everything looks nice, because right after that, we're going to be entering um, something that is a little bit more optional for the game. So we have a game flow that works well, but we want to go one step further after that and create a shop um, and also make sure we have uh, ads in our game so we can generate a little bit of profit for ourselves. So that being said, Congratulations for making that far. Uh, you now have a game that has a complete flow to it. You can actually publish it if you wish right now. Uh, but I do encourage that you add a little bit more value to it, add your own flavor. And um, we're not done. So stick around for the shop in the next section and stick around for the next, next section to make a little bit of profit off this game when people play it. OK, thank you so much. I'll see you there. Hey guys, welcome to the 10th section of this course. In this one, we will be creating a shop in order for us to spend um, the, the fishes we are getting from when we play a game. So we're going to start with the most appealing part of this. Um, and the first video about this section is going to be about the UI. So we're going to be laying down a UI for this. And just like we've done with all the other states, um, this is the flow we'll be using to create a whole new state for the game. We will create a new game state shop. We will create a new UI piece. We will create a new camera. Uh, we will pretty much redo the whole thing we've done for, for adding, you could say, chunk of content to our game. We will redo all of that, which is going to be a good reminder of everything we've done thus far. So um, the first thing I'll tackle is the most apparent one, and it's going to be the UI, as I've mentioned. So I'm going to go ahead and copy over, say, the canvas initialize for canvas shop. I went ahead and I copied it. Let me just put it here and I'm going to open it up. Now, this is what I had in mind here in my other project. I have it running. It's a, it's a UI that's going to look like this. It has this scrollable rect with all of the items we have, a home button and also the fish icon to let us know how many fish we have right now. Um, as you can see, things have changed a tiny bit since my previous version. But uh, let's go ahead and implement this one. And we will do so by um, what we have the canvas shop. We will do so by removing what we have thus far. We will leave one of these buttons. So I'll leave, for example, the shop in there because that's going to be our home button. So I'll go ahead, just rename that to home and switch the icon over. I don't know if I have an icon for home at the moment. We will just put the play button for the moment. Um, but if you do have one, which should be the case, so in your artwork package, you might see a, a different icon for home. Because by the time you see this, uh, art is going to be a, a tad different. What we can do is anchor this on the bottom right, and I'm going to give it a position of 300. Now, right above that, I'll create a new UI image, and that's going to be the fish count. And actually, you know what? Let's make this a container. So fish. I'll anchor this directly on top of the other one. So that should be 400, I believe. Yep. I'll give it a width of, mm, we can do 550 or no, let's just do 500. And I'll remove the image on this one. This is just going to act as some sort of container. Uh, maybe we can make it that smaller. So 125. And then on here, I will create a new image. That will be my fish icon. So I can put it here. Make sure I can preserve the aspect, anchor it on the left hand side, and make it a tad bigger. So maybe 150. That'll be my icon, and then the text next to it, which I believe is actually anchored directly at the right place right now. But just to make sure, I'll anchor it on the left hand side and give it the exact same position X as this one. Um, you know what? It can actually use a whole scale, like so. Okay. We can go in the center. This is going to be the fish count. 
which of course is going to be set manually in, in the code. Play around with the font, um, and that should be good. Okay, so we have our home button, we have our fish button, and then I'd like to have a text at the top here that says what is the hat I'm currently wearing right now, because they all have a, they all will have a name to themselves. So for example, chicken hat, dog hat, whatever hat you'd like to put on top of the penguin. Okay, to do so, we will just create a new UI. That's going to be the hat name. And this one will be anchored on the top right. I can make this, um, say, maybe 50% of the screen, so which is roughly 600. A height of 300. And I'll anchor this at the very top here. So maybe give it a padding of 50. Or minus 100, yeah. Hat name. Okay. So we're off a good start. However, we're going to need to have a couple more things here. And the size of the font could be a bit bigger as well. I'm thinking we could actually move this a tiny bit in the other axis. Yeah, okay. Um, now, what I'd like to do is reserve the whole left side of the screen to have a scrollable rectangle, uh, just like we saw in the example. And this is a little bit more hard than it seems because these are being instantiated at, at runtime. Um, actually, this whole shop, we don't know what's going to be in there um, in our UI. It's actually something I'll, I'll be loading from the addressable. So we, we don't exactly know how many hats there is. However, um, this list will be filled dynamically. Now, whenever you are creating this type of scrollable list, so something that can scroll indefinitely, you're going to need a couple of different things. You're going to need two objects, one that will act as a container, which we will create right now. So create empty, we can call it container. And just to see where, um, where this container is, I can also add an image component that will remove. Um, but adding image component, I'll make sure it uses this whole size here. And my width for this one will be roughly 600. 600 fits perfectly fine. Um, we might want to <laughs> just move things around a tiny bit. Uh, so this container is good right here, has a proper scaling to it. What we'd like to do uh, on this one is add a mask. So by adding a mask, everything that goes beyond this point as a children will be cropped and we won't see it. So that's kind of a behavior we'd like to see in case we, we have the list. Well, we don't want to render everything. So if we have elements that are down there, uh, we would not like to see them visually at least. Now, another component we will need on top of the container is a scroll rect element. And um, we will come back to this one in a second because we don't have a container, a content container. Uh, actually, we do. We are the container, but then we need another object beneath it. What is the content we will be scrolling? So we can right-click here, create a new one again, call it content. And then I will just head back really quick to the container, drag and drop our content in here. We would like to be able to drag uh, vertically, but not horizontally. So I'm going to remove that. And then we should be good to go. OK. Um, for the sake of not seeing the mask, I am just going to remove the show mask graphic here. We can, uh, we can, and we have to leave the image here actually, so the mask uses something, but we don't have to show the mask graphic, so I'm going to remove that. Next up, we have the actual content. Now, for the content, um, in order for us to see our modification, we will go ahead and we'll create a, a content element. So we'll actually create one of this. Um, hat container. And this hat container is going to be a button, actually. So we're going to have a button. I don't know how big they're going to be, maybe 400 by 400. I realize that we have uh, something that is 600 in width. Might want to remove the text as of right now. And we have our content here. Um, one thing that is going to be very important for us to do is to save this, uh, let's call it hat item, save this to a prefab. So under my prefab folder, I'll create a new folder called UI, 
and I'll just drag and drop this in here. Or maybe it's not a good idea to call it UI. Maybe it's a better idea to just call it shop. And then what we'd like to see in the future is have a couple of these just show up. As you can see, I now have five of them. So I have five hat item. And I don't know if you can see here, but as soon as we exit the mask, they are not being rendered. And that's the behavior we'd like to see. Um, however, the way they're being placed is not the behavior we'd like to see. So going back on my content item, the one that is apparent for all of these hat item, I can put a grid layout group. And now you're gonna see a resemblance of something that makes sense, but yet it still doesn't make sense just yet. Um, you get to decide how big these are. We said we'd like to have them 400 by 400. Okay, we're off a better start. Then there is spacing we can put in between. Maybe we'd like to have a spacing of roughly maybe 50 in between each of them. We also have the start corner. We can say, hey, yeah, you can be in upper left. That's good. Um, however, our pivot point here is definitely not good. So we might want to take this content and just tell it to fit the parent. And we do so by going here and clicking on this. Okay. So we seem to have something here. Uh, for some reason, I do have some issues with the size of this object. So we could go ahead and create another thing, which is a content size fitter, and make sure our vertical size is the minimum size. This will actually um, expand our item depending on how many items we have. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to expand with the content we have. So if you have a look over here, so if you have a look over here on this um, white corner, that's the size of our content. And if I am to actually paste new item in there, you'll see it expanding with the content. And if we didn't have that, the content size fitter, you just wouldn't see that. And that's why we have it in here. And it's very important we do have it in here, else our scrollable list will not work. Okay. Um, now, looking at this, do we need any type of padding? I believe we do. So it's just not directly stuck to the wall. We could go and do a little bit of padding on the left-hand side, so maybe 50. Top as well, so 50, or maybe even a little bit more from the top, so 100. And um, yeah, it's starting to look good. All right, so it's looking good thus far. If we are to actually play this, um, we are going to overlap with the initialize UI, but we might be able to just play around with this. Let's, uh, let's give it a try. Yep, as you can see, we have a nice, nice scrollable rectangle that goes in both sides. Um, if we are to add on top of this at the runtime, why not? Because we are wild and free. It doesn't go back to uh, the initial snapping. So that's exactly the behavior we'll be, we'll be looking for. Uh, maybe we want to we wanna add some padding at the bottom here as well, because I feel like this button is directly at the end of the screen and not, and that is not something I'd like to see here. So let's give it a try. So 100 for bottom as well. Okay, amazing. So we're having something um, working great at the moment. Now, the next step, I'd like to take is just decorate one of these so it actually looks good. So we can go ahead, take one of these items and maybe change the image of it for something that's a little bit more accurate. Now I don't have many <laughs> things that I could put in there. Um, let's give it this image for the moment. Might wanna change it in the future. And then on top of that, I will need to add um, a little bit of text. I like to add text to say, hey, this is for example, the chicken hat. Um, and to do so, I will make sure my text expands on all the axes, fills the whole screen. I'll give it a center alignment, but I'll leave it at the top here. Maybe with a very small margin of, of 10 or something like that. And this could be the chicken hat, just as one example. Um, make this bold, always in caps because we are wild. And yep, that could do it. So that's the text or I could call it the hat name. Now do note that I'll only be hitting one of them and then you know we'll apply it like so. So it just affects everybody. Um, and next up, the last thing we really need here is gonna be an image that will be the image of the hat. Now at the moment we don't have any image, but let's just assume that that's the image. And I can just put it in the center right here. So hat thumbnail or hat preview. 
And that is it. So let's override this, apply all. And we will actually um, make sure we save this. So that's saved properly here. And we will delete pretty much everything else. Okay, so I've deleted all the other item. I only left one and I feel like the, that's not the place where it should be. So I don't know, maybe the anchor is not at the proper place. And yep, that was it. So on my content item, I'm holding shift and I'm clicking on top left because that's where I want my anchor to be. And then uh, the rest should do the work. So the rest should work as, um, as it was prior to that. Okay, so we're actually going to end this right here for the sole purpose that we don't have any logic behind this. We don't uh, initiate these properly. We have our text that needs to be set. So we have all we need in terms of UI and we will soon deep dive into making this uh, a little bit more dynamic using a different game state and a different camera and also by setting the text on the screen. But for now, we have a good start and I will see you guys in the next one. Last time, we created this piece of UI here for us to use for the shop. Today, we're going to be um, starting to define what is a shop item, what is a hat in this case. And to do so, we will take a slightly different approach just to explore something else with our scripting. Um, and that will be, I'll actually create a section for, uh, <laughs> for shop here under the script folder. And that will be a scriptable object. If you haven't used it in the, in the past, it's something quite fun to use. So please tag along as we create a new script called hat, which is going to be our hat object. Now, as I open this one up, we will make it inherit something else than mono behavior. So we're going to make it inherit from scriptable object. Now, do note that by doing this, we don't have a hat that we can apply on, on the scene, for example. This cannot be the component of an object because it does not have the mono behavior, um, the whole system behind mono behavior here. It's going to be something that you're going to have to, if you want one, you're going to have to do a new hat instead of adding a component. So you're going to be doing something like that instead of doing a add component. Um, I actually forgot how to do add component, but <laughs> you get the gist of it. So public class hat scriptable object. And then we're actually just going to give it a data structure. We're just going to make this a data class starting right here with a public string item name. And I'll leave this in caps, just like a, a scriptable object here. You'll see why I do that. I, not a scriptable, just like a property here. You'll see why I do that in a second. Um, we'll go with a item price. That is going to be int. So how many fishes is that hat going to cost? Uh, we're also going to give it a sprite, which could be a thumbnail. And we're going to give it a game object, which is actually going to be the 3D model that we'll put on top of our character. And that is all we will need here. Now, by inheriting from scriptable object, this can now become some sort of prefab, you could say. This can now become some sort of object that you manually spawn for your game. Um, and it's common practice to have this for different items in your game. So, for example, the hat here works well. And in order to create it through the menu, because you can create it through the menu, you can add the create asset menu. Uh, tag right here. And it also takes in a couple of parameters. You can give it a file name. So I'll do that file name hat. And then we close off that bracket. It will now be part of my Explorer menu. So as I go over here, if I right click, you'll see now that the create menu has a hat right here that we could click just to see what happens. And on the right hand side, you'll see that item name, item price, thumbnail, model, are all sitting on top of this object right here. Now I'm going to go ahead and delete this one because that's not where we'll be spawning ours. In our case, when we have new hats, we will be putting them inside of the resource folder because it's something I'd like to load at um, when the game starts. And I don't know how many there is, and I don't want to have to drag them through a certain prefab, for example. So. Um, we, we could have a list of objects, uh, a prefab that has a list of objects that we can just manual drag every time that we have a new one, or we could simply create a new scriptable object within the resource folder. I much prefer the second version of that. So what we're going to be doing is right clicking on asset, making a resource folder and make sure it is written the exact same way. Uh, because of course, we're going to be using resource.load, which means it's going to be loading from this folder and it has to be written the exact same way. <laughs> Um, that being said, we're going to create ourselves a test hat within that. The name could be test hat with a spacebar. 
could be worth five dollar five fish not dollar um thumbnail for the moment i'll just give it any thumbnail really um it could be just so i can see a change i'm gonna put the uh the penguin icon that's good <laughs> and then for the model as i don't have these models right now and i'm sorry but you, you should have them <laughs> um you should have these models at the moment but i i sure don't so until i do have these model and you have them through the package as well i'm going to use something else for example i could be using the zero okay cool now that we have a definition of what a hat is we will then move on to the next step which will have to do with creating our game state regarding the shop in there we'll be able to load all those hats dynamically and also set the ui properly and then after that the final step will be to actually put the hat on top of the player so that being said, we will end for this one and we will see you in the next video in which uh, we're going to do exactly what I said prior. I forgot. Okay, see you there. Welcome back to the shop implementation. Um, at this point, we're going to create a new crucial piece of our game, another, you could say, another piece to our puzzle um, that we do for pretty much every single add-on to your game, you could say, every module of your game. And that's going to be by creating a new game state. So if we head back under the script, we can find under the game flow, game state, a folder that has a bunch of states, but not the shop one. So let's go create it. Game state shop. And we are going to tackle this fairly quickly because we've done other, other states in the past. And make sure it inherits from game state. Now, if you guys remember, I'm going to open one other states so maybe the def one or the initialize right here if you guys remember we do have some override construct destruct and um, a couple of others i realized so transition as well was supposed to be in there maybe oh no construct destruct and update state and we're going to make sure we override construct for this one so we're going to start strong with a public override construct and in here most of the thing we do usually is just First, turn on our UI and then maybe update some text and also change your camera. So what, whatever we have in the initialize here is pretty accurate for what we need in the game state shop. So we will need to change the camera. I'll leave that here for a second. We will need to update some text. Yeah, so the amount of fish we currently have, that's for sure. And we will need to set a UI to active. So that in mind, I'm going to create a new game object and I've removed the using int engine, but we, we actually need it. So um, this one's gonna be called the shop UI. And I'm gonna make sure to enable it here when we construct. Also the practice we've been doing thus far is that we disable that in the destruct. So let's make sure we also do that. Okay, then the two other lines, uh, I did it in the wrong order, but the two other lines are the following. We update some text. It's something that we also wanna do here. So we'll need a reference to that text mesh pro UGY. I'll make sure to use the TM pro text mesh pro. And we can call this one um, total fish. Yeah, total fish. And then total fish is going to be equal to the following save manager instance save. Is that the total fish here? I believe it actually is. So we actually we have what we need over here. That's perfect. And finally, the last line in our clipboard copy paste is the change of camera and here you can see we changed to the camera initialize that's not what we want we want to change the camera shop which if you guys remember um, we input that in here because we knew we, we needed it but we never actually created a camera for that so it's going to be up to us to go and set that camera that being said are we ready to do that right now do we have everything we need um, we pretty much have everything we need. The only thing is we have no way to get to that state shop. So let's jump into the game state initialize, I believe. And here on shop click, we left that as a comment. We need to change the state to game state shop. Uh, we we're already ready. So I'm really proud that we've did that now. <laughs> okay. I'm going to go ahead and, um, go in my game manager, add my game state shop to it. And we'll set the references we need. So first up the shop UI, so this one, and also the amount of fishes that we have. So over here, um, whoops, I lost my reference, but it's right here. So the, that, what I call icon here, and then that was the total 
fish. Okay, now that leaves me to wonder. We added a part of text here that maybe we don't want to have in here, so I'm just going to remove it. Not going to need that. Just, just the text straight up will do the job. And um, yep, I believe we got. We could also add a two string while we're here. Why not? Okay. Now let's give this a try. See if we can navigate to it. I'm going to disable the canvas shop for a second. Let's hit play. Head over to the shop. And then you will see we have our default camera set over here. The amount of fish is right here. And we have a very good start. So that works. We will need a action for when we press on the home button. And of course, we'll need to populate the amount of... Uh, well, we need to populate the shop. So that being said, I'm going to turn that off and uh, let's tackle one problem at a time. I think the first one we'll tackle is the camera because that's the simplest one for us to do. We can head over here, toggle on the camera shop, and um, I'll just take this object as a selection. Then for the moment, we will just move around in our scene and maybe just angle it in such a way and once I find a proper angle, I know, I know our lighting isn't really that good thus far, and that's, that's okay because we'll revisit that fairly soon. But once I have the angle I want in the scene view, I'll hit Control, Shift, and F. And I'll just keep hitting that until I find the proper angle. So maybe something like that will do the job. And I just realized, wait, <laughs> we should be headed that way because uh, our menu is on the left side. So maybe I want to have this type of angle with him. A lot of people playing amongst us today. Oh, okay, cool. So that will do roughly because our shop is going to be all here. We have some text at the bottom. That leaves us enough space to see the hat. And um, we, we can fix the background here with some big mountains. Okay, I'll turn this off. And uh, just give it a quick look. Yeah, we zoom. We can look at the hat. And yeah, that's going to be great. Now let's address this button, the home button next. I'm going to head back under game state shop and it's pretty much going to be the same thing as here. So you know what? I'll, I'll copy what I have in the game state initialize and I'll put that right here on home click. And I want to move over to game state initialize. That's really all we needed to do fairly fast. Um, now it's just a matter of hooking that to the button. So I'll head over to my, um, where is it? So that's my shop. It's totally fine. Where is my button? Here, it's actually called shop, should be called home. And this button, I'll add a on click event. It actually, right now it actually uses the old one. Um, yeah, the, the old reference was here. So obviously we don't want to have that. Uh, but I'll just go ahead and change that for game state shop and we'll put that to on home on home click. Again, I like to test out stuff as I do it, so it's fairly simple, fairly fast. Whoa, what's going on? Oh, I left the other one on. You don't want to leave any type of UI active because uh, our state machine takes care of that. Okay, we can now swap in between the two and it's fairly simple. What we're going to be tackling next is the chicken hat, the chicken hat, and also pretty much all the other hat. Actually, I don't want to have a chicken hat. I'd like to see a test hat. So um, it's going to be a little bit more complex in this case uh, because we'll have to create a new prefab for every single object we have. And then we'll have to dive into that prefab, change the text and do all that kind of stuff. So prepare yourself for something a tad more complex. We're going to head over to our shop under the container, I have my content and my content is the hat item. To make sure that everything is sure is like 100% saved, I'm going to click on override. It doesn't ask me if I want to save again, so that's good. That's done. Press on delete. We don't want to see him anymore. Okay. Now, that being said, we'll need some reference to that, uh, that actual item here. So back on my game shop, I will create a new small section here uh, called shop shop item and I'm going to have a public game object that's going to be a hat prefab and also a public transform that's going to be my shop container or you could say hat container. Okay, we'll need to assign these two. So back on my game manager, I'll drag and drop my content. So container content, 
I'll drop that under the hat container. And then let's find our hat item. Where did I put that? Under prefab hat item. And we're just going to drag and drop it right here. Now, um, I'm going to do something here. I'm going to make sure to create a list as well. So a private, you know what? I'm going to make this one public for now, but it's good. It'd be good if we just turn it back to private. It's going to be a list of hat that we're going to be loading at runtime. So public game object, um, we can do game object array and just call it hats. Why not? Now, what I'd like to do over here is use a start statement. Um, I don't want to use the construct because I don't want this to be something we do every single time, but only once when the application loads up. So I'll be using a, should I do start? We're going to do a wake actually. And in that awake call, I want to say that my list of hats is actually going to be equal to resources. Oops, resource, only one S. Okay, dot load. You want to load all game object at the following path. Now we didn't assign a specific path for our object. We'll do that in a second. I'll just say hat dash. And I believe that should work. I'm not quite sure. That's why I left it on public so I can see. Now with that in mind, it means that under my resource folder, I will have to create a new folder called hat. Uh, did I just put a capital there? No, I did not, but I'll do it. Okay. And drop my hat in here and see if this works. Okay, it's now on zero, so that doesn't work. Okay, so I found my issue. It was a fairly stupid one. Uh, we're not trying to get a list of game object. We're actually trying to get a list of, uh, of hats because that's what they are. They're hats and they are a scriptable object. So my, my bad about that. Um, once we have that, however, it would be time for us to populate the shop. So maybe you want to create something else. Maybe you want to create a private void populate shop in which you can send over your list of ads. But since we have them here in memory, we don't need to send them. And also since I've, I've checked out that this worked, I'm gonna put it back on private as it should be. Okay, oh, and sorry, populate the shop. We'll do that in the awake as well. We don't wanna do that in the construct else it's an operation that we'll be doing only once. Um, when it comes down to populating the shop, we have a couple of things. We have the hat container, we have the hat prefab, and we have the data stored inside of hats. So we'll need to do a loop here. For every single hats we have, so for i is equal to zero, for the length of hats, i++, we are going to instantiate, so instantiate, um, the hat prefab, we'll instantiate it inside of the hat container, like so. And now we're also gonna make sure that we grab a reference to that as it comes out. Um, we'll do a game object reference. So that actually works. Um, I know some version of Unity that doesn't work, so maybe you want to cast as a game object, uh, but that works. Okay, cool. And then once we have the head prefab, this is where a couple of things uh, need to be done. We will need to get the uh, reference to the button. We'll need to get a reference to the thumbnail, to the item name, and then also the price. So let's do all of that. So the button is here. We'll need a thumbnail. We'll need the item name and we'll need the price. So all of these are things that we will need. Okay, let's start with the button. We can do a game object get component. The button is on the top level, so we can just say get um, component type of button, and I just put the wrong thing here, hold on. We want unityengine.ui, so this one. Get the button, and then on top of that button, we're going to assign something, some sort of listener. So unclick, add listener, and I just realized here we don't have a new listener at the moment, but we'll create one called probably something like on hat click. And we will need to tell it which hat it is. So I'll just say hi in this case. Okay, so quickly, private void on hat click. That takes in a index as a parameter. Now we can uh, go down here and just type in something of the sort hat number, hat was clicked, since I'm not going to keep that for long. Now i just put the index next to it. Okay, so in terms of button, we now have a function being called every time we click on a hat. Next up, we need a thumbnail. 
Um, where is that thumbnail? I actually don't know. So we're going to head into the game. I'm going to find my prefab. Here it is. On the top level, we have the image. We also have an image here. That's the background, so that's not the one we need. Um, and then after that, we have the name. Not the one we need. It would be on the second children. So if we do a get child, it's going to be get child index one. And then we can do a get image. So game object, transform, get child, the first one, get component. Now do note that this is an operation we only do once, so it's not going to be uh, the end of the world uh, if we have a couple of get component in there. Um, and also it's an operation we do in the awake. So get component, we'll need to change its sprite for hat. Actually, wait, oop. Um, hat side the index i dot thumbnail. Awesome. Next up, we will need the item name. Where was the item name stored? It was right here on the first object, so get child zero. Transform get child zero, get component, type of text mesh pro ugy, dot text, and then the hat dot item name. There we go. And finally, the price. Now, we don't have the price in there, but uh, let's just put it in here prematurely. Um, it's going to be get child number two. So we'll create another we'll create another one for this. And it's going to be item price. Item price. That should work. Oh, two string because it's, uh, yeah. All right. So with that in mind, I can now head back in here. I'll just create a new text. So we have the hat name, the hat thumbnail hat price and it's going to be anchor at the bottom for the moment oh you know what let's actually use this, the whole size of the square again and i'll just modify the alignment of my text and here you'll see a number pop up later on so maybe 500 that's a little bit a little bit expensive five um i'll put zero for now okay that being said, I think we have everything we need. Uh, let's give it a try, see if it crashes. Okay, we have a test at, we have a price of five, and we have the proper name. That's exactly the behavior we'd like to see. Now, let me see it without too much, um, without the other one, the other UI on top of it. Okay, it looks at that better. So obviously here we're gonna have a different thing uh, in the future, a different thumbnail, a different name. Um, and I'm just realizing here that we might have to reorder things around because I'd like the text to be on top. Maybe the thumbnail should be at the very beginning. So uh, let's make sure we reorder that right now. I'm going to make sure the thumbnail is at the top. And do note that the way our code is set up right now, it does mess up things. So we'll have to head back and say, hey, you know what, the thumbnail um, over here is actually get child zero and that text is get child one. Uh, and I think we've got everything we need. So do know that every time you're going to be creating a new hat, you can just come here and input whatever you wish. So yeah, that's pretty much it. To give this a try, I'm going to go ahead and copy it over and do a test hat number two. I actually went in the in this folder, but don't worry, that, that also works. I'll just write in number two. This one is 10. Um, the icon is going to be, for example, the play icon, and we use a different model. Okay, don't worry about the name of your scriptable object because that's not the name we use, but just for this example, I'll just say two next to it. As we press on play, everything should have been loaded right now. We head to the shop and we have different data. So that's exactly what we should be expecting from this. The last thing we'll need is, uh, oh, by the way, yeah, look at, down here as well. We have a problem. <laughs> we have to adjust this problem before we, I was about to close the video. There's an actual problem, crap. Okay, so um, if you if you see here, as I click, we get number two. And we also get number two by clicking on the other one, which is not the behavior we'd like to have, actually. We'd like to see zero and one. What actually happens here is um, is, is that complex to explain. Um, because I have, I have issues with this code as well. What really happens here is that on hat click takes an i as a parameter, but it's a reference, and it just... It's a reference to i, which means 
we run the full loop and it remembers what was the last value of i, which in that case, that was 2. For some reason, that was 2. I don't know why, <laughs> but we'll have to figure it out. Um, so what we have to do to overcome this issue is that we have to create a new an actual uh, index here and set it every single time. And I don't know why it does that. If you actually know, well, I mean, there has to be a good reason. I can probably Google it long enough. But um, if you if you know, then please let me know because I have some issues with that all the time. So I can declare int index and just say I. We'll have to do that directly in the loop. It's something that we'll do directly in the loop here. And I'll make sure to just replace this here with that. Uh, we could also replace these, like there's no there's no issue with that. Now with that in mind, in, during the scope of this for loop, we've created a field that will be deleted by the end of the for loop. So, well, this iteration, and that's what's being saved here. Now with that in mind, I can go back, press on play again. That's zero and that's one. Um, I don't know why we had a two earlier, I'll be frank, but uh, I don't get the issues anymore. Now the one last thing we will address before we add over to something else um, is the following. Under the game state shop, there is one more text, as you see here, the hat name that I'd like to change for whatever we currently have selected at the moment. And it's not going to work 100% by the time we, we end this video, however, we'll make it work uh, in the next one. So we will add a new reference. And I'll just call it current hat name. And what we'll do is that we'll take this and once we click on something, we'll just set the name of the hat. So we'll say something like um, dot text is equal to hat, wait, hats at the index i dot name. Okay. I just wanted to do that here. The reason I said it's not going to work 100% is because we are not setting that on the start. And the reason I'm not setting that in the start is because we don't know what have we what what hat we had previously. What is the player preference? We don't have this information. It's not being stored in the save data, but uh, it's something we'll have fairly soon. So hat name is over here. I'll go under the game manager, drag and drop my new reference, and if everything works, we can call this video a day. And uh, whoops, and so many people playing Steam tonight. That's crazy. Okay, maybe I should be playing video games. And here it is. So we now have the test hat, and now we have test hat number two. And I believe that is not the proper name for our hat, so I messed up again. Um, sorry about that. That's the name of the object, so these object, but it's not the name, but it's not the item name. That's what we're looking for. Um, name in this case was the name of the scriptable object, the one that is in our folder. We want to have the item name, which turns out to be uh, exactly the same thing you see on top of it. So on top of the icon, there we go. We have something proper. Okay, cool. So I'll be ending it for, for now. Um, in the next one, I think we're going to be looking at putting a hat on this guy and also start looking at the save data. Uh, maybe just putting a hat on this guy. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll see you there. Cheers. Hey, welcome back to another episode of the shop. Last time we were able to populate these um, properly, but we had one issue that I didn't really see last time. So it's a small bug correction here. When we were to click on home, it didn't work anymore. Now, our problem here is because we have a private void away inside of a game state here, but uh, that's that's the base state. Now, under our game state shop, we have another awake. And oh, that was it used to be private, my bad. Um, we have another awake here. And we it, it actually overrides the last one. So that's, that's our problem. So it overrides this one right here. And that's not cool. So we have a couple of ways to go about it. One. We could just put the line of code right here and that would work completely fine. Or two, we could swap that over to a start so it does not butt over the last one. Or three, and that's the option I'll be using, is turn this awake into a protected function, which means here under my game state, which is the, uh, the base object, I now have a protected void awake, which would mean that on my shop, I can override this. So I can say, oops, override. Oh, can I do that? It doesn't seem to let me do that. Oh, override point. <laughs> okay, my bad. Um, and then from here, I can call the base.awake. 
seems to be the plan. Oh, it doesn't work because my um, my awake is not virtual, so my bad. Predicted virtual void. Okay, now we're good. Now we're fixed. Okay, my bad. And now with this fix, we should now have the reference for a home button, and um, I don't even need to test it because I know it's gonna work. Okay, <laughs> that being said, we must now move on to putting hats on top of this this little guy here, and to do so, I will go in my hat folder which I did not create, it's under the shop, um, the shop folder, and I will create a new C-sharp script called at logic, in which we will define all the logic regarding the at, including spawning them on top of the player and also um, swapping in between them. Now for that, we'll need a couple of things. First, let's do a cleanup. We will start with a private transform hat container. Um, we actually, we will need this to be able to be uh, set in the inspector, so I'll do a serialized field here at the top. That will be the point on the bone of the head. So that's part of our rig, because our head is going to be moving around. Well, we need to put the hat at the proper place, so that's, that's why this is here. Um, next up, we will need also a, a list of all the hats, just like we've done for the shop. So I'll grab this line, put it in here. Now I'll go back under the shop and I'll grab this as well. Lay it down in a private void awake. And now like so, we should be able to get a reference to all the hat object. Then we should spawn them on top of our player. So private void spawn hats on the player, which we will do only once. And then it will just toggle off everything. So in order to spawn ads, um, Pretty much the exact same thing as we've done. So maybe in the in the construct, I'm taking back pretty much all the code that I've that I've written over here, or written actually. So we'll do a for loop for every single hat in the loop. We will um, instantiate that at, and that at actually here is under hats at the index i dot model. So that's the big difference in between the two, and we will put that under hat container. Oh, that's funny. I use the same name. And I believe that's all we need at this point. So maybe I'll just leave that on a single line. Oh, why does it not work? Probably because I assigned a field. OK, um, we won't need that hat field for some reason. Um, I don't know why I put it in there. Now, as I grab this, I'd also like to put that hat under a list. Um, so a private game object list. List is part of system.generic. So make sure you include that system collection generic. And let's just call it hat models. And I also instantiate the list right here at the top so I don't have to do it in the awake. Um, and you know what? I'm actually going to remove that line and instead we'll just do a straight up add like so. OK, so now what happens is that we spawn these hats and we keep a reference to their model because that's all we need really. We keep a reference to your model in the list, um, and, and the index will be just fine. So um, since we've added them in, in this order, the index will also match their proper hats index. OK, so let's visualize this real quick. We have uh, this script being put on top of the player. We assign the hat container. That's fine. And then he spawns all the different type of hats we have, uh, only their model. So right now, that's the 0 and that's the 1. Um, and that's pretty much it. It spawns both, and it just doesn't work well because all, all of these hats are being stacked together. You know what? The best example I can give you is the actual real deal. So let's go under the penguin and I'll add my hat logic. Now let's deep dive into where is the head bone? Should be under the spine. And then what we have here, we have left shoulder, we have neck, head, and head top. So that's the one right here. I'll assign that in my transform and let's press play. Okay, so our our penguin has weird hats. Um, it has a zero and a one. Yep, and if we are to play, he keeps them because that's 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 him. He just likes to roll with that. Okay, amazing. So we have a good start at, at what's going on now. It's time for us to actually decide which hat is being active right now. And we can do so by heading over to our script again and disable all the hats. So we'll do a public, we'll make it public in case we need to call it from somewhere else. Um, disable all hats. 
And all we have to do is run through that list. So again, another for loop. And we'll do hats model at the index i set active false. And finally, we'll do one more public void um, select hat with the index. So int index. And it will do the exact same thing, but of course, set to true, and the index is going to be put directly right here. I think that's actually all we need. Um, now, at the beginning, let's just make sure we select at, say, number one, uh, index one, which is the second one. Let's try not, be, not to be confused with it. When I run this, I should only have the one number on top of my head. Oh, wait, did I forget to disable? Yeah, I forgot to disable all the hats. So something we have to do here, maybe in the spawn hats right there. There we go. Or even better, wait, no, we'll have to do it in the select ad. So every time we select a new hat, we're going to have to disable all the other ones. And there we go. We only have that one on top of our head. Uh, let's give it a try. So as you can see here, we have the two hats in the object. One of them is not active and the other one, of course, is the one. Now we get to play with our nice little digit on top of our head. Um, but that's a fairly good start. Um, what we're going to be doing next is we're going to make sure we implement that in the shop as well. So the shop will now have a reference to the hat logic and we'll be able to decide um, to change its hat. So that being said, back on the script, I'm going to head over to game state shop. And we'll give it a reference, a public reference to the hat logic. And with that reference, every time we select a new hat, so on hat click, we'll do the following. So at logic, select hat with the index. I can also remove that debug.log because we'll have, um, we'll have visual feedback now. As we assign this under the game manager, Everything should now be linked together and working. So we start with a one, and then if we go here, zero, one, and we get to switch in between the two. That's great. That's ex that's exactly the, the behavior we'd like to have. Now, the next thing we'll be tackling is that notion of price over here. And um, what we will be doing is deduce the price based off this and also keep track of what has been sold and also what has been unlocked thus far. So it's something that we'll have to play around with in the save data. And that's also something we'll do in the next episode. So thank you so much for joining and I'll see you in the next one. Hey, welcome back to one more episode about the shop. Last time we were able to get these hats on top of our head, being equipped by the player himself. And today we're going to be looking at keeping that information um, over time. So we're going to be keeping two new values. One, what is the previous hat we've had when we last played the game? And second, which hat have we unlocked thus far? Because chances are you, you have to buy them once and uh, you don't have to buy them every single time, basically. Um, so we're going to start right off the get go with our save state. We've just mentioned that we're going to need to be keeping new data over multiple play sessions, which means we're going to have to go in here and put those. Now, it's going to be fairly simple for a start. We're going to be keeping a new int that we'll just call current hat could call it current hat index. It's a little bit more accurate. Um, we just need to keep some sort of preference. Which hat did you have last time that you played the game? Now, the next information that we'll need is um, which hat have we bought thus far? And to do so, um, the option I've decided to opt for, because there's going to be multiple ads, and you, of course, you don't want to have multiple different fields in here, is to keep those inside of a byte array. So public byte array, which is, of course, a serializable um, serializable type, and I'm going to call it unlocked hat flag. Why flag? Because it behaves, it's going to behave just like a, uh, a C sharp flag. And it's just going to give us a bunch of zero and one. And from that, you can determine, okay, well, the first one, you don't have it. The second one, you have unlocked it. The third one, nope. Fourth one, yep. And so on. Now, when we create the save state initially, um, we will need to actually assign a current hat value, so current hat index. And we can put that on zero. 
And we can also make sure we always unlock the first hat, so at least the player has one of these that he that he can try out. And um, actually, the one that he could try out is actually a hat, a hat that could have nothing on it. So that could be very much possible just to create an empty game object and just put that as a prefab for the model of the hat. Um, and that's what I'm thinking of doing here. So current hat index could be equal to zero. Zero would be um, a pointer to a hat that that is basically nothing. So we we could call it none. And that seems quite accurate. Now, when we start the game initially, I like my unlock hat flag to be, or at least the index zero to be unlocked. So being able to swap back to the hat that is none. Um, we have one problem over here, however. Our unlock hat flag array is not defined how big it is right now. And the way I'm going to be getting around this is, um, well, we have two ways we could do. We could do a a dynamic resource.load. So we could do a resource.load and then look up how many items we have in that list and then send that over to the same state, maybe as a parameter. So hat count here. Um, that's one possibility. Or we could just define it here at the top. Um, I'm going to be defining more than I actually need. So here's what I'll do a private const int hat count. Uh, and we could go for like 12. And if we go beyond 12, then of course we can increase that number later on. So uh, you'd be going for 8, 16, 32, and so on, just to give some nice values in terms of bytes. Um, but if you if you know what this is going to do, a int is also a serializable type. And this is now going to be stuck inside of our save state. And maybe we don't want that. Actually, we don't want that. We don't want to have this arbitrary number here put in our save state. There is an argument you can say, hey, don't serialize this. And it's called non-serialize. And by doing this, we extract this value. This is now just part of the logic of the save state. It's not part of the actual file we're going to serialize. And now with this, I can go down here and say, hey, you know what? Unlocked hat flag is equal to a new byte array of hat count. And now in terms of data, we should be good to go. Now for testing purpose, I'm just going to head down here and copy that and also unlock the second hat. So we're going to have two hats total when we create a new game. And um, to make sure I actually don't reload the old data, because now we're going to run into corruption issues. We have a different save state. That's that's corruption. Like you're going to have issues reading the previous um, the previous save state. So I'm going to head over in my folder, delete the data.ss, press play once more, and now say file not found, let's create a new one. Okay, that sounds good. Now um, what I'd like to do next is head inside of that logic here, the game state shop logic, and maybe change the, um, change the preference, so change the current hat flag, that could be the next, the next step. So let's go ahead and do game state shop. And when we click on the hat, we want to say save manager instance state or sorry, save. The current hat index is going to be equal to I. And we can also save once everything is done. So, so save manager dot instance dot save like so. So once we click on the hat, we change the index and then we save that again. Okay. Now, with that in mind, we're going to be able to change the different hat index we have. So we're going to be able to, uh, oops, to change the current hat index inside of our save state. But that doesn't do anything right now. We don't actually use this, bit, this value anywhere. So go ahead and grab this. We're going to head over to our hat logic, and we are going to select the proper hat when we um, launch the game. So here in my awake call in the hat logic.cs, I'm actually going to say the following. Hey, select the hat at the index that is defined within my save state. Okay, so we have a, a bit of a confusion here. Um, both of them are being spawned at the same time. So what could be the problem? Um, the problem in this case is that we're doing that in a wake call and also the save state is being created in a wake call. So maybe we want to swap over to a start call for the hat logic. Um, this is just like a race in between those two, and and uh, the save state didn't win. <laughs> okay, so right here we see the zero. If we are to click on the one, 
And then apparently this has saved. I'm going to turn this off, turn it on again. And we have the one and we can just switch in between them and our preference is save. And that's amazing. That's exactly the behavior we'd be looking for. Okay. The next thing I'll do is I'll actually copy my test hat over and I'll create the none hat. So none hat or no hat, whatever you feel like. Um, this could be just called none has a price of zero. And the shop icon could be literally nothing. I think that's going to work. And the hat model, none. I don't think that's going to work, however, but let's, uh, let's give it a try. OK, the variable model of hat has not been recognized. Um, and that's probably because there's nothing, right? Yeah, so we're going to need to have a, a, um, a hat that has nothing for our script to work. And for that, I'll just create an empty game object. I'll call it no hat and I'll drag it, drop it inside of the prefab folder under the shop. With that in mind, we can now head back to our none hat and drag and drop this here. Now let's see if this works. Doesn't seem to have any issue thus far. And then let's switch over to none. None is good. I clicked on none. Then I'm going to reopen the game, see if it doesn't appear. Yep, so we're good. So no hat at this point. Um, of course, the thumbnail is wrong here, but do not worry about that. We'll actually create a um, one by one alpha and that will do the job. But as you can see here, the rest work just fine. Um, the next issue we could be tackling here would have to do with buying and also limiting the access for other things we haven't bought. Like for example, when we create our save state, we have two things, right? We have the one at the index zero, which is none, the one at the index one, which is this one, but we shouldn't be able to click on this one because technically, according to our byte array, which is one, one, and then 10 zeros, that's actually more, it's 14 zeros, this one we shouldn't have access to. And that's what we're gonna do right here. So we're going to restrict we're going to restrict the last hat. Any hat that we don't have access to, we're going to restrict it. And we will do that over here. I'm actually going to wrap up all of this in a if statement. And we're going to say, if save manager instance save current hat, actually, no, that's not it. It's the unlocked hat index, unlocked hat flag, um, if that at the index i is equal equal to one, then we can proceed with this code. Now, if we don't have that, we need to have a else statement here. Else if, and I'm doing it else if because there is something more in between here. If we don't have it, can we buy it? And then that will happen here or else don't have it, can't buy it. So here we can just do a debug.log, not enough fish. Um, so this should work, right? Um, this should work for just changing it if we need to. Then we have the else if statement that looks for the amount of fish you have and also the price of that hat. And let's have a look at it. So. We do have an index for hats, so we have hats at the index i, but price, item price, if that is smaller or equal to our current amount of money, which should be stored under our save state, so fish, then we're going to go ahead and buy it. And now when we do buy it, a couple of things happen. First, we take our fish count and we do minus equal the item price. That's fairly normal. So we deduct the amount of fish we have with the price. Then we also need to change the unlock flag. So this value here, we need to make sure this is now on the one. So we have toggle this one on. Do we need to do anything else? Um, yeah, we could go ahead and do this and also save. So when we buy, 
we deduce our price, we toggle on the good boolean, we change the current hat name, we change the hat, and then of course, we make sure to save. Let's see if this works. And you know what? I'd like to not have any fish. Just so I think I don't have any fish, right? Because we just reset, yeah, fish zero. So if we are to go here, we can get this one, that's fine. One as well, because um, I unlocked it. I hard unlocked it directly in the save state. And then this one, which costs 10, we don't have enough fish. And if we were to play the game um, just a tiny bit, just to make sure we have 10 fish, which I just realized is going to take more than five seconds. All right, so here we are with now a total amount of 10 fish and a very high, high score. Oof, my biggest score thus far. Um, let's make sure we go here. 10 fishes, click here. We've unlocked this one. And if I am to go back, we also have 10 fish. We'll need to reset um, our text over here as well. But let's just assume that this is fine. We're going to turn this off and oh, we don't have the proper fish on our head. That's annoying, but it is unlocked, however. Um, so we had two issues. First, the text did not update. And second, when we joined back, uh, we didn't have the right hat on our head, which means we were missing this line here. OK, so that also sets our preference for next time we load. Um, and now we need to set the text, which I believe we do over here. So we'll just grab that line and just set it again. That's all we need. So we've just fixed that issue. To show you what it is fixed, I'm going to go ahead and uh, redo what I just did. But I'm going to reduce the price of that hat because it's right here. I can I can do that. It's legal, <laughs> right? Um, hat price is going to be two. I've deleted the save file, so we're starting fresh. We have a high score of zero and then a fish count of zero. I just need to collect two of those. So one and then two. Run into a wall. And we have a total of two fish, so I can choose this one. I can choose this one. And I could technically unlock this one as well. And here it is. Fish count has been updated. We now have zero fish. Turn this off, turn this on again. And we have the right one on our head with the right fish count. All right, so that's good. I see two more problems with this very specific shop. And those problems are the following. We've just entered the shop and we have a hat name here. Obviously, that's not what I'd like to see. And also, I see the price of things I've already bought. So it's time to head back. This one should be a simple fix. So hat name should be a fairly, fairly simple fix. When we join here, we populate the shop and we could actually, let's see, um, select hat. What happens when we select the hat? Oh, so here it is. That's the name we wanted to change. So current hat name dot text. This is what we have to change. Let's grab this line of code. Head at the um, at the top here, maybe in the awake. And we will have to change the current hat name dot text. Change that to the hats at the index of our current hat index. And just like so, we should have fixed our first problem. Now, the second problem comes from um, the populate shop. So when we lay down our buttons, assuming that we have assuming that we have um, here the price, <laughs> assuming that we have unlocked the thing, then we want to set that to maybe nothing. So it just doesn't show up. So here we'll have to do if statement. If save state or save manager dot save state, the unlock flag i is equal equal to zero that means it is not unlocked then we can change that to give it its proper price else let's go ahead and just take this line of code and make sure it's empty and i think we're good to go now oh we got a no reference exception what could this be Oh, again, um, again, we're doing something in the awake call and the base state has not been awakened, you could say. So um, this is something we could move over to the construct, which is being ran on the start. All right, so this one is a bit tricky because the way our safe state work, um, it works on the same exact 
awake call as everybody else. And maybe that's that's definitely not the best way to go about it. Maybe we wanted to have a preloader of the application that would load the save state and then load everything else. But I think we, we've been able to make it that far without, without having that logic in place. So what I think I'll be doing here is um, I'll just move these two over to the construct and to make sure they're not being called every single time, in, including the resources. So basically I'm getting rid of the whole awake. <laughs> um, let me just move that in the proper order. To make sure they're not being called every time, we can just have a boolean that checks that. So private bool is initialized. That's going to be equal to false. If initialize is equal to false, then we're going to run these three. And now that's going to become true. OK, now this way it's going to be created um, once we enter the state. And uh, we'll have access to the safe state at that point. Oh, and I just realized that I put that in the wrong order here. So you'll want to put these two here at the top first. Or actually, these three. Because we were using hats in there, but hats is being defined um, at this line. So I had a no reference error when I booted the game. All right. Now that being said, I'm going to click on shop. And now we're in here. And we don't see the text beneath any of them because we have all of these hats, which means we're now ready to do a clean test by heading over to our save state, removing the uh, additional flag that we've unlocked, then back into our folder, delete the data.ss, and let's give this a try. Okay, so save file not found, that's totally fine. We're gonna head over to the shop and we have none. We can't select this one because we don't have enough uh, fishes. We can't take this one because we don't have enough fish. Let's give it a try in the game. We just need a total of two fish, so bear with me. And we've got two. I'm going to just jump into this rock. Yep, let's head back. Um, can't unlock this one, not enough fish. But uh, however, I can get this one. Oh, and I just realized that we'll need to, um, when we do unlock, we'll need to remove this one here, change the text back. And if we are to go back, yep, the text is still here. OK. But now it's gone. OK, so we have access to these two. OK, so final mistake we have to correct, hopefully final mistake we have to correct, is under the game state shop. And once we do um, unlock something, so in these line of code over here, once we do unlock, we're going to have to change the text. So I'll take this line of code. And what's going on here? So we don't actually we actually never save these game objects that contains the um, that contains these hat. So the way we can access it is through this hat container by doing the following: hat container get child, and we get child at the index i because that's the index. Um, it's the same index as which you have been spawned. And that's the first one. And then we can copy the rest of this text. So hat container, get child one, transform get child two. We take the text and we remove it. There is probably a good way to clean up this code. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, with that in mind now, I'm going to give it a quick try and cheat a tiny bit. I'm just going to say that my fish count is equal to 10. Delete my data.ss once more. I'll boot the game and then let's give this a try. So I have no ads. I could be choosing this one. The text, as you could see, disappeared. And we also got our text updated here and here. So I'm going to choose this one. And the behavior I'm expecting to see is that this text is going to disappear. I'm now going to have three fish. And the text is going to change here at the top. And it did. So everything updated properly, quit the game, I should have all the hats and three fish. Yep, so we got it working. All right, so that actually wraps it up for the shop. Uh, believe it or not, we're done with the shop. And um, it leaves us with two more sections of this course. Um, one has to do with monetization. So we'll have to put some hats in there um, for when we die. That's going to be the next section. And we'll wrap up everything nicely by uh, polishing everything. Uh, our game doesn't look very good right now, 
the lighting is extremely bad, especially from this angle. Um, we don't have the proper icons, we don't have the proper hats, we are missing content, and the gameplay chunks are kind of bad. <laughs> so a lot of things to fix, and you'll see it take all place in the next two sections, which will also wrap up the first part of this course. So guys, thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next section. Hope you're ready for some more. Cheers. Hey, welcome to the 11th section of this course. In this part, we are going to be adding monetization. So at this point, we can start seeing a couple of cent come in um, when we publish this game. And to do so, we will be adding, of course, advertisement. Advertisement will be done with Unity ads. And we are going to be setting up our scene and also our code before we set up the actual collaboration, uh, not cover, before we set up the actual services. So to proceed, I am going to create a new script that will be some sort of manager. We tend to do that a lot now, and um, it's, a, it's going to be a nice way to wrap this up, I believe. Let's create a script called add manager. In here, we'll define a couple of things, and we'll start with the usual line of code we have at the top of one of our managers. So the instances, the static instances. All right, then we'll also need a private void to wake and say instance is equal to this. Perfect, now we'll have a reference of this pretty much anywhere we go. Um, and then next up, we want to add two fields here. We can call them the configurable field, but basically those are, this is um, what is going to be referenced on Unity ads and also a rewarded video placement ID. Um, this is a string that we'll use to say, hey, this video is a reward video and the player is getting something out of watching this video. Okay, now um, what we would do next is uh, start looking into adding the advertisement namespace, but I believe we actually can't do that because we don't have it in sort of our, our services, our active services. So I don't see it right here, which means we'll have to enable um, the service. Okay, so I just figured out something here. Um, we are not actually getting anything when we toggle this on. We're not getting what I was expecting to get. Um, instead, we need to get our advertisement package through the package manager now. It's a new thing that I completely forgot. I'm used to the whole process, that's why. Um, but we have to head under Window, Package Manager. And here, under the Package Manager, we will be looking for, let's look for all the packages. We have one called Advertisement, here it is. It is currently on 3.4.9, which is the verified version. And I'll go ahead and I'll install that. Um, 3.4.9. And after a little bit, we should then have the proper reference in the script we were actually uh, attempting to write. So this one. All right, so this one is installed. As you can see, you have the little check mark here, which means everything is good. We can close this off, open up our project once more, and see that advertisement is now working. And do note that there's a little S here, advertisement with an S. Um, and at this point, we should be able to call the advertisement static class, which is right here. And we'll start it with a initialize with the game ID and our win test mode. Uh, you know what? We can write through over here. Or I believe if we just leave it like that, there's chances we might have a transfer over for what, what do you have in Unity? I'm not sure, but let's input through and make sure we toggle it off later on. Actually, you know what? Let's go here and create a new field. A serialized field, Boolean test mode. And I'll just input that right there. Okay. And then um, from anywhere else in the code, I'd like to call a simple function, which is going to be show reward and add. And we have to do a couple of things here. There is a, um, a data class called show option that we can just create like so. If we have a look, what do they give us? Gamer SID and also result callback, which is deprecated. So it doesn't really help us much here. Um, I don't remember what this is, I'll be frank with you. <laughs> but we have to pass it in as a parameter for advertisement.show. We show with the rewarded video placement ID and also the show option. 
And I believe that is actually it. So that's all we need to wrap up this ad manager. And the reason that's all we need, and you're, you're going to be asking yourself, well, you know, things happen and how do we know that these things happen? Um, these we'll call events that we can subscribe to through a interface, actually. It sounds a little bit complicated what I, saw, what I said, but I'll show you the uh, simple implementation under our game state def. So as of right now, we are going to close this off, minimize, not close, and add the ad manager on top of our game manager. So over here, ad manager is here. We are in test mode. We will find a game ID fairly soon and also a reward video placement ID fairly soon. But if you have everything here, the ad manager is on top. We press on play, nothing happens. That's completely fine. Um, just, oh, actually, you know what? In value configuration, that's, ex that's what we kind of wanted here because we don't have a game ID. But this is normal. So just leave it as is. And in the next video, we're going to be um, getting ourselves a game ID, a rewarded video placement ID, and then we'll start implementing the, the actual logic behind the game state dev. Okay, I'll see you there. Welcome back. Last time we left off, we were in need of a game ID and also a reward video placement ID for the ads we were going to play on our game. Now, we don't have these at the moment, and we need to go get these off the Unity ads on dashboard, and that's what we'll do. So I invite you to open up the services, if you don't have that tab, window general services under ads we will open up the dashboard so go to dashboard um do note that you will have to actually log in and uh, get into your account so of course you'll need your unity id for that and you will enter this page which is basically your dashboard that will let you know how much money you've made and so on um here i have a fresh new organization and i have no profit and it's a little bit it's a little bit sad to look at um, but that being said, you can go under project, find your project name in my in my um, case here, that would be runner. Um, this project name is actually defined under, I believe, your project name in Unity. So if you head over to file, build setting, player settings, yeah, product name is runner in this case. And in here, we can go under the monetization tab and also the placement ads. Now, placement, um, we already have a couple of settings here. That's great because that's exactly what we'll need. You'll find over here your ID. You have the ID for the Apple App Store and also for the Google Play Store. In our case, we're running ads on Google Play at the moment. So I'll do a copy to clipboard. I'll head back under my code. Actually, not my code. This is actually an object on top of my ad manager. Paste in my game ID. So 382430. One. Then I will also need a reward video placement ID, which um, luckily for us, they already defined. So there's already one right here. It's a video of type uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. reward video. It's a playable video and it's not skippable. So you can pretty much modify the things you need here. Uh, audio is not muted. We can't skip it. And this video is. Oh, yeah, you can have a video, you can also have a playable. And I don't know what this play is. I believe um, I've never actually experimented with that just far, but those are the type of ads. Playable is something that is interactive. So you might have a ad that you can play on. You can actually have inputs in that ad. Uh, placement name, placement ID. Okay, that's totally fine with me. Um, we need to copy this over. So the rewarded video, the ID, we'll need to copy that over because that's the one we'll be using. We won't be using the regular video. We don't want to put ads in the middle of our game randomly. Of course, you could if you wish, but in my case, I just want to play ads when um, the person wants to revive the penguin. And I'm going to copy this over, put it under the reward video placement. And just like so, now um, I should have what I need. So if I am to click on play, let's see if we get a problem still. It doesn't seem like we got any problem. And we're pretty much ready to implement this in our game, which is going to be fairly simple. And it's going to be all done in the game state dev. Why there? Because that's where we use the logic for the ads. Now, when it comes to listening, when the ad is done, if the ad was completed successfully, you can do that through an interface that we'll define here at the top. It is called iUnityAdsListener. And you won't see it pop up unless 
you are using Unity Engine dot advertisement. And once you have that and you type to that in, uh, it's going to tell you a couple of things. It's missing four different functions, um, and we will need to implement these four functions. Um, there's a good way to do that fairly simply. It's to choose this whole text, hit control dot, and implement interface. It lay down four new function. One, once the ad is ready, if ad add an issue, if it did start, and if it did finish. So when the ad is ready, that should be called right away when the game starts. And I don't want to implement that. I actually don't need to do anything here. It's something that I also do not plan on implementing here. Uh, we could do a debug.log, however, that let us know what the problem is. So debug log that message. Next up, we have on Unity ads start. So what do we do when the ad start? We really have nothing to do here as well. We can acknowledge that it has started just by having the ad pop up in our face. Now, the place where it matters is right here on Unity ads finish. And you'll see we'll get the placement ID, which we know which one it is because we're only using one throughout the whole game, and that's the rewarded video, and then the show result which we can do a switch case on. So this is what we'll do. Um, as soon as we receive the, the, uh, the result, we're going to do a show result in a switch. And then for the cases, you have failed, finish, or skip. We don't have the option to skip in our case. So we'll do both fail and finished. We can do, um, we can do default here. That really does nothing, really. Um, and what do we do when we fail? Well, if we fail, somehow, if the ad stop playing midway, if there's a crash, if, if something bad happens, let's send our player to the menu. And this way, he can keep on playing. Like, he has the full loop. However, maybe the ads are not loaded because he's no longer on the network and he's no longer getting those ads. It can be a couple of reasons why it happens. And just as a fail safe, let's send it over to the menu. Now, if the ad is finished, however, now is when we want to do a resume player. That is when we want to go back and do, um, I don't want to call it resume game here. Oh yeah, we have to. Okay, so resume game. We want to call the resume game and then we'll reroute whatever we have going there in a moment. Um, and that being said, once we resume the game, we respawn the player and the state is being changed. So I believe that's fine over here. Um, one thing we could do on top of that is once we enter here, we can turn off the completion circle. So the completion circle is what is the thing that actually turns. We don't want to give it to the player twice. So that's very important. We can revive only once per play session. Else there's nothing stopping our player from reviving a couple of times and uh, like indefinitely until he gets the highest score. Uh, I mean, that's not how I wish the game is, is played. So I'm just going to stop that mechanic completely by hiding this completion circle once we revive once, and we will have to toggle it back on somewhere else. All right, so we've got everything we need down here. The only problem we have thus far is that once we die and we click on the button, uh, we have the resume game uh, being triggered already. We have to go through an ad first. So what we'll do, we'll create a new public function that we can call try resume game which basically is being translated to show an ad and in here we'll do ad manager dot instance dot show rewarded ad just like so and then we will reroute whatever we had prior so once we go under the game state def or sorry that's the um we have to go on the uh, actual ui find the revive button and here we had revive so and actually resume game so game state def resume game instead of that we will do try resume game and let's give this a try oh maybe i want to disable this ui first run into the wall click here an ad is being played, we go back, and we were not revived. Okay, um, why is that actually? So I have to figure out. 
Oh, I just realized why this didn't work. We will need a start statement over here um, because we need to subscribe this whole script. This whole component needs to be subscribed to um, advertisement. So advertisement add listener this. And now we can actually receive those events. So what would happen prior is that we would call an add, but um, these down here would not be called for the sole purpose that they were not like they were not being um, added to you could say the events. So now this whole component is added and these function will be triggered depending on what happens. So going back under my shop, oh, not shop, the play button, we are going to run into a wall, try to revive, close, and then we are being revived properly. Now I'd like to do one more thing before we end this off and it's to stop the user from being able to revive more than once. So as you can see here, I died, I revived and then I can do it again. And the problem is because we have our completion circle being set to true um, every time we reconstruct the state and this happens every time we die. So that's not something we'd like to have here. How should we go and turn this one off? Well, it's something I like to do every time we start the game session. So maybe I'll grab this line of code and I'll create a new, a new function for it. Enable revive. And I'm just going to paste it in here. Make sure it's no longer a part of the construct. So I deleted it from the construct. I now have it on inside of a function called enable revive. And during the update state, we turn it off in case it goes beyond a certain point. So do know that this is happening. This is turning it off. But not only that is turning it off, but also once we consume it. So over here, OK, that being said, we'll need to call enable revive at least once every time we start the game. And we could be doing that under the game state init, initialize. Yeah, so over here, we restart the session under the game stats. We could also grab a reference to the game state def and call that there. And the reason I'm doing it here is because we cannot put it under the game state game uh, construct simply because uh, we go back to that state after dying. So we'll need to do it only once. And that's a good place to do it only once over here. Um, however, we'll need a reference to that. So maybe here we'll cheat and we'll do a find object of date. Oh, actually, you know what? We're on top of that object. So we can do a get component type of game state def and then call the enable revive. And that should be the final touch to this little add inclusion in our game, which was very simple. Uh, I really do enjoy this new package that Inti gave us. You subscribe to it when you need to, and uh, yeah, that's good enough. So during this play session, I can revive, and then I'm gonna die again, and I should not be able to. Yeah, so I don't have the option twice. Then I go back, play again, should have the option this time, and I do. So. The whole flow seems to be working just fine. That's actually where we're going to be ending our section on ads. We did it in a fairly simple manner. It was quite fast and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed. Now you can start looking at your profit go up. Uh, make sure that once you're ready, you go on your game manager and you toggle off the test mode. That's going to be fairly important. If you just give it one try, I'm just going to give it one try, see how it looks like. Um, I believe you can't actually get ads in the editor. Yeah, no, you can't. <laughs> but if you are to build this on your phone right now, you should be getting a real ad. So if you wish, you can go ahead and give it one try. Just don't abuse the system because you're going to get caught. That being said, I will see you in the next section in which we will start making this game look a lot better. So they, they always say the last 20% is the hardest. Um, yeah, we're going to have to create content, make this look good. So it's going to be quite hard. but. We're going to have fun. And as we do it, the game is going to increase in value very, very fast. So that being said, I'll see you there. Cheers. Welcome to the final section, the polishing section. In this one, we're going to go over our game, uh, make sure we have some proper content, some proper uh, gameplay chunks, some good lighting, some good scene. We're just going to go over the game and make sure everything looks good because our logic is pretty much done. So we've managed to get pretty much everything we wanted in the game. Of course, there's always um, spaces for improvement or new mechanics here and there. But in terms of having a full loop and the full content of this game, then it's out there. Now, it's a matter of making it look good. It's a matter of designing 
uh, gameplay that is enticing and also not too repetitive. And uh, yeah, and I'd like to begin by actually changing the lighting. One of the big things that I've been having in mind this whole time um, is just getting this to look a lot better. And this looks a little bit depressing when I open my project um, on a daily basis. So the first thing I'll do here is I'll grab the skybox again and I'll drag and drop that back into the world. Uh, we removed it at one point. We wanted to play around with the UI and this didn't really help us. So we remove it, but now it's back. So you just click and drag and drop that over the sky. The next thing I'd like to do is play around with the lighting a little bit. So under window, rendering, lighting settings, I'm gonna go here and switch from a um, a skybox source lighting, which is what we have right now, to a gradient that I'll manually define. So over here, environment lighting, I'm gonna go and choose gradient, and I'll be zooming in on our scene just to have a better look at this. So as soon as I switch to lighting, maybe I can play around with the sky color. Um, I want the sky to give me a very dark highlight. Um, and this the flow could be total white, so like this. And maybe in between, for the equator, which is the one that makes the biggest difference right now. And I think this looks quite good. So I'll be going with this option right here of um, of these selections. So for the rendering, I think there you go. So a black, a very light gray, and then a white for the ground. Now, the next thing that bothers me quite a lot, and I've been asking this question when I toggle this feature on, um, is actually the shadows. So if I go under Edit, Project Settings, and I'd like to go under quality. Now under quality, I wanted to make sure the real-time reflection probe are set because I'd like to put one in there. Um, and we're just gonna leave it on top of our player all the time. So I'd like to just put that in there, get some a little bit of reflection, and it's not gonna be something that will be um, constantly refresh. So it's something that will take a picture off at the beginning, so on the wake, and then we will just leave it running. So. That's it for quality. Then I'm gonna head over to graphics and under graphics, let's have a look here. I'd like to choose my scriptable rendering pipeline. So everything here seems to be okay. I'm gonna go back on my scriptable rendering pipeline settings. You'll see them on the right hand side. And let's have a look. So we don't want the high definition range. We don't need that because our color are quite simple here. Um, rendering scale is on the one, that's good. Under lighting, we now have the shadows, but I'm not sure anymore if I'd like to keep the shadow. Of course, they look good here at the beginning. You can put some crazy resolution too, but uh, it's something we might as well want to bake um, just for this starting scene. But you know what? I'm actually going to disable all the shadows. And we are going to avoid this cost by just putting that down on zero. So yeah, I don't think I'm going to be running shadows. Okay. Let's give it a look in the game, see how it looks like without shadows, see if we can get through. And it seems like we can get through. I, I like that a little bit better without shadows because I don't see the... Um, the it, it really seemed like artifacts to me, so those blob of shadow that were flickering a little bit. I could have increased the shadow and make them smoother, but that comes at a very high performance cost. So I'm not sure I'm ready to do something like that for a mobile game. Now we mentioned a reflection probe a couple of seconds ago, and I'd like to create one right here. So I'll head over lights, reflection probe, and I'll drag and drop that on top of my penguin. So it just follows him around. Now I'll stack this directly on top of him and let's go ahead and just click on the, the bounds and make sure it includes pretty much a whole scene and even beyond than that. So you know what, I'll just set it manually here. And as we've mentioned, we'd like to have this bake only once at the beginning. And the way we can do that is by putting it on real time, but only trigger it on awake, which means at the very beginning, we'll get to have um, we'll get to have the reflection probe applied, and then that's it. <laughs> only only at that time. Um, I might want to lower down the intensity just a tiny bit. And it seems like my snow is really extremely white in this case, and maybe I want to change that. So. I'm going to go play around with the texture. All right, so I went ahead and I changed the texture um, for you. This should be automatically this color initially. So the whole tutorial, you saw a very, very white snow texture. Well, that's that wasn't like that on your end. <laughs> and that's because I've just changed it now and you receive a new package. 
And I seem to like this color quite a lot, a lot better than what we had for sure. And I think we're good on this one. So we messed around with the lighting settings and I enjoy this a lot better than I used to. So uh, there's that. I think it's a good change. In the next one, we will tackle the whole environment around here, the, the starting point and also the shop. And yeah, so that's what we'll do next. I think that's going to be another big touch to our game. See you then. Last time, we messed around with the light just to make sure we could see something. And also we removed the shadows, which gave us a much brighter brighter alternative. So um, what we'd like to do today is to play around with the scene. So I'd like the scene to change its layout a little bit. Maybe I want to change the angle in which I look at the penguin and also just, just put stuff around. So the big goal of this episode is going to be to make sure that when I look around, I don't see any glitch in the background and also that the scene is disposed properly. So here, if I click on shop, you'll see we see this big line here at the back and I don't like that. So we're going to make sure to clear the horizon and the other part we'll need to fix is here. When we press on play, we could see the horizon over there as well. So the area we're trying to cover is everything that the, ca that, um, the camera covers. So in this case, this part, and also this part would like to just put more stuff in there. Now, one thing that we could do, uh, could start off with, is just change the angle at which I'm looking at my penguin just a tiny bit. I like to see him from maybe roughly this angle. Seems a little bit more. And we have to make sure it makes sense with the menu as well. So I just booted up the game and I'm looking. It does make sense with the menu. We're not taking too much spot. Maybe we want to get, want to get uh, a little bit closer even. Yeah, something like that. And do note that the hat is going to be less annoying in the future because it's going to be a real hat. But I could go with something like that. Now we can replace the background with, without any problem. The only thing we can't move is the player. That's why I'm kind of focusing around him. And here we go. So I'll use this. And to make sure I save, I'll right click on the transform while it's at runtime, copy the component and then paste component value so it goes back there. Now we got a brand new angle. And it's time to start playing around with the background. So here, I'm moving stuff in the scene view, but I'm really just looking at what I have in the game view because that's really, that's the scene we're trying to set up. That's, that's where the magic happens. And um, yeah, so this cabin here, we could put it like that. Fireplace could be a tad closer and smaller. And do remember, we have a bunch of assets we can use as well. So um, I will go back under my model folder under, I believe it was environment. We have some firewood we could use. Yep. So I'm going to use that firewood and just put it right there. Um, a gift. I'm going to put a gift in there. Why not? We barely see this gift, but the small details are what really matters at the end of the day. So maybe even we see it through here. That could be cool. Also do know that we might see inside of that house as well when we flip the camera over to the shop. Oh, and what's going to be very important is that over here in the back. So I'm going to make sure to cover a little bit of it, maybe add a tree. Just like so. Now, if I am to press play on this, I just want to see how the player behaves, how he moves around. That seems fine to me. And when we enter the shop, we'll need a brand new angle. We'll need some, some stuff in the background. But right now, I believe this is fine. It's a little bit, a little bit too packed, but do know that we're going to have a big splash screen here at the top um, in a few as well. Um, now it's going to be time for us to decorate this other side and I'm going to make sure to disable my initialized camera and instead just toggle on the shop one. So we have a better understanding of what's going on now. Of course, we need to have a look at the hats. So the player will need to be in sight and will need to be in sight in such a way that it doesn't cover up our menu on the left hand side. So maybe something like this will do the trick. We can also do as we did earlier because we know that we know the player is moving around. So chances are um, we should be opening this shop and just doing it live here. Also do note that the hats, they won't be that big. Yeah, I could go with something like that. 
So I'll copy this component, paste it. And it's going to be time to actually just move stuff around. So maybe that igloo, we want to have it in the back over there. Okay, so we've managed to set up the camera for the shop and also the camera for the initialize. Now we only need the transition in between these two. So from this to over there, so this whole side here. And I'm thinking maybe just a bit of a glacier over here, something huge. I just don't want to see like the, the horizon. That's really what I'm trying to avoid. And I feel like we just, we could use this twice just in a different angle. All right, so I think I've did it. So I've covered that angle as well. Plus you don't really see it that much, so it's not a big deal. Now, what is a big deal is the fact that we've made a mess out of our key over here. So I'm just gonna make sure I drag every single object that isn't, um, isn't well, that is part of the environment. I'll just take that and I'll drag that under our level object, which is roughly here, yep. We also wanted to get this gift and what else? Those glacier. Just to make sure we can go back to having something a little bit clean. Now there is a fish collectible that has been sitting there for a couple of videos and I think it's time for us to remove it finally. My bad on that. Um, but yeah. Now we have a better scene in the beginning. Now do note it all, you know, it looks not so good from the scene view, but what really matter is your game view. Um, as long as you fake it, as long as it looks like it is a big environment to the person who plays, then it is a big environment to the person who plays. That's all you have to do. <laughs> okay, that being said, I think we covered uh, pretty much this, this episode. We've covered what we had to do, which was just to fill in these blank and have a little bit of uh, different camera angles. And yeah, we pretty much succeed. So I'll see you in the next one. I think in the next one, we can lay down the, uh, the splash screen or we can start looking at doing something else, maybe like the font. That could be nice. Anyway, I'll see you there. Cheers. Welcome back, guys. As a third addition to the polishing round, I thought we could do some sort of um, splash screen. Now, a couple of ways you could go ahead and do that. You could include a PNG that you've made in this UI, if you wish. Um, but what I'm feeling like doing is, um, I'll toggle on this UI just for, for just to see this, um, is just play some 3D font floating in the air around here. Uh, we have a bunch of letters in our model folder, model letters, and we can just place these and um, have a text show up. <laughs> so that's what I plan on doing. And I think I'll be doing it inside of a empty game object. So let me just bring that up here just to make sure I can see where it is. Maybe give it a small uh, icon because I don't want anything on top of this object, but I'd like to place it in the air for the moment. Or maybe even like 5,000 in the air, just for editing purpose. Okay. So with that in mind, I am going to drag a couple of letters in here. So the S, the U, and I'm just going to spell it out completely. So spell out the name of the game. And there you go. So I've got all the letters I need. They spell out Subway Skater. And if I am to just move this around, um, I'm going to select all of them and just move them like so. So, of course, uh, I'm going to have to retouch the position of that, but I'm just going to keep on going until I get the whole word. And as I start a new word, I'm just going to take this and go down. And there we go. So we have our text right here. Now, it's a matter of positioning it in such a way that it doesn't look too bad. And for some reason, I'm having a little bit of glitches as I'm trying to edit it up here. So I'll just bring it there. Bring it back down to zero down here. And I'll call this the splash screen object. Maybe we want to position that in such a way that we see it um, from this angle. Maybe it's a little bit too close, so we're going to put it at the back there. And of course, um, we'll need to have a different color for that. So. Let's click on one of these font. You'll see that the material is called LPN and L1. So if you have a look, usually when you have um, an object like that and it has a material that is uh, with the object, you can find a material folder within the project. So what I think I'm going to be doing is I'll actually just take this one and I'll drag it out. I don't want to lose a reference to it and I'll just drag it out right here. We have um, we had one called letters over here using another shader. 
we're going to remove the old one we had and instead use a brand new one that is going to be a shader graph main so the same as we had before and also we have a texture for letter gradient which is uh, roughly around here now it doesn't look too great right now but we could position a light on it so it looks a lot better but before I go ahead and I do any of those, um, I'm just going to make sure that this doesn't look too bad by, um, by just going around and um, maybe just giving it a slight more organic style and maybe bigger letters sometime. All right, so here it is. So I placed those around a little bit funky in a funkier matter. Um, now we do have one issue where it doesn't really look good in that angle. And I believe that is because of the, um, the way lights are being set up in our game so if we have a look this way it looks great but once we look at it at it this way it just feels like the light doesn't exist on this object whatsoever so um we could be playing around with the light but as we as we've done that earlier i don't really want to play around with the light so much for the sole purpose that we've already cleared that out before so one of the options we have over here something we could do is we could go under our settings and create a light that will only affect this. Because right now, if we have a look, uh, for example, we have this light here, the directional light that we use for a game. It would look good if we had directional light that pointed this way, but that did not mess around with anything else but the text. So right now we have a certain setting in our project that makes it so we cannot have two lights. In fact, if I was to take this directional light, copy it and just move it around, you see there is no impact whatsoever. And that's because there's only one light affecting our project. Now, um, we, can, we can actually resort to that by going over to project settings. Actually, well, you can go on your pipeline asset and then enabling additional light, which we could do per pixel. And now this way, when we do copy something, you see that you know, there's multiple things affecting it now. Um, which is not what we want either. We only want the light that is going to affect the splash screen. And we can do so by resorting to layers. So on my splash screen object, the one that contains all my letters, I will head over to the layer folder, add a new one, and just call it splash screen. Now I'll make sure to apply that. And yes, change all the children so everyone beneath that has the splash screen layer. I can create my second directional light, which is here. I can just call it, say, um, splash screen light. And down here under the cooling mass, you can set that to nothing at first and then just a splash screen. And this way, we can now have a light that only affects this. And in a similar fashion, you can go on the other light and toggle off splash screen. So now it's only being affected by one light and not two if that's how you want to vibe. And there you go. So like that, we now have a splash green. Um, and I just realized that we also changed the hat colors. <laughs> that's good. At one point, we'll have real hats, but right now we don't. Uh, do note that the real hats won't be as long as this. Well, oh, maybe. Maybe we can have a top hat that's as long as this. But um, at the moment, we don't have that. So just have that to note. And that's it. In the next one, I believe we could tackle the font and then we could move on to making some gameplay stuff. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, I'll see you there. Welcome back to another polishing session for this game. And today we're going to be looking at fonts. But before we go through that, I'd just like to say that you might see something different with the project. Um, and it's just the fact that I've changed the background buttons here. Uh, I might change them again in the future because they do not stack very well with the play button. But that's something um, I might do later on. And if uh, if you start this course and you have different files, then it's completely normal. Okay, now when it comes down to font, um, you got to be kind of careful what you do because you can't just take any font on the internet and hope that it's going to work for your project. You have to take something uh, or make something that doesn't have any royalty associated with it, that has a proper license. One of the places that I like to go to find these fonts is the safest place, I believe, and it's the fonts.google.com. And I've never had any issues with the license thus far. One I've been going for is one called Grand Stander. I believe it has a comic and also not, not childish, but a little bit of a comic feel to it that I think is going to fit our game well. So that's the font I've decided to go for for this game. And if we click on license, we have a look 
we are free to use this in our product and project, print, digital, commercial, or otherwise. However, I cannot sell the font on their own, which I'm not doing. I'm including them as part of another package. So, so by reading this, I'm quite assured that I can use this font. And to do that, you'll have to download the font. So go to the top here, download the font. You'll then receive it as a zip format. And I'm going to go ahead and extract that zip format. Deal the other file, just clean up everything. And I will take a, for example, a static regular font. So I'll take this one, cut it, and find my project folder, drop it under, um, under the artwork folder. Yeah, under the artwork folder, I'll create a new folder called font. And I'll just paste it in here. And I'll go clean up what I've made. Okay. Well, actually, you might want to keep it in case that's not the right font, but uh, I just have a very destructive nature um, when it comes to this. So having a look here in my artwork folder under font, you can now find the font. But it's not as easy as that. Since we're using Text Mesh Pro, it's a little bit different um, where we have to create a font asset. So you can't just go here and then change the font because by default, you only have these two when you import um, Text Mesh Pro without any samples. So here's how we do it. We go under Window, Text Mesh Pro, Font Asset Creator, and then we're going to have to drag and drop our font in here. This will create a font asset. So if we have a look here, this creates this type of um, texture, and then the fonts are being sampled from that texture. But before we go any further, let's play around the settings. Um, a padding of 8 is good. Atlas resolution is, um, I go 2K by 2K, else the definition of those are not very good. And we can give it a try. So I can do, a, for example, 512, 512, generate this. And you'll see here that you get a lot more blurry images. Um, either way, we can come back and play around with this. But at the moment, let's just try and save it. Save it inside of same folder. I'll keep the default name. And by doing that, I should now be able to change, if I go under my, my play button, for example, should now be able to change this for the grand standard. And then you'll find my fund. And uh, yeah, I intend to make this a little bit bigger. And also, should we do anything with this? Um, it feels like this is great. Like we don't need to modify or make the, the, the texture a little bit uh, bigger. But do know that when I was generating, I was generating with only capital letters. And for some reason, we're getting non-capital letters, which is odd to me. And just like this feels pretty good. Um, we are going to play around with a little bit more. For example, here, the outline. I wish I could have a small outline like so. Maybe 0 0.1 will do the job. Just so we can highlight the text and see it. Uh, maybe even 0 0.2, that might be too much. Whatever it is you're liking in this case. And what else could we play around with? Um, by the way, we're under text mesh pro distance field, but I believe we could go under mobile instead. Now, when it comes down to these one, one thing I'd like to do is to change the material we have on top of that. So right now we have um, our regular material. That's fine. But I'd like to go ahead and um, and actually change the Text Mesh Pro distance field for one that is mobile friendly. So if we go under Text Mesh Pro, mobile, then distance field, then we can go down here and play around with the settings. For example, we'd like to have a small outline, maybe 0 0.15. Uh, but at least now we're using the mobile friendly and it should be a little bit less expensive when in, it goes to, uh, to rendering fonts. But you'll find out that that's the only one we have. So we have to make sure we swap all of these to the proper um, the proper font asset. So you won't have to change the material once again. You just simply have to change the, um, the font asset. For example, this high score, I'll do it once more. We don't go here. Instead, we go under the Text Mesh Pro UI and choose the proper font asset. That being said, I'm just going to go back and rework a little bit of these. For example, I'd like to have bigger text for these. There is an alignment issue that we see here. Maybe I want to have. Um, my font lowered a little bit. Uh, and the way I could do this, I'd like to do it on the font level. We can play around with this. If we go over to the font asset, which is right here, you'll find a lot of settings. 
but under the face info we could play around with the um, the accent line I believe will do the job yep and it helps us center it a little bit so you see both of my text here I can just lower them down to where they should be okay now what I'll be doing is I'll go around my whole application and I'll make sure to modify um, all the font asset to reflect this to use my new font also don't forget to head inside of your hat item and actually change the font in here as well because it's part of the prefab and uh, we must not forget these there's three no, there's two texts here the hat name and also the hat price and as mentioned earlier with these changes of font you might want to move things around just a tiny bit and feel free to do those manual at this point um, and just make sure it looks good so I feel like these had to be moved regarding the new background and also the new font. So I decided to do so. And if we are to play this, you're going to realize that most of the text that I've input in the game had um, no capitals. So here, well, it had one capital, which, you know, the proper way of writing. But one thing I realized is maybe I'd rather have all caps all the time. So I can either select the settings here on the right hand side, or I could go change my text or do both. So what I'll be doing is is that so I'll make sure that every text that I've input in that game is actually always using caps. I like caps. One other thing that bothers me is when we change line like so. And sometimes it's not a possibility to make this bigger because if I am to make this bigger, then I don't start where I want to start uh, my line. And I don't really have an offset here because I'm using a um, I'm using something that scales it automatically, so the vertical layout group. So what I tend to do here is disable the wrapping. I don't want it to wrap. And instead, if I go a score that is, a score that is five digits, I'll just let it overflow and I'm okay with that. Um, that's one of the thing you have, you have control over as well. So wrapping of these lines, maybe sometimes you don't want to see any wrapping. Okay, I believe we're pretty much done. Um, maybe I want to play around with the thickness a little bit because I have a hard time seeing all the text all the time. But it's something that you're going to be messing around in your game uh, until you find the right feel. Now, um, just do please go back and forth and, and make sure all the fonts that you have are looking great for you to your liking. And also do note that if, for example, here I have too much outline, but I don't have enough at other places, you are allowed to just create another material <laughs> and, uh, and run that material instead. So. Yeah, I'm pretty much, I'm good pretty much everywhere except here. I'd like to make this fish bigger. Okay, so this completes it for this episode. I'm quite happy with the result. In the next one, we're going to be looking at um, importing a couple of hats, maybe from an outside source, a third party, and uh, making those thumbnails. Yep, so I'll see you there. In this episode, we're going to be looking at introducing new hats to our players. So at the moment, we have a couple of hats that we've put in there just for debug purpose, as you can see none test hat and number two now those were using um 3d assets that we already had in the project and uh, actually just just using the funds but we're going to be looking at importing something else um from another source now depending at which time you're looking at this course you're watching this course there will not be any hats included so uh, in my first pass at the moment what i plan on doing is grabbing them from the asset store through a third party now obviously if i am to do that i cannot redistribute them um, to you guys. So unfortunately, I'll show you how I did it. And then uh, maybe if you're watching this in the future, then you'll have some hats you can actually expose right away, which would have been the best option, but really I'm not an artist. <laughs> so um, that being said, I did look at a couple of things and I fell on this asset that I really liked. Um, there's a bunch of low poly hats, which could fit our game. For example, I see this one here. I really like this one. Um, and it's $5. So I'll be buying it directly from the asset store and I'll be importing that in my project. Um, and I do invite you to do the same if you wish to use these hats. The link will be in the resource of this um, of this lecture. So you can find it there as a link. And uh, yeah, so I'll go ahead and I'll add that to my card. All right, so once we have the low poly hats and I have them here instead of this folder, I have uh, materials, I have the meshes, I have the prefab and also textures. Once we have that, I'd like to create myself a scene in which I have my penguin just standing up here on his own. I have the camera angled at him in such a way that I can see his face well, and I can also see the hat when there's going to be a hat. Um, and what I want to create is some sort of, of small green screen studio, you could say. So 
I'll go ahead and I'll create myself a new plane. That plane will be angled to 90 degrees, and it's going to have a material, which I've made here prior. It's a material that is uh, using the URP, so the Universal Rendering Pipeline, unlit, and just has a green color on it. And I just want to put that behind my player like so. Once I have that, um, I want to start creating those hats. So I want to actually create those hats. And what I mean by that is lay down the objects on top of the head and also make sure they are in the right format for a game. Because if we're just to say, OK, well, let's just go ahead and spawn that on top of our player. Well, it's going to look a little bit too big at the moment. So let's go here on the head. And it's going to look like that. Now, obviously, that is not the behavior we'd like to have. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to create an empty game object every time I want to add a new add. I'll create a new empty game object on top of the head top end. I'll create uh, one that is called antler hat in this case, because that's the name of the hat. And then I'll put the prefab, the one that we receive, I'll put that beneath the antler hat, like so. Um, and then I can go ahead and just reset the position of the other one. This one has to be on zero, zero all the time and has a scale of one, one, one. But the one here that we've made, the empty game object, this is the one we're going to edit. And this is the one we're going to save. So now by having these two objects, as you can see, we have one that is the one we'll be saving is, is the top level one. So the end of hat, the one we've created with nothing in it. Um, has a position of 0, 0, 0, rotation 0, 0, 0, and the scale of 1. So that's exactly what we'd like to have. We don't want to change that. If we were to change that, it might mess up everything. For example, if we change the position, ah, that, 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 that might mess up everything. We don't want to do that. So instead, uh, when we do modification, we'll do it directly on the object beneath. So here, I can come down and start scaling it in such a way that is big enough for the player. So maybe something like that. And then move it down. And here is our first hat. Now, um, I realize that I did a little bit of work prior to this, but if you don't have the proper color on this, just make sure you set the material to something shader graph main, because that's, that's the prefab we've made, the shader we've made. And then you can uh, assign it the right texture, which uh, should not be very far. If it's the first hat you're looking for, then it should be the first texture. But again, by that time, hopefully you already have all of that in your folders. OK, so that will be the first set we've made. We can now take it, create a new um, folder under artwork that I'll just call hat. Or maybe we can just put it under prefab. Yeah, it makes a little bit more sense. So let's put it under prefab, take this and put it directly in here. OK, I'll just do one more and then we'll move on to take pictures and I'll do the rest offline. The next one we could tackle is the second one, so the big horn element in this case. I will go ahead, right click, create a new object empty that I'll call exactly the name of the hat. Make sure it has a position of 0, 0, 0. Same thing with rotation and a scale of 1. Then I'll go ahead and I'll drag my prefab in here and we'll have to do a scaling modification for sure on this one as well. So let's scale it down. Maybe I want to turn off the other one just for this a moment, but just keep it around because we'll need to take pictures. That's a very small hat for a very small head, but it seems to fit. Oh, it seems to fit well. Okay, that's our second hat. <laughs> um, let's go ahead. Oh, wait, I did the modification on the wrong object, so that's definitely not something you'd like to do. So let me go and reset all I've done and do it on this object. That's where you want to do the modification. There we go. We'll grab this one and we'll drag and drop it inside of the prefab folder. And there we go. So we have a total of two hats being um, on top of this. Now, the next thing we'll need is a 3D, not 3D, a 2D software that allows you to edit images that can be Photoshop, that can be GIMP, that can be really anything. Um, like I've said, chances are you already have those thumbnail, hopefully in your artwork folder. But if you're watching this when it came out, then um, you won't have them right away. It's an update that I do plan on making for this course. But once you have that, 
you can just pop the, the hat that you like, take a picture. Our goal here will be to take a square picture, so a square thumbnail um, that includes the hat and doesn't have to include the face. So something like that will do the job. I'll put that in my clipboard for the moment, open up Photoshop, and I want to have something that is 256 by 256. It's not something that's going to be too huge, but it also has to have a certain um, resolution, so it does look good. So I'm going to move that around, and since we have a green screen, I can just go ahead and delete everything behind with the one tool. Make sure it is also a PNG file. Once I have that, I can save it. Now with this, I can save it under artwork and maybe a new folder that I can call thumbnail. And I won't save the PSD file, I'll just save a PNG and I can call that antler hat. Good. I'll do it one more time for the other hat and then I will go ahead and integrate what we have. It might be worth creating a script to always have the same um, same kind of pause with the, with the actual player, but I don't think it's going to be that important for us. Also, for example, this hat is much smaller than the other one, so maybe I want to make the face of the player a little bit bigger like so. You can see the difference here. Whatever fit your style better. And then I can say that under the big horn helmet. Save this and we're going to move on to integrating finally. Integration will be done in the other scene of course so we'll go ahead say what we have head over to game scene and under the shop. Hmm, actually we don't have to do anything under the shop it's all done within the resource folder right here. None hat is fine. The test hat is no longer fine it's now the antler hat. And then we have the big horn helmet. And I have a feeling that because now they are in different order, chances are the nun hat is not going to be at the top and that might be a problem. So let's see. Yeah, so here's what we can do. We can take the nun hat and just put the underscore in front so it goes at the top. And this way, um, we can create some sort of ordering this way. So none is now back at the top and do realize that the underscore was not put here because that's not the name, the item name. Um, and if you want to do a certain order, you feel free to go ahead and just say something like that, which is probably what you'd like to do because the prices are going to be different and maybe you want to have the more expensive at the bottom. So really up to you, but you can go ahead and create something like that. If you do plan on having more than 10, then of course, go ahead and add two digits in front of it, like so. Okay, so none hat is good, no price. The antler hat, um, you can call it antler hat. It's fun, I don't have to, I don't have to name them. <laughs> um, this one could be going for, I don't know, 10. Um, the thumbnail is the following. So where is my images? Here they are. I cannot drag and drop them thus far because I have to change them to Sprite 2D and UI, which is fine. I'll do that here. Then we'll head back on it, drag and drop this new thumbnail and find the prefab that we wanted to have here. There we go. Same thing for the other one. Um, let's go with a price of 10 as well. I have a feeling that this text might be a little bit too huge, but we'll find it out in a, in a second. And there we go, we, we actually put that here. Press on play, see what kind of behavior we will get from this. Well, first we have this hat, looking good. And there we go, so the shop actually looks good. The text here is definitely not fine. We can go ahead and fix the, the text. Well, I really like this one. This one is my favorite thus far. Yep, and uh, we're going to have to create a thumbnail and we'll do that immediately for the none. So that's that's totally fine. We can head over to the other scene, just take a quick picture of, of no helmet at all. And that will do the job. So here, let me just find my hats, which are right here. Turn this one off, take a quick picture, put that in Photoshop. 
something like that. And remove the green. And now we have our thumbnail for none. Okay, and that's how we've added content to our hat shop. As I've mentioned, um, hopefully by the time you're watching this, you already have some stuff in the folder, but chances are you might not. So um, either stuck, stick around for a while, create your own hats, or you can go ahead and buy the one that I've bought on the asset store, which are good looking. So if you feel like doing that, you can find the link in the description down below. And by description, I mean the resource of, um, the resource of this course. Okay, so I'll go ahead and I'll address a couple of issues like this one. I want the text to be always in caps and um, I might want to make sure that this one overlaps a little bit down here. And that's pretty much it. So guys, thank you so much. And I will see you in the next one in which we might be tackling the gameplay prefab um, to actually change the gameplay of the game and uh, make this a little bit more enticing than having to stay in a single line and just jump once in a while. So I'll see you then. Cheers. As we are getting closer to the finished product, it's time to start thinking a little bit more about the gameplay. Usually it's something you might want to start with, but uh, we've been making this game in, in one big one big rush. So um, we have been using the same two gameplay prefab from the get-go. And then in the, as you can see right here in my folder, I have a lot more that I've made. And I'm going to show them to you, but first I'll actually create one more, just to give you the hint that we have to create many of those and of course um, create them in such a way that your game is going to be fun and enticing. So now to create a new chunk of gameplay, the way I like to do it and, and how our project is currently set up um, is by starting with an empty game object, resetting its position to the origin of the world, changing its name, and then adding the, this is going to be chunk number nine, adding the chunk component. Now I still don't know how big this one is going to be, but let's give it a try. With my empty game object, I'll drag and drop it inside of the gameplay and then I'll double click on it so I can enter the prefab editor. I know that my, um, my chunk has to be angled in such a way that it's going forward on the Z axis, so in that direction. So I'll put that back at the center and then I'll start dropping some of the element on it. So we could be doing a block. Drop that here, reset its position and put it say roughly are around here. Now we don't have to be perfect with the distance in Z, but what uh, what would be good is that you try to at least align them properly on, on the lanes. So we know that the lanes are at zero, minus three, and also three. So I can create a, a ramp just before that, create a gap in between the two. So here's a small setup I could be doing. So I could be bringing that all the way over to 20 meters. Now do know that these are equal to 10 meters. So when we're going to be setting the, the chunk length, let's say that right now it's 20 meter. We might want to give it a small room here of 23, um, but something like that could do the job. And then I'll just move this on this axis here. So maybe on the right lane, if you look at it this way and move it over this way, I'll put the ramp there. And what I'd like to get as a result of this one is um, block all the axes and then force the player to be on this one. So what I'll do is I'll copy this, move it over to the middle lane, copy it again to the other lane, and I'll just put some more in the middle. Why not? So something of the sort, feel free to improvise. And I'm just going to block the axis for, um, for most of this part here. So you can't just jump on it because that's something possible. And I'll just block it with a log, for example. Yep, so something like this. I'll make sure it doesn't touch this lane as well. And I'll just anchor it this way. And then you can give it a, like a small bit of modification as well. Now you can scale this up. You can move this in such a way that it's not going to interfere with your gameplay. And it's very important that it doesn't because if I was able to go here and not die, then I might get stuck there. And that's not cool. That's not a cool feeling if your player just gets stuck. So instead, I'm making sure I'm just blocking all the axes. And you know what? These at the bottom here could also be logged. It would make a lot more sense. So I'm going to go down here, make sure I scale this one up. 
I'll, I'll just place them in such a way that it looks somewhat visually appealing. So here we go, we have chunk number 9 over here, which is a lot more messy than the chunk we've made in the past, but we know that we cover all the gameplay axes. If he goes somewhere close to here, he is going to die of one of these dead zones at least, and then if he misses the jump, he's also going to just run into this and then die. He has an option to keep on going, um, I hope so, I hope this is not touching the lane, but we can test this out. And just like that, we've made a chunk. Now let's measure it. It is... 10 meter here, 20 meter there. So we could be assigning 20 meter exactly, or we could be just maybe cutting it to say something like 18 could do the job. With that in mind, I'll go back on this node. I'll input say 18 meter, go under my world generation, add one more slot for it, not, not 89, just nine. And I'll just drag it in here. And now you'll see that when we play our game, oh, by the way, make sure you remove it from uh, the screen. When we play our game now, we have a lot more variety than we used to, and that's because I have a total of nine different gameplay prefab now, and the more I add, the better it's going to be. So I have this one, I have here where I'm forced to either jump or go on the left side. I have a lot more um, different behavior I can play with here. Oh, and I just missed my jump. And do note that you're able to do some angles if you wish. Uh, that's totally fine. Just make sure that it's, it's not going to get your player stuck anywhere. Here's our new prefab. It worked well. Okay, so that's really all we have to do for this. Um, of course, make as much as many prefab as you can. So go ahead and create some of those gameplay prefab and try to make them fun. All right, I'll see you in the next one. Hey, welcome back. Last time we created a lot more gameplay prefab and we have a lot of variety now that comes to play. And um, something we'd like to do that we we probably pretty much realized it a long time ago, but um, we should be doing now is to give our player some breathing room when he starts a game because sometimes uh, the time it takes just to change a camera you don't really have a lot of time to react and it's something we might want to do um, and it's going to be very very simple thing to do actually so if we head over to the world generation we just have to change the first chunk spawn position we just have to add on top of this number now i'll give myself uh, maybe 10 meter more so that's going to give us uh, roughly two more seconds to react. So I'll take my well generation. I'll say, hey, we're going to start at 15. And for my, um, my scene chunk, those are going to start at 20. Let's hit play. And just like that, we have a lot more room at the beginning, a lot room to think and actually make our first move. <laughs> That's really all I wanted to say for this episode, actually. It's a very small change, but it was a much needed change that we could have done a lot earlier. But uh, We've done it now because we're pretty much wrapping things up. So um, come again for the next episode in which we're going to review controls. I believe that we might want to uh, permit the player to actually switch lane in the middle of a jump. So I'll see you there. Hey, welcome back. Um, as I was testing this game, as I was testing out the product, now that we have something that is a little bit more close to final and we have a lot more uh, gameplay prefab, I've realized that it might be good for a player to be able to change lane in the middle of the hair. So right here, as I was jumping, I might be uh, able to change lane, and I think that's, that's something very good. So I'm actually going to implement that. It's a fairly easy implementation. All we have to do is when we are in the air and also when we're falling, so I believe we have the jumping state, which is right here, and also the falling state, we have to permit um, the call to change lane. And we have to do it in two scripts, but I'll open a total of three. Walk, jump, and also um, falling just so I can steal the code from the, the walking state. Or I believe we called it running state. So I'll start under the running state, go down here, and the line of code we wanted to add in the transition, because that's what we call every frame, was um, the following, the swipe left, swipe right on change lane minus one, and also change lane one. So I'll be copying this code over in the transition right about here. I'll do the same thing for the falling state. Please don't say because it's going to take a while to, uh, to compile apparently. And there we go. Now by adding these pieces of code, we should be able to look for those swipes as we are jumping or falling and therefore change lane. So let's give it a try. I'm going to jump here, jump again, and then switch lane in the air. 
Yep, so that gives us a lot more control and it's something that just help us do this one and uh, avoid death right there. So it was a very small fix, but I wanted to do it to make sure we have a little bit more control and I actually prefer those control. Okay, so that's pretty much it for this round of polishing and I'll see you in the next one in which we're gonna tackle something regarding the progression. So maybe we'd like to display how far the player has made it in the game uh, regarding to hat collection. So I'll see you there. Cheers. Hey, welcome back to another round of polishing. In this one, we're gonna be displaying additional information regarding how many hats we have gathered thus far. So as we enter the shop, I'd like to display some kind of meter roughly around here or maybe uh, at the top there, leave some space for text. Um, and, and that is going to say how many hats you have collected based on how many there is to sell. So we'll do a ratio and we'll cut some sort of image in there. Um, that being said, I'll do it with um, default UI that I have from Unity. But by the time that you see this, then chances are that there is proper UI for this. So I'll go ahead and get started. We will be doing this under the shop page. So under the game manager, game state shop, I'll open this one up. I'll add a new section over here at the top, and this will be the reference for the images. So let's call it the completion circle, completion circle. And that will get started with a public, let's do a public image completion circle. And that's the one we'll be manipulating. So um, I'm actually going to start by laying down the UI this time because I need to visualize it first. We are going to open up the shop UI and place this object. I'll add this item on the same level as these. So let's go ahead, right click. We'll be adding a, oops, we'll be adding an image. So UI image, top right side anchor. Actually, I'd like to anchor it directly under the hat name. So if that's possible, I'll just copy this rec transform, paste it here. And what do we have here? Yep, we have the exact same thing as the hat. So call this one completion circle. I'll put a uh, height and width that is the same. So maybe 500 by 500. And I just want to make sure that it's anchored properly in the middle of the hat name. So maybe position of minus 100. And just like that, now I'm going to go ahead and use a knob. So that's what I mentioned here. I'm going to be using Unity's UI, but by the time that you see this, the package will include some, some sort of ring um, for this type of effect because we're using it when we die as well. And I'm seeing here that it might be too big, so I'll make sure it's not that big, maybe position X like so. And this will be the background object. Now on top of that, we're gonna have another completion circle, the same exact thing. I'll call one of them background and I'll put it as a children of the first one. Or actually it's the other way around, sorry. So background will contain the completion circle. So maybe we want to call it something else. So completion circle will be the top level one and here that will be the ratio or actual ratio. Okay, now the goal of this is that the children will be um, put on top. So as you can see here, the children is on top of the image behind it. And we'd like to input a image that has um, a different color in here. So for example, we could use this color. And what we'll do at runtime is that we'll put the image on field and say, okay, if only if you collected only 50% of the hats, then your fill amount is going to be 0 0.5, which will give you something like that. That's really all we have to do. Um, now, something that might be cool as well to do is to put some transparency on the image behind. So maybe something like that. And there we go. And I might as well want to add some text next to it. So a very, very small text that will act as um, just a, well, just a text representation of this. So I'll anchor this, for example, here, just above the subject. Put it in the middle, make it a little bit more wide. And say so it's gonna be something like, hey, you've got 20 out of 30. Now we can change the color of this and also change the font. 
and get a result that makes a little bit more sense. All right, so now we have to reference these two objects and also input some code. It's going to be fairly simple. So we have an image component and also we have a text mesh pro UI. Let's do text mesh pro UGUI. That will be the completion text. With these in mind, we are going to be setting them on construct, I believe. Actually, we have to reset them every time um, there is a uh, something happening. So, uh, for example, when we buy a fish, we also, not, not when we buy a fish, when we buy a hat, we also have to reset this. So I'll create in my own function here called um, reset UI or reset text. Let's do reset UI. Or actually, it's reset completion circle. And here, we'll have to assign values. Well, for example, here, that's going to be the fill amount is going to be equal to 1. And the completion text will be equal to, um, for example, 0 out of 20. OK. Oops, so it's dot text. OK. Now it's actually time to get these value. And our issue here is that we don't actually know how many hats we have. Um, the reason that we don't know is that we actually put a arbitrary amount here under the, the save state. So if you guys remember, we have the save state here and we have a private cons int for hat count, but that's not always accurate um, for the amount of hat we have. In this case, it is accurate. I do have 31. There is 30, um, 30 different hats and then one more for the no hat. So in this case, I am accurate, but that's that might not be a case if you put a arbitrary amount here. You might want to put that right amount. That's totally fine. Then you can just uh, you know, you have the right amount of hats. But the truth is, if you want to be 100% sure, you can always look into the resource folder, um, which is annoying because we have to load everything here. So what I do recommend that you do is actually input the right amount. And you can say, hey, uh, int hat count is equal to this. You can do that. And I do recommend that you do that. And that, that's totally fine. I'll do that personally, but I also show the other way to do so. Um, you can do a resource.load, just like we do for the shop. And I think we do it in here, actually. Hey, you know what? Yeah, it makes a lot more sense to do that here, actually. <laughs> so we'll keep this value here. OK, that's never mind. That's the best way. Um, hat count, because we're already in the shop here. And when we populate the shop, we can do hats.lank. Hats is actually an array of ads that has been loaded from resource to load. So we have access to hat dot. OK, I just went on a complete rent for the following piece of code. I'm extremely sorry for that. Hats dot length. OK, so that's the amount of hats we have. Um, now, how many did we unlock thus far is another question. And to have a look at that, we can do the following. Save manager instance save. And we can do unlock hat flag and uh, find how many we have set to one. So for this, we can iterate, or we could go ahead and um, cheat a little bit. So we can iterate through this. We can do a for loop on all of these, and then just do i plus one every time there is a a, um, a index. For example, index i here is going to be equal to one. Then we can do i plus plus, not i plus plus, but like another number plus plus. Um, or we could head and hook ourselves right here and just keep a private value, which is something a little bit more efficient that I'll do here. Unlocked hat count. The reason is more efficient. It's because we're already iterating through this array. So when it is not unlock, this happens. Else, this happens. But also, unlock hat count is going to go up by one. Okay. So that will work um, fine. And now I have access to the other number, which is how many we have right now. This is how many there is total. This is how many we have right now. But do know that one of them is actually a no hat. <laughs> so I'd like to decrease these two just by one. So what we'll do here is that our ad count is actually going to be equal to the length minus one, because we don't want to have 31. We want to have 30 in this case. So we don't want to count the no hat as a hat. So even though we start the game and we have one of the hats unlocked, technically, that would be the no hat, I'd still like to see the number zero here. 
Um, and that's what I'll do. So hats dot length minus one, and then while I'll show the the unlocked hat count, I'll also do a minus one on it. Okay, how do we do that? It's fairly simple. Let's do uh, that's the hat count. That's the currently unlocked count. Unlocked hat count minus one. Now, when we want to have a ratio for that, we first cast as a float the following. How many do we have right now? So currently unlocked count divided by float hat count. Oh. Just like so, we'll get the proper ratio in between the two. And for down here, we are just going to format that in a very specific way. So we're going to say currently unlocked hat count plus, and then I'll just put a dash in between the hat count. We're going to put this function directly inside of the construct. So it's being called when we construct this, but also um, we also have to put it somewhere else. By the way, make sure you put it after you do the populate shop. That's very important because our unlocked hat count is going to be populated in here. <laughs> um, when we do buy something, so on hat click, if we do manage to buy something, which is roughly around here, we're going to say unlock hat count plus plus, and then reset the completion circle. Let's give this a try. Oh, and also make sure you um, assign these values here. So under the game manager, for example, I'll go and under my game state shop, completion circle, put the ratio in there and also put the text. And just like so, as I press on play, well, first, um, I forgot to disable this, so I'll go back, press and play again. We're going to call the construct, and we have 7 out of 29 hat, which means that I've missed one um, when I created those. But I believe the math is fine for the rest, I just have to look. So, Oh, a good way to check, instead of counting like I just did, it's just to go inside of here and select all of them. And it does say I have 30 model behavior object, but that that's actually including the non-hat. So I, I have missed one, um, my bad, <laughs> but there is one hat in here that I have to input still. But the count is actually fine. Now let's see how many we really have. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven here. I shouldn't have any more. Yeah, so I don't have any more. Um, let's go buy something cheap. Is there still something cheap here? No, I need 20 fish. Okay, let me go play a bit. Okay, so I got more fishes. It's time to go back and buy something, see if the dynamic UI works. So with 23 fishes, I have seven out of 29. Let's go buy something. I have eight out of 29 and my fish has been updated. So that does work. And um, it might be a good idea to change this positioning here. Maybe uh, at one point, one of the heads will be too big. Definitely is gonna look a lot better when the new UI is integrated but I'm quite happy with the result thus far. So with that said, I believe this wraps up the first round of polishing. And yeah, we now have a product that doesn't look too bad, that is playable and has a good game flow. So that being said, I'll see you in the next one in which I believe we're gonna start wrapping up and maybe publishing to the game store. In this section, we will be publishing our game over to the Google Play Store. Three things are needed in this case. First one will be to obtain a developer account for the Google Play Store. Second will be to fill in our listing, our store listing. And the third one will have to do with waiting for them to approve. And we'll just have a look after that at our application on there. So the first step, getting a developer account is what we'll do in this video. I encourage you to go over to the Google Play console. I type it in Google so I can get the link and I click on the first one. Link will also be in the resources. Upon signing in, you will receive the this form actually, but in English most likely, and ask me to create a developer account. There will be some information needed, such as what is our developer name, what is our secondary email in case we need it, and also what is our phone number. Those are all needed for us to enter and have a developer account. Once you fill in all the field and then you press on confirm, you will have to pay a $25 fee. This fee is a one-time fee. You only have to do this once with one account, and then you'll be able to publish as many games as you wish on the Google Play Store with no restriction. So go ahead and fill those information again, and I'll see you in the next one. Welcome to the Google Play website. 
The date is November 2020, and we have yet again a new update for the Google Play Console. So, the first step you'll have to do today, and our goal of course is to publish your game, is to head over to the play.google.com slash console. Make sure you head to the console, else you're going to be stuck in the portal uh, with all the games on it. So, going here on the top right, I will have to sign in. Now, this process has to do with your Google account. Of course, you choose your Google account, and then beneath that, there will be something called a developer account. If you don't have one already, you'll have to buy into this program. So, you have to buy yourself a developer account, and it is a one-time fee. It's a one-time $25 USD fee, so you only have to pay this once and then you'll have your developer account. You can publish as many games as you want on it. Once you enter on the Google Play console, you will have the option to create a new app. Obviously, this is what we'll be doing today. So I'll go ahead and I'll create mine. This first screen here has really basic information regarding your name. Are you a app or a game? In our case, we're a game. Um, we are free and also we agree with both the developer program policies and also the US export law. Once we have this, we'll now have a screen just for a game. Once you're done with that, you'll have a dashboard only for your application, so in this case, the Subway Skater. On the left hand side, you'll see a bunch of services I have just for this app. For example, we can see analytics on our store performances, um, rating and review, vitals, this is when the application crash, your product if you have some in-app purchases, financial report if you made money, and a um, couple of other things, so here, your releases. Our goal right now will be to set up the store, so we can have a store listing as soon as possible, we can send that over to our friend and they can download it. Um, I'm gonna go and look for the task I need to release my app. First, I need to complete the initial setup. So it's funny, because um, this dashboard changes all the time. Initially, all you have to do is really just go under production and then release something. But um, things seem to have changed. So here, we'll go to the app access first. Now, application access. We actually don't need any special access. So we don't need to sign up from another website. We don't need to do any prerequisite before we use all the content in our app. So all the functionalities are available to me. We'll move on to the second step, which I believe was the ads. Yes, my app contained ads in this case. Next up, content rating. Go ahead and fill the questionnaire. This is going to give a rating to your game. So let's see. We have a game. And then it's going to ask you if you have any violence, fear, sexuality, simulated gambling. No to all of these in my case because it's quite a friendly game. There is none of that. Um, we don't share the physical location. We don't allow IAP at the moment. Of course, we'll have to change that if we include IAP. No voice chat. No Nazi symbol. That's, okay, that's good. <laughs> um, nope, nothing about Korea. Nope, this is not a how to make a bomb. And finally, no, there is no terrorism. So we have a app that is very, very clean. Let's hit save. Next. And it's going to give us a rating. And of course, it's just a perfect... Well, it's not perfect rating. It's not meant to be say perfect, but it's E for everyone. So everybody could access this. Okay, submit this and then we are pretty much done. Let's go back and um, actually I'm going to go on my play console, go back on my thing so I can go and uh, follow this first step initial setup. What is our target audience is somewhere in between all of that actually, 13, um, 13 to 18 and over. Now this one is part of the new rules with the children's below 13. Um, for some reason, your app could unintentionally appeal to children, and I'm not quite sure what to answer in this one, because, for example, in my app, it's a small cartoony penguin. Now, yes, it could technically appeal to children, because it's some graphics that is cartoony, but I I don't know. I'm just going to say now for the moment. <laughs> okay, here's what you told us. Yep, yep, and let's save. So that is our target audience done, and finally we have one more called News App. Is your app a news app? Nope. Perfect. Move on. Manage how your app is organized and presented. Let's see. We are, of course, a game. We are an arcade game in this case. We could add some tags. So, for example, oh, what is this? There is a tag for Endless Runner, so I'm going to put that in there. 
listing contact is here i don't actually need to input my phone number we do have a website so i'll put that in there and i'm pretty much done with this one so let's move back set up your store listing so this is where it gets interesting this is where we'll have a couple of requirements as well we'll need a short description a full description couple of graphics and what else a video is something that really helps you out a lot so if we ever have video which we don't at the moment let's make sure to input it in here when you make your graphic for the store listing make sure you go ahead and you um you take the suggested dimension for example here we have the featured graphic you're looking to have something that is 1024 by 500 so when you create those make sure you have the exactly uh, exactly the same ones and i just made a mistake it's actually 500 okay Something I do when I take those pictures is I go inside of the game and then I just grab myself the main camera. Um, I make sure I'm on play mode so I don't modify anything and I switch to a free aspect, make it full screen and just move around in the scene view, control shift and F on the main camera. I'm going to disable the brain so it can actually move. And I look at the preview, if I think the preview is good, then I go inside of the game scene and I take a screenshot of that. So for example, something like this could be looking good for the store. Yeah, something like this. So I head over to my game view, oh, and I, I'm going to delete my UI and just take a picture of that. Paste that in Photoshop and recenter it if needed. So of course this could be anything, it doesn't have to be um, pictures from the game, but in my case it is, but it could be concept art, could be something an artist make uh, if you're going for a very specific um, store listing. When it comes down to the phone screenshot, they say you have to take in between 320 and also 3840 in terms of pixels. Um, what I would do in your case is I would take the resolution you've been developing in. For example, in my case I'm using 1920 by 1080. This is portrait for um, I'm not quite sure which phone, but it's actually a good good resolution for portrait. So it's 16 per 9, and I'll be using exactly that resolution. So 1920 by 1080. Same thing, I'll head into Photoshop. 1920 by 1080. Okay, so I've inputted a total of 5 screenshots, and I don't have any for the 7-inch tablet or the 10-inch tablet, which I think is going to make me ineligible for the people who do have on tablets. To, to find my game on Google Play. But I don't think it's actually a required field like it says here. We'll find out later. I'm gonna go back to the dashboard, look at where we're at. It says we can choose a, um, a small number of tester. We can test with a bigger group. We can let anyone sign up and test. So those three tasks right here are all about testing. Build excitement, um, so this is a marketing campaign. And then finally, publish your app with Google Play, which I think we're gonna do right now, actually. So let's select the country and region we'd like to push in. I'll create a new release, top right. And we are going to be asked to, what is this exactly? Okay, so app sign in by Google Play. We're going to have to sign our application. I'm actually going to decide for the first time to let Google manage my app sign in. So I did click on the continue button. And it's going to ask me for app bundle and APKs. So I'm going to go ahead and actually turn this off find my build settings and then under build settings I will have to go under player settings let's scroll down where I'm currently in Android so I'm going to scroll down under the publishing settings and we have the key store manager which um which we could use a brand new one to start off fresh with the company or we could use one that is existing I'm not going to go over uh, using one that is already existing because at that point you probably already know how to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and create myself a new key store. So create new anywhere in my case and make sure that you save this somewhere safe. And you're going to have to save this somewhere safe because this could be used for every single app in your organization. This could be used only for this. It really depends on where you want to use this, but do note that if you lose it, you won't be able to upload a update for your application. So go ahead and fill in more information. Let's add the key. And we had a new key created. Do you want to set them as your project key store and project key? Of course I do. So now you'll find that we have a custom key store, which, um, you know, you can also get it now from this place. 
And what else do we have to do at this point? The password is entered. Do know that you have to enter the password every single time that um, you make a new build that you want to upload. So we don't need any custom in this Mimify. Um, we could Mimify with Gradle, but I'll do that later if everything works. One more thing that I forgot is that you have to actually um, be targeting the API level 29 and above at the moment on Google on Google Play, it's a new requirement for security purpose, so you can go and change that under player settings. And then under player settings, you'll find um, the other settings. And you can change the API, so minimum API level to 29. Now it will come with a bunch of problems if you don't have um, if you don't have the updated version of the Android SDK. For example, in my case, if I try to build right now, and this is gonna be my release candidate. I try to build and it's going to ask me for required. Um, well, first it's going to ask me to update my Android SDK. If you do that, it ain't going to work. And if you do hi use highest install, in my case, it's, it's 28 right now. So that won't cut it. So one thing that I'll try out is that I'll update my LTS version of NT 2019.4 to 0.4.14. Right now I'm on 0.4.2 F1 and I'm going to go, um, 12 version above that, you could say. And I'll download that, see if this works, see how the updated SDK in there. All right, so let's give this a try with a newer version of Unity, which is exactly the same. So it's 19.4, but this time dot 14, which is a much later version in the LTS, um, in the LTS suite. So I'll go under the player settings. By the way, you most likely already have this version. <laughs> so, um, and I'm going to choose the API level 29. So it's already in there. Well, let's give this a try and hope that it has been updated. And obviously we'll need to sign, since we closed off the application, I have to go back and assign the application once more. So under my publishing settings, um, I'll enter my password for both the key store and then the application within the key store. Try to build once more. And it seems like this version is actually supported, so I'm quite happy about that. We'll receive a build that contains the API level 29, and we'll be able to put that on the Google Play services. And now we have the AAB, which stands for the Android Application Bundle. We can drag and drop it directly in this screen. Give it a name, so this is going to be my release candidate. Do note that this name will not be reflected on the Google Play Store. It's only for you to identify this uh, specific release. You can also have a release note. So this one um, has some markup. So for example, here for the English language, you could go ahead and um, also have French. So I actually, maybe FR Canada, that works. I believe so. Okay. Oh, no, it's not supported. Okay, well, we don't exist here. I give it a very short description here for the initial release. And then as I was doing that, the, ad, the um, app bundle finally got uploaded and we have it right here. If you have any more errors when it comes down to um, uploading, we've tried once, it told us that we need to have the target SDK of 29 and above, we fixed that. But if you have anything else, please let me know in the, in the uh, section down below in the comment, in the resources, because I want to help you figure these bugs out. They are quite annoying and um, sometimes they, they take quite a lot of time to, uh, to figure out on your own. So please let me help you with that. Once we are done with this, we're going to hit the save button, review the release. And let's see where we're at. There's one error. No country or region have been selected for this track. At least one country has to be in the uh, rollout region. Okay, so that's not going to be a problem to actually find which page this is because it's quite confusing to look at everything. Uh, I'm going to go back on the dashboard, scroll all the way down and do a select countries in region. Let's go ahead and do that here. Add countries. Can I add all of them? Is there a button to add everybody? Rest of the world. Okay, that's a good start. And I think we're just going to have to go through all of them. Oh, no, we can click here. Okay, cool. So we got that. Add countries and region. Uh, there is no restriction anywhere because there is no racial thing going on. There is no religion going on. I mean, I don't see why it would restrict the application to anybody in this case. So available for the whole world. And now let's go ahead and back to the dashboard, scroll down all the way, and I'm going to review and roll out the release. So here we are, I'm going to go under edit, 
review the release and it seems like everything is fine. We do have two warnings that come from our code in Unity because it's not native code, it's gonna give you a couple of errors like it, it can't find the symbols, so that's totally normal for our case. Um, if you're looking to get some more information out of your crash, you can actually hook up the Unity analytics in there and that's gonna do the exact same thing. And finally, start rollout to production, bottom right. So it took roughly 24 hours and then I had my game up and running on the Google Play Store. We have a public link over here that anybody could access. We have a public link that anybody can access, at least I think so. Let me open this up. Yep, so exact same link in a browser where I'm not signed in. Everybody can access this and they can download. You'll have more information about yourself, the information you've signed in, or actually the information you've entered during the, um, the store listing. So I have a website, I have email, um, and also the current version is fed from Unity itself. So inside of the other settings, you have a bundle version and that is what it is right here. And that's pretty much it. So we are pretty much done. Yeah. So our application is finally on there. It's on the first store. In the next section, we will be going over uh, Google Play services. So we will integrate that with the services to get achievement and also leaderboards. So I'll see you there. Welcome to the 14th section in which we're going to be implementing some Google Play services. Those are the leaderboard and also the achievement. But before we get into these, before we get into going inside of the Google Play console, we are going to set up our game to just give us some places to start initiating these and also testing them out. So the first place um, I'll actually implement something is right here in this menu screen. So I've got my game open, made sure to enable the canvas in it so I could just look at it at the moment. And inside of it, I will be creating two buttons. Now these will probably change by the end of, uh, of the tutorial, of course, but I have these graphics right here with these circles. So I could do buttons, I could do circles. I feel like doing circles for these, so might as well do that. Um, I'm gonna go with a width of 225, 225, and you probably guessed it, what I'm doing right here is just a, a regular button. So I'll grab this button, anchor it at the bottom uh, maybe give it a margin of minus 50, 50, and create two of those. One of them will be a leaderboard button, and the other one will be, of course, the achievements. There we go. I'll be moving one of them towards the left. Now that we have these buttons, we're going to head over to the game manager and find our game state in it, because that's the one that's um, attached to this very specific piece of UI. And I'll go under here, open it up, and I'll make sure to create two new function on achievement click and also on leaderboard click. These will be hooked to the button, of course. So now that I've saved this, I'm going to go back to my buttons. I'll select both of them at the same time. And let's go ahead, add a new on click function, drag and drop the game manager, and find the on achievement click and also I'll go back on the leaderboard and make sure I modify that to on leaderboard click of course okay all right so we have these two they're quite ready to be used uh, when I click on them the code within is going to be run and that's actually where we're going to be ending we just needed to set up this very very small thing here for our game We'll come back in the next episode. We're going to be looking at um, inside of the Google Play Console, enabling these services and also what to input in here. Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode in which we're going to be configuring the achievement and also the leaderboard for our game. So those already have some buttons for those right here, this button and this button, and those will help me open up the achievement and also the leaderboard for the game. I'm currently remaking this video for the sole purpose that the first time around I had some issue with a black screen. Okay, so what I've did right here is I've head over to the Google Play Console just by tapping in Google Play Console. Let's make sure I go to the right account. There we go, that's my right account. And then lately we made, oh actually we uploaded the Subway Skater course right here. So I'm going to be going back on this page. This page, you should already have seen it thus far. If you haven't, make sure you go back a couple of videos where we publish to the Google Play Store. Okay, so today is all about the Play Game Services, which is a, um, a tab that you have here on the left hand side. Make sure you click on it, expand, and we're going to start with the configuration. 
you should be following the wizard here because I already have done it. Unfortunately, I can't redo it, but um, it's going to ask you, have you ever, uh, well, does your game already exist on the Google Play services? You're going to say no and then enter the meta information. So adding your icon, hiding description, what is the category of your game is very important. You're going to need to fill all of that in. And once that is completed, you will then need to um, assign some credentials. Now, this is the part that is a little bit complicated. So I'm just going to go and have a look. Is everything good? Uh, seems to be good here. And then we have the credentials. Now, the part that is complicated is when it comes down to credentials. And what are those credentials actually? So what I'm going to do here is add a new set of credentials. I hope I can do that actually, else I'm going to have to delete the other one. We're going to add new credentials for Android. That's our name. We don't need to use credentials for new install. Um, this is only there, I believe, because I already published a game with another set. This entire piracy settings over here is just so if um, you have a leaderboard, for example, if you have a leaderboard or achievement, people that did not install the app through the Play Store will not be able to participate in that. So that's what it does. Um, I'm going to leave it on off by default because I don't want to have any conflict with anything else that could happen. Um, and here is where it gets money. So we need to select a OAuth client. And if you don't have one, they're going to ask you to create one in which you can simply click on this button and then make sure you follow these steps very, very carefully. So I'm going to be opening a new link with my middle mouse click. Let's open up this here. And I have both screen up. Um, the first thing I get here is a insufficient permission. That is because I am on the wrong account. So if you have multiple account here, make sure you select the right one, the one associated with your game. So here I am both on the same account. I have to create a new um, OAuth client ID. Now, what is the type? The type is going to be Android because that's what it says here. The name is going to be Subway Skater in this case. My package name is the package name. And now unfortunately for me, since I most likely because I deleted my uh, credential, I have to recreate it again. Uh, this did not auto fail. Hopefully for you it did. Else if it did not, what you can do is um, go back here. I'll just hit done because that's the last step. Um, I'll hit done and then I'll go over to where was I? I believe I was under app integrity. So you're going to go under release. No, actually, sorry, set up app integrity, and then you'll find your SHA-1 certificate right here. I'll copy this one and I'll paste it where it belongs. Then we can hit create and go back to where we were a couple of seconds ago. So here it's going to give you your client ID. I'm just going to copy this in case I'll need it, but I don't think we do. I think it's going to find itself automatically. Um, so back on our configuration under the play game services, we start creating credentials. So let's do add credential again, scroll down, and then we should have it right here. That's the one we created a couple of seconds ago. Then I'm going to hit save changes. And now we have our credentials. All right. So now we have our credentials. We're going to go ahead and create ourselves some achievement and also some leaderboard. So as mentioned earlier, this is my second time recording the video for the sole purpose that I had a black screen when I rendered some reason. Um, but here are all the achievements I actually created prior. They might inspire you to create your own, you could say. But I have one where I collect 10 fish during one session, up to 300 fish, um, have all the hats, and joining the ladder. Things like that, basically. And I'd like to show you how to create one. I'll fake create one. So create achievement. That's what you'll have here at the top. You'll input a name, a description, and also an icon. You cannot publish an achievement that does not have an icon, so you'll need to actually get one in there. Those are 512 by 512 usually. Next up here, it says uh, incremental achievement. So for example, if you had an achievement that said play the game 10 times or like boot the game 10 times, you could make this achievement incremental. And then every time that you enter a game, you do a plus plus on it. So you do plus one. Um, and what this does here is that it keeps track of the progress of the user. So this is like an achievement, but with a save function on it, you could say. Okay. Then right after that, we have the initial state. Is it revealed or is it hidden? Some, some game do that. They hide some achievement and they just give it to you once you did the, you did whatever it needed to be unlocked. Uh, how many point is that achievement worth for 
for this is actually for the Google Play services. You have experience, you can have up to 1000 points. In my case, I have 1005 for some reason, but hey, <laughs> that'll do the job. And uh, which which is the order in which this achievement will appear in the list? I have 12 achievement right now, so this could be the 13th one or 12th one. Okay, I am not going to create it because when you when you create an achievement here, it just stays, and I don't want that to happen. But it's a very simple process. You guys can go through it um, just through the wizard. The wizard is going to guide you quite well. Next up, we are going to create an achievement for top scores. Here is exactly the same thing. So name. You also have a format in which you're going to choose. Do you want to have number, duration, or currency? And you're going to be sorting the order. So are you going to be allowing the largest number? Largest number is better or smallest number is better? For example, here, uh, our score, the largest number is better. But for duration, if it was a time, um, a timed course, then the smallest number would be better. Temper protection. What this one? What is this one? Okay. So this mentioned that it protects and it filter fraudulent, but I'm not sure how it does it. So I am not going to speak on that. And of course, you can also set limits. So set a minimum allowed score. So if you're below 1000, in my case, then you're not allowed to be in the leaderboard. Once you're done creating all of those achievements, you are going to hit review and publish. Now do know that once an achievement is published or once a leaderboard is published, you cannot unpublish it. So everything that you create has to stay um, in here. What is ready to publish? So a bunch of new achievement, new credentials, all of this. Sorry about that. That's my Facebook hit publish and then publish those changes. It's going to take a little bit longer for you. Me, it, I think it's instant because I already published something prior. So in your case, it might take a little bit more time, but once that is completed, you're going to be heading over to the next video, I believe, in which you're going to be integrating the Google plugin. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you then. Cheers. So last time we left off, we managed to publish our Google Play Game services. So here they are. We have an achievement, a leaderboard, and now today we're going to be looking at integrating that within our code. And the way we're going to go about it is by also integrating a Google Play SDK. So Google Play Game Services has a page here which uh, mentions a couple of SDK you can use for, for here, it's plugins. There is a plugin for Unity. This is what we're interested in. And do note that this one is actually being maintained by Google themselves. If it's not hit by that, then it means it's a third party and you'll find a couple of these over here. But they're mostly for Android and as you can see, they are for nat native if you look at the languages. In ours, we are of course um, for Unity. We'll have access to achievement, leaderboard, events, save games. So this is important if you're doing the, um, if you're doing cloud saving as well. So that might be something you're you're down for. If you're interested in save game, there is another video on the YouTube channel, and there's also assets on the website you could use. But that's not our goal today. Our goal is going to be about achievement and leaderboard. So let's make sure we grab this plugin. It's actually on Git, and it gets updated very often, as you can see here. Um, Ten days ago it was updated. I'm going to go ahead and get this code. So I'll just copy this. You can download as a zip, or you could just clone it. Once it has been extracted, you can now click on the folder, go inside of the current build, and you'll find a very convenient Unity package file. We like this because all we have to do is run it while the engine is open. And here you'll see a couple of things and be really careful with that because you'll see that we have external dependency um, that will modify our manifest. So if you have any other SDK, for example, Google AdMob, you might run into conflict and it's going to be very, um, you're, you're going to need to actually merge them into one. So here we can see plugin, plugin version, social platform. I think that's the code we'll need. Yeah. Uh, actually we need, we need pretty much everything here. We need the basic API as well, but, uh, we're just exploring here a little bit. Do know that when I hit import, we might run into some issues with the manifest as I've just mentioned. So after waiting a little bit, this pop-up actually happened. It is the manifest. So as you can see here, we have issues with the manifest and that is because we need to have some more scopes. We need to have these Google scopes. So I think I can actually just enable the auto resolution and it's going to work. Um, but I've just verified it's the same exact packages, but we are going to use the scope. Uh, same thing if you're using Firebase, same thing if you're using the, um, the Google cloud services. So I'm actually going to try and trust the auto resolution by enabling it. And was that a good idea? It seems not. Um, okay. 
So it seems like the auto resolution doesn't work because we don't have the Java home uh, set, which is kind of a problem because usually we do have these um, set automatically. This is coming from, um, well, or Java is actually an installation that came with Unity. So the GDK came with Unity. So seeing this error just really pisses me off because it's part of Unity. One of the way to fix this issue online that I've read is going under preferences, external tool. And we're going to go down to the GDK, just disable it. Um, disable two of them. So SDK and the GDK. I am going to let this run for a bit, crash, I don't care, okay, close this off, and then just re-enable it. And let's hope that somehow it fixed the Java Home path. And also, I didn't boot the screen, it just booted on its own, it seems like it's going through uh, a lot more than it used to back in uh, two minutes ago, actually. <laughs> so just disabling this and re-enabling this helped me out with this bug. Um, Chances are you are running Unity 2020 and you're not getting this, this issue at all, so that's even better. But in my case, since I'm using 19 and it's a known bug, uh, I had to go in and do this workaround and it worked well. I am going to test this out quickly on my device simply because we've done a lot of change and we also have some new dependencies, so I want to make sure that it works. To build, of course, I will need to sign my application. And once this is signed, actually, you could put this, if you're tired of doing this all the time, you could also select to be on a debug, which I believe is, um, it's somewhere around here. You can actually, oh, be maybe here in debug and it's not going to ask you for a key, but you're also not going to be able to publish. So I'm going to go ahead and build this to my phone. I'll let you know if it works in a moment. All right, so it seems like the build was interrupted by this because the meta file I set uh, just doesn't work here. So what I'll be doing is a whole new thing. Let's check this out. So the name of this file is Google Play Games Plugin v0.10.11. Uh, so I'm going to be looking for v0.10.11 and it's not showing up here because I also want to be looking in packages. Seems like it's also not showing here. So maybe look in all and I can't seem to find this file. So I'll go manually find it in my folder. We're no longer kidding around. So um, asset Google Play Games into editor. Google Play Games and here it is. That's the file that's causing all my issue and I'm just gonna hit delete. Um, I'm tired of that file. <laughs> it's gonna regenerate itself and see what happens now. Again, I will start another build and um, what this is going to do is going to force Unity to create those meta file for the text and hopefully it's going to be using the new format we have uh, with this engine. I'm not quite sure exactly um, what was the issue, but it seems like this meta file got corrupted and it went through the, it went through the, the build. So right now it's building to my phone. So quite happy about that. It seems like deleting it was an actual solution. <laughs> And uh, we're going to see if this works on my phone in a second. As I was building this, on the very last second of my build, roughly two minutes after my build, um, it crashed. And here's what I have as the information. Could not find any valid target to launch on Android. So I'm going to take a wild guess and say that's because I already have a build of this game that doesn't have the same manifest. So what I'll do on my phone right now, and you just have to listen to me say it, I'm going to take my game and I'm going to uninstall it. So make sure I uninstall my game. And once again, I'll give it a, another build. So control B, build and run. And I'll try once more with a fresh install. And it seems like it is booting on my device. The build was completed with succeed. It took a long time actually, <laughs> um, longer than I would like to admit. And it's running on my device. So everything seems to be back to normal right now with no issues. So we managed to integrate the package, which was one of the hardest thing to do, to be honest. The rest is going to be to write code and uh, have fun. So from this point on, I will be seeing you in the next episode in which we are going to write that code. All right, so last time we managed to publish our Google Play services, then we integrated the SDK, and today we're going to be writing code to make sure we can actually sign in those SDK or their, those services actually, and then um, call the achievements when needed and also call the leaderboard when needed. So I do have a page over here called the, well, actually it's the, um, it's the Google package we integrated last time. And if we scroll down here, you're going to have a big readme 
And in the README, we'll need to do three things. The sign in, post score to leaderboard, and also uh, achievement. So unlock, reveal, and also increment achievement. Those are the three features we're going for. Achievement and leaderboard is what we're going for, but to do that, we have to be signed in. So let's scroll down just a little bit. Our first step will be to configure the game. So we have to copy the game resources from the console, which means we are going to go right back in here. This is my, of course, this is my Google Play console. We can head over to the, where is it exactly? It's, it should be down here. So play game services, we're going to go under the configuration. Actually, never mind that. We're going to go under achievement or leaderboard, any of those. And then you'll be able to see this button. I don't know why it's not anywhere else, but um, I can find it inside of the achievement and I can also find it under the leaderboard. So one of these two will be looking for get resource button. Then we'll have this right here. I'm actually going to copy this over. So with a copy, copy to my clipboard, we're going to go back to the game under window, Google Play game, setup, Android setup, and we'll just paste it in here. This will generate a class called GPS IDS and uh, IDS, <laughs> GPS IDs. And if you'd like, you can also change that. That's not a problem. But do know that by default, it's called this over here and it's going to be stored under the asset folder. So it will just be somewhere in our folder here. Uh, we can probably move it around right afterward. So our code is in here. That's good. And then do we have a web app client? I believe we don't. So our next step will be to click on setup. Really the only important part here is that we have our ID and our sword game. The rest here will be made um, to, to make sure we can actually uh, call these achievement and also the leaderboard with a certain ID. So let's set it set up and we will be seeing a new file appearing right here in our project. If you want, you can just have a quick look at it. You'll see that we have a bunch of constant field achievement and also leaderboard top score. Okay. All right. Now we're going to go all the way down to the sign in and to sign in. All we have to do is call the play games platform instance authenticate with sign in activity. We can see a snippet of the code right here and that's actually what we'll be grabbing and that's what we'll be putting inside of our initial script. Okay. So I'll be headed to the very first script that runs when the, the game starts. Actually, there's a bunch, but uh, game manager is the first one in our main logic. You could say, uh, there is a start. We could actually put that in a awake. I believe I'm not hundred percent sure, but let's give it a try. So private void awake. If it doesn't work, we're going to be putting it just a little bit, um, below that. So in the start, I'll be integrating those two at the top. So using the Google play games, also using the unit engine dot social platform. Do note that in order for these to appear at the top, you'll have to have integrated the SDK, the thing we've done in the previous section. So authenticate the user. That's what we have to do. And then in the middle, we have the end all result. So what we have here is a call. So sign in activity. Uh, why is that not working? Okay. So apparently we need one more thing. We need the Google play game, basic API. All right. So over here we have three options. One of the option is to not prompt the user whatsoever. So no UI will be shown if you are needed, it will fail. So that usually happens if you click on the button. Um, it's an action that is manual. So the person decides to sign it. It's something that he wants to do. Can prompt once will actually show him the um, a prompt initially asking him if he'd like to, to sign in. If he accepts, then we will keep on trying to automatically sign in afterward um, in the next game session. Can prompt always will simply mean that it's always going to show the UI and it's always going to um, try and sign you in. And if you accept, then it's going to keep signing you in as long as it works. Um, the only difference in between these two is that if I refuse to sign in in the can prompt once on the next game session, when I reopen the app, it's not going to try to do anything. So I've refused it and it remembered that I refused it. So this one is the preferred method not to lose user because they will receive the, um, the call once. And if they accept, they accept. And if they don't, um, then we're going to implement a manual option for them. So that's what we'll do here. Okay. Yeah. It's a sign in status. So already in progress, canceled, failed, uh, network error. Okay. So we're going to do success. And if it's successful, we do something and else else is going to be the default. We are not going to do anything or maybe just do a debug.log for that.
Actually, what I'll be doing here is simply store a Boolean value that let me know whether or not I'm connected. And if I am, and I'm pressing on the achievement button or I'm pressing on the leaderboard button, we're going to be showing these prompt. And if I'm not, I'm going to try sending it again. So it's just the state that I will be storing it in here. So is connected to GPS. Uh, it sounds weird, but that's Google Play Services. So Google, yeah, let's just write it completely. And I can't type today. Okay, cool. That's true. And if it's something else in success, then I will say it's false. Um, that's, however, not true. Maybe I want to do some more cases. So in this case here, uh, we can also do sign in status already in progress, developer error. Um, hmm. I'm quickly going to have a now something I'm going to go do here is just bump up this field and make sure it is public. We'll be accessing it from the game state initialize. So right here in my game state initialize, we've input these two function and I'm simply going to be calling the game manager and look if we are connected. So if we are, something's going to happen. And if we're not, we're going to try and connect again. So the same code that I've put in there, I'll try to put it here. So if we are connected, let's do whatever we have to do else. Else we are going to try and sign in. And you know what? We could actually wrap this up in a function. So we'll do that just to make things a little bit cleaner. Public void sign in to Google Play services, which will not require any parameter. And all we'll have to do is the following. All right, in the awake, we'll try to call it. And now I'll take this function, which is public, go back here and call the game manager instance sign into Google Play services in the else statement. So if we are not connected, okay, that should pretty much do it for this one. Um, there might be some cases where we have to manage failure, but at the moment, I'll have to test and see. The next step is right here. So social show achievement UI and also social show leaderboard UI. Actually, I think that's all we need. <laughs> so let's give this a try. Hopefully that's all we need. Um, social show achievement UI and also social show leaderboard UI. Okay. Before we move any further, I'll give this a quick test on my device. All right, so I've just launched a game here and we have the starting the OAuth client. We can see the authenticate happening. And then eventually I run into one issue with the process. It says returning an error code. And I'm not quite sure which one it is, so I'll have to figure it out. Uh, it might take a little bit of time, but uh, we'll get on with it. All right, so I just had the chance to install this on my device with a whole new setup and I have to tell you all about it. And let me just, um, let me just boot up the analytics real quick. Uh, I also installed the Internet Logcat so we can have a good look at what's going on. Let me check this out. Right, so the application just booted and it automatically signed me in and it worked. And I found out what is the big problem. The big problem is actually quite a quite a big one and you'll find out what it is in a second. It's so everything is worked. So I signed in with the last sign-in account. So my problem was as I was trying to sign in, I was trying to sign in with a an application that was not actually released on the Play Store because we've made changes here on our, on, on, on our own, right? So we've added buttons, we've added a little bit of code, we've changed the Ash and also we changed the application as a whole. And when I try to sign in with that, I have a what Google Play services uh, consider as a corrupted install. It's an, you know, it's an install I have on my device that I've done on my own. It's not coming from the store and therefore it doesn't accept the sign in. So what I had to do to get this to work is actually first, um, I've did two things, right? So I released it again here. So I've made a new release with a new build containing the code. And this one is actually not live. Uh, it says live, but um, it's not live yet because it has to be reviewed. Uh, you know, it's a new, it's a new release to production. So it has to be reviewed. So instead what I've done is I went to internal testing. I went on our tester group. I've added myself as a tester, made sure that this is correct. Um, 
send myself the link, install it on my device, and also made sure that my release here, I went under create a new release, I uploaded the APK and it works. So the APK I'm using is uploaded on the console. However, it's not open to the public right now, so the public cannot sign in, but here as an internal tester, I was able to try it with a version of the application that is actually on the store. So that worked and um, as soon the people in production will be able to see that work as well. At least signing in because as you saw the show UI um, for both leaderboard achievement didn't work. So I'm glad we went through another hard problem. At this point the next problem is going to be to make sure these UI work. So I'm going to try and find out why they didn't work. Okay, so we are back and I found out what the issue was. We were missing the playgamesplatform.activate. So under the configuration, let me just find it real quick. Here, under the configuration section, we need these two here at the bottom. Well, we don't technically need the debug log dot enabled, but I actually use it. So all you need to do is the playgamesplatform.activate and you'll have to do that in a awake or a start, but that would be before you do the sign in. So there is a small modification I've done to the code. Here I now have a private void awake in which I call these. And then in the start, I call the sign into Google Play, which makes me wonder why this is here. This should be here. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so that's the new code. Awake into a start that calls the sign in to Google Play services. And now with that in mind, the result we're actually getting is the following. So I've now booted my application on my phone. I'm going to try and give you a visual this time. So if we go here, it's hooked up and there is a function to do a screenshot somewhere here. Screen capture. So let's give this a look. I, this is actually what I have right now. And then I'm going to play, press on the achievement button. So I've just pressed on the achievement button and this is what it gives me. Go back, press on the leaderboard button and this is what it gives me. There we go. So we now have these two things. I actually didn't see my achievement. Let me go check back. Yeah, so collect 10 fish is here. Um, and everything seems to be working just fine. Now it's going to be a matter of reporting uh, changes to the leaderboard and also reporting uh, unlocking those achievements. So we'll have to do these two things in the very next section. <laughs> so I'll see you in the next section. All right, so we just finished testing again. The UI was appearing for both achievements and also for the leaderboard. And now we're gonna be learning how to report to the leaderboard and also report progress on achievement, which is quite, quite easy and you'll see. We will start with the leaderboard. I think that's the easiest example. And to do so, I will open up my dev state. So my game state dev, um, because we are posting school to the save manager here. This is in the construct and in the construct we look prior to saving, set the high score if needed. Well, on top of that, if we're having a personal high score, we're also going to make sure that we publish that to, um, to Google Play in case we're signed in. So let's have a look here. We will start with one call, a if statement. That if statement is going to have to do um, with knowing if we're connected. If we are connected, we are going to post a score. If we're not, in this case, I will not prompt the user because we're in the middle of a play session. He has already been prompt um, to log on and it didn't work and he didn't want to go through. So we're not going to ask him every single time, right? So only once at the beginning and that's enough. That's good practice. But if we are connected, let's go ahead and let's report to the scorer. And we do that using the social platform. All we have to do is call social report score and we report it to a certain, well, first we, we need to score. So um, let's take the one over here. This is a score. And then it takes in a string. Now that string is exactly what you have in under the uh, constant class that we've created earlier. That class was called GPS ID in our case because we did not change the name and we're reporting to the leaderboard top score. You'll find it right here. CGKLX. That's the string. You could also type it in manually, but you know what? We have the constant class here, so might as well do that. Um, and then after that, you get to see, uh, you get to have an action, a call back here that you could input. So for example, we could say um, success. So we're going to create a new variable called success and create a function right after. Oh, and I forgot there's a space in between. There should not be a space in between. 
and uh, you can verify here if it worked or not. Um, in my case, we are going to be posting the score silently, so I'm not actually going to put anything in there. In fact, I believe I could go and say null. Or that's bad practice, actually. <laughs> Let me at least do a debug.log error in case we're not able to reach the server. So, um, unable to post high score. Just in case, and I'll put the if statement in front of it. So, if not success, then we're unable to post the high score. And that's all we need to do. It's, it's really as simple as that. Um, when it comes down to an achievement, however, you are going to need to have specific logic for your game. For example, well, not for your game, sorry, for your achievement. In, in our case over here, we do have one achievement right now that has to do with how many fishes we have. And let's see here. Um, we do take notice of the fishes we have here during the game, but what I prefer to do is go over to the game stat and proc it as we go. So for example, fish collected this session, if we reach a point where um, we reach a total of 10 fish, I'd like to trigger it during the game so we have some encouragement during the game, the, the person is playing, and, and then it just shows up in the middle of a play session. So here's what I'll do. Um, we have an action here, so technically we could also just hook it up. Um, yeah, we could do that. So we could do on collect fish and have a, a function that looks for those achievements. That could be a tad cleaner, so let's do that private void um, verify achievement or send achievement send achievement progress or look for achievement progress with the fish count would that do the job here I believe so and what's gonna happen is once we start with the awake so during the awake as soon as we collect the fish I'd like to call this function and verify so um, we are not going to do it the way I just did it. We're going to do on collect fish is going to be plus equal to the name of the function I've just created. Like so. And then now every time we're calling on collect fish, this is going to be run. And we can do a switch statement, for example, uh, with the fish count when we reach 10. So case 10, then we're going to be reporting on that achievement. So let me just do a default break. When we reach 10, I'd like to do a social dot report progress. I believe it was report progress. Yeah, so here it is. We're going to be reporting the progress. And as you can see here, achievement ID, exact same thing as prior. So we're going to be looking at our GPS ID and then find the one we need, collect 10 fish. And we are going to do a, um, it's going to ask you for progress because you can actually do that incrementally. So you can say, hey, you're going to have a 70% progress on this achievement or, or something like that. In our case, since it's a one-time thing, we are just going to input 100% in here. And that's going to give us the achievement in one go. When we are successful with this achievement and it goes through, we're actually going to see a piece of UI that pops up. And I'll try to capture this one for you. So I'm, I actually don't need to, um, to, to parse anything in here. I'm not doing anything if it's successful or not. So I'm going to see the default UI that pops up and that's going to be enough. So we're going to give this a try, but as you know, to give this a try. So as I am making a new version of this game, I have to upgrade the version and the bundle version code. By the way, you could just upgrade by 0.5. You don't have to increment by a full number like I'm doing. Um, I don't know why I started doing that, but I've started doing that. So I'm going to keep on with that. All right, so I got the application on my phone right now. What I'm going to do is try to get a high score above 1000 because we do have a lowest allowed score that is actually locked in. So I can't make it any um, any lower than that. So I'm going to make sure that I get a, a high score of 1000. And I also want to take, try and take a picture uh, the second I'm going to hit 10 fish during a single play session. And that is right now, actually, I was playing on the side. Let me hit capture. And you see right here, as I was trying to get it, um, by the way, I'm also dead, but we see the pop-up here at the top says collect 10 fish, 1000 XP. And that bothers me a tad bit because we, I, I thought we mentioned that this should be only 5 XP. So maybe it's something that uh, we have to double check on. So what's going to happen here, and I have mentioned here, I want to have 10 points. Must be a multiple of 5 between 5 and 210 out of 1,000 point use. Okay, so here it says 10, but somehow on the Google Play services, I got 1,000. So maybe that's a bug. I'm not quite sure. 
because at the end of the day, you're trying to have the achievement that amounts up to 1000. So I'm not sure what's going to happen once I input more of them inside of the game, which will happen. But um, at the moment, I, I seem to have the achievement at least. So that's a good start. Now, if I go under my achievement UI, this is what I see. So I have my achievement unlock and I have one out of one. However, um, if I go under the other menu, which is the leaderboard, and I hit capture, you're gonna see that really nothing happens because I didn't get I didn't get 1,000 point. I just died um, while I was trying to get the fish and also the picture. So I'm gonna go back and get a score of 1,000 and plus. So surprisingly enough, it's much easier to get 10 fish than get a high score of 1,000. So what I think I might be doing is um, increment the amount of points you get for getting a fish. And here, as you can see, I managed to get a total of. Uh, 15 fish and a high score of 1034 or 1035 i'm not sure um i'm gonna have to see what's wrong with here as well but let's have a look at what we get in the logs a bunch of gds okay that's for my phone that's fine we are reporting a score of 1034 to this very board and i'm gonna go on that menu let's boot it up capture and you will find my really annoying <laughs> um person here with my, my fake google account so i'm rank one of my own game and it works so the ui is here and we got it to work and i'm quite happy about that so that's actually where we're going to be ending up this adventure with the google play services a lot of hustle a lot of things um pieces of the puzzle we need to put together in order for this to work but we finally got it working and now i'm going to go back to the board uh, the leaderboard is fine, but I'm going to go back to the drawing board and create a lot more achievement. I want to have the game full of achievement. And um, and yeah, that's actually where we are going to be ending up this session. So thank you so much for watching. In the next one, we're going to be starting to tackle the Apple product, which um, hopefully I can get my hand on fairly soon. And that will be it. So thank you so much. I'll see you then. Cheers. Welcome everybody to what should be the final content uh, section of this course. And I'm talking about content here because we um, it's the final section in which we're not going to be doing a build. Um, to be a little bit more clear, in this section we're going to be tackling audio. Um, I would like to thank everybody who left rating for the course because this idea of adding the audio uh, actually came through a rating um, description. So it's because of that rating we're making it and I do want to thanks everybody who left rating because uh, yeah, they're, they're quite useful for me at least. Um, that being said, we are going to be not recycling some code that we made in the past, but we're going to be recreating um, some code that was made on the YouTube channel prior. And in fact, if you want to skip the whole first episode, um, you could actually go and grab the code on the website itself. So if you want to do that, it's under the website, epitome.cc. You go under the download section, and here we have the audio manager. You will need to be uh, signed up for this and also subscribe to the YouTube channel. You'll see all the links are on there. So that being said, I've downloaded the package. It's a Unity package and I'm going to be running it inside of here. Um, it's not completely cleaned up right now. It's going to be by the time you see this, but what we need here is the audio manager. If you do decide to download, all you'll have to do is double click on the audio manager and uh, make sure you import it to your folder. Now, if you're not going to the easy route, we are going to recreate that code and it's going to be quite fast. So let's make sure we create a new folder under our script folder. I'll call it the audio manager. And in here, I'll create another file, C sharp file, also called audio manager. And we'll be reusing the same technique we did for um, static instance. And that technique is the same one we use, for example, in the save manager here. It's kind of a half singleton. And I'm saying half because it does not compose all the section that you would want in a singleton, but most of it is here. Well, at least the static instance is here. So for our game, I'd like to allow music to be played in the background as a loop music, but also I'd like to be able to crossfade in between two different music. For example, when we're in the menu scene, I'd like to play a certain music in loop. And when we enter the game, same thing, I'd like to play a certain music in loop. For the crossfading to be made in between those two and for it to sound good, we will need to have both uh, both, both tunes playing at the same time. In order to achieve that, we could be using two different audio source for the two different tracks. So I'll start by declaring a couple of fields here at the top. A audio source for music one, and also another one for music two. And since we're in the audio source, I'd also like to declare another one 
for the sound effects, which are going to be played on a whole different one. So the sound effect source. Um, on top of that, I'd like to have a configurable field here for the music volume. So private float music volume. Oops. Could be equal to one at the moment, and we can lower that if needed. And one more field, which is going to be boolean first music source active. So you're going to understand that this one is for logic. So I'm just going to move that down and actually move this one up because it is a configurable field. Now in a awake statement, I'm going to configure both of these music sources and also make sure I, um, I create them. So in a private void awake, I will be doing the following. I'll start by a don't destroy on load this.game object to make sure that this audio source persists in between scenes. Even though we're not switching scene in our case, we have a one, one scene application, which is quite cool. But just in case something happened and we have to change. Um, next up, music one is going to be equal to game object add component. So we'll be adding it manually. Type of audio source. Can't seem to type today. Um, same thing for music too, and of course, same thing for the sound effects source. So when we put this script on top of a empty game object, it's going to create its own audio source. It's going to make sure we're not able to destroy it when we change scene. And then finally, with the music sources, I'm going to make sure to put them on loop. So loop is equal to true. Same thing for music too. Now it's time to start playing the sounds. To do that, we're going to be using the audio source component, so the one we have right here, and call the play um, action on it. The easiest one is the sound effect, and it's also the one we're going to be doing first. We're going to be creating a new public function. This one will be able to call it from outside, called play sound effects, with the audio clip you'd like to play. Now the easiest way to call this one is like so. We call the sound effect source, and we do play. Actually, we're going to be doing play one shot like so. And do note that this one also takes in a, a volume scale if you'd like to, um, if you'd like to lower or increment the sound here. So the reason I'm using play one shot instead of play, um, play would mean that before I actually call the play function, I will need to assign the clip manually to the sound effect source and then call play. And that's cool. It's something we could have done. We have a reference to the clip. However, when we try to play uh, using just the play function itself, we cannot overlap sounds if they need to be overlapped. For example, if we want to play two sound effects at the same time, the sound effect is going to be called with the normal play. And then on the second sound effect, when this one starts, it's going to completely shut down the first one and you won't hear the end of that sound. Now with play one shot, it doesn't do that. So you just launch the clip that audio clip and it doesn't stop it. So <laughs> um, it doesn't stop it whatsoever. And this is why we're going to be using this one in case we overlap sound at one point, which in our case would be a desired behavior. So with that being said, I'm quickly going to create an overload in case I need it here um, for volume. Just like so. And now we have the play sound effects, which are a public function in which we can access from anywhere now. Okay, now moving on to the part that's a little bit more hard, and that's the play music. I actually play music with some fading in between them. Again, we're going to be creating a public void, and I'm going to call this one play music with X fade, with crossfade, basically. We're going to take in the music clip as the audio, audio clip, and also the transition time, which I'm going to default to one in case we don't specify it. The first piece of code I'm going to be creating in here is the following. We're going to be determining which one is the active audio source. And it's going to be important in case we're switching from one to another um, in the middle of our scene. So I'm going to be recreating these audio source called the active source. And we're going to be looking at is my first music sound uh, music source active? If that's true, then I'm going to give the following. So music one. And if not, it's going to be music two. Now the same thing is true for this one. So a new source, if this one is true, we're going to be saying music two and then music one. We're just swapping them around. 
And now these will have the reference of music one or two, depending on which one is the active one and also which one is the new one. Then it's gonna be time for us to swap that Boolean over here. So if previously the first music source was active, now it is no longer true. And we do that by saying equal not the same thing. And now it's gonna be time for us to set the new source. So new source dot clip is gonna be equal to the music clip we receive in parameter and then new source dot play. And with that, we are going to start playing that music. However, now we have to create the cross fade in between the two and make sure we call a stop at the end. This is gonna be done with a coroutine actually. And the coroutine is gonna be declared just down here with a private I enumerator. If you haven't already, make sure you add the system dot collection. You'll need that to call the I enumerator. Now I'll call this one update music with X fade. In parameter, we're gonna have the audio source, the original one. We're gonna have the new one, so audio source, new source, audio clip, oops, audio clip, the new music, and float transition time. Just like so. Now that we have this function, I'm gonna go back to the previous one and make sure I create the coroutine clip. So now that we have this function ready, the signature ready, I'm gonna make sure to call it with a start coroutine. And then what do we need to send? We need to send the coroutine itself. So that would be update music with crossfade. And this one takes in the original source. In this case, that's the active source. The new one is the new source. The audio clip is a music clip and transition time is of course transition time, like so. Now a couple of fields here repeat themselves, um, that's from my previous implementation. Technically in this implementation we would not need to include this, um, but the reason they were there in the first place is because in the other implementation we have normal crossfade, we have normal fade and we also have crossfade. Uh, and we also just have play music on its own. So there was a different way to actually call this, um, but technically in this one we won't need it. I'll leave it in there just in case but you'll see that inside of the first uh, few lines that you'll find under the update music with crossfade, those are just really uh, things to make sure we're configured properly. So here, make sure the source is active and playing. So if we're not playing, we are now playing. If the new source wasn't stopped prior and wasn't um, on the new clip, then we make sure to do that, stop, change the clip and play again. This is what we see over here. Uh, it's repeated code. So if you'd like not to see this, you can remove this part here at the top. But you wanna keep the stop because every time uh, we crossfade back, you'll wanna stop your, even though the, mute, the sound is gonna be at zero, you'll still wanna stop that so it doesn't cost you some performances. And now we begin with the actual crossfade by declaring ourselves a float, t, t for time. And now we're gonna be doing a for loop. So for t is equal to 0 0.0f, as long as t is smaller or equal to the transition time, then we add this by the delta time. So t plus equal time dot delta time. And now with this, we can um, yield return to make sure our coroutine stops here until we're actually done with this for loop. And we can say, hey, the original volume can be equal to the music volume this is the one we have by default, minus t divided by transition time times music volume. We can go over this very, very quickly. Oh, oops, here this is not a, <laughs> it's equal. 
So imagine that this music volume is always one by default because this is the maximum sound that you can have on the audio source. So you can say here, for example, if we are um, three seconds in and the transition time is five, so you're gonna see three divided by five, we're at 0 0.6, so we're at 0 0.6, and then you can do one minus 0 0.6, which gives you 0 0.1 because you are uh, making sure that we start here at one and then we go down. So this number goes down over time. And now we're gonna do the same exact thing, but the other way around with the new source. Let me make sure I replace here with the um, the music volume here. It's very important because, for example, if your default music sound uh, music volume is not one, but is, for example, 0 0.7, you wanna make sure that you go back at 0 0.7 when you're done. So here we do the exact same operation, but the other way around. So T divided by transition time times music volume. And for the priority of operation, I'm just gonna make sure to wrap these up in parentheses. Okay. So with this, the original volume goes down and the new source volume goes up. And to make sure that we don't end up on a funky frame, which means uh, we don't end up at a weird value. For example, the new source volume could be 0 0.97 instead of one. We're gonna make sure that once everything is completed, we set the new source volume to music volume, which right now is equal to one, and also the old one, the original. We're gonna make sure it's completely shut down by putting that on zero. And once we're done, we can finally stop the original soundtrack. All right, that's a lot of code for a single video. I know it was quite fast on this, but it's code that we've seen in the past. That's code that I've made a video about um, one year ago, I believe, and it's code that works very well. So if you're interested in learning more about this, I do have a full-fledged video right here on my YouTube channel. You can find it. Audio manager playing a sound, and that's my stupid face again. Okay, awesome. I'll leave you here. <laughs> Thank you guys for watching, and I will see you in the next episode in which we are going to start tackling this in in our game, so we're going to be integrating the sounds in our game. Cheers. In this section, we're going to be using the audio manager made during the previous episode and implementing sound in our game. One thing we have to make sure when we're working with sound, and it's something that gets me out all the time, uh, you have to make sure that you're not under mute audio in your game view. So my game view over here, the mute audio button is not pressed on. So with that out of the way, um, the way we've made our thing is, is really simple. Our audio manager takes in a uh, public function. You just call them with the audio clip you want and everything should work. So so our first goal will be to play the menu loop music, which is the, the music we're going to hear when we're inside of the menu. And now the best way to actually get to that place, the best entry point for that place would be under the, I believe, the game state menu. So let's open up our folder look for game state and under the game state initialize that's what we called it okay so here i'll be opening this one up i'll need a new serialize field which is going to be the it's going to be audio clip called menu loop music and when we construct this one i'm going to be calling the audio manager instance and the play music with crossfade send in the menu loop music with a transition time of say 0 0.5 seconds, so it's gonna be quite fast. And that should be all we need for the music to be played. Of course, now we have to first create our audio manager in the scene. So this, we only have to do it once, all right? Create a new empty game object, audio manager, um, add the audio manager script to it. So here it is. And then under the game manager itself, we're gonna find the game state initialize and our music is right here. Now I made sure to import a couple of music um, that I found on a free website. Um, unfortunately, I cannot share them with you because it's not something you're allowed to redistribute. However, you will not have any problem finding royalty-free music to use for your game if you just do a quick Google search. But do note that it would be better to create, of course, your own assets. In my case here, I found these four clips on Epidemic Sound, which is a you would say it's a service that I subscribe to for YouTube, but also works with game. And I have two tracks, a menu loop and also a game loop, and then two sound effects. Just for show purpose, um, we could add a lot more sound effects. Actually, your game would be much better 
if you added a sound effects for pretty much everything, it's a good way to do a feedback. However, in my case, I don't, I don't have enough of these right now. So, and I also don't know how to make sounds pretty well. So what I'm doing here is just showing you how to do it. And of course, if you want to make that better on your end, you can do so. Now back on my game state initialize. So over here, I'm going to be adding my menu loop music and we're going to give this a try. And I've got a problem right here where it said we did not find a reference to this object. So most likely our audio manager was not found. Let's double click on it, see what's wrong. And uh, yeah, so because this was done in a... Hmm. Because this was done in a awake statement, the audio manager is never actually set. So here on my audio manager, I did forget to do something here. And that something would be the instance is equal to this. So it's going to be very important to do that. In my other implementation that I have on my website, uh, I had the better singleton that would do it on its own. However, here I did not do it. So that's why we got a null reference. And now when I hit on play, we should be able to hear some music. Yep, I don't know if it's loud, so I'm going to stop it here, but uh, we should be able to hear that music. And what we're going to do now is try out the crossfade with the game music. So the same principle applies. We're going to go under the game state game. Here, I'll be adding a new serialized clip. Audio clip. That's going to be the game loop music. And in the start, I will be calling the audio manager instance play with crossfade um, game loop music and again 0 0.5 now let's try going back and forth uh, in between these musics but to do so we'll have to assign the reference first so under game say game drag and drop my game loop music and then let's play Then I'm going to die, go back to the menu. And here you go. So we got music that crossfade in between each other. Um, now the next step I'm going to do is add two more sound effects. Those work in a different manner simply because they are not being looped all the time. So they're just being played when we call it. For example, I have the uncollect fish that I'd like to modify to actually play a sound when I do collect the fish. So what I did is I found my fish.cs and under my pickup fish, I am going to uh, do the exact same thing. So I'll go here, do a serialize, or actually, you know what? I'll do it under the game stat. So I don't have to have a reference to everything all the time. Um, over here, public audio clip, fish collect sound or SFX. And when we collect a fish, so on collect fish, let's play a sound using the audio manager, play sound effects, and we're going to play that sound effects we just had. Now we have to find the game stats.cs in our game and make sure that this is, um, that the sound is assigned. So game stats. The game stats.cs is on top of the game manager, so over here, and I'll drag and drop the collect sound. Now what we'll do is we'll play this and try to run into a fish. And there you go. It's as simple as that. If we'd like to lower that sound, we can do so by just adding a different parameter here. So under the play sound effects, we can say 0 0.7, for example. Now we'll do one more, and that last one is going to be about the def mechanic. So I'll do that on the player. So under the player motor, we should have the uncontroller collider hit. So under the uncontroller collider hit, we could be doing that in the dev state as well, but I'll do it here because the action is done when we hit something. Um, we are going to be calling the audio manager instance Play sound effects would, of course, the sound that I don't currently have. So I'll go back, declare myself a sound roughly around here, maybe here, 
hit sound. Oop. Like so. And we will play the hit sound when we actually hit the wall. Again, I'm going to lower the sound just a little bit because it seemed like the last one was a little bit too much um, in regard to the music. And now with that in mind, I'm going to go on my penguin, find my player motor. We have the hit sound right here and I'll be drag and dropping the death hit. Let's give this a try by running into the wall. Okay, it's a weird sound, but the, the purpose is here. I mean, we're doing the right thing here. I'm going to cancel this music, and that's pretty much all we needed to implement sounds. Um, now, I would suggest that you actually spend a lot more time than I did to find these sounds, or even better, make these sounds, and add as many sounds as you wish on button clicks, when you collect stuff, when you, maybe when you jump, when you land. There is so many things you could add on top of what we currently have to make your game sound a lot better actually and feel a lot better when you play it but do note that most of the game being played on the android or phone are actually not being played with sound so <laughs> um that that's a bit discouraging note but it's a it's the reality here so um that being said it's gonna wrap up this section very simple section it's a very simple logic as well and i hope you guys enjoyed in the next section we're going to be looking at building for ios and that's going to be the final section before we tackle the optional videos Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. The very first step we'll need to take in order to publish our application to the Apple Developer Program will be to enroll in it. So we'll need to put our Apple ID and make sure we um, we make it a Apple Developer ID. So go on their website, make sure you click on Enroll, read through a bunch of stuff and then start your enrollment. At the end of that, you will have to pay a fee, a fee to be part of the um, Apple Developer Program and that fee is something you renew every year. It is roughly $120 Canadian and um, make sure that you have that before you publish. Now, if that runs out and you decide not to renew it, your application will not be able to be used by the people who have it and you won't be able to run any updates on them. Actually, it will be removed from the store as well. The second step will have to be done on the developer.apple.com website in which you'll go under, under your account and then you'll choose Certificate, Identifier, and Profile. And here, we will have to create ourselves a provisioning profile. A provisioning profile requires you to have a certificate, identifier, and also identify a couple of devices in which you'll be running your test on. So we'll start with the certificate here. You're going to hit Create Certificate and choose Apple Distribution. You could be using um, Apple Development if you don't plan on pushing this to the App Store and only to your device, but in our case, we're using Production. Then you'll be asked to create a new certificate. In order to do that, you'll have to access the Keychain Access application on your Mac. Head over to Keychain Access and then use the Certificate Assistant to request a certificate from a certificate um, in which you'll enter a couple of information and then make sure you save that to disk. It's very important that you keep it to the disk. Make sure you hit continue. Choose the place where you save it. And then once that's done, we're going to be uploading that on the website. Let's choose that certificate. Open it. And then we'll hit continue and download the result. So in there, our certificate has been merged with Apple. And in here, we will have to save this to our desktop or anywhere really. And make sure we double click on it. It's very important that we open this file because it saves it within our keychain access. To make sure, just open it up and see if you have the certificate. Our second step will have to do with um, adding a app identifier. So go to the identifier section and then click on the plus sign. You're going to be registering a app because we're not doing any services, we're not doing anything like that. We're doing a application. Hit continue. And in here, put a description for that app. And on the second field, we will need the bundle ID. In here, just to make sure that um, there is no problem, I also include the access Wi-Fi information because we're going to be using um, the internet for a couple of features in our game. So to find our application bundle ID, let's make sure we open up our Unity project. And then while we're here, let's also check uh, if you have anything that is Android related or if you have any error, make sure you go ahead and you comment those out in preprocessor statement, just like I did here. For example, I'm using the Play Games platform 
um, but that's only for Android, so I made sure to put that on their preprocessor statement. Once that's done, go over to build settings, player settings, and then we'll be able to find our bundle ID, which is just a little bit below in the um, other settings. Copy that over, and we'll be putting that on the website. Once it is done, let's hit continue. And our last step will have to do with um, adding certain devices for testing. So here, I already have one. I already have a iPhone connected to my Mac as well. But in your case, if you don't have anything, make sure you hit the plus sign. And then here, you're going to be entering your device name. That could be your iPad, that could be your iPhone. But most importantly, you will need the UDID. This one, you can find it over on Xcode. So I invite you to build your project for iOS um, at the same time. We'll be saving a little bit of time here. We'll create our project, make sure we build it to Xcode. And then once we have the project built for Unity, we can open up that folder, open the Xcode project, in which we'll be able to find our device UDID. In order to find it, make sure it is connected to the Mac and go over to Window, Device and Simulators. Here, you'll be able to find the identifier. So make sure you copy that over to the website if you don't have a device already. Now with these three things, while we have a certificate, identifier, and also devices, we're now able to create the final piece, which is a profile. A profile pretty much puts all of these together. So let's make sure we create one that is for the Apple Store because we're wishing to, um, we're wishing to push that on the App Store. Hit continue, select our app. That's the app identifier. Hit continue again, select the certificate. We only have one. And then finally, give it a name. So in here, I called it the Subway Skater provisioning, provisioning Profile. Let's hit Generate, download that, and we'll need to save that because we'll need to also include it in our build. Okay, once that is completed, let's head over to Xcode, open up the project. We'll go under the display name and we change the name here because that's the product name but not the, the name of my game. And finally, go over to sign in and capabilities. So I'm going to be importing my profile, the one I just created. And now everything should work and we'll give it a try by hitting the play button on the left hand side. And that should be building to the iPhone. In my case, I had a little bit of issue making this work because I was not under um, the right signing in capabilities. I was actually under release, but I had to be under all. So after going back to that, and making sure I um, I disable a couple of things, I put the same setting as I had prior, I was then able to build this to the iPhone. After, of course, inputting my password a couple of times. And there we go. Our final step will be to push that over to the App Store Connect. So with your Apple ID, make sure you connect to the Apple Store Connect. And on here, we will be creating ourselves a new app. Of course, before we do that, we have to accept the terms and agreement. Then head over to My Apps. Let's left click anywhere, or actually on the plus sign, to make sure we create a new app. We're not looking to create an app bundle here, just a regular app. Input your information. And once that is completed, we should be put over to a page in which we're going to be entering a lot of information. So this is just like the Google Play Store. You have to input a lot of things um, and also some pictures of your game before it is being put on the store. You could think um, you can think of this as a app store listing. So you have to input your bundle ID, your game category, subtitle, release note, uh, content rights, age rating, all of that. So make sure you go through all of these steps. The information you're looking to fill are in the first section, the one called 1.0 Prepare for Submission. They're also under General App Information and then General Pricing and Availability. That's what you have to do. And then in terms of the build, to make sure we have a build uploaded there, we have to reopen Xcode and then under Xcode, after building, we are going to go under 
product archive and it's going to take a little while to build but once that is completed you'll be able to find this right here on the right hand side you'll find a blue button called distribute app which we're going to be pressing and following the steps um, that goes along with it now the connection in between your application here in xcode and the one you've made on the um, the app store connect website will be done automatically when you upload here through the bundle ID. So of course you want to have the bundle ID matching on both sides, which is um, really the only way they connect together. Here you have to include the iOS content or not. Um, in my case, I don't include it because I don't plan on doing debugging so much. But for example, if you have a game that uh, you want to keep metrics off, you want to keep uh, crash reports off, even on the user's device, then make sure you include that. You'll need those symbols to debug. Enter the rest of the information, your password a couple of time, and then you should be starting to upload the application. After a little bit, that should be done. It's going to say successfully uploaded. And then you're going to have to wait just a tiny bit because the, the link in between those two websites uh, doesn't seem to be instant. So when I go back on my app listing, I am not able to find anything for the build just yet, but uh, if you wait five minutes, 10 minutes, you should be able to see it. So here is a little bit later on. I scroll down and I see plus button next to build. Make sure you click that and you should be able to see your game right there. Of course, if the bundle ID match um, the one that you have on the store. Here it asks if our app uses encryption. In our case, it really doesn't. There's nothing encrypting data. Um, usually by default, Unity doesn't have anything, but if you have a third-party plugin, there's chances that it might. So double check with that. Once you're ready, hit submit for review, and then you'll see all the steps that you still need to complete before you put that on the App Store. In my case here, I need to upload screenshot for four different types of devices, and I did all of that. So once that is completed, I hit submit for review. Just wait a tiny bit, and it seems like it went through validation and now it has been submitted for review.